Okay, now, Cherry. We'll give you five minutes with him. That's all I want. All right, Job. Here's visitor. Hey. Doc, what is it? Well, well where, where the heck is he? He's gone. I knew he was. I knew well, it. Well, why the heck didn't you say so then? How'd he get out? Here's how he got out, opened the window, and slid down the drain pipe. Well, that's great. Jack's going to be mighty proud of yeah, us. But look here. Why, why would he want to do a thing like that for? Silly question number one. What you mean? You didn't think Brother Job would stay put without plenty of liquid refreshment, did you? You mean he sneaked out for a few snorts? But he shouldn't have. He must come back right away. He must. Why must he? They'll get him. They'll get him this time. I know they will. Is that what you wanted to tell him? Yes. I wanted to tell him to stay here where you could watch him. They're just waiting, waiting. Reggie, get downstairs and tell Jack what's happened. Right. Don't leave the girls alone for a minute, Doc. Come on, you two. Get back in Faye's room. Come on, Miles. Why did he go? Because he likes the taste of the stuff. He's breaking Grandma's heart. Well, Grandma broke his spirit. Turnabout's fair play. No, you mustn't say that, Faye. Hey, wait a minute, huh? I want to look in and see if Hope's all right. Uh, you two wait right here by the door so as I can see you all the time. And I don't neither of you move. Yeah, she's all right. Poor little fella. Keep right on her sleeping, honey. She's all right? Yeah, sleeping like a baby. All right, come on back to your room. Say, how much longer you three super sleuths think you're going to keep us undercover? Until Jack says to let you out. Well, I'm getting pretty sick of being a prisoner in my own house. We're just doing it for your own good. It isn't any good locking us up. It ain't, huh? No. When they want to strike, they'll strike whether you're here or not. And what you think we'll be doing all that time? It won't make any difference what you're doing. If you understood, you'd know that. Well, then, why don't you come out and make us understand? You can't. Nobody understands but me. <laughs> She's psychic. I don't know. I just know, that's all. Well, all I gotta say is, if you hadn't told us so much it's come true already, I'd say you were the screwiest screwball dame I ever did see. You wasn't so little and purty along with me. Hey, here comes Reggie back. He's gonna get mighty sick of those stairs if this keeps up. Uh, how about it, Reggie? What's Jack say? Well, he's going out to find Job. While he's gone, he doesn't want us to leave the girls for a second. Oh, stick right with him, huh? Right. I'm to go and sit in my Hope's bed and stay right beside her. And I'm to chaperone Faye and Cherry, huh? Right. Go in Faye's room with them. Don't let either one of them out of your sight. Well, what about Grandma upstairs? Oh, leave her alone. She won't be bothered. It's the girls that are in danger. Oh, no. Hey, hey, what's the matter? He did it. He did it again. Look. Her shoulder. She's been slashed again. Yes, they did it. They did it. Cherry, Cherry, how did it happen? I don't know. I was just standing here. I feel a sting on my shoulder. She's been slashed, all right. Just like the others. It isn't possible. We were all standing right here. There isn't anyone else. Yes, there is. They were here. They were here. Terry, stop it. They slashed me. They slashed me. Further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. System presents I Love a Mystery. Transcribed.
Reggie, keep changing those cold compresses on Job's head. I want to bring him around as quickly as possible. All right. Shall I let his head hang over the foot of the lounge this way? Yes, that'll bring the blood up where he needs it most. Doggone, fella. You must have popped brother Job a whopper. I had to. Well, what happened? Well, the minute you told me he'd escaped from his bedroom and slid down the drain pipe, I dropped everything and went after him. But how'd you know where to look, Jack? Where would you look for a thirsty man? The nearest bar. And he was there? Yes, just getting ready to go on to bigger and better things. And you said, come on back, and he wouldn't come, so you floored him. Something like that. You sure all the girls are locked up in their bedrooms so there's no chance of them getting out? Yeah, and I don't mind saying they resent it. They'll just have to resent. Boy, the things Faye said would have skinned them you. <laughs> Living up to a reputation as the family Bulgarian, huh? No fooling. Doggone no, I hated to take that little old cherry girl back up to her room. She didn't want to go so bad. Why'd you insist on it? Because I want each girl locked up separately. Uh, Hope's still unconscious? He's just sleeping now, I think. <laughs> Seems like Grandma's keeping awful close to her room up on the third floor. She's all right. Jack, you say you want the three girls locked up separately. Why? I want to see what'll happen. You mean if the baby will cry, then one of them gets a the business. Yes. But ain't that dangerous? This time, one of them might get killed. How? If they can't get out, how can anyone get into them? You got me, feller. But Cherry insists they can. It's just like her getting sliced on the shoulder out yonder in the hall when we was all standing right there. Did you have your eyes on Faye all the time? I say. Hey, you mean... I just asked if you had your eyes on Faye all the time. Well, no, of course not. But what would Faye want to go and slash her sister for? And more than that, uh, Cherry said they did it. All right, they did it. But couldn't Faye be one of them? Job, I'd never thought of that. There's a woman in this someplace. Whoever tore her clothes and slashed her up in her room earlier this afternoon was a woman. Mm, you mean those fingernail scratches on her neck and shoulder? Yes, they were narrow and pointed. Faye's nails are like that. Most women's are these days. Doggone, but I'm balled up. About what? About everything. You think maybe Faye shot the chauffeur last night, too? She had the opportunity. But she screamed and brought us down when she found him. Why not? Make it look like she was innocent. Yeah, she could have, all right. Yes, but why would she want to? Well, she may have done it to keep her sister Hope from becoming involved. Or she may have seen him leaving the front door with Hope's dress in her hands and, believing the worst, killed him on the spot. Yeah, but that didn't mean that she was prowling around the house with a gun in her hand. What'd she want to be doing that for? Well, she knew Hope was out with him. She might have gone to Job's room, got his gun with a silencer, and waited for them to come back. Well, we know the gun that killed him had a silencer, all right. And that gun was Job's. You sure about that? Certainly. How many guns with silencers have you seen in your life? Oh, a couple or three. Which means that guns equipped for silence are about as scarce as hen's teeth. All right, I get your point. Well, if Faye is the one, are you going to turn the information over to police? Not yet. I want to know for sure. I talked to the police, and they're sure the chauffeur was a gangster and that he was wiped out by rival gunmen. Let them work on that theory. We'll go on working on this angle. Uh, then then you think for sure what's going on is an inside job. Well, maybe not entirely, but there's someone working on the inside. Finger for the gang on the outside, huh? Something like that. And and it's Faye? Well, certainly her skirts aren't any too clean. But why? What's it all about? You know as much as I do, Doc. They may be trying to frighten Grandma Martin into paying blackmail. She knows something about this she's not telling, that's certain. But that city, why'd she bring us in here to clear up this mess and then hold out information on us? I'm afraid to tell us. Trying to protect someone? How do I know? Yeah. Jack, Job's conscious. What's that? Quite. Had his eyes open. Closed them again when he saw me looking at him. All right, Job. Oh, what a head. Can you sit up? I don't know. Well, come on, try it. Oh. Say, what'd you hit me for? Because you wanted to argue about coming back, and I didn't have time to argue. It wasn't very friendly. I'm not here to be friendly. You sober? Yeah, I feel terrible. I'm not surprised. I always feel terrible when I'm sober. Like a fish out of water, huh? Look, be a good guy. There's a bottle of brandy in the buffet. Go get it, Reggie. I know. Job. Well? There isn't a doubt in the world your gun killed the chauffeur. Now, where is it? It's gone. I know it's gone. Where to? I don't know. I looked in my bureau drawer for it. It wasn't there. Why do you keep a gun with a silencer? It was a birthday present from Faye. Hey, a birthday present from Faye? Yes. But why would she give you a present like that? I always thought it would be fun to have one, so she got it. Here you are, Jack. No, I'll just take the bottle. On the other hand, you get one drink. That's all. One drink. Maybe after you've talked a while, you can have another. Here. That better? Uh, A little Job, did you approve of Hope running around with a family chauffeur? Hope is old enough to vote. Isn't it a fact that your grandmother fired the last four chauffeurs because they were too friendly with Hope? Sure. As the man of the family, what did you think of this? Grandma wears the pants in this family. You had no desire for revenge on them for dragging your sister down to their level? Look, we got a motto in this house. You mind your business and I'll mind mine. 
So you were willing to look the other way, no matter what happened to your sisters. Oh, let me alone, will you? Another thing. Cherry says you and Hope are in grave danger. Oh, she's always talking. But why did she link you and Hope together? Did it have anything to do with her escapade with the chauffeur? I don't know, I tell you. I don't know what Cherry's talking about nine-tenths of the time. You don't think you're in danger? Sure, I'm in danger. Everybody's in danger. You might get hit by a car or anything might happen. No, I mean specific danger. Oh, nuts. You say that, yet you know that someone tried to chloroform Hope this afternoon. Maybe she tried to commit suicide. How do I know? Well, it's possible. Except that there have been attacks on Cherry, too. Yeah. Somebody scratched her with a pin. Cut. Not a scratch. And it was done with something very sharp. Do you use a safety razor? Yeah, but if you think I'm going around cutting up Cherry with a safety razor blade, you're crazy. I didn't say that. More than that, Cherry was thrown downstairs. And at the same time Hope was chloroformed, she was unconscious and slashed up in her room. Well, nobody's dead, is he? Except the chauffeur and he doesn't count. Why not? I asked why the chauffeur doesn't count. He's not in the family. He was attached to the family. Okay, he was attached to the family. So what? You know, Job, I'm getting the impression that you're getting a great deal of satisfaction out of that murder. How about another nip? No. You don't like Faye, do you? As a brother likes any sister. That's not answering my question. You don't like her, do you? If she was dead, I'd send flowers to the funeral. Oh, look here. Now. That's an ugly thing to say. Well, you asked me, didn't you? This is the first time we've seen you sober since we arrived. I've got a hunch I'd like to see you and Cherry together when you're in this condition. Well, what's that for? Well, you object? Look... Don't I feel bad enough now without you bringing that terrified mouse down to whisper about the horrible death that's in store for me? Uh-huh. Yes, I think I'd like to see you and Cherry together. Doc. You want me to go get it? No, I want you and Reggie to stay here with Job and keep that bottle away from him till I get back. You hear that, Job, old kid? I won't be gone but a minute. Say, hey, old chap, you know, you'd be a handsome man if you didn't have such an unhealthy pallor. <laughs> no. How long have you been hitting it up like this? A year, two years, I forget. You like the stuff? In such large quantities, I mean? Oh, now, lay off, will you? Fine. Sorry. You don't understand folks like him, Reggie. No? Mm-mm. Folks like him is tickled to death with themselves. That's why they pour it in. Because they like themselves so much they can't stand it. Oh, you're pretty smart, aren't you? They call him the good-natured drunk. But where does his nice disposition go to when he's sober? Look, you two, just leave me alone, will you? Oh, sure, sure. We don't really like to torture dumb animals. Thanks for nothing. What's Packard want to bring Cherry down here for? He has his own reasons. Maybe he wants your little sister to see you when you ain't plastered. Because uh, Cherry told us she loved you a lot. Yeah, I'll bet she did. Yes, she did. We both heard her. First time I knew Cherry had a sense of humor. She didn't say it like she thought it was funny. All right, stop it, will you? He's going to bring her down here. Why doesn't he? It's just me, Cherry. Oh. Hello. Who did you think it was? They... They were outside just a minute ago. What's that? Yes, they were. They tried the handle. I saw it moving. And then when they found out it was locked, I heard them whispering. Could you hear what they said? No, just whispering. Men's voices or women's voices? I don't know. Just whispering. Well, you might have been mistaken. No. It was them. They came to get me. Well, I'm here now, so don't worry. I want you to come downstairs to the library with me. Come in my room first. Yes, if you wish. Why did you close the door? Look at me. I am. I'm pretty, aren't I? Very pretty, Cherry. Your face would be beautiful if it wasn't so sad. I'm young. I'm nice. I am, aren't I? I'm sure you are. Then why don't you take me in your arms? Cherry, what is this? Why don't you? Why doesn't anybody... I'm a woman. Yes, I am. If you don't think I am, just give me the chance. Jerry, stop that. Oh. Here, here. You're just all upset. No. Nobody wants me except them. Nobody. They want me. They want me so bad they'll tear down this house to get me. And they will do. If somebody doesn't take me first. I can't do it alone. No. No, not while we're here. Oh, Mr. Packard. Mr. Packard, I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid.
further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. I Love a Mystery, transcribed. down here, Cherry. Yes? Hey, Jack, what'd you send Reggie out for? A special job that needed to be done at once. Oh. Well, hello, Cherry. Ain't you happy? No. Well, neither is your big brother Job here, so that makes two of you. Yes, I know. Well, ain't you gonna say hello to your little sister, Job? We don't need small talk. My sisters and I understand each other. That's just the trouble. We don't. We don't what? Understand each other. We all want to love you so much, Job. And you won't let us. You crazy little fool. Job, don't talk to me like that. Don't you know these men brought you down here just to hear you talk? But I haven't got anything to say they shouldn't hear. Oh, you haven't, huh? No. Did you think I did? Look, I don't know anything about it. I wish somebody would give me a drink. Has he had anything while I was up getting cherry? Nope, not a drop. All right, pour him another jigger. Jigger? It's not even a drop of water on a hot stove. Job, I wish you wouldn't drink. Yeah. Yes. Why do you? The same reason Faye indulges herself in vulgar language. The same reason Hope's devoting her life to chauffeurs. The same reason you... What, Job? What am I? The same reason you're the way you are. But what am I? What is it I am? I want to know. I've got to know. Can't you see she's driving me nuts? Why don't you pull her off? I wish you'd answer a question, Job. What did you mean, she's the way she is? No, thank you. And have them on my neck. Them? That's right. Cherry's mysterious they. The little people. Hey, you believe they are around, too? Very much around. They're going to destroy this house before they're through. Not while we're here to prevent it. Yes, they will. Because they will have completed the job here before you realize who they are. The Martins will come to ugly and early deaths one by one. It'll seem so strange, so unnatural, utterly unsolvable. And all the time, they will be right under your nose. They... These murdering little people who've been closing in on Cherry and the rest of this household. Now, will you please give me another shot of that brandy? Jack. Jack, look at Cherry. Why does she eat? Cherry. Cherry, do you hear me? Oh. Oh, yes. I was thinking. About what? I didn't know anyone realized how dangerous they were except me. There's not a bit of blood in your face. Are you all right? Yes, I'm all right. But now I know why Job is drinking so much. Why is Job drinking? Well, why? Because he's as frightened as, as I am. Is that true, Job? No. Mr. Packard. Yes? Where are Faye and Hope and Grandma? Faye and Hope are locked in their bedrooms. Your grandmother's in her suite on the third floor. C- could they come down here? I suppose they could, if there's any good reason for it. Yes, there is. I'll have to know what it is first. Job has something to tell all of us. Job? Hey, what are you talking I about? I promise you. I promise you he will tell something. But everybody's got to be here. You might as well save yourself the trouble. I haven't got anything to say to anybody. If he doesn't tell you, I will. I promise. She's crazy. I don't know. But I think we'll try it. Doc. Yeah? Go up and ask Grandma Martin to come down here. And then get Faye and have her help you bring Hope down. Wake Hope up if she's still asleep? Yes, yeah, she may still be a little weak. Okay. Oh, just a minute. See that she's warmly dressed. Person coming out of a heavy dose of chloroforms in danger of pneumonia. Yeah, I'll take care of her. Look here, Packard, I don't like this. You don't like what? It just happens I don't want to see my grandmother right now. Why not? That's my affair. Sorry, you'll have to stay. 
I haven't got anything to say, and neither is Cherry. But I have, Job. I'm not going to stay, and that's all there is to it. Job, sit down. You heard what I said. I said sit down. I punched you once tonight, and I can do it again if I have to. What are you going to sit down? You're being almighty high-handed in this house. Your grandmother gave me full authority. Now sit down and relax. Strong arm method. Yeah, that's better. Sometimes a strong arm is the only thing people understand. At least give me another drink. No. You've had enough for now. I've never had enough. I never will have enough. Enough of what? Well, speak up. Enough of what? Job thinks he needs a drink, Mrs. Martin. Nonsense. Everyone tries to make Job appear worse than he is. Job, dear... Would you like a cup of coffee? No, I wouldn't like a cup of coffee. Oh, don't be naughty now, Job. Oh, nuts. Hello, Grandma. What's wrong with you now? Nothing. Nothing, Grandma. And I'd like to know who moved the chairs in this library. Chairs? Certainly. They're not where they belong at all. Well, I'm afraid I'm responsible for that. Indeed. Well, they go right back where they belong. Get up, Terry. Yes, Grandma. May I help you? You know where they go? <laughs> oh, I'm afraid not. Well, then stand out of the way. Just as you like. <laughs> Well, hello. <laughs> Did someone touch one of Grandma's precious chairs? Oh, hello, Faye. Hi, Miles. Hello, Job. How's drinking these days? Ha <laughs> ha, great joke. Come on, Grandma, relax. Mind your manners, Faith Martin. <laughs> oh, those chairs of hers have been sitting in exactly the same spot in the library for 40 years. She knows where they belong to the fraction of an inch. I certainly do. There. Now, the room looks like something. Where's Doc and Hope? They're coming. Hope's feeling pretty good, so I came on down. What's happening now? Cherry and Job have an interesting surprise for us. Oh, Job's not going to confess he's responsible for the baby, is he? <laughs> Don't be vulgar, Faye. Take your own chair, Cherry. Yes, Grandma? Job, come here to your chair beside me. Look, Grandma, will you lay off me tonight? Job. All right, Grandma, anything you want. Say, what is this? What do you mean, Job's own chair? Some more of Grandma's discipline. When we were kids, we each had our own chair, and... Every evening we had to sit in that particular chair and listen to Grandma read to us. Kept you from running the streets. You mean all these years you've always sat in the same chair in its same position? It was the law. You must have ruled with an iron hand, Mrs. Martin. I did, and I'm proud of it. Yes, but you're not quite so proud of what you made out of this, are you? I'll thank you not to blame inherent wickedness onto me. Any bad in you children came from your mother's side of the family. You leave our mother out of this, Grandma. <laughs> You can take it our mother wasn't a Martin. And that she probably died to get out from under the thumb of Grandma. Job, you've never said an unkinder word in your life. That pays you back for your jab at our mother. Oh, you're an ungrateful boy, Job. Okay, I'm ungrateful. Yeah, everybody's in the library. Oh, here they come. They're kind of weak. You, you better sit down here. Hope, take your own chair. Hey, what you mean? Hope's in no condition to walk She can her... walk over here to her own chair. Well, I swear to Grandma. That's all right. I'm wobbly, but I'm game. Come on. Well, I don't mind telling you, Grandma. The more I see you, the more I don't like you. Keep a little tongue in your head. There you are. Okay? Yes, I'm perfectly all right. Well, I think this is your first appearance among the living, if you call this living, since your attack of chloroform. Yes, and it's nice being alive if you're interested. I want to ask you a question about that later. About being alive? No, about who did it. Well, I can save the interview right now by saying I was asleep when it happened. You didn't wake up while it was being given? If I did, I went right out again. And you've no idea who did it? No. Not even whether it was a man or a woman? No. Come now, what's all this about? I think you asked for our presence down here, didn't you, Mr. Packard? That's right. This is to be Cherry's show. Cherry and Job's. What's the matter? Have they been after her again? This has nothing to do with they. Yes, it does. It has everything to, to do with them. I understood either Job here was going to make a confession or that you were going to make the confession for him. What sort of nonsense is this? It's true, Grandma. It's true. Job, what are you going to confess? Nothing. Cherry's got bats in her belfry, and they've got her going in circles. Mr. Packard, you mean you brought us all down here simply on the word of this neurotic girl? I'm not neurotic. You don't say that about me. Mrs. Martin, if you'll please just let me go ahead with this in my own way. But the child's utterly irresponsible. Please. Oh. Now then, Job. Don't look at me. I haven't anything to say. Cherry? Job, why don't you tell them? Why don't you make a clean breast of the whole thing? What are you talking about? The murder of the chauffeur. Cherry Martin, are you accusing your brother, Job? Be still, Mrs. Martin. I never heard Mrs. anything. Mrs. Martin. Well, I never did. Is that what you're doing, Cherry? Accusing Job of the chauffeur's murder? Yes. Why, you little double cross? It doesn't matter, Job. It doesn't matter. You'll never be punished for it. You're crazy. I suppose I'm the one who tried to chloroform Hope here, huh? Suppose I've been pushing you downstairs and slashing you. Just a minute, Job. 
Cherry, what do you mean he'll never be punished for it? Because they'll get him before the law dies. Cherry, what do you mean? It's true, Hope, it's true. Uh, Are you trying to give us all the creeps? Why are you all looking at me like that? Stop looking at me like that, do you hear? So the good-natured drunk killed the chauffeur, and they are going to get him before the law does, eh? Can I help it if that's the way it is? Can I? Can I? Doc. Yeah? Keep an eye on Job. You bet you. If you ask me, Jack... Oh, hey, who turned out the light? Quiet. Listen. The baby. The baby. Doc, get the light on. I gotta feel my way around. Darn if it don't sound like it's right here in this room. Hurry up. Turn on that light. Got it. All right. Everyone stay right where he is. You all right? All of you? I don't want to be vulgar, but I feel like something laid a hard-boiled egg in the pit of my stomach. The baby cried. It's a warning. It's a warning to Joe. Nonsense. I won't have it. What I want to know is how those lights were turned off. No one was within six feet of that switch. But the baby, the warning... Doc, you stand there right beside that switch from now on. Okay, fella. I'd like to see it. Oh! Oh! Job! Oh. Job! He's been shot through the head. The gun with the silencer. Yes. Oh, Joe, darling. Oh, Joe, Joe. Didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you? They want all of us dead. Further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. System presents I Love a Mystery. Transcribed. Welcome to Viacom's Old Time Radio Show. We are playing I Love a Mystery, I Love Adventure, and Adventures by Carl Danny Mars. We are up to episode number 75 out of 139. Enjoy. Just sit back, relax, and enjoy the radio. But the police have just got to be right, Jack. The, the shot that killed Job come from out on the porch. I know that. And, and Faye, Hope, and Cherry, and Grandma Martin was a-setting right in this room with us. That's right. So they couldn't have done it if they'd wanted to. Looks that way, doesn't it? It not only looks that way, it is that way. What you keep nosing around this library for? What you expect to find? The answer. Answer? Answer to what? Uh, someone in this room killed Job. You're crazy. That's so? I'll be a bow-legged hypnosis if you ain't. What? Ain't we just admitted Job was shot from out on the porch? Doc, you're sure Reggie's up patrolling the second floor hallway? Of course he is. That's what you just told him to do, ain't it? Yes. Well, then that's where he is. Looky, it's three in the morning. How about us calling the whole thing off and going to bed? Can't. Well, if the police are satisfied he is shot from outside, why shouldn't we be? Because I know more than the police do. Okay, you know more than... Huh? You know more about what? What's going on in this house. For instance... We know that a baby cries in this house and that there's no baby. Yeah. We know that Cherry predicted Job's death not ten minutes before he was killed. You mean her saying they would get him before the law did? Yes. How did she know? Well, how about her being in cahoots with the killer on the outside? Maybe. 
We also know that just before Job was killed, the lights went out in the library. And the baby cried. Yes, but what made the lights go out? Well, somebody snapped the switch. But who? No one in the room was nearer than six feet to the switch. It's right beside the door. Somebody must have sneaked the door open, reached in, and snapped them off. Who? Well, the guy that shot Job from the porch. Maybe. I don't think so. Well, why don't you? Here, bring your flashlight over here and run along the floor. What for? Would you mind, Doc? Oh, no, of course not. Thanks. Hmm. Okay. You know, fella, don't mind me saying so, but I think you're trying to make something out of nothing. You can go to bed if you want to. Oh, you know doggone well I won't go to bed till you do. Suit yourself. Why do you think somebody in this house done murder? At least you can tell me that much. It was too well set up. It was all planned. What was? The murder. Cherry insisted on bringing the whole family down here. Cherry accused Job of killing the chauffeur and predicting his death. Cherry was frightened from the moment we brought her into this room with Job. Cherry's always scared. Just the same, she was breathless, expectant. Waiting for something to happen. Then you you really think she done it? Uh, on the other hand, Grandmother Martin acted very peculiar. She insisted on arranging the chairs in a certain position in the room. She insisted on each one of the family taking a certain chair. She selected the chair right in front of the window for Joe. But didn't Faye explain that she'd been doing that since they were little kids? Yet when I interviewed the family on the first night we got here, she didn't insist. Everyone sat where he wanted to. Hmm. That's funny. Yes, I think so, too. The only thing about Grandma doing it, though... Everybody said Job was her favorite. You don't just up and murder your favorite grandchild. You don't even help somebody else do it. Still, she did make him sit in the chair in front of the window. Yeah, she done that all right. But looky, Jack, just before the murder, uh, you were so sure that Faye was the one. I'm still not overlooking her. She's the most intelligent, the most capable of planning a foolproof murder. And she, she was the one nearest. Hey, wait a minute. I just thought of something. Did you hear any gun go off? What's that? When Job was shot. Did you hear any gun go off? No. Well, neither did I. Just a smashing of the wind. Which means the gun with the silencer was used. Yeah. I guess that'd have to be it, wouldn't it? Hmm. Well, well what's that for? Huh? Well, what's you doing that for? Marking on the floor where each chair is placed. Just in case they're moved. There. Yeah, now then, we're ready to go upstairs. To bed? <laughs> no, not to bed. Oh, all right, all right. I was just asking. Uh, well, will you tell me one thing, though? What? Why, if you think Cherry or Grandma or Faye is a killer, didn't you lock them up tonight? I said Reggie to patrolling in front of their rooms, didn't I? Yeah, but this afternoon you had them all locked in and had me and Reggie watching besides. Now you have their doors unlocked and you only have Reggie on the job. I've been waiting for something to happen. Huh? You've been doing what? Waiting for something to happen. You mean that's what we've been doing in yonder in the library, waiting for something? Yes. I thought you said you was hunting for something. Well, I had to put in the time some way. But what? Waiting for what? For the murderer to make the next move. For the... You mean you're turning the murderer loose to prowl in the house? That's about it. Well, just to see what he'd do next? Yes. Then why'd you bother to put Reggie up on the second floor? So we could get to all the rooms fast in case the baby cried. And no baby ain't cried. No. So you're giving up expecting something to happen? Maybe. I'll take it easy on the stairs. Yeah. Hey, that... That kind of makes my hair stand up, fella. Right this minute, a killer may be a-sneaking and a-crouching around in dark places. Hey, 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 hold it. What's the matter? There's somebody standing there at the head of the stairs. What? Oh, what's the matter with you, Doc? That's Reggie. Well, what's he in the shadow for? Is that you, Jack? Yes, Reggie. Everything quiet up here? Too very quiet, if you ask me. Haven't heard anything, huh? Mm, there's been movement in Faye's room. I don't think that young woman's getting much sleep tonight. A bad conscience, maybe, huh? That's all you've heard? Funny thing, once I thought I heard a rustling of a dress. When was that? Oh, 15, 20 minutes ago. What did it sound like? Just movement. Like a drape blowing at an open window. Must have been hearing things not in the hall. If any of the doors had been open and closed, I'd have heard them. You couldn't have seen around the corner of the hall? No, but it's been so quiet, I would have heard the turn of a doorknob. Maybe, maybe not. Let's have a look. But I tell you, Jack, there's no time for guesswork. We'll make sure. Uh, This is Faye's room. Yeah, give me a flashlight. Uh Uh-huh. Wait here. I thought you said Faye was awake. She was. Half an hour ago. She all right, Jack? Yes, her bed looks like it had been stirred up with a spoon, but she's asleep now. Pope's right around the corner of the hall. All right. I don't see how anyone can sleep tonight. Her brother murdered. Exhaustion. I suppose so. This is it. Wait here. Funny, they didn't lock their doors from inside. Yeah, but I was on duty up here. Well, just the same with somebody prowling. Oh, uh, Hope okay? Yes. Doesn't look like she'd moved since she got into that bed. Doc, you keep watch down here while Reggie and I go up on the third floor and have a look at Grandma and Cherry. Sure, go ahead. Come on, Reggie. Hey, 
Faye. Hey, what's going on? Oh. Hello, Faye. Did somebody just come into my room? Yeah, Jack. Uh, just checking up. Well, he's got his nerve. For your own good. I'll bet I was something to look at. Didn't he ever hear the old saw, let sleeping girls lie? I guess not. Where is he now? Oh, up on the third floor, checking on Grandma and Cherry. Oh, <laughs> Grandma's going to love that. Well, business is business. <laughs> Grandma keeps a poker beside her bed. For his own good, he'd better not wake her up. Grandma's asleep? Yes. She snores. <laughs> now then, across the hall is Cherry. Listen. The baby. Quick, look in Cherry's room. Righto. Turn on the light. I'm trying to. Here it is. I say, she's not here. Cherry's not here. Downstairs, quick. Get down, wait. What's that? Here by the door, look. Handkerchief, blood on it. Oh, I say. Come on, don't stand there. Jack. Jack, wait a minute, look here. We haven't got time for anything. But right, right here by the head of the stairs. A shoe. What's that? Here, let me see it. A girl's shoe. Cherries. Come on, keep your eyes open. I go. Here. Here's something else. Yeah, I say, a ribbon out of her hair. Jack, Jack, the baby. Did you hear the baby? Yeah, we heard it. And Cherry's not in the room. Cherry, you, you mean the baby's got her? Don't be a fool. Doc, you stay here and guard these doors. Reggie and I have got a job on our hands. Well, where are you going? Search the house. Seems to have been dropping things all along the way. I say, what's this? Stocking. Looks like a strip tease here. I'm downstairs to the first floor. Uh oh. There's something at the foot of the stairs. Another shoe. What's that in the hallway? Get it. I say, I don't see it. Toward the back of the house. The baby again. Hurry. Hurry. She must have gone this way. All right. What'd you pick up that time? I don't know, but it's it's feminine, Lisa and perfume. Well, hang on to it. Now this goes into the kitchen. Come on. I say, here it is. A bit of lace. Looks like it was his off address. Right in front of this door. Jove. Dark. Must be the cellar. Find a light. Fine. Here it is. Come on. Here, this way. Check, I say, the furnace. It's going full blast. I can see it. But the furnace, full blast, at three in the morning? Look. Look there, Reggie. It's Cherry. Cherry lying in front of the furnace. Here, let me see. Bound hand and foot and gagged. She's unconscious. But Jack, the furnace. Do you think they were going to do it? Do you? transcribed adventures of Jack, Duck, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. System presents I Love a Mystery. Transcribed.
So at last you've seen one of them, these people you call they. Yes, but not his face. No, 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 don't try to sit up. Uh, I'm thirsty. Get a glass of water, Doc. Water coming right up. Just lie still and keep covered up. Where am I? Don't you recognize your own bedroom? Oh, oh, yes. You're sure you do? Yes. It's my bedroom. I always hated it. Why? Because when I was little, Grandma punished me by locking me in here. I was afraid. Why? There were pictures on the wall. Pictures of Humpty Dumpty and Simple Simon and Peter Piper and a lot more. You mean the wall was papered with Mother Goose characters? Yes. And they wouldn't stop looking at me. Even when I shut my eyes, they were still there looking at me, laughing, laughing. That was when you were a very little girl? Yes. Here you are, Jack. Couldn't find a glass. All right. No, let me raise you up. All right. There. Go ahead. Thank you. Better? Yes. Now then, you say you didn't see him. That is, his face. No. They... They're very clever. Was his face covered? No. It just wasn't there. Wasn't there? He had a kind of hood over his head. It was all kind of blank and dark inside the hood. Doggone. Describe what you did see. Oh, do I have to? Please. Well, the hood, and then kind of a short smock, you know, big and full. I think it was made of satin. What color was it? Red. Red, like when you stick your finger and the blood comes out. Hey, Cherry, are you telling the truth? Yes, I am. I am. And what about his trousers? Oh, I don't remember. I don't remember whether he had legs or not. You don't remember whether he had legs or not? No. And yet he picked you up and carried you down to the furnace room, so he must have had legs. Yeah, I guess he must. How did he get here in your bedroom in the first place? He... He, he just opened the door and walked in. Well, why didn't you scream? I was too scared. And then he put a gag in my mouth. Didn't you fight him? Oh, I couldn't move. You just laid there and let him let him gag you and hog tie you? Yes, I couldn't move. And all the time, Reggie, Reggie was out there patrolling the hall. Well, how come he didn't see you when old No-Face picked you up and carried you out? I don't know. He kept my face pressed against his chest hard so I couldn't see a thing. I thought I was going to smother. And then he carried you down to the furnace room. Yes. And then he turned on the furnace full blast. Yes. Why? What do you think he intended to do? Oh, I know what he was going to do. Well, then why didn't he do it? Because just then the baby began to cry. Yes, the baby. Yes, the baby cried, and, and that's the last I saw of him. You didn't see which way he went? No. He was there, and, and then he was gone. And the next you knew, we were beside you. Yes. Well, son, it looks like we got to set our traps for a feller in a red smock and no face. Yes. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Where, where's Grandma and the girls? Down the library. Reggie's staying with them. Why? Reasons of my own. You... You haven't done a very good job here, have you? Well, what do you mean? Since you came, the chauffeur was killed. And now Job is dead. That's right. And then this happened to me. Oh, you'd rather have someone else? No. You couldn't help it. Nobody could. You think this reign of terror is going to continue? It's got to. It can't stop now. It's got to go on and on and on until there isn't any of us left. Nobody but Grandma. You mean you think you and Hope and Faye's going to be killed? Yes, I know. You say you know. Do you actually, or is it just your belief? It's the same thing. I haven't been wrong about anything I said was going to happen. That's right, Jack. She kept saying over and over that Job was in a bad spot. And Hope. She's in the worst danger right now. Oh, what about Faye? I don't care about Faye. She doesn't like me. And I don't like her. But she's going to die, too. Yes, but I don't care about that. Job was the one who bothered me most. And next to Job, you like Hope the most? Yes. Cherry, do you know a girl named Pauline West? Pauline West? Yes. Do you? Why do you ask that? Just answer. Do you or don't you? I... Yes, I've heard the name somewhere. Sounds familiar. She's a radio actress. Now, do you recognize her? I... No, I don't think so. What the heck's a radio actress named Pauline West got to do with this, Jack? I don't know. But I found several casting sheets down in the furnace room made out in her name. He found what? Casting sheets. 
What's a casting sheet? It's a form sent out to actors and artists who've been cast on a show. It tells the time of rehearsal, the date and hour of the show, and the amount of money the performance pays. Okay, so you found a casting sheet for Pauline West, and I still want to know what that's got to do with all the rough stuff that's going on here. Probably nothing. Simply a new name in the picture. And if there's a Pauline West connected with this house, I want to know it. Well, wouldn't Cherry know it if there was? It seems likely. But I'd still like to know what that casting sheet was doing in the furnace room. You must not be a very good actress. I never heard of her before. Oh, you listen to radio shows? Of course I do. Well, anyway, all of them, it's got girls on them. What you think I just bought a battery set to carry around with me for? <laughs> in love with all the women on the air. Huh? And boy, is there a couple of them that I'd like to write dialogue for. Would I? You're darn right. The words I'd put in those babies' mouths would make the radio sensors turn over in their graves. What do you know about radio sensors? Nothing. Then what are you talking about? Okay. Hey. Hey, Jack, look. <laughs> Cherry. Cherry, a little fool, come back here. What's the matter with you? Where do you think you're going? No place. Well, come back here and get into bed. Pull the covers back, Doc. Yeah. There. Now get into that bed. Uh, I, I wasn't going anywhere. And what do you mean, trying to sneak out on us? No, I wasn't. I just don't like this room. Well, would you like us to move you downstairs? Jack. Sta- Jack, where are you? Hey, that's Reggie. Up in Cherry's room, Reggie. Something's happened. I knew it. Jack. Jack, Hope's got away. Hope's got away? Why, she snapped off the light in the library downstairs and was out the door and gone before I could get it back on. Probably on her way down to an employment agency to get herself a new chauffeur. Now, never mind that, Doc. Where are Faye and her grandmother? I locked them in the powder room just off the hall while I came up to tell you. Are they all right there? Well, they can't get out. Good. Doc. Yeah? You stay here with Cherry. I'm going with Reggie. Okay. Don't let her out of your sight for a minute. You hear that, Cherry, honey? Come on, Reggie. Do you think Hope left the house? No, I think she went towards the furnace. Furnace room? Did he say furnace room? That's what he said. That Hope was heading for the furnace room. But she mustn't. She mustn't. Why not? Because that's where things happen to people. Things happen to folks in the furnace room? Yes, go tell them. Go tell them quick. Hey, you mean that? Yes. Don't you understand? Go tell them to keep Hope away from there. Well, I don't know. Jack said to stay here with you. Hurry, hurry. You promise to stay right there in bed? Yes, yes. Okay, I'll be right back. I'll leave the door open. No. No. No, hurry, hurry. Poor little Hope. Poor little sister Hope. Better hurry. Hurry. Okay, Cherry, get back into bed. Oh, no. Now, come on. Get oh. back into bed where you belong. But you didn't go. You didn't go. No, but just waited outside the door to see what was, uh, why you were so anxious for me to leave. But I was just going to help find Hope. Well, Jack and Reggie's pretty good at that sort of thing. Yes, but, but, but I know. I think I know where she is. Well, if she's in this house, they'll find her. But she's in such danger. They've got to hurry. Now, look at Cherry. How could you know that? But I do. I do. Hey, shut up. What's the matter? There's somebody out in the hall. Oh, no. Listen. It's them. They've come back. Maybe. But it is. I know it. I hope so. I ain't never seen a fellow with no face and a red oh, smile. Could I get under the bed, please? You stay right where you are. Listen. They're right beside the door. I can feel them. Somebody out there, okay? Have you got a gun? No. Oh, please. Let me get under the bed. No. Where are you going? I'm going to sneak over the door. Maybe I can jump. Oh, no. That's what they're waiting for. Lay still and keep quiet. Hmm. That's funny. What's the matter? Wasn't nobody out there at all. Yes, there was. I know there was. Not when I got there. I know what's the matter. You're giving me the jumps. You got me seeing things that ain't there, too. I tell you, there was some... Oh, oh, that's right. Hello, Texas. Well, hey, Hope, everybody in this house is looking for you. Now, that's silly. What'd you dodge out of the library for? I had to see Cherry, my little sister Cherry. Oh, I'm so glad you came. I was so scared for you. Sisterly devotion, huh? Yes. I love you so. (laughs) She loves me so. Now, isn't that sweet? Oh, Hope, don't say that. You and Job, you two are all in the world I've got to love. And now you haven't got Job. But I've still got you. No, you haven't. Oh, oh, please. No, you haven't got me. Not any of me. Then then why are you coming over here to the bed? Go away if you don't love me. I want to show you something. What What do you mean? Look what I found. The gun. The gun. That's right. The gun that killed Joe. Hey, what'd you say? Give it to me. Jerry, stop. Let go of it. Hey, hey, don't do that. Give it to me. You bet I won't give it to you. (laughs) You shot her. He shot Hope. Oh, poor little sister Hope. My poor little sister.
further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. System presents I Love a Mystery. Transcribed. Jack, not only is there a policeman outside Hope's door, but there's a doctor and a nurse inside with her. Well, what's the need of Reggie, a gardener, too? Right. Hope's got a fighting chance to stay alive. The doctor says with an even break, she'll pull through. I'm going to see if she gets that break. I don't get you, Mr. Packard. Yes, please explain yourself. Does it mean you're protecting her from something? You bet I'm protecting her from something, Mrs. Randolph Martin. But that's absurd. Hope was accidentally shot when she and Cherry were wrestling for the gun. Maybe. No, maybe about it. You have the word of your own companion, Mr. Long, here, who saw it. Yeah, there ain't no getting away from that, Jack. I saw it all right. I wish I'd seen it. Why? Look, Doc, I want you to tell your story again, in front of Grandma Martin and Faye here. Go over it again, every detail. Well, when Reggie come running upstairs and said Hope had escaped from the library and was loose in the house, you told me to stay right with Cherry, not leave her for a minute. Yes. Then you and Reggie run downstairs. Well, the minute you was out of sight, Cherry started in saying... Don't let Hope go to the furnace room. Don't let Hope go to the furnace room. Kept saying it over and over. And then she says, hurry, hurry, go tell him. You must warn him. What did you do? Well, she sounded so scared. I thought maybe that I ought to tell you. And I started out the door. And just as I got out in the hall, I remembered you saying, don't leave Cherry under any circumstances. So I whirled around and tiptoed back to the door. And there was Cherry out of bed and putting on some slippers in her bathrobe. Well, I grabbed her and stuck her back in bed. Where was the terrified mouse going? Well, she said she was going to find Hope that... She thought that she knew where she was. Then what happened? Well, then the bedroom door was uh, was open, and I thought I heard somebody out in the hall. Cherry said it was them, that they had come back. Well, I sneaked over to the door and looked out, and nobody was there. Hmm. Some more of Cherry's romantic nonsense. Yeah, well, I hardly got back in the room when Hope comes now, in. Now, this is the part I'm especially interested in. Be very sure about every detail. Where were you standing? At the foot of Cherry's bed. What was Cherry doing? Well, the minute she saw Hope come in the door, she sat up in bed. And Hope, where was she? Well, she come in the door and walked about halfway between the door and the bed at first. All right, now go on. Well, yeah, well, Hope just walked in and said, Hello, Cherry. Well, I was looking at Hope, but Cherry made kind of a funny little gurgling noise in her throat, and I looked at her, and she was kind of green around the gills and trembling. Cherry, afraid of Hope? What are you talking about? Well, that's the way it was, Faye. I'm just telling you what I saw. Horse feathers. Well, I'm only telling you what I saw. Go on. What then? Well, I said, hey, Hope, everybody's looking for you. Why'd you dodge out of the library? She said, on account of I got to see Cherry, my little sister Cherry. Just how did she say it? I can tell you how she said it. She was making fun of Cherry. Was that it, Doc? Well, yeah, kind of, all right. Cherry was a shivering all the time. But she said, oh, I'm so glad you came. I was so scared for you. Then she said, I love you so, Job and you. <laughs> the mouse always was sloppy with her emotions. Yeah, it kind of made the hair stand up on my neck. Her saying sweet things in a kind of pleading voice and all the time trembling so she could hardly talk. What was Hope's reaction? Well, she said, and, and now you ain't got Job. And Cherry said, but I still got you. And Hope said, no, you haven't. Not any of me. And then she started toward the bed. Well, uh, Cherry kind of cringed down and said, said, go away if you don't love me. But Hope kept it coming until she got right up to the bed. What were you doing all this time? Well, just standing there at the foot of the bed. That's great. But, Jack... Forget it. Go on. Well, when she got right up to the bed, she pulled out Job's gun with a silencer on it. And the next thing I knew that they, they was fighting, fighting over like a couple of cats. And before I could get around the bed, it went off. And Hope sort of stood up, stood up on her tiptoes, and, and then just crumbled up, all in a heap. You said before that Hope said it was the gun that killed Job? Yeah, that's right, she did. You're sure she didn't say where she got the gun? No, just that she found it. Mr. Long. Yeah, Grandma? Was it your impression that Hope 
intended to shoot Cherry with that gun? Well, she was sure enough going to do something with it. But she didn't say anything about shooting Cherry. Well, no, not exactly. Just just look what I've got. Then maybe she actually just intended to show the gun to Cherry. Cherry got excited and thought she was going to shoot and made a grab for the gun. Well, maybe. Doc, you believe Hope came up here with the planned purpose of killing Cherry? Well, doggone it, Jack. She was all steamed up for something. You could see hate all over her face. You'd have thought Cherry was a worm the way she stepped on her. And, 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 and when that gun come out of her dress, there was no fool in the back. I don't believe it. Well, let's see now. If Hope did intend to kill Cherry, could she also be responsible for the other deaths? Well, she was the last one to see the chauffeur alive. That we know about. And she was sitting in the library right next to Joe when he was shot. Nonsense. Not such nonsense as you might think, Grandma. I say nonsense. Well, if that's the way you feel. It's exactly the way I feel. None of my granddaughters is a murderer. Nor are they connected with murderers. The chauffeur and Job were killed by men outside this house. Hope was accidentally shot. That's all there is to it. To try to read anything more into it is unjust and unfair to the name of Martin. Grandmother Martin, you know better than that. I know nothing of the kind. The police will eventually find the killers of Job and the chauffeur. The doctor gives Hope a good chance for recovery. That's the end of it. You believe that, Faye? Why not? What Grandma says goes. You're not interested in where Hope found the gun with a silencer? You're not interested in who bound and gagged Cherry and carried it out to the furnace room? You don't want to know what makes the baby cry when it's... Here. Huh? What's the matter, Jack? Doc, did the baby cry before Hope was shot? Hey. It didn't? No. Not a peep out of him. You, you don't suppose he's losing his grip, do you? Well, there you are. That proves the shooting of Hope was an accident. It does? Certainly. You said yourself the baby always cried as a warning when one of the family was in danger. Yes, and certainly Hope was in danger, whether accidentally or by plan. Why didn't the baby cry? Because it happened too fast. But if our psychic baby can anticipate a planned attack, why couldn't it anticipate an accident just as easily? Well, I guess I don't know. I'll tell you why. It didn't dare cry. But why not? Never mind why not, but that's the answer. It didn't dare cry. Well, ain't you going to say any more than that? No, if you don't get the answer from that, I'm not going to tell you. Mr. Packard... You mean you know more than you're telling us? I know a great deal more. I know who the murderer is. I know where I can put my finger on the baby when I want it. I know who killed Job and how it was done. I know who they are. Those they people Cherry's so frightened of. And she has a right to be frightened. I'd rather be where Job and the chauffeur are right now than to have them after me. Mr. Packard, you're talking like a madman. I'm sorry. Yeah, fella, what's eating on you? So you know who the murderer is? That's right, Faye. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Very interesting. Faye, I asked Cherry this question. I'm asking you. Do you know a radio actress by the name of Pauline West? What's that? Oh, you do. Pauline West? What has she got to do with this? If you know Pauline West, then you certainly know that. Yes, yes, of course. Why didn't I think of it before? What's this nonsense about Pauline West? You never heard of her? An actress on the radio? What would I know about a radio actress? Well, Faye, apparently you're the one person in the house who knows her. Well, what of it? I called the broadcasting company where she had done most of her work and asked them where she lived. They gave me this address. That's preposterous. I don't think so. Down in the furnace room earlier tonight, I found casting sheets. You found what? A printed form from the broadcasting studio giving the day and hour of her broadcast and how much money she was to get. How much? Well, it wouldn't buy any fur coats. Then we may assume she's not a star. No, run-of-the-mill actress. Well, young man, there's no actress in this house, run-of-the-mill or any other kind. Faye. Yes? Remember the night the chauffeur was killed? You told me you'd been down in the furnace room burning some letters. Yes. It wasn't casting sheets you were burning, was it? Oh, really? (laughs) Are you asking me to break right down here and confess all my sins? I'm just asking you if you were down there burning casting sheets and that some of them were dropped unnoticed by you. No, I wasn't burning Pauline West's casting sheets. But looky, Jack, this don't make sense. If there's a girl named Pauline West in this house, why ain't we seen her? You want to answer that, Frank? No. Do you? Not just yet. I didn't think so. But I will tell you one thing. You're one person who isn't going to get out of our sight for one second from now until this case is cleaned up. Dangerous. Very dangerous. Are you saying my granddaughter, Faye, is dangerous? Faye understands what I mean. Sure. Doc. Yeah? Faye's your one and only responsibility from now on. I don't care where she goes, what she does, or what happens. You don't leave her. Not under any circumstances, get it? Got it. <laughs> Hello, Shadow. Lady, me and you is the same as handcuffed together, beginning now. Well, so you don't forget it. Mr. Packard, I've changed my mind. You've changed your mind about what? I've decided that your services in this house are no longer needed. You what? I say I don't want you here any longer. Well, that's too bad. It's not too bad. It's the end. 
Get your things and get out. Hey, Loki, Grandma. You heard me. Get out, at once. You mean now, just as the case is on the point of being solved, you want us to leave? Yes. You want this murderer free to roam this house? You want your granddaughters left unprotected to face sure death? Is that what you want? I want you to get out. Very well. Hey, Jack. Shut up, Doc. Very well, I'll turn over my information to the police and we'll get our things. Wait. Well? There's a check for $10,000 waiting for you at my attorney's office. Hot dog. On the understanding that the moment you pick it up, all three of you leave Hollywood and disappear for a year. After I've turned my information over to the police. No. You talk to no one. That's out. For $10,000? Absolutely out. You know as well as I do that I have information in this house that the police would never find out. You know that every granddaughter in your house could be killed, and except for what I know, it would remain a baffling mystery to the end of time. Yes, I know that. Well, that information is not to be bought. Not at any price. Then if I was the murderer, do you know what I would do? It might be interesting to know. If I was the murderer, Mr. Packard, I would see that you, of all people, never left this house alive. Hey, Grandma. Yes, I'm quite certain that is exactly what I would do. <laughs> transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. System presents I Love a Mystery. Transcribed. thing, Jack. We're sure are we not the innocent members of the family. All that's left in the house is Grandma, Cherry, and Faye here. Don't forget them. Cherry's precious they people. Yes, and Pauline West. Uh, yes, we mustn't forget Pauline West. Well, if they are in the house, and this Pauline West is here, they've certainly kept in the background. Way in the background. On the other hand, they're right up in the foreground. Well, I ain't seen them. That's because you don't know where to look. And then perhaps you'll show Doc and me. Not yet. Yeah, and, and what about the baby? Yes, the baby's very much with us, too. Y you've seen him, too, I yes. suppose. Yes. I say you have. But, Jack, if, if, if you know... Not yet, Reggie. But, Jack... Reggie, don't you know Jack well enough by this time to, to know he ain't gonna tell us nothing until he gets darn good and ready? Right. But would you mind telling us why you suddenly decided to have Hope removed to a hospital? And why you've given Grandma Martin Cherry free run of the house while you're keeping Faye here practically a prisoner? Yeah, how about that, Jack? Hope went to the hospital to get her out of the way. Out of the way of what? She couldn't possibly stay alive in this house. She knew too much. You, how could you know that? She's unconscious. She was conscious just long enough for me to ask her one question. What was that? Where she found the gun with the silencer that killed Job. She told you? Yes. That's the thing that made somebody want to kill her? Yes. Well, then doesn't that put you in the same danger she was in? Exactly. Jack, you're in danger of being killed. Well, with proper precautions. But looky, tell us where you found the gun, too. Then there'll be so many of us that know... I don't want that. You don't want what? Look, I know who the murderer is. I know how Job's murder was done, but I haven't got a scrap of proof. I could tell my story from now on. Nobody'd believe me. The baby... The baby would be proof. Yes, I could bring the baby to light, but a crying baby doesn't prove murder. Well, so what? So I've got to catch the murderer in the act. But how does you being in danger? We know he wants to kill me. We know he's going to try to kill me. 
When he tries, it's up to me to be the smartest. <laughs> you haven't been the smartest so far. That's true. Jack, you're setting a trap for the killer and using yourself as bait? Yes. I don't like that. I don't like it a bloody bit. And Doc. Yeah? The outcome's going to depend a great deal on you. Hey, you mean you're laughing? I mean, if you let Faye here give you the slip for one minute, I can't predict what will happen. Faye, huh? Faye. Oh, my goodness, but you look ferocious, Doc. Look, you Faye, <laughs> I ain't never hit a woman in my life. But you, just you try one move, and, lady, I'm going to lay you so flat that you could be shoved under the carpet. No rough stuff, Doc. <laughs> well, I ain't fooling, sister. What a pal. Now then, Doc and Reggie, I want you to listen closely to what I'm going to say. In case I'm not as smart as the killer when the time comes. Hey, cut it out, will you, guy? Will you listen? In case anything happens to me, I want you to give this information to the police. First, find Pauline West, the radio actress. She's in this house. Second, remember that it was Grandma Martin who arranged the chairs in the library so that Job sat in front of the window the night he was killed. But be sure to tell them that she had been arranging the chairs in just that same order ever since the grandchildren were small. You got that? That's great. I'm, I'm making notes. Third... Tell them the night Jerry was bound and gagged and taken down to the furnace room that her clothes were strewn from the third floor to the basement, making a trail that would assure us finding her quickly. I see. I never thought of that. Did you ask Jerry? Did she drop stuff as, as, as she was being carried down? How could she? She was tied hand and foot before she was taken out of her bedroom, according to her own story. Then the fellow who carried her down must have dropped the stuff. Right. But why? That's all the police need to know. They can find out the rest from that. Uh-huh. You know, from the look on Faye's map, I bet she could tell us. Maybe I could. Fourth... There's about three or four thicknesses of wallpaper on the walls of Cherry's bedroom. Did you know for many, uh, for sure, how many, Faye? Well, I'd say offhand the room had been papered uh, four times. Yes. Well, tell the police to peel off the three top layers of paper in an area about three feet square and examine the figures on the paper very carefully. Well, what the heck's that for? And you be present when they do it and you'll see. Joe, sure, that's the queerest yet. Five. Give them this gun. It's the one that killed Job and the one Cherry and Hope fought over when Hope was shot. Be sure to call their attention to this piece of black thread tied to the trigger. Yeah, I noticed that. It is on the gun when I picked it up after Hope was shot. Yes, about a foot long. If they'll examine the end under a microscope, they'll probably find it looks as though it had been burned off. You, uh, getting all this down, Reggie? <laughs> it's quiet. Six. Uh, this is going to be in the nature of a demonstration. Take hold of Faye's arm, Doc. Say, hey, what's the idea? Jack says to take your arm, so I'm a taking your arm. Well, take it easy, will you? I don't want to look like I've been manhandled by a gorilla. Be sure to hang on to it, huh? You bet you. Hey! Yes, the lights! The lights! Jack, who turned out the lights? I did. Sit still. I'll turn them on again. Sit down, Phil. No. no, you let go of me. I said sit down. Let go of me now. Go! Oh. Why, you little cat, let sit down. Go. Get them lights turned on, Jack. Let me Here they go. are. Oh. Oh. oh, I say. Doc, what happened? Look, looky, looky at my face. Scratches. She did that. I say she done it. She tried to get away. Faye, what's the matter with you? Why'd you try to get away? Why not? It was dark. Lady, you don't know how near you come to getting soft. So what? But the lights, what made them go out? I turned them out. How could you? You were six or eight feet from the wall. The same way they were turned out last night before Job was killed. Look, I've got a piece of heavy black thread. Thread? That's all. I tied it to the switch when you weren't noticing. When I was ready for the blackout, I pulled on the thread, pulling the switch down. Lights go out, the thread slips off the switch, and... Then somebody right in this room uh, snapped off the lights. That's right. Faye, Faye, is that why you made such a fuss? Because Jack found out how you switched off the light? Oh, don't be absurd. Jack didn't say I did it. Well, what about it, Jack? Did she? I can't prove anyone did it yet. But demonstrate it to the police if I'm not here. Quite. That, that, that's five things to tell the police. And that's all. Now then, Reggie. Yes? I want to talk to Grandmother Martin and Cherry separately. Go find them. Uh, have you any idea? No, what... but they're around the house someplace. Well, how do you know that? We ain't kept a watch on them for hours. How do you know they ain't slipped out? Because the house is completely surrounded by plainclothes detectives. What? What's that? That's right, Faye. What's that for? Because of hope. Whoever wants her dead might otherwise have slipped away and followed her to the hospital. I see. Think of everything, don't you? We do our best. There's murder loose in this house. We're doing what we can to keep it here, under quarantine. Well, go on, Reggie. Find Grandma and Cherry. Mm, right, oh, I'll have a look. Oh, Reggie. Yes? One at a time. Bring Cherry first. Cherry it is. We, uh, we're just going to sit here and wait. I am. You can do as you choose. I choose to go up to my room. Go ahead. Hey, Jack. You go, too, naturally. But uh, leaving you down here alone, fella. You stick to Faye. Don't worry about me. Well, come on, Shadow. Yeah. Yeah, only I still don't like it. <laughs> You've certainly got a lot of faith in your partner. What do you mean? Two girls and one old woman, and you're worrying about leaving him alone here in the library. Well, so I'm afraid... To... And all the time you'll be within calling distance of you and Reggie. And the house surrounded by cops. That's what I call real bravery. Don't make us all look ridiculous, Doc. Go along with that. <laughs> well, I got a feeling. Oh, come on, if you're going to. Yeah. Okay, let's go. You better lock the door when we go out, Jack. 
530. I don't quite know where you are. You may be right here in the room with me. You may be watching from some panel I don't know about or at one of the windows or doors. I don't know. All I know is that you've been listening to everything that's been said in this room. I knew you were there. That's why I sent Reggie out to find Grandma and Cherry. That's why I let Faye go up to her room with Doc so we'd be alone. You may be the murderer. I don't know. But whether you are or not, you're a very unhealthy person. You're afraid. You feed on darkness. Your thoughts are lustful and violent. You're the power of evil in this house. You're not only cowardly and violent and evil, but you're much worse because you're a woman. When a woman's bad, she can be so much more wicked than a man. Strange, isn't it, that anything which can be the greatest instrument for good in the world can also be the greatest instrument for wickedness. I feel sorry for you. It wasn't your fault in the beginning. I think of all the people in this house, you had the greatest potentialities for greatness. You could have been just as great in the realm of goodness as you are superior in the realm of evil. You've worked with such perfect deliberation, coolly, masterfully, with superior knowledge of human nature. You've even used your own weakness to the best advantage. It's been fascinating working against you. And in a way, it seems a pity that you're at the end of your rope. I don't know when that end will come. That'll depend on you. An hour, day, not much more than that. And I want to tell you that Jack, I... Jack, look at me. Doc. Doc, where's Faye? I, I don't know. What's the matter with you? I was hit over the head. Hit over the head. Doc. Doc. Hit over the head. The baby. Reggie! Reggie! Reggie, it's the baby! Find Faye! We've got to find Faye! <laughs> transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. I love a mystery. Transcribed. Hit on the head. Fine face. Hit on the head. Who did it? Doc? Doc, answer me. Who did it? I don't know. Be all right in a minute. Fine face. Fine face? Why? Why? What's, what's, what's the matter with Faye? Jack's scared. Fine face. You sure you'll be all right? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. The baby. The baby. Doc, I've got to go find Jack. Jack? Jack? Jack, where are you? Reggie. Reggie, where are you? I'm in the living room, Jack. In the living room. Stay right there. I'm coming. Something is loose in this house. Something dangerous. I can feel it. Oh, oh, Jack, are you all right? Yes, I'm all right. I've been down in the furnace room. Have you seen Faye? No, but the baby. Yes, I heard it. We've got to find. Jack. Jack. Out the hall, quick. Who is it? Who fell downstairs? Grandma. Grandma Martin. Oh, my. Hey, is she dead? No, unconscious. Jack. Jack, look at her leg. Yeah, broken. Oh, that's too bad. An old lady like her. Jack. Reggie. Jack, what was it? Hey. Hey, what's the matter with Grandma? Thrown downstairs. Unconscious and broken leg. You mean Faye done that to her own grandma? We haven't got time to talk. Doc, how do you feel? Oh, better than it did. Can you carry Grandma into the library? I guess so. Then take care of her. Don't leave her for a minute. But I want to go with... You're not in any condition to go anywhere. Do what I tell you. Come on, Reggie. Where are we going, Jack? Search every room on the second and third floor. We're looking for Faye? I'll search the rooms. You stand here in the hall. See that no one slips by. 
That's Faye's room. Yes, I know it. But what about Cherry, Jack? We find Faye. Cherry will be all right. Um, did you look in the second closet? Yeah, no one in there. And across the hall to Job's room. We're wasting time. I know it. What else can we do? Watch the hall. Well, why not call in some police from outside? No, I'll do it myself. I know it's done right. Yeah, nobody in here. Come on, Hope's room's next. Around the corner of the hall. If Faye threw her grandmother downstairs, she's got to be up here somewhere. Well, if she's not in here, she's got to be on the third floor. Uh, don't forget to look in that window seat. Don't watch me. Keep your eye on the hall. You expected to try to slip by? I expect someone to try to slip by. We're closing in. Mm, looking for anyone in this house is a ballet job. Nobody in here. Come on up to the third floor. Right, oh. They've got to be... Wait, hold it a minute. What's the matter? Here's a linen closet. Don't let's pass up anything. <gasps> no. No, go away. It's Cherry. Oh. Cherry, what are you doing in this linen closet? Crouched on the floor like a belly animal. Cherry, answer me. What are you doing here? She's after me. She's after me. What are you talking about? Who's after you? Faye. She mustn't. She mustn't. Faye's after you? What for? She, she wants to kill me. Well, where is she now? I don't know. Here, get up on your feet. Oh, uh, uh, look here. Go easy, Jack. Now then, answer me. Where's Faye? I, I don't know. Answer me, do you hear? Tell me where Faye is or I'll shake it out of you. Oh, I don't want to see her. I don't hear her. I don't. Oh, Jack, this is beastly. Don't you think I know it? Well, she's so terrified now she doesn't know what she's saying. You can't get anything out of her like that. No. No, I guess you're right. Oh, Jack, look at her hands. Fingers straight out, stiff like claws. I can't bend them. Something's happened to them. Here, let me see. Oh, like ugly claws. Cold as ice. I can't bend them. Look. I can't bend my own fingers. I can't <laughs> I can't bear this. Hysteria. It'll wear off when the tension's over. <laughs> Cherry, do you feel safe here in this closet? Yes. Yes, it's dark. They can't find me in the dark. All right. Go back in. I'll lock you in. Jack. We can't take her with us. We've got to find Faye. But she shouldn't be left alone. I tell you, we've got to find Faye. Right. I'll be all right. We'll come back for you in a little while. I don't like it, Jack. I don't like any of it. I hate women who get themselves into messes like this. Now, oh, come on. They certainly aren't the best. Come on up the third floor. Cherry with her fingers spread out, stiff like clawing talons. Grandma sprawled grotesquely at the foot of the stairs. I wonder how we'll find Faye. Yeah, that's pleasant. I say we're not rushing about as we were. Isn't it as important to find Faye as it was? Just as important, but not as urgent now that we know where Grandma and Cherry are. I see. And she's got to be up here ahead of us somewhere, huh? Yes. All right, now for Cherry's room. I'm to wait up here? Yeah. You don't suppose... Jack. Jack. Come here. What's the matter? Look. Around the corner of the hall there. Shadow. Creeping this way. That's a man. Right behind him is throwing a shadow ahead. But there haven't been any men in the house? Well, there is now. You want to take him or shall I? Let me. He's almost at the corner, so get set. Right out. Move fast. He may have a gun. Quite. Hold it. Get him, Reggie. <laughs> look out for his gun. <laughs> <sighs> There. Good work, Reggie. Hey, let's have a look at him. Here's his gun. You suppose this is the chap who carried Cherry down to the furnace room? Hello. Reggie, we made a mistake. What's that? Hey, look at this badge on his vest. Badge? Yes, police department. Oh, but I say. Plain clothes man from the detective bureau. You've had the doubtful honor of knocking out a policeman. Yes, but wh what's he doing here? Naturally, I wouldn't have tackled him. Well, that's I... what I want to know. What's he doing here? I wonder if they've planted any more in this house. But I thought you said they weren't going to. They weren't. I said they'd keep all their men out. What's that? I don't hear anything. I do. From Grandmother Martin's suite of rooms. Come on. Here. Here, this is it. Here, this way. Jack, what's that smell? Chloroform. Here. Here, she's locked in this closet. Faye. Faye, do you hear me? Put me out of here. Hurry. Get me out of here. Listen, get hold of yourself. Save your breath. We'll get you out. But how? The door is locked and there's no key. We'll break it in. Right, oh, but can we do it? Wait. Faye. Faye, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Harry. Lie down on the floor. We're going to break in the door. Do you hear? Yes. All right. Well, come on, Reggie. Together now. <coughs> Solid. Once more now. It's coming. Do it again. Now. <coughs> that did it. Here, help me with it. Get me out. Get me out. Easy, easy. All right, you're all right. There you are. Now throw open the window. Cry. Now get all those saturated towels and throw them out. Out the window? Yes. Don't try to talk for a minute. Just breathe deep. Why? Why would she do it? Don't talk. Don't talk. Just breathe. Half a dozen towels soaked with chloroform enough to kill an elephant. Out they go. I, I, 
I could talk. Let me sit up, please. Take it easy. The fresh air is all I needed. Who locked you in that closet? Grandma. Grandmother Martin tried to kill you? Well, how did she get you in the closet in the first place? Yeah. You remember Doc was bringing me upstairs? Yes. Somebody hit him on the head. I, I didn't see who it was. I, I just ran. I was so scared. You didn't do it? No. I, I ran up here to Grandma's room. She, she wasn't here, but she came in in just a minute. Well, where'd she been? I didn't get a chance to ask her. She, she was out of breath. She said, Qu- quick, Faye, get my slippers out of the closet. I didn't think. I just went in the closet, and she slammed the door on me and locked me in. Uh, and the chloroform towels were already in there? Oh, no. No, she said, you'll be safe in there, my girl. Then I heard the door to her room open and close, and I pounded on the door to be let out, and in a couple of minutes she came back in. What did she say then? Nothing. I think she didn't, she didn't say a thing, but pretty soon she began pushing towels soaked in chloroform under the door. Joe. Grandma Martin. I was all wrong. I thought I knew who the murderer was. I, I thought I knew from the way you talked, Jack, but I was wrong. It was Grandma all the time. Grandma Martin, I thought it was you. You thought it was me? Yes, we found Cherry hiding from you. I say, are you sure it wasn't you? It was Grandma, I tell you. But Cherry said you were trying to kill her. Cherry? Cherry said I was trying to kill her. That's what she said. And see here, you might have locked yourself in there with those towels, you know. But I didn't. I didn't. Jack, I, I thought you said you knew for sure who the murderer is. I do, Faye. I know just as sure as I'm sitting here looking at you. transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Stick with us. Next episode is right up. Coming right up. On Christmas Eve, the star of Bethlehem shines bright as a symbol of mankind's efforts to make the world a better one in which to live despite ravages of war and hunger and disease. So from the writer and producer of this series, Carlton E. Morse, a further message about the plight of children overseas. These millions of unfortunate youngsters have never known what the star of Bethlehem symbolizes. They have never known a Christmas. Who are they, Mr. Thorson? They are four-year-old Christian Ocel of France, 14-year-old Panyoto Gavril of Greece, 14-year-old Shai Quichen of China, 7-year-old Claude Grandjean of Belgium. They are legion wherever war has struck. Those children who have never known Christmas. Why don't you do right now what many in your community have already done? Gather discarded toys and children's clothing. Pack them with care. Tie them secure. Those children who have Address never known Christmas. Address them to foster Christmas. parents' plan for Why don't you children? do right now? 530 47th Avenue, Long Island City, New York. That's foster parents' plan for war children. 530 47th Avenue, Long Island City, New York. Do it now. Your Christmas will be happier in the knowledge of what you have done and that you too can be a Santa Claus. The next episode will be starting here shortly. As we do, I love a mystery. Part 15. The thing that cries in the night. Hmm. Should be starting automatically, but... Maybe this player, after you play a certain amount of times, it stops. So, one moment. Mm. There we go. Welcome to I Love a Mystery. I'm standing here. 
Grandma tried to kill me. Would you go on the witness stand and swear to that, Faye? Certainly not. This is a family affair. Nevertheless, it's true. You're mistaken, Faye. I'm not. Yes, you are. Because at the time you say Grandma was shoving towels saturated with chloroform under the door of the closet you were locked in, she was lying unconscious at the foot of the stairs on the first floor. No, I tell you... That's right, Faye. I was there when she fell. I'll grant you, your grandmother may have locked you in the closet, but she wasn't the one who tried to chloroform you. Then who did? She was the only one who knew I was in there. No, the murderer knew. But how? How could he possibly have known? Have you forgotten you pounded on the door and yelled to get out? It drew the killer's attention to you. What a perfect setup. Your grandmother locks you in, so naturally if you die there, everyone would suspect your grandmother. Then... Then that's why he wouldn't answer. He wanted me to think it was Grandma. Certainly. The killer was roaming around the house. Grandma Martin locked you in the closet to protect you and started downstairs to find me. She was thrown or pushed down the stairs by the killer, who then came on up to the third floor. Here you were, yelling and pounding. Saw the perfect opportunity to finish you and nearly succeeded. Dr. Jack, what about Cherry down on the second floor? When we found her crouching in the linen closet, she was in a fit of terror. She said Faye was after her, trying to kill her. She was mistaken. Mm -hmm. You mean she mistook the killer for Faye? But but in that case, who is the killer? You don't know now. No, I, I don't. Oh, look here. There's only one person. It could be Pauline West, the radio actress. Yes, Pauline West. Yes, it would have to be. She's the only other person connected with this house, the only other name mentioned. Yes, Reggie. Pauline West is the murderer. But where is she now? Why haven't we seen her? I- is she in the house now? Yes, and you're going to see her very shortly now. In fact, in the next few minutes, I'm going to turn Pauline West over to the police. No. No, you can't do that. No matter what happens, you can't do that. She's guilty of murder. She killed your brother, Joe. She was responsible for Cherry accidentally shooting Hope, although it wasn't an accident. She tried to kill your grandmother by pushing her downstairs. She tried to chloroform you, and she was responsible for Cherry being pushed downstairs and being slashed over and over again. I know, I know it. Oh, don't you understand? We'd all rather be dead. We'd all want to be dead if she was taken into court and, and, and made a public exhibit. Something for the newspapers to gloat over, for the appetites of the scandal mongers to feed on. I'd rather see all of us dead than to see that happen. I'm afraid I haven't got much choice in the matter. I warned your grandmother when she brought us in that if the murder was in this house and I could prove it, nothing could prevent me from turning it over to the the police. Then if I get the opportunity, I will kill her with my own hands. Oh, but you must That'd be terribly foolish. Because then you would have to be the public sensation instead of her. No. Because you'd never take me alive. Reggie. Mm -hmm. Under these circumstances, Faye's a very dangerous young woman. It's going to be necessary for you to stay by her and prevent her from doing what she said she'll do. How much longer is this going to keep up? Only a few minutes. Only until I have Pauline West in safe custody. No. No, you can't do it. Reggie, stop her. Jack. Jack, she's locked us in. Now, now we are in a fine mess. We've got to break down that door. Right, all. Let's go. Wait, listen. The baby. Oh, look here. Come on, we've got to get out of here. Together now. <laughs> Once more should do it. Hurry, hurry. <laughs> More solid than I thought. We've got to keep trying. We've got to get out of here. It's murder. We've got to get out of here quick. Cherry. Cherry, is that you? Hey, they don't come near me. Cherry, listen. We haven't got much time. Give me your hand. Now, come on. No, no, Faye. I tell you, we haven't got much time. Now, hurry faster. Faye, where are we going? I don't want to go. Now, then, up, up these stairs to the attic. The attic? Faster, faster. Wait. But why, Faye? Why? Come on. Now then, up this ladder to the roof. Faye, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Come on, come on, hurry. I'm right behind you. Oh, please, Faye, please. Now push that trap door up. No, no. Push that trap door up. <gasps> All right. Up on the roof. It's so high up here. It's so high. It's all right, Cherry. It's all right. I'm going with you. Uh, Going with me? Here, come over to the edge of the roof. I want to show you something. Hey, someone's turned the searchlight on. They can see us up here. It doesn't matter, darling. It doesn't matter in the least. Hey, I'm so scared. Don't worry. I'll be with you. I'll be with you all the time. Now, look. Look over the edge. You see the glass roof of the sunroom right down below us? But, but it's so far. The glass roof of the sunroom. You loved the sunroom when you were a little girl. It was your favorite room. Hey, hey, why did you bring me up here? And darling, you couldn't help it. It wasn't ever your fault, so you mustn't suffer anymore for it. Just close your eyes. Do you remember how? Do you remember how you used to close your eyes when I told you fairy stories? Fairy stories about the good little fairies who always came to the rescue of little girls. And little I think we're getting it. Once more, we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> That did it. That did it. Downstairs, Reggie. Downstairs. I know. I'm coming. 
Which way, Jack? Which way? Come on, come on. Downstairs to the first floor. Well, how do you know which way she went? I don't know which way she went. We've got to find her. Wait, I'm going into the library. You take the dining room. Conservatory and the sunroom. Right oh. Yell if you see anything. All right. You do the same. You're fine, mess. Hey, Jack, what's the matter? Doc, has Faye been in here? Faye? No, nobody's been in here. Jack, we ought to get a doctor. Jack! Jack! Come here! Come here! That's Reggie. Come on, Doc. He's found her. Jack! Jack! Coming, Reggie. In the sunroom! In the sunroom! Hurry! Hurry! Did you find her? Reggie. Reggie, where is she? What's the matter? Look, look, Jack. Up through the glass. Look up on the roof. What's that? Hey! Hey, it's Faye and Cherry. It's Faye and Cherry. Look, they're fighting. Well, don't stand there. What's the matter with you? Get up on the roof. Look out! Look out! No. No, it shouldn't have happened that way. Oh, boy, four o'clock in the morning. Reggie, when this mess is cleaned up, I'm going to bed and sleep straight through a week. About a little sleep I'd get if I did go to bed tonight. Wonder why they don't put some sleeping chairs in a hospital waiting room. Where'd Jack say he is going? The doctor called him out. Something about Faye. Yeah. Chauffeur dead, Job dead, Cherry dead. Poor little old Cherry. That isn't all. Huh? Hope in the hospital with a bullet wound, Grandma here with a broken leg, and Faye here with a fractured skull. Man, when when Cherry and, and Faye high-dived off that roof and down through that skylight... Would you mind not talking about it? Yeah. Sure would like to know who was pushing who up there, though. Cherry was pushing Faye. Yeah, it sure looked like it, all right. Oh, uh, you, you back, Jack? Yes. Anything? No, everything's just the same. Looky, Jack... I don't... Uh, I still don't know who is doing what to who over yonder at the Martin. Well, it's time I told you. Yes, I think it is. You said Pauline West was the killer. She was. But what I didn't say was that Pauline West was... Well, who? Cherry Martin. Hey, you mean Cherry done all that dirty work? Yes. But the slashing thrown downstairs. She did that herself. She did? And them, the, the, the they people she was always talking about. Figments of her own imagination. She really believed in them some of the time. Huh? Hey, th- th- things don't fit together. Yes, they do. Let's start at the beginning. Way back when Cherry was a little girl. She was a nervous, excitable child. Her grandmother had little patience with her. She used to lock her in her bedroom. On the walls of the bedroom were all the old Mother Goose figures. Man and Moon, the old witch. And one of the characters was a figure with a black hood, the face shadowed from view. And he wore a blood-red smock. The man who tied her up and carried her to the furnace room. Hey! Yes. The characters from her childhood wallpaper transferred from the walls to her mind. Those were the they people who were after her. Locked in the room with these figures she feared and hated, her child mind absorbed them to the point where she could never get rid of them. Oh, how horrible. But no Mother Goose character carried her downstairs. No, of course not. She did that herself. But somehow in her mind she blamed him for it. But she was bound and gagged. She did that herself. Was this why Grandmother Martin called us in on the case on account of Cherry? No. Hope and Job were involved with the chauffeur. He was trying to make Job ask his grandmother for money to pay blackmail. When Job refused, he found Hope an easy target, so he threatened to bring the family name to shame through Hope unless Job got the money. Grandma knew this? No, only that Job and Hope were in trouble. Which we were supposed to get him out of. Yes, but the night we arrived, Job took things into his own hands and killed the chauffeur. Job really did do that then? Yes, Cherry actually saw him. And that's what set Cherry off. She was shocked and afraid, but she saw how easily people could be killed. She was right on the verge mentally anyway. That finished. She killed Job. Yes. She was impelled to kill Job because she knew he was going to be found out. But how? Well, she watched where Job hid the gun and got it. She took it out on the porch to that big urn that sits right in front of the library window. She fastened it in place, pointing right to the chair Job would sit in. I say, she knew he'd sit in it because Grandma Martin always made each one sit in his own chair? Yes. Then she fastened a heavy black thread to the trigger, ran it over the muzzle of the gun, in through a crack in the window to her chair. So that's how it is done. Yes. When the gun went off, the bullet cut the thread that was holding it in place, and it fell into the urn out of sight. I say. Only a mind in that condition would have conceived such a thing. But it worked, and it made Cherry look innocent. And then Hope found the gun. Yes, before Cherry could get it and hide it. Hope suspected Cherry because she had said they would get Joe before the police did. So she came up to Cherry's room while you were with her, Doc. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The minute Cherry saw the gun, she knew that she had to do something desperate. That Hope knew too much. So she pretended to struggle with her, but deliberately turned the gun on Hope and shot her. Boy, murder. And me, you're standing right there. Then I discovered Pauline West. And when I mentioned the name to Faye, then Faye knew that Cherry was guilty. Well, I don't get that. Why? Because Faye that knew that two or three years ago, Cherry had tried to be a radio actress. To keep the rest of the family from knowing, Cherry had taken the name of Pauline West. She wasn't a good actress, but they discovered she could cry like a baby. What's that? Exactly. Cherry was the baby. She'd done baby imitations on the radio. Doggone. Faye had forgotten all about that. It happened so long ago, but 
The minute I mentioned Pauline West, she knew at once. So now she had to kill Faye to keep a secret. Yes, that's why I insisted Faye be guarded so closely. Well, who bought me on the head when I was taking Faye upstairs? Cherry. She wanted you out of the way so she could get at Faye. But Faye didn't wait. She ran up to her grandmother's room. By this time, Grandma knew. She knew Faye was in danger, so she locked her in the closet so Cherry couldn't get at her. But Cherry did get at her chloroform. Yes. It was also Cherry who tried to chloroform Hope. Boy, and such a pretty little thing. But why push her grandmother downstairs? Well, this time Cherry was so unsettled in her mind she didn't know what she was doing. But that that roof business, sir. How would Cherry ever get Faye up on the roof? What happened up there is best left alone. You ain't a-talking? Case is finished. The house of Martin has fallen. They, those little people, have succeeded just as Job said they would. Now let's forget it. I'm dead tired. Right. Yeah. Poor little feather. The next episode of I Love a Mystery will be titled Bury Your Dead in Arizona. transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. The next episode of I Love a Mystery is titled Bury Your Dead, Arizona. Part 1 of... I think it's 12 to 13 parts of the, of the episode. I should be starting here in just a moment. Actually, it's part one of 12. This is Bury Your Dead, Arizona. Part one of I Love a Mystery. we will be starting in just a moment. Sorry, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties getting this episode of Bury Your Dead in Arizona. I Love a Mystery started. It takes just a minute here. All right, let's see. Bury Your Dead in Arizona. I love a mystery. It's loading now. Should be another minute or two here before it finally started. I hope. Here we go. Oh, you're dead, Arizona. I Love a Mystery episode begins now. Well, you see Enjoy. what you got us into? Now, Jack, you couldn't hardly say it is all my fault. I could hardly say it was all your fault. Sure, I reckon you could say it all right. Move over, Reggie, so as I can squat. Be quiet. Go ahead and squat. You knew as well as I did that the police were looking for us. Yeah, I know. And you knew that if they found us, they intended holding us as material witnesses in the Martin murder case. Yeah. Well, you see what you got us into? Now, Jack, you couldn't hardly. Oops, one moment. We had a little bit of issue skipping on this episode of I Love a Mystery. Bury Your Dead, Arizona, uh, you see what Part you got us 1 into? of now, 13. Jack, you couldn't hardly say it is all my fault. I could hardly say it was all your fault. Sure, I reckon you could say it all right. 
Move over, Reggie, so I can squat. Be quiet. Go ahead and squat. You knew as well as I did that the police were looking for us. Yeah, I know. And you knew that if they found us, they intended holding us as material witnesses in the Martin murder cases. Yeah. And you knew that it might be months before we'd be free. But, Jack, after what happened to Cherry and Faye, you wrote a full report on the whole business. We all signed our names to it. Yes, but I didn't say who the murderer was. But you said the killer was there. The police weren't satisfied with that, as you quite well know. Yeah. They wanted you to say right out that it was Job that killed the chauffeur and it is Cherry who killed Job. Why didn't you say? Because we went to the Martin house to protect Grandmother Martin's interests. Her chief interest was to keep the Martin name unsullied. Besides, Faye and Hope were going to get well. Why well, brand them for life as sisters of a killer? And so the police were after us to make us tell what we hadn't told. Well, huh? we were doing all right. We could have stayed right here as long as we'd wanted to. Never been found. But what do you have to do, Doc? Well, doggone it, Jack. You have to get yourself mixed up in a drifting poker game. But I was bored. So you were bored. That's right, I was bored. So what do you do? Well, I hunts me up a bunch of hombres and gets myself into a poker game. You take the $25,000 reward money and lose the works. Well, what you mean, I lose the works? Well, you did, didn't you? Well, I got it back, didn't I? Did I say you didn't? Well, you act like I didn't. That 25,000 potatoes is in the money belt slung around your middle, and here you are making more fuss. Yes, but, Doc, that isn't the idea. Then what is the idea, I want to know? You lost the money in a poker game, and then what do you do? You throw a gun on the game and take it back again. Well, of course I took it back again when I found out the game was crooked. How do you know it was crooked? Oh, that's just plain silly. I still want to know how you knew it was crooked. Because when Doc Long loses 25 grand in a poker game, it's got to be crooked. That's no reason. Well, it's reason enough for me. So now we're not only wanted by the police as witnesses in the Martin case, but you're wanted for robbery with a gun. By the way, where'd you get the gun? Well, one I picked up around the Martin house. Well, where is it now? I made a present of it to the Chinese who runs the laundry around the corner from where we is living. Oh, but, Doc, if the police ever find it on him, he'll be in an awful hole. Well, that's what he gets for shrinking my underdrawers. <laughs> Very funny. You've not only got the police buzzing around our ears, but you've got the gang that was backing that poker game out looking for us with Tommy guns. And we're running away. You bet we're running away. Well, I don't like it. You brought it on yourself. Well, it ain't that I mind hopping freights out of town. That's kind of different. I like things that's different. But what makes me mad is us up and running away from a bunch of tin-horn bandits. Quiet, Jack. That belly well makes my gorge rise, too. Where's your sense? We can keep out of the way of the police so we can fight the gangsters. But you know as well as I do that we can't do both. This town's too hot, and the quicker we get out of it, the better for everybody. Well, it ain't my way. It's mine. Well, I mean, Jack, if we could get just one fast round in with the gang before we go, just to make them understand we're not leaving because we're afraid of them. Now, you're talking, Reggie. No. And I could slip up town, and I know where we could find some of them. No. Yeah. I reckon when Jack says no, that's all there is to it, Reg. Apparently. Uh, what time is this freight that we're catching pull out? I don't know. And we're just sitting here in this boxcar until it does? Yes. Sure a nice night for dirty work. Man, is it foggy. Mm, bloody well have to keep our eyes peeled. Freight could slip by us in this soup and we'd never even know it. You know what makes me so blame mad about this? What's that? Well, here we come down to Hollywood for no other reason than to spend 25,000 bucks. Did we spend it? Not one cent. Not one doggone cent. First we get mixed up in the Martin murders and now we got to sneak out of town. I swear to my grandma, it, it's harder to spend 25 grand. Shut up. Huh? What's the matter? Somebody outside the car. Yeah. Get down behind those bales of hay. Right on. Oh, probably just one of the yard bulls. I don't care who it is. We don't want to be seen. Yeah. Are you sure, Jack? I don't hear anything. Yeah, there's somebody out there, so keep still. Hey, I see a flashlight. Well, hold it. Keep down. Nothing in this car but three, four bales of straw. Jack, shut up, you fool. But Jack, I know that feller's voice. He's one of the gang. What? I'm a spank hypnosis if he ain't. He flashed his light in here. He was looking for something, all right. Of course he was. Looking for us. That's great. Huh? Well, what do you mean, that's great? I mean, if the gang is that anxious to find us, they're going to be watching every freight that leaves these yards. But look here, then maybe we'll have a go at them after all, huh, Doc? Now you're talking. How about us piling out of here right now? Listen, you two, you're playing with dynamite. Now, let it alone. But, Jack, this isn't like you. Yeah, what's the matter, you fella? You act to me like you got your running shoes on. I'm telling you, if you don't get out of this town quick, we're going to end up in jail or in a slab at the morgue. You call that any way to talk? And another thing. I don't want anybody to see us climb up on that freight. You mean they'll follow us out of town? Well, what about it, Doc? Yeah, you got something there. For 25,000 armed men, them mugs would follow us to kingdom come. Exactly. Of course, I hope they do. I'm still mad about them euchre and me into a sucker poker game. Well, forget your man. I don't want to be trailed all over the country. 
Hold it. What's the matter, Neil? The back. Hot dog. Listen. All right. Climb in, boys. It's him again. Shut up. Tony, your lookout. Keep a lookout for the yard bulls. Give me a foot up and then close the door. Close the door? Shut up. All right, Tony. Shut the door. All right, you rats. Come on out. It's no use, Stalin. We know you're in here. There's five of us and only three of you, and we've come to do a job. So come on out and get it. You mean there's only five of you? Well, hello, Dark Law. Hello, Lefty. Honest, is that all you brung along, five? That's plenty. Come on out. Well, say we do come out. What then? Use your imagination. I ain't got much. Well, I can promise you it'll make nice, juicy reading on the front page of your hometown newspaper. And man, do I love getting my name on the front page of the newspaper. Quit stalling. What's the matter with the rest of your outfit? Are they deep and dumb? They ain't here to talk. Uh-huh. They're here for something, oh, I bet. Kind of bets you make don't mean much. Says which? You made the biggest mistake of your life when you held up that poker game. We've come to get that 25 grand and teach you better manners. Well, how about beginning? How about starting out by turning on your flashlight? No flashlights. This night's work's going to be done in the dark. It's too bad you can't do a little gun shooting, ain't it? Yeah? Yeah. On account of you going to need them. But you dasn't on account of that every... Every bull in this yard would be down on you. Knives are better for this kind of a job anyway. Yeah, knives, huh? All right, you've stalled long enough. Now come on out. Oh, we ain't quite ready yet. You're as ready as you'll ever be. Not quite. You see, my two partners is kind of maneuvering into position. What's that? Yeah. You see, all the time that we've been a-gassing, Jack and Reggie have been crawling around back of you so as we can attack front and back and kind of boil you up. You're crazy. Pete, Johnny. You ready, Jack? Let's go. Hey, let go. Reggie, you all right? I've got one more to polish off. There. <laughs> Doggone, I didn't know when. I had so much fun. Anybody hurt? Oh, never mind that. Count the bodies. See if we got them all. Oh, here, here. Well, wait a minute, Jack. I got left his flashlight. Uh, here, here you are. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that's all. And it's nice and mess of busted <laughs> noses I ever about seen. <laughs> what do we do now, Jack? When we get that lookout bird outside the car. Well, that means we got to get this door open. Give me a hand, Reg. Quiet. Now, just a minute. When you get the door open, let me do the talking. Okay. Come on, Reg. Open her up now. <laughs> That you, Lefty? Yeah, I'm coming down. <sighs> sure didn't take you long to do the job, eh? No, it didn't, did it? Here's a little present for you. Get him, Jack. Yes, come on down. Help me throw him into the car. Yeah. Uh, uh, come on, Reggie. Right over. Let uh, uh, me give you a hand, Jack. I'll grab hold. Up. Up with him. Yeah. Uh. Uh. All right, now push the door shut. Right. Let me get my shoe. Wait, listen. Never mind the door. Here comes the freight. Come on, get over the tracks. Hey, look out. We don't get separated in the fall. There's a the headlight. She's moving slow. I say, this ought to do it. Yes, keep out of the headlight. We don't want the train crew to see us. If the engine gets by, then start looking for an open box car. Here she comes. Here we are, Jack. Here's an open box car. Run for it. Get in. Hey, hurry. She's picking up speed. Thank you, Reggie. I don't know. Give me a hand, Jack. Up with you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Doc. Give me a lift. Yeah. Up with you. Uh, oui. And here we are. So here you are. Hey. Hey, sir. Hey, who, who said that? I say it. Why not? Jack, there's a girl in this boxcar. Why not? Doggone female riding a freight train. Yes, I am female. A dangerous female. So watch out. you chose this box car. Why? Because this car is occupied by the maestro and myself. That's all right. You won't bother us. But you bother us. Did you 
say the maestro? I did. You mean there's somebody else in this here freight car besides you? The maestro, yes. A man? A very great man. Well, what's a very great man doing riding in a boxcar? Yeah, and what about you? You a female hobo? That is insult. Well, why is it? Most folks that grabs rides on freight trains is bindle stiff. I am not bindle stiff, I will have you know. Not, huh? No. The maestro and I have temporary financial difficulties. Financial difficulties, huh? That is true. Yeah, but see here, where is this maestro person? Right now, he is asleep. So you're out of cash, so you and the maestro are trying to get somewhere by freight, is that it? Yes. Business is not good. Well, just what is your business? I am dancer. The maestro is great magician. Magician? You mean one of them fellers that pulls rabbits out of a hat? Oh, pull rabbit out of hat. Well, does he or don't he? The maestro don't pull rabbit out of hat. He is great man, I tell you. The maestro, your husband? My husband? Yeah, you and him married? That is preposterous. Oh, it is? The maestro is not married to any woman. What kind of a man do you think the maestro is? That's what we're trying to find out. Uh, that is what many people try to find out. What kind of man is maestro? But nobody ever has. You been with him long? Two, three years, I don't know. You have been tagging that maestro around for two, three years and you ain't married to him? I most certainly am not. That is insult to the maestro. Oh, you think you ain't good enough for him? No woman is good enough for the maestro. I am best woman there is and even I am not good enough for him. I say, he must be quite a... Chippy. Well, how about us striking a couple of matches and having a look at you? No, you do not like matches. Uh huh. Why not? Because it will disturb the maestro. What's your name? Nasha. Nasha, huh? You mind? Oh, uh, who? Me? No, it's okay by me. Nasha. What is that, Russian? No, I am not Russian. Your dialect sounds Russian. I am not Russian. Nasha. Hi, that is the maestro. Nasha. Yes, maestro. Who are you talking to? I do not know. You don't know? No, I do not know. Well, find out. Yes, I will. Who are you? Well, my name's Jack Packard. One is named Jack Packard. I'm Doc Long. One is named Doc Long. And I'm Reggie York. And one is Reggie York. That is all. What are they doing in this boxcar? I do not know. Well, ask them. What are you doing in this boxcar? Just going for a ride. The one named Jack Packard say they are going for a ride. Tell them to get out. Hey, who does he think he is? He is the maestro. He say get out. Well, tell him to take a jump at himself. The one named Doc Long say, go take a jump at yourself. What's that? He say, go take a jump at yourself. Oh, he did, did he? Yes, that's what he said. Apparently, he doesn't know who I am. I guess he don't. Shall I stick a knife in him? Oh, look here. You do, and I'll wear the daylights out of you. Then what I do? You just shut up and let me go back to sleep. The maestro is great man. He needs his sleep. Hey, maestro. Uh, who said that? I did. Come on out, be sociable. Apparently, you don't know who I am. Sure, you're the maestro. Come on up the doorway. Uh, uh, very well, very well. Anything to make for peace and good feeling. Well, how do you do? Care to sit down on the door and dangle your feet? No, I would not care to dangle my feet. Nasha. Maestro. We'll bring that packing box. Yes, Maestro. Nasha says there's three of you. That's right. Doc here. Hi, you Maestro, old kid. Reggie. My pleasure, Maestro. And myself. Uh, tramps. Hey, fella. Do we sound like tramps? The packing box, Maestro. Will you be comfortable? Certainly, I will not be comfortable. When was a man ever comfortable seated on a packing case? Your star has not risen yet, maestro. But it will. It will. Mm -hmm. These men say they're not tramps. They want to know if I am Bindlestiff. I am insulted. <laughs> not a Bindlestiff, eh? Well, shucks, it is only naturally important folks don't ever ride around in a boxcar. I beg your pardon. Well, well, do they? I am an important person. I am riding in a boxcar. Important, huh? Nasha here says you were a two-bit magician. I did no such thing say that. I said he is a great man. And, gentlemen, she is right. I am a great man. Don't mind admitting it yourself. I do not. I wish there was some light. I'd like to get a look at you two. Why? You sound like a pair of phonies to me. He say phonies. Shall I stick a knife in him? I'll wear the tar out of you if you do. He say phonies. You are Mr. Packard? That's right. 
You think, Mr. Packard, you could tell whether we are phonies if you could see us? Yes. <laughs> Perhaps you'd like us to describe ourselves. Sure. We aren't doing anything in particular. Nasha, describe yourself. Yes. I am very beautiful. I am very exotic. My hair and eyes are black as night and my mouth is red. I am straight and lithe. And my body is so flexible I can stand straight and touch my forehead on my knees. Or I can bend backwards and touch my head to the floor. I am built like a young boy. But my legs are nicer. I am so proud of my legs. And I dance as no other girl can dance. Oh, we and hot dog. You don't believe me. Oh, sure, I believe you. Only pretty soon I'm going to wake up and take another drag on the opium pipe. It does sound a bit incongruous, doesn't it? Masha hasn't begun to tell you her accomplishments. She says she is not Russian. She is not. But she is from one of the states close to the Russian frontier. Uh, does she sound phony? Well, you'll have to admit she's hard to believe. What about yourself? <laughs> My hair is silver gray. I'm extremely fat and ugly man. I'm neatly dressed, but shabby. I'm a sensualist, but I have strong, fine hands. I'm a magician, yes, but I'm more than a magician. I'm a student of philosophy, of mysticism, of, uh, of higher ethics. Are you a moral man? <laughs> I'm neither moral nor immoral. I am unmoral. I say, maestro, what do you mean you're a student of mysticism? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Well, do you mind explaining? Yes. Yes. Your lack of understanding would only convince you I am a charlatan. Why are you on this freight train? Why are you? <laughs> Circumstances. <laughs> exactly, my friend, exactly. <laughs> Circumstances. Hey, look, Ian. Uh, how do you and Nasha here happen to be traveling around together? You're very curious about other people's affairs, aren't you? Okay, I can take a hint. On the other hand, I don't mind in the least telling you. We all need money from time to time to keep body and soul together. When finances are bad, I suffer the indignity of going on the stage to perform uh, simple acts of magic before the public. Nasha is, is part of my uh, paraphernalia. Oh, I get it. She's the girl that you saw in half and the girl that escapes from locked trunks, things like that. And I dance. That is what I like to do best. Dance. In other words, you're a common garden variety of magician with a lot of highfalutin ideas. You're trying to insult me, Mr. Packard. Perhaps. Well, you won't succeed. When you talk in that manner, I consider you stupid. <laughs> An intelligent man never pays attention to stupidity. Thanks. Well, if you're so doggone smart, go ahead and show us something. Show you something? Sure, if you're such a high muck muck in this here mysticism stuff... Go ahead and show us something. That's a very dangerous thing to say, young man. Yeah? Why? Because I might do it. Well, go ahead. What's holding you back? Nasha. Yes, maestro. Remove that cloak. Yes, maestro. Have you done so? Yes, maestro. Then lie down at my feet. Yes, maestro. There. You cannot see the girl, but she's lying curled up. At my feet. Nasha. Yes, Maestro. You are thinking only what I am thinking? Yes, Maestro. You are going to let me put this rawhide leash about your neck? Yes. Yes. I stroke your hair. Stroke your hair. Now it is no longer human hair. It is the hair of an animal. The mane of a tigress. The mane of a tigress. You are going to be a tigress. When I say so, you are going to be a tigress. You are a tigress. Hey, Jack, it's snarling. <laughs> Hey, look, look, look at its eyes. Look at its eyes. That they're shining. Shining in the dark. That's enough. That's enough, Nasha. Nasha, you're a woman. I am so sleepy. Sleep, Nasha. Sleep. Ah. 
Sleep, dog, come. I don't like it. I don't like it a bit. Now, she's asleep, gentlemen. She won't awaken. You don't need to lower your voices. <sighs> Boy, I'd darn near jump clean out of this boxcar. Well, Mr. Packer... What just, do you think you were doing? Just a very short uh, visit into the realm of mysticism. A very short and unimportant visit. And you want us to believe you turned that girl into an animal? <laughs> Why should you believe anything except what you heard and saw? It was too dark in here to see anything. But her eyes, Jack, I seen her eyes. They was blazing green and yellow in the dark. I saw that. And that horrible snarling. Yes, I heard the snarling. And you don't believe? No, I don't believe. <laughs> you don't believe your eyes, you don't believe your ears. Would you believe your sense of touch? I might. We'll see. I clap my hands twice. Hey, hey, what was that? A man has just been murdered. Murdered? Here in this boxcar? Nuts. Mr. Packard, reach over here at my feet where Nasha was lying. Oh, sure. Why not? What's that? A man with a knife in his heart. You are touching the knife. Yes. A man with a knife in his heart. You believe... Well, this isn't magic. It's murder. murdered man in this boxcar. Now do you believe? Now do you believe in the power of the maestro? I believe you've committed murder. Doc. Yeah. Yeah, Jack? Have you got that flashlight? Yeah. Yeah, got here somewhere. Yeah, here it Wait is. Wait before you turn on the light. Wait for nothing. Just until I clap my hands twice. Go ahead. Clap your hands twice. Thank you. There. Now turn on the light. You better... Jack! Jack, where is it? Where's that body? I clapped my hands twice. It is gone. You're crazy. There was a dead man lying right on that spot less than a minute ago. What became of him? My son, the powers of the mystic are beyond your comprehension. Rubbish. Jack, turn the flash on this here maestro. Let's have a look at him. Yes, let's have a look at you. If you wish. I say, holy jumping catfish. Will you look at what we got? I told you I was fat and ugly. Well, I swear to my grandma, you wasn't kidding. You're just about the fattest man I ever did see. I wouldn't doubt it. Fella, you're darn near as broad as you are long. So you're the maestro, huh? I am. What's your name? <laughs> maestro is sufficient. Reggie. Yes, Jack? You stay right here with this man. Don't let him get up off that packing case. Right. Doc and I are going to search this boxcar. For the dead man? For the dead man. <laughs> Murder amuses you? <laughs> Look at your hands. What's that? I suggest you look at your hands. Well? Uh, you touched the knife that was in the man's heart. Are there any signs of blood on your fingers? No. Isn't that odd? A man stabbed in the heart bleeds profusely. That's true, Jack. There was a dead man in his car. Another simple excursion into the world of mysticism. Rubbish. Come on, Doc. We're going to look for that body. Well, there sure ain't much looking to be done in a boxcar. Empty boxcar is about the easiest thing I know to search. Here, wait. Huh? Well, hey, it's a little dancer, Nasha. Now, hold your flash down close. Yes, I want to look at her. Well, doggone. Just as pretty as she said she was. Sleeping like a baby. That's what I wanted to make sure of. Well, she is, ain't she? Yes, there's no faking about that. Doggone, fella. Can you imagine a little honey like that or traveling around the country with a big, fat, ugly buzzard like the maestro? Beauty and the beast. And darn it, she ain't plumb crazy about it. Queer, sir. Well, there's nothing down in this end of the car. If you mean corpses, they ain't. All right, let's try the other end. I don't really think we'll find nothing, though, do you? There was a dead body in here. Well, are you convinced? 
We aren't through yet. I heard you talking down there. You find the girl? Yeah, uh, Nash is getting her beauty sleep. Well, when you search to your satisfaction, come back. I, I enjoy your company. Thanks. <laughs> come on, Zach. Sure is a good-natured old hypnosis. Hmm. Now, looky, Jack. Uh, you gonna insist that there was a murdered man? Yes. Well, all right, then, then we got a right to say that Nash was turned into a tiger. Baloney. But tiger, a dead man. One makes just as much sense as the other. That woman in the tiger gag was just a trick. Optical and oral illusion. It was dark. We didn't actually see the tiger. But we seen green eyes in the dark, and we heard it a snarling. Illusion, I tell you. Well, all right, then, then uh, why ain't the dead man an illusion, too? Because I had hold of him. But in the dark. Maybe, uh... Maybe he had that fixed up some way. These magician guys are smarter than a whip. You see anything down here? Well, there ain't nothing down here. I feel kind of silly even looking. Silly, huh? Yeah, I do. Him sitting there playing tricks on us and laughing at us and all the time us taking it serious. All right, come on. Of course, I know you still ain't convinced. I know there was a dead man. Then where'd it go? Yes, Mr. Packard. Where did it go? All right, all right. Well, how about the car door? No, I didn't move off this box. I was sitting here right in front of you all the time. I couldn't see you in the dark. But I was right in front of you, talking to you. <laughs> no, if you have any idea that I threw a dead man out of that car door, <laughs> you're quite mistaken. You maintain it was an illusion? I maintain I opened the door into the world of mysticism. Just a crack. What's you been doing while we were away, Reggie? Reggie. Hey, hey, Reggie. Turn on the flashlight, Jack. Don't be alarmed. Your friend has nearly gone to sleep. Asleep? He must have been very tired. Reggie. Hmm. Reggie, what's the matter with you? Get me alone, Jack. I'm tired. Yeah, Doc, get hold of him. Help me get him up on his feet. Yeah. Come on, Reg. Wake up. Come no, on, get no. him. Let me alone. Your chap is letting me alone. That's it. Walk him around. Come on, Reggie. Snap out of it. That's it. Stretch and wake up. Who's it? What's going on? You all right? Naturally, I'm all right. What made you think otherwise? What made us think otherwise? I say, I... I just remembered. You remembered what? Nasha, that girl, she's been killed. Hey. But I saw it. I know it. I saw it. You saw Nasha She too? must have been. She walked up to the door of the car and plunged out head first. She done what? She... I saw her. Now look, Reggie. It's as black as the inside of your hat. How could you possibly have seen her jump out the door? I, I, I don't know, but I did. Doc, take this flashlight and go back to the end of the car and show Reggie she's back there asleep. Yeah, come, come on, fella. It was beastly all over before I could move. Well, I don't think you and I are going to get along. That's a pity. What did you do to Reggie? I'm afraid you have a suspicious mind. He didn't go to sleep of his own accord. He didn't? Nasha didn't jump out that door, and you know very well she didn't. I didn't say... Jack! Jack, she's not here! What's that? Jack, did you hear? Nasha's gone. She's not here. It's just as I said, Jack. I saw her float out of the door of the car. This is ridiculous. But it's the truth. Doc, go down and look at the other end of the car. Yeah, yes, you. Jack, I know what I'm talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. You've been asleep. Asleep? Yes, you have. When Doc and I came back from examining the car, you were lying on the floor asleep. You're sure? Certainly I'm sure. Anything you think you saw, you dream. Well, I don't believe it. Nope, she ain't down here, Jack. You look good? Sure I did. She just plain ain't in this box car. Your friend, Mr. Long, is right, Mr. Packard. And I suppose you're going to say you saw her dive out the door, too. As a matter of fact, I did. Uh, to throw even more light on the subject, I caused her to do it. You made that girl jump out of this train going like we are? I did. But look here, that's murder. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I'd like to know why it isn't. The train going the way it is, well, she couldn't possibly have come through alive. Besides, this is mountain country. Ravines, precipices. The girl may have fallen a hundred feet. You two boys still don't believe, do you? Don't believe what? That I have the mystical power necessary to conduct acts which to you appear uh, the supernatural. Are you going to tell us now that we're witnessing another of your experiments in mysticism? Exactly. You say you caused her to leap out of the car. I suppose you can cause her to leap back in again. I didn't say that. Reggie, tell us exactly what you saw. You mean when Nasha... Yes. 
What did you see? Well, I saw her come from the end of the car where you saw her asleep. Don't you see how ridiculous that is? You can't even see her hand in front of me. Yeah, I, this was different. There was a faint glow about her. I don't know how to explain it. it like a firefly. Where in neon nights, huh? Oh, I mean it. Luminous. Her body, her hair. She glided along till she got to the door. And she stood there for a moment and... And then suddenly she just seemed to float off into the air. You actually saw her? I mean, after she left the car, you saw her out in the air? Yes, yes, for a moment. I could I could see the wind blowing her luminous hair, and then all of a sudden she disappeared. But Reggie, what'd you stand there for? Why didn't you yell? I don't know. I began to feel heavy, sleepy. I say, that's what happened, Jack. The minute she floated out there, I went to sleep. That's great. But I, I, I couldn't help it. Jove, I never felt so sleepy. Did the maestro here touch you? Mm, no. No, I don't think so. No, I didn't touch him. Well, I don't know the answer, but I think the whole thing's a lot of silly hocus pocus. But doggone it, Jack, the girl's gone. Yes, and so is the body of that dead man. I know they're gone. I also know there was a dead body here. And I know that if that girl jumped out the car door, she's dead. The ways of mysticism. I don't care anything about the ways of mysticism. You sit there like a big, fat spider creating evil. I think you're a murderer. And I'm not so sure, but what you're not a double murderer. I know. A man convinced against his will. Jack! Jack, look. Yeah, yeah. She, she, she's coming back. Floating in through the doorway, just the way she left. Nasha. Nasha, do you hear me? She's, she's just returned from another world. She must have time. Floating back to the end of the car. I want to talk to that girl. You will have the opportunity. Just give her a minute. You see? You see how luminous she is? How she glows? Hey, look, it, it, it went out. She don't shine no more. The power that surrounds her. The power surrounding her. I think she's ready to talk to you now. Nasha, come here. We'll see what she has to say. Nasha. I am here, Maestro. Nasha, where have you been? Away. Away, away. It was cold there, very cold. Here, let me feel your hands. Yes, I am cold. Yeah, you're like ice. Yes, I am cold. Well, how did you get so cold? In the faraway country. But I did not mind the cold then, because everything was so beautiful. Mr. Becker doesn't believe you. Shall I stick a knife into him? No, Nash. Here, let me look at you in the flashlight. So you can see how beautiful I am? Let me see your hands. They are beautiful, too. Hello. What's this blood on your hands? Blood? And rust. Iron rust. No. No, not blood. Not blood. Blood and rust. No. Oh. Catch her, Doc. Yeah. Got her. Put her down at my feet. I will heal her. The next episode will be starting here in just a few moments, ladies and gentlemen. I do apologize. This is going to be episode five of Bury Your Dead, Arizona. From I Love a Mystery by Carl Denny Morse. Carl T. Morse, rather. How's everyone doing out there this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are? And in the, in the chat room, you'll see a link to our shop. Feel free to browse 
and hopefully maybe you like some of the items we have for sale up there. Taking a few moments for uh, this to start, I apologize. Come on. There we go. Here we go. Part yeah, five. Yeah, that ain't much, but that's where we live. Mysterious. What's your daughter's name, Jumping Dick? Laurie. Laurie, huh? Y you mean L-O-R-R-Y? L-O-R-R-Y? Well, that's plain English. <laughs> it is, huh? Laurie. L-A-U-R-A. <laughs> that's Laurie, huh? Well, it ain't Kate. Oh, he's got something there, Doc. Now, just a minute. I think we're getting too far ahead of the maestro and nature. Well, what you keep worrying about them for, Jack? They ain't no skin off our nose. And besides, we've practically arrived. Just the same, it won't hurt to show a little friendliness. I got a feeling our maestro could be a pretty venomous enemy. You mean he could be witches or something with his mysticism stuff? Well, talk sense, Doc. Well, yeah, that does, does sound kind of silly to me, even at 6 o'clock in the morning. But if his weapon ain't magic... What the heck hurt can he do us? He sure can't chase us at a night. Well, look at him. 300 pounds of pure, unrendered whale blood. Well, fattest man I ever see. I expect to see. Can't hardly drag one foot ahead of the other through this sand. Can we be of any help, Maestro? How much more of this torture is there? Just a few yards more. Can we help? A curse on this desert sand. Well, we're in the city limits of barrier dead now, so the going should be easier. A curse on Bury Your Dead. Hey, don't say that. Well, the folks in Bury Your Dead is going to feed us and put us up. Go along with you. Stop annoying me with your silly pattern. Nasha and I will arrive in our in our own good time. How you doing, Nasha, honey? You do not say honey to me. Why not, sugar? You do not say sugar to me, neither. Why not? Because maybe if you do, I speak nice. <laughs> <with you. laughs> now will you be good? Come on, let him alone. Yeah, they seem to like their own company better than ours. Well, uh, looky, Jumping Dick, uh, tell us more about your little old daughter. Hmm? Lori? Yeah, that little old, little old Lori female gal. Well, ain't much to tell, except she's had a heap of book education. She talks a bad, burned, citified, and pretty. Most folks won't have no truck with her. You mean your daughter was educated away from burying her dead? Yeah, I reckon. But again, my will... Why, say, she's so darn stuck up. Do you think she'll wear flower sack bloomers like the rest of the women in these parts? Oh, I say. No, 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 sir. Not Laurie. She's got to have store-bought and clothes from top to bottom. <laughs> you should be proud of your daughter, Dick. Well, of course I am. But she's about the most expensive female critter yet. Store-bought clothes underneath where you can't see them. Why, with ideas like that, you'll never get a husband. And shoes. You don't mean she insists on wearing shoes. Darned if she don't. Shoes and stockings both. <laughs> well, darned if I don't think you've got a pretty desperate case on your hands, Jumping Dick. Hey, you ain't in the mood to get married, are oh. you? Oh, <laughs> hey, now, 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 wait a minute. You, you ain't, huh? Well, uh, at least not till I've kind of looked her over. Well, I mean, say, if you look her over and... Uh, like what you see, uh, you take her off my hands. Uh... <laughs> Look out, Doc. <laughs> what you mean, take her off your hands? Oh, it's got to be legal. Legal, huh? Oh, darn right. I want a marriage ceremony which says right in the contract that once I'm shed of Laurie, I'm shed of her for life. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, jumping, Dick, I don't reckon that I'm particularly interested. Oh, here, now, don't go and say that. That ain't fair to Laurie. It ain't? No, no, it ain't. How can you tell you don't want a girl before you've even seen her? Well, of course I can't. Well, of course you can. Now then, uh, I'm out branching off up to my place, oh, not huh? Not a chance, Dick. We want to get to the boarding house and get some breakfast. Yeah, but you'll only be a minute. Just one quick look, so Texas here can make up his mind. Uh, you mean a, a young gal is up and around at six in the morning? No, no, she ain't up, but you could sort of peek in through the window. Oh, look here. Oh, that's all right, because there ain't no glass in the window. <laughs> no, no, that, that, that ain't my way, Dick. Oh, ain't, huh? No, nope, I, I like my women on the hoof, especially when I'm trying to judge them for marrying. Well, I could have her up and dressed. Uh, Dick, uh, what's that building down at the head of the drawer there? Uh, that's Dry Gulch Mary's boarding house. As I was saying, I could have her up out of bed and with her hair combed in no time. Hey, maestro. Oh, 
yelling at me, will you? That unpainted building at the head of the drawers, the boarding house. Well, will you get there and tell them to reserve the best room in the place for me? And how do you like that? As I was saying, I can get Laurie up and dressed. Forget your daughter, will you? But this is the first chance to marry her off. You barked it up the wrong tree. Ah, uh, what's that? The doctor's just kidding us. He doesn't want your daughter. Well, he just said himself he didn't know until he'd seen Jack, her. Jack, for the love of Mike, will you put Dick out of his misery? Well, I don't know, Jack. If Laura's as pretty as Jumping Dick says she you is. You crazy fool. <laughs> Ah, that's the way to talk, young fella. Look, you go on over to Dry Girls Mary's and get your breakfast, and I'll run along home and yank Laurie out and have her over there for you to look at. Huh? Yeah, why don't you do that? Yeah, Texas, you're, you're, you're the same as married right now. I'll be back quick and you can play <laughs> snow. Jack, I'd like to break your neck. <laughs> oh, what the heck? It's all in fun. When you're getting yourself into this, don't come around asking for help. Come on. Well, that's Dragon's Mary's boarding house. It looks more like a cow barn. Five, six, seven, eight shacks. What well, looks like this is all there is to bury your dead. Just them eight shacks stuck around the slopes of this gulf. Well, Dick said there were only 19 citizens in the town. 20, until the uh, wolves killed one last night. Yeah, that wolf business sounds mighty funny to me. Yeah, it does, don't it? Man, you sure know you're in the desert. Only six o'clock in the morning. Already, it's hot enough to fry eggs. Well, here we are, such as it is. Mm, bit on the dilapidated side. Look at that porch. <laughs> Looks like your foot would go through it if you stepped on it. Uh, do we knock or just walk in? Well, let's try knocking. Come on up on the porch. Looks deserted to me. No curtains. Yeah, look inside. No, no carpets. Furniture, though. No answer? Try again. I hear somebody inside. Oh, good morning. Well? You're uh, Dry Gulch, Mary? That's right. You have room and board to offer? I rent rooms at Serve Grove. That's fine. How about showing us three rooms with uh, baths, if you have them? I don't. Well, then, three connecting rooms. All my rooms connect. I say, but they're locked between, of course. No. What do you want to lock your room for? Oh, wait a minute. We can settle the details later. Can you show us three rooms, then get us some breakfast? Uh, let me see the color of your money. Well, that's fair. How much? Dollar a week apiece for the room. A dollar a week? Well, if you don't like it, find someplace else to sleep. No, no, that's that's quite all right. That's um, three dollars. And uh, how about meals? Fifty cents a day for each of you. Take it or leave it. Doggone, did you hear that, Reggie? Fifty cents a day for a week is uh, three and a half. Times three is nine. Ten and a half. You'll feed the three of us for a week for ten and a half? Mm, don't try to jaw me down. No, no, no. And here's the ten and a half, and here's the extra three dollars for our rooms. <laughs> Just lousy with money, ain't you? <laughs> no, not exactly. Say, you ain't the fellows that killed Alky Joe last night, are you? I say. Done what? Killed Alky Joe. Oh, he must be the feller that Dick is telling us about. We understood he was killed by wolves. <laughs> Human wolves. Say, who's that coming? Hmm? Oh, oh, yes. Two more customers for you. Uh, they gonna stay here? Yes, if you have accommodations. Uh, is he that fat? Or does he just look that way? No, ma'am, he ain't kidding. He's just as fat as he looks. I uh, wonder how he does it. I wish I could get my hogs that fat. <laughs> yes. Hey, madam. Your attention, please. Uh, uh. What you puffing about? The sand is difficult for the maestro. Uh, now, uh, we'll dispense with unnecessary conversation. Madam, I want... The best room in your establishment. Well, you can't have it. Madam, I, I demand the best room in now, the house. Now, look here, Don't you get tough with me. Huh? I've got the best room in this house, and I aim to keep it. Shall I stick a knife in her, my throat? Stand back. Hey. Hey, don't make a move, none of you. Joe, Jack, did you see that? She throwed a gun on us quicker than a man could have. Mary, put up that gun. Tell me how to run my boarding house. But your flea butt ten to feet. You don't need that gun. No one's going to bother you. Now you bet the ain't. Uh, uh, madam, I, I, I misjudged you. My deepest apologies. Show us the best room you have available. It will be plenty good. Well, now that's more like. Say, what about this girl in the night? Uh, no, sir. Yes, my... Uh, apologize to this good woman... 
Madame, I have been impetuous. Please, you will forgive me. <laughs> Is she your wife? Uh, no, no, I will also want a room for Nasha. Well, that's a Lulu of a name, Nasha. <laughs> you mind? It's all right by me, sister. Then, quickly, a room, hot water, and then uh, breakfast. Let's see the color of your money. Madam, you question our integrity? I want a dollar apiece from you and the girls. Now, that's for the rooms. Meals is 50 cents a piece a day. That's quite reasonable. In fact, very reasonable. In dish out. At the end of the week. Money talk. My dear madam, filthy lucre it is my curse. Well allow me. What's this? Well, let me take care of your week's room and board. Here, Mary, I think this is right. <laughs> yes, don't care how you throw money around. Are you sure you didn't murder Alka Joe? <laughs> quite sure. Well, you folks just wait here now. I've got to go see where I'm going to put you all. A peculiar situation. Hey, look, you maestro. Ain't you going to thank Jack for paying you a nice way? No thanks is due. The honor of paying my way, as you so crudely put it, is sufficient reward. You think so, huh? You are privileged. You can say they helped the maestro in an emergency. Well, of all the ornery... Hey, what about you, Nasha? Ain't you grateful? Uh, why should I be grateful? It is you who should be grateful. Yeah? Grateful you have been allowed to live. Grateful we've been allowed to live? That is true. Have you forgot the wolves? Hey, what you talking about? Wait until tonight when the wolves come. Then you will see. Yeah. Man, there ain't a door in this boarding house that don't creak and groan. Make a darn good burglar alarm, Mo. What are you doing? Come on into my room. Well, I'm coming. Doggone it. This ain't like living in a barn. Yeah, a bit of a clatter, all right, when you walk about. Where have you been? I'm across the hall talking to Nash and the maestro. <laughs> Fit to be tied, the maestro. He says he, uh, we had better accommodations in the boxcar. Well, did you ever eat such vile food? Uh, probably the reason we get it for 50 cents a day. Hey, who's that? It's Dry Gulch Mary. Who'd you think it was? Well, good evening, Mary. Is that so? Who said the food I serve well, up is vile? I, I, I'm afraid I did. Uh, well, if you don't like it, you can get out. But how did you know I said it? I was listening. That's how I know. Hey, you admit you was listening at the keyhole? I was. And the next crack about the food I said, and you can all get out the whole kit and caboodle. Oh, we're extremely sorry. You'd better be. Oh, just a minute, Mary. Are you always going to be listening at our doors? Well, I'm a mind to. But isn't that considered bad taste? I got a right to know what's going on in my boarding house, and I'm standing on my rights. Well, you just go right ahead and eavesdrop to your heart's content. And mind what you say about my cooking. We'll be careful. See that you do. <laughs> well, I know what I'm going to do. <laughs> what's that? Well, I'm going to bed in the dark tonight. With a peeping Tom for a landlady, I ain't gonna take no chances. <laughs> All right, remember after this. If you've got anything important to say, say it in a low voice. Well, I got something important to say. What's that? Jack, that there Nasha gal in the maestro is up to something. What makes you think so? I know it. You remember what Nasha said this morning about the wolves descending on bear you dead tonight? Rubbish. Well, maybe so, but I'm telling you, something mighty funny is happening across the hall in their room. Well, what? Well, for one thing, y you know them tights like acrobats wear? Like long underwear on his skin tight? Yeah. Well, Nash has got a pair of them on. Black ones. And Valerie, is she a looker in them? Nasha is wearing a pair of black tights? I swear to my grandma, she is. Well, what for? What's the object? Well, I asked her and I asked the maestro. Yes? And every last word that they'd say was, Tonight the wolf howls. Tonight the wolf howls? That's all. And when I come out of their room, you know what was happening? Nasha was a laying curled up at the maestro's feet like a dog. And here's a petting and a smooth in her hair. But, Doc, that's just what happened in the boxcar. You're telling me what made my hair stand up on end, just uh, standing there watching them. Why, well, they didn't pay no more attention to me than if I wasn't there. Why'd you leave? 
You think I wanted to stand there and see Nasha turned into a wolf right in front of my eyes? Doc. Well, Dad Gummit, that's what happened in the boxcar. You don't know that it did. You didn't see it happen. Yes, but Jack, we saw her eyes, green and yellow. Only an animal's eyes shine like that in the dark. And nothing but an animal could have made them snarling noises. So you think the maestro's in there turning Nasha into an animal? Huh? Well, doggone it, Jack. I know it don't make sense, just as well as you do. But something's a happening in there. Something that made me want to get out of there just as fast as I could. Hey! Oh, you're back again, Mary. Yes, I'm back. Well, what is it this time? Talk loud. I can't hear a word you say. <laughs> that's just the point. We don't want you to hear. And so that's it. You're plotting. Plotting? That's what I said. The more I see of you three, the more sure I am that you're the ones that killed Alky Joe last night. Mary, for the tenth time, we did not kill Alky Joe. Maybe. But doggone it, Mary, why pick on us? Everybody else in town swears up and down that Alky Joe was killed by wolves. Wolves, Jack. Well, I saw his body this afternoon. It certainly didn't look like the work of a man to me. That'd be a good way to commit a murder, wouldn't it? Make it look like an animal done it? Well, you're certainly the only one in town who believes that. That's because I'm smart. Look, Mary, will you go away and leave us alone? What's that? You ordering me out of my own boarding house? We paid for these rooms for the time being. They're ours. Well, if you don't like I it, know, I you know, know what. If we don't like the way you run this boarding house, get out. And take it or leave it. Well, what else can we do for you? Talk louder. <laughs> Man, what a woman. I say, isn't there some way we could put a lock on our doors? Well, where would you get a lock? No stores. Besides, as long as she makes a point of letting us know she's listening, what harm can it do? Well, now what about Nash and the Maestro? Don't you think you ought to go over there and have a look, Jack? No, I'll let them alone. As long as they stay in their rooms, they can't do any harm. That's quite. And if they open their door or walk in the hall, we can hear them. But if they go out, will we follow them? Is that it? Well, we'll see. By the way, Doc, what happened about that old uh, desert rat jumping dick? Oh, what you mean, what happened? Well, this morning he was going up to his house and get his daughter for you to look over. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, did you see her? Are you going to marry her? No, no, she wouldn't leave the house. <laughs> the way Dick talked, I thought he intended to drag her down here by the hair if necessary. I don't know. He just come back and said if I wanted to look her over before I married her, I'd have to come up to his shack. Well, didn't you go? No, I told him I wouldn't walk a, walk across the street to look at a female. Oh. <laughs> said if he wanted me to see her, he'd have to lasso her and bring her down here to the boarding house. <laughs> hey, you think the old coot's serious, Jack? Well, he seemed awfully anxious for you to see her. Yeah. Well, he come back this afternoon and said he'd catch her when she is asleep and hog tie her and tote her down here. Well, I've always heard the desert breeds some weird and wonderful specimens. We're getting our share of this trip. Jumping Dick, Dry Girl Schmidt. I say. Company. Hey, don't tell me Mary's getting some manners. Come in. Oh, I say. Oh, hello, Nasha. The maestro wished to speak with you. Fine. Tell him to come on in. No. You must come to him. Well, to the heck with him. Very well, and we'll go to him. Hey, Jack, you gonna let that big tub of goose grease order us around? You do not say that about the maestro. Oh, I see you still got them black tights on. Why not? Where did you get them? I always have them with me. They are my dancing tights. Why are you wearing them tonight? That is what the maestro wished to talk with you about. Will you come? All right. Come on, Reg, Doc. Right in here. The maestro is waiting. Maestro, they are here. Close the door. Yes, maestro. Oh, dread is forsaken hole. Door squeak, shutters rattle, boards creak, musty, filthy. Hey, maestro, you better not let Dry Gulch marry here. You... I told that woman I'd turn her into a mangy coyote if she didn't keep away from this room. You told her that? I certainly did. She believed you? Uh, with good reason. I wouldn't hesitate one moment. Now, look here. You're carrying this mysticism to a point where it's ridiculous. You can't turn anyone into an animal. You know that just as well as I do. So, you want to defy me? I don't know what your game is, but whatever it is, you're overplaying your hand. You still think I didn't turn Nasha into an animal in the boxcar? I know you didn't. Some clever trick, yes. Nash is a woman. She's never been anything else. With your own ears, you heard a man scream in that boxcar. With your own hands, you felt a knife stuck in his heart there in the dark. It was a dead man, all right. What's more, I think you killed him. But when you turned on your flashlight, he was not there. Another of your tricks. Mysticism. I say trick, and I mean trick. It was a trick, too, when I sent Nasha floating out of the moving boxcar and then made her return? It was. So, I have not yet convinced you I am a great mystic. 
that I have powers beyond the normal. You have not. Then I will prove it tonight. Just as you like. I will prove it beyond any reasonable doubt. Is that why you've called us in here? No. No, I called you here to warn you that you must not leave this boarding house tonight. You're telling us what to do? I'm warning you. Why? Why am I warning you? Well, that isn't what I mean, but why are you warning us? Because you gave Nasha and me financial assistance. Yes, I paid your room and board here. And that is my way of showing my gratitude. By warning us not to leave the house tonight? Yes. I don't follow you. Tonight, the wolf pack returns to this village. That's what Nasha said this morning. How, how do you know they're coming? Because I shall bring them. Just how do you intend to do this? First, I will put Nasha to sleep. Nasha. Yes, Maestro. Curl up at my feet. Yes, Maestro. Yes. Now, close your eyes. You are thinking only what I am thinking. Yes. Yes. You are sleepy. I am sleepy. Sleep, Nasha. Ooh. Sleep. She's sure enough asleep, Peller? Beyond awakening until I give the word. You think she is, Jack? Yes, that's simple hypnosis. Well, she's asleep. Now how are you going to bring the wolves? I will turn Nasha into a wolf. You, you mean that? I will turn Nasha into a wolf. I will send her out to the pack, and she will bring them here. Uh, you mind if I yawn? I will turn Nasha into a wolf. Well, don't stand there saying it. Go ahead and do it. Turn out the lamp. No. Do it here in the light where we can see it. The metamorphosis must take place in the dark. Now turn out the light. So, shall I, Jack? Yeah, go ahead. All right, Jack. Here goes the light. There. Man, is it dark in here. Well, the light's out. Do something. Nasha, I am smoothing your hair. It is the hair of a woman, but it is changing. It is changing to the hair of a wolf, the mane of a wolf. You are going to be a wolf. When I say the word, you are going to be a wolf. Nasha, you are a wolf. Those eyes, those eyes. They're shining in the dark. Go, Nasha. Go join the pack. Jack! Jack, she went right out through the window. The wolf pack will visit bury your dead tonight. Listen. Listen. She's gone, gentlemen. You heard her crash through the window. What did you do to that girl? Answer me before I shake it out of you. What did you do to that girl? Don't touch me, Packer. Then answer me. I warn you. Don't lay a hand on me if you know what's good for you. Jack, if you want him manhandled... Yeah, give me and Reggie a chance at him. We'll tan that thick hide of his right there on his fat carcass. You heard that, Maestro, or whatever your name is? Gentlemen, you mustn't be so disturbed. Oh, we mustn't be so disturbed. No. Huh? The three of you will be perfectly safe so long as you remain here in the boarding house. We're not interested in our own safety. We want to know what you did to that girl Nasha to make her dive through that window glass. Yeah, and lope off down the gulch, yelping at the moon. Well, that's crazy, Doc. But we heard her howling her head off. That wasn't Nasha. That was a real wolf. Mr. Packard, that was Nasha. I say it wasn't. Very well, Mr. Packard. Yes, but, Jack, we saw the glittering eyes. We heard the snarling right in this room. In the dark, yes. Well, supposing it was dark. We seen and heard what we seen and heard. Of course, but get it through your head. You didn't see Nasha turned into a wolf. Well, I say we did. No, Doc, you only think you did. Everything indicates you did because the maestro set the stage to make you think so. But you didn't actually see Nasha turned into a wolf. Well, that's true, Jack, of course. Yeah, you can't tell me any little old girl in her right mind's going to go jumping through a window. Right, I could just see her in the moonlight as she went through. Well, did it look like a girl or a wolf? Well, naturally, I could only see something shadowy, but it made a long, graceful dive. Yeah, like a wolf leaping through a window. Was it, Reggie? Right. Well, yes, I suppose that's how it did look. I could see the lithe outline of a body... Well, that's about all I'm sure of. Naturally, you could see the lithe outline if you could see anything. Have you forgotten Nasha had on those black dancing tights? <laughs> Gentlemen, you're making a fearful to-do about nothing. Oh, you think so, huh? Yes. I have sent Nasha out. She's obeying my will. When I am ready, she will return again. Listen. There. Does that sound like the voice of Nasha? It sure don't sound like nothing human to me. It is Nasha in the animal form I have given her, calling to others of her kind. Listen carefully. 
Are there not certain notes, certain tonal qualities that uh, that are familiar? Oh, look here You're now. crazier in a bed, Buck. If you say that sounds like nausea. Ah, but you don't know nausea as I know her, naturally. Well, I know one thing. Yes? Yes. I know we're going out and find that girl. No, you must not. Mustn't, huh? I forbid you to leave this house tonight. Well, it just so happens you're not in any position to forbid us anything. And the quicker we get started, the better I'm going to like it. Quiet. Let's go, Jack. I warn you, death is out there in that moonlight. Then what's Nasha doing out there? Nasha is the instrument of death. Oh, come on. I've stood about all this nonsense I intend to. Huh? You going this way? Sure. Nasha went out the window, so why shouldn't we? I warn you, someone faces death in this place tonight. If you go out there... I will not be responsible. We take our own responsibility. You just sit there and worry about your troubles. You want, Doc? Uh, yeah. Now look out for the glass around the edge of that window frame. Come on, Ray. Uh, there. Made it. Come on out, Jack. We'll be seeing you, Maestro. Fools! Fools! Give me your hand, Doc. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, uh, thanks. Which way do we go? Wait. Oh, Maestro. You still have time to return to safety. Forget it. I just wanted to warn you, when we find Nasha, don't expect us to return her to you. You still have time? Are you listening to me? It's pretty apparent that you're not a fit companion for Nasha. Your influence over her is too great. You can't have her anymore. Now the thing's that over. Death is out there in the moonlight. You have had your warning. All right, follow me. Where are we going? Up here in the shadow. Doggone. Something's loose out here tonight, all right. Yes, and I don't mind saying I'd rather meet a real wolf than to meet Nasha running about on all four. He cut it out, Reggie. Now shut up. Crouch down here in the shadow. It's quiet. Reggie, I want you to stay here. What's that? You'll be our lookout. We're up on the side of the hill above the boarding house so you can see everything that goes on. Yeah, you can even look down into my spouse's room. You see him? He's sitting there and he's fat, rocking back and forth. Mm. Ugly brute. Now keep an eye on him. But watch the rest of the house, too. You can see anyone who leaves or enters as long as the moon stays this bright. But you... You mean you and Doc are going and leave me here alone? Can't you take it? Well, I bloody well don't like it. I haven't forgotten yet that the ballet maestro put me to sleep while we were in the boxcar. Now, what defense have I got against a chappy who can put me to sleep whenever he likes? But he doesn't know you're out here. How can he put you to sleep if he doesn't know you're around? Well, how about letting Doc stay here? Hey, now, look, you fella. I don't like the maestro no matter you do. Oh, nuts. Hey, Reg. Well? Jack's disgusted with him. Quiet. I know it. Well, you two act, you think that fat man sitting in that rocking chair down in that dump of a boarding house was in charge of the universe. Well, he's doing a pretty good job of proving that he's straw boss anyway. He hasn't proved anything. Yes, but Jack, he says there's danger. Now, why take this sort of a chance? I mean, spreading out. Why not all stick together? Because I don't believe there's any such danger as he says. Well, me and Reggie do. What you want to keep watch for anyway? Well, sometime tonight, Nash is going to return I wanted to deny a witness to what happens. I also wanted to know if anyone else sneaked in or out of that boarding house. Well, naturally, Jack, if it's important... Well, what was I'll you st- planning for you and me to be a-doing? Well, there's eight houses, three, four shacks, and a couple of lean-tos which make up the village of Bury a Dead. Yeah, in a kind of a gulch. We're up here at the head of the draw. The houses and shacks are scattered down below on both sides of the gulch. Yes. Well, the maestro said there was going to be someone killed by the wolves. I want to cover every house on both sides of the gulch. You take one side, Doc, I take the other. But what for? Find out if everyone's inside for the night. Warn them to stay inside and try to find anyone who isn't home yet and get him safely in. Very well, I'll stay here and watch. Good boy. If I thought there was any real danger... Just a minute, fella. Huh? But why are you so anxious about having the citizens to bury you dead inside if there ain't no danger? Yes, Jack, how about that? The maestro says the wolves are coming. Well, if he ain't got the power to bring wolves... Listen... That there's all all the answer I need, Jack. What do you mean? Well, that there's either a real wolf out there, or else that's Nasha. And either way, the maestro's turned his trick. Now listen, you two. I know the maestro's up to some dirty work. But you still won't admit he turned Nasha into a wolf. No. And you won't admit he has the power to bring wolves down on this place. No. Well, even with that thing howling out there to prove Even it? with a dozen wolves howling out there. If the wolves come, it'll be their own accord, not because a fat man called them. But, Jack... I'm not going to argue anymore. Doc, you stay here with Reggie. Hey, well, where are you going? Never mind. You stay here with Reggie and keep an eye on the maestro's window. But he hasn't moved. Sitting down there in that rocking chair, rocking back and forth in the lamplight, like a huge, grotesque shadow. Now watch him, both of you. Stay here until I come back. Reggie. Well? Something's awful wrong about this. I know it. That wasn't right, letting Jack go off that away by himself. Well, there's no use trying to keep him here. Well, maybe I should ought to run and catch up with him. Well, do you want to? 
No. I think he's wrong to go out there. Quite. So do I. I ain't never seen him so stubborn about anything. He shouldn't have went. I don't know how I know it, but I do. And I think he knows it, too. You think he's deliberately going out to danger? I swear to my grandma, I do. And I think I know why. You do? Yeah. Something's happening that he can't understand. And Jack ain't a fellow that'll take something that he can't can't figure out or laying down. You mean he doesn't believe in the maestro's magic, and he's either going to prove this is a fraud or die trying. Hey, hey, look down in the maestro's room. Look at him. Pick up the lamp. He's coming to the window. Hey, what's that for? Look at the way he's waving that, that arm around there. It, it's some kind of a ritual. A ritual? Quite. He's making signs. See how he keeps repeating the same gesture over and over? You mean some more of his mysticism stuff? I, I, I don't know. Hey, that doggone wolf is answering Oh, that silly doc. No, it ain't. Look. Look how excited he is. Look at that expression on his face. Oh, Jove. I say, doc, shut up, Reggie. Listen. Reggie, I'm a ringing wet with sweat. Yeah, but what was it? What was it? A girl laughing. A girl out there somewhere with him wolves laughing. That, that man down there is a bloody maniac. Look at him. He's gone back to that rocking chair. Yeah, sitting there with his eyes closed. Rocking, rocking. Doc, hadn't we ought to go find Jack? I wish to goodness I knew what. Doc, hold it. Huh? What's the matter? There's something coming this way. Listen, maybe it's... Hey, it's a girl. Shut up. Reggie. What'd you hang on to me for? Bally, idiot, haven't you got any sense? But that girl needed help. Did you see any girl? Well, not in the dark, naturally. It's moonlight. You trying to say that wasn't any girl? I don't know whether there was or not. But this is some more of the maestro's dirty work. Doc, Reggie! Hey, that's Jack. Doc, Reggie, help! Help! Gun shooting! Come on, Reggie!
Sorry, everybody. Bear with me just a moment. Get this uh, next episode coming. This is episode 88. Episode 8 of Bury Your Dead. Arizona from I Love a Mystery. I apologize, everyone, that this is taking so long. Come on. So episode 88. Bury your dead, Arizona, from I Love a Mystery. We'll be loading up here in just a moment. How's everyone out there doing tonight? Everybody having a good weekend, I hope. If not, or even if you are, Chat about it with me. Here we go. Bury your dead, Arizona. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... The City of the Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. Dashing around this broken ground in the dark. But, but, Reggie, Jack was yelling for help. Oh, I know that as well as you do, and it sounded like he was right about here when he yelled to us. And then that rifle of ricocheting and that girl laughing. Well, we'll never be able to find him in the dark like this. We've got to go get some help. But don't you get it, Reggie? He may be shot and needing us right this very minute. I know minute. it. I know it. That's why it's foolish for us to be chasing around in the dark. Let's go back and get some lanterns and some of the residents of Barrier Dead to help us. Stand still. L let me try calling again. Jack! Hi, Jack! Where are you? Oh, listen, darn wolf. Look, look, Doc. Look, outlined against the sky on that rise over there. Holy jumping mackerel. What is that? A full-grown hypnosis? <laughs> the wolf. Oh, listen to him. Never mind the wolf. We are looking for Jack. Well, now, don't you see how impossible it is? Please, Doc, let's go back to the boarding house and get help. Waste all that time. Well, not as much as we're wasting this way. Hey, 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 hold it. What is it? Something's coming this way. Crouch down. Either that or running on all four. You don't suppose that sobbing girl's coming back? I don't know. Hold it. Something's are coming through the grease wood, all right. Howdy, boy. Hey, who, who said that? Kind of starting you. <laughs> uh, what's going on out here? Who are you? Jumping Dick. Hey, ain't you that toe-headed Britisher that's staying at Dry Gulch Mary's? That's right. We need your help badly, Dick. You do, huh? Who's that with you? It's me, Doc Long. Well, that's you, Texas. Well, now, ain't that a coincidence? I was just on my way over at the boarding house to tell you about my daughter, Laurie. Look here, Dick, we haven't got time to talk about your daughter. You ain't? For the love of Mike Feller, haven't you heard all the commotion that's been going on out here tonight? Commotion, huh? Uh, what sort of commotion? What sort of commotion? Girls screaming and laughing, girls are sobbing, wolves are howling, guns going off. Oh, shucks, now, you don't say. Where have I been all this time? You be, you didn't hear none of it? Not one bit of it, I didn't. But look, you can hear that wolf. You can see him outlined against the moon over there on that next ridge. Oh, sure, sure. That's old Brindle. Old Brindle? Yeah, he's the old he-wolf of the pack. He's been sitting over on that ridge howling at night for, oh, I don't know how many years. Well, uh, ain't he one of the wolves that pulled down and tore up Alky Joe? No, don't reckon. Oh, but look here, there's something more important than wolves. Something's happened to Jack. You talking about your friend Packard? Yes, we're out looking for him. What makes you think something's happened to him? Well, there ain't no thinking about it. We know it. We heard him yell for help, and then we heard a rifle shot and a girl laughing. 
Well, we ain't been able to find hiding a hair of him since. How long ago did all this happen? Oh, 10, 15 minutes ago. Well, then I reckon your friend's all safe and sound. Y- you seen him? Yeah, not five minutes ago. Yes, are you certain? Sure, certain. But where? Where is he now? Over in the boarding house, talking to that there maestro fella and the Russian girl. Talking to the maestro and Nasha? Well, at least was he was five minutes ago. Well, yeah. darn his hide anyway. Come on, Reggie. What's he think he's pulling on us, running around in the desert yelling for help, and then when we start scouring for him, he sneaks back to the boarding house? What kind of a way is that to act? And Nasha, apparently she's back. Back? Where's she been? Well, the maestro turned her into Stop. a... Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Huh? Yeah, what kind of talk's that? The maestro turned her from a girl into... You... Well, what's that supposed to mean? It don't make sense. Not quite, Doc. Hardly ever does. Well, look you here, Jumping Dick. Are you sure Jack's all right? Well, all I know is what I seen. I looked in the window over yonder, and there was your sidekick Packard and the fat man and the roosting girl. Are you aiming on going back to the boarding house and joining them? Yeah. I want to find out what sort of a circus Jack's a putting on. I'm a telling you, he's all right. He, now then, that... Uh, I want you to listen to me for a minute. Well, go ahead, but keep walking. Yeah. Well, now, look, Texas. Uh, you're still in a marrying mood, ain't you? Oh, look here. You're still wanting to take Gloria off my hands, all legal and proper, ain't you? Hey, I never I never said that I'd marry you, female daughter. Uh, 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 now, wait a minute, son. Wait a minute. Don't go throwing careless words around like that. Look, you jumping, Dick. Things has been a-happening bury you dead tonight. It's had me sweating one minute and give me cold chills the next. I ain't no mood for a girl courting tonight. Oh, so you aim to go back on your sworn words, huh? I didn't give no sworn words. You blame well no. Hey, and what about you? You were supposed to bring that Laura daughter of yours around to the boarding house at 7 o'clock this morning for me to look over. Yeah, but it's just like I said. 7 o'clock this morning you were supposed to bring her. And did you? No. Here it is, 10 o'clock at night. You, you ain't even brought her yet. Well, no. That's what I want to explain to you. I don't want no explanations. You ain't kept your word, so I ain't obliged to keep mine. Hey, now, look here, Texas. I got a good excuse, and I aim to tell it to you. Well, hurry up. On the counter, here we are at the boarding house, and we got to go in. Yeah. First place, the reason I didn't bring Laurie over at 7 o'clock this morning, she wouldn't come. Wouldn't come? Ain't that what I'm telling you? And you let her get away with it? No, no, wait till I explain. What kind of a man are you, jumping dick? Let a little old female daughter telling you what to do? Well, Dad busted, I'm trying to tell you. She got the draw on me. What's that? I'm telling you the gospel truth. She beat me to the draw. Dick, are you trying to say your own daughter pulled a gun on you? Yeah, and what's more than that, she'd have... Punctured me like a sieve if I'd have made one false move. Well, jumping, Dick, that sure does explain why you couldn't get Laurie down here at seven this morning. Ah, oh, but things is different now. I got the upper hand now. I got her right where I want her. Yeah? Where, where did you want her? I got her locked in the cellar. Now, if you was to come along with me, we could all go up to my place and hog tire and stop all this well, nonsense. Why do you want to tie her up? Well... That's the only way you're going to get her to stand still long enough to get a good look at her. Father, is that you? Holy jumping jeepers. Hey, who's that? That's my daughter, Lori. Father, what are you doing here? It's time you were in bed. Yes, Lori. Who are these men? Well, this here is Reggie York. Yeah? And, uh, and I reckon I'm Doc Long, the fellow your papa wants you to marry. What did you say? Hey, you, 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 you don't know about it? Father, what have you been saying to these men? Uh, nothing, Laurie, nothing. Uh, these fellas is crazy. Oh, but I say, I thought you were locked in the cellar. The cellar? What cellar? Well, at your cabin, naturally. Our cabin doesn't have a cellar. Come along, Father. Good evening, gentlemen. Well, I'll be a double-jointed toad frog. <laughs> Did you see her face in the moonlight, Reggie? Oh. Did you see it? Most beautiful. I say she was real, wasn't she? Say, Reggie, you suppose we've been taken for a ride? Oh, now, don't include me. I wasn't supposed to marry that girl. Well, dang if I don't believe every word that old coot's been saying to me was just plain lying. It's hard to imagine a girl like that drawing a gun on her father. Matter of fact, I got the impression he was ballet frightened of her. Man, what a voice. Cool, soft, low. 
Reggie, if I ever go to heaven, that's just exactly the way I want to hear them female angels talk. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? For a village of 19 citizens, Berrio de Arizona certainly is loaded with mystery. Ain't it the truth? Well, shall we go in and tackle Jack? Hey, I just thought of something. Hmm? If Jumping Dick was a lying about his daughter, maybe he was lying about Jack. You mean Jack may not be in with the maestro? Well, come on, let's find out. Down the hall. Here, Doc, you're passing the door. If Jack's been a laying out on the desert... Stop pounding on my door. I say, is Jack in there? Yes, come on in, Reggie. Hey, he's there. Oh, I say, Jack, you're all right. Certainly I'm all right. Shut that door. Yeah. Now then, Jack, what the heck's been going on? That's what I've been trying to find out. But, Jack, out there on the desert, we heard you cry for help, and then we heard a gunshot. They weren't shooting at me. Well, why'd you yell for help, and, and then then not wait for us? I didn't have time. Didn't have time? Why did you yell for help? A wolf had me down. A wolf? Well, sure enough, wolf. The biggest wolf I ever saw. That's when I yelled. And somebody fired that gun, and it streaked off across the desert like crazy. Yeah, look at my coat. I say, ripped right down the back. Luckily, I fell on my face. My throat and face were protected. But what did you mean you didn't have time to wait for us to get to? Well, I jumped to my feet and I saw something sneaking through the greasewood and I took out after it. Well, what was it? It was Nasha. I followed her here to the boarding house. Was she girl or wolf? Girl. Yes, I had transformed her back into her natural shape before I brought her back. Rubbish. I changed her back into her natural form. Just as you see her now... Lying on her bed, asleep. Why you got her asleep? She is exhausted. She's always exhausted after her participation in one of my manifestations. She sure does look all in, all right. But, Jack, all this still doesn't explain that girl laughing hysterically out there. Yeah, and it don't explain that girl that passed us sobbing like her heart would break. No, I heard the girl laughing. Uh, did you see her? No. In the morning, we're going to have a talk with every person and bury your dead. In the morning, the citizens of bury your dead are going to have something much more interesting to talk about. Is that so? Quite so. Such as what? That we'll have to wait for the dawn. Tonight, my work is finished. I wish we could be sure about that. As a matter of fact, I wish we could be quite sure just how much you had to do with tonight's work. I was responsible for everything that took place out there. You didn't move from this room. Nevertheless, what I say is true. Tonight, I turned Nasha into a wolf. She went forth and led the pack down on Bury Your Dead. <laughs> you know what I'm going to do tomorrow night? What? Tonight, I turned Nasha into a wolf. Tomorrow night, I'm going to turn a wolf... Into a man. I say. Hey, cut it out. I will turn a wolf into a man. And I will give you the privilege of talking to him. Are you just plain trying to give us nightmares? Well, gentlemen, there is the wolf who will walk like a man. That's it. Put the bed against the door. Here, I'll give you a hand. Right over there. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, that ought to do it. You got both windows covered with blankets, Doc? Yeah. Nobody ain't going to peek in this room. Good. Now, you see, uh, Jack, what's it all about? We've got to do some talking, and I don't want to be interrupted. Our landlady's going to be plenty mad if we don't talk loud enough for her to hear. Now, she's one person I don't want to overhear, sir. But come on, sit down. I'm going to keep my voice guarded. All right. Uh, okay. Shoot, fella. All right. Now, two men have been killed and buried or dead since we arrived. By wolves. By the maestro. Hey, I say, can you prove that? No, but I believe it enough that I'm going to try to prove it. And I believe that's the third murder he's committed since we made his acquaintance. Well, you're talking about the body you touched in the dark boxcar. Yes. Now, Jack... I don't want to argue, Doc. I just want to outline a theory. I think there was a body in the car and that somehow, after he let me touch it, he threw it out of the moving car. Now, that's one murder. The second was the night our boxcar was shunted out of a siding. That same night, Alky Joe was killed here in Berry Dent. Well, Jack, none of us knew about that killing until Jumpin' Dick come along and told us about it. Don't you remember? You and Reggie and I didn't know about it. We don't know what the maestro knew. But we all woke up together the first thing we knew. The car had been dropped off on the siding. That's the first we three knew. We don't know how long the maestro had known it. it may have been there for hours. Yeah. Yeah, he could have done it, I reckon. But why? All I'm trying to do now is show that he was in a position to do all three murders. Then the third murder last night. Huh? Yeah. Chinese Tom. This morning, the body was found outside his cabin, slashed and torn by fangs and claws. Beastly. And there's something interesting about both these men killed here. How you mean? Alky Joe is a very old, defenseless, decrepit man. So is Chinese Tom. 
old, frail, easy prey. I say that's true, isn't it? But, uh, well, what's that mean? I don't know for sure yet. I'm just stating facts. Yes, but, Jack, how can you possibly link the maestro with Chinese Tom's death? He was in his room here in the boarding house all the time. He was under our eye almost constantly. But Nasha wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, Nasha wasn't. And what's more, the maestro said his very self that he turned Nasha into a wolf and sent her out to bring the pack down for a kill. But that doesn't make him a murderer. Well, I'd like to know why it doesn't. Because there isn't a jury in the world who'd believe it. How about it, Jack? You don't have to go as far as a jury. I don't believe it. Well, what would happen if... If we'd tell all the maestro said to us to a judge. Well, if the maestro insisted we told the truth, the judge would lock him up in a padded cell and probably find another cell for the three of us for believing him. <laughs> now, we're getting off the subject. I'm not trying to prove how he killed. I'm just saying I think he did. Now, if he's killed three times, there must be a reason behind it. Unless he's just a plain homicidal maniac. Maybe. But I think there's more to it than just that. I think there's some kind of a plan behind all this. I think he's working towards some payoff. Yeah, but look here, Jack. What possible payoff could there be in a place like Bury a Dead more tremendous than murder itself? I don't know. That's what we've got to find out. There's one thing we do know for certain. Yeah? Yes. That what he wants has nothing to do with Bury a Dead itself. Well, how do we know that? Because our coming here was accidental. He couldn't have known our boxcar was going to be left in this forsaken Arizona desert hole any more than we did. Therefore, what he wants to accomplish, he would have wanted to accomplish just as much if the boxcar had stopped in Texas or Timbuktu. Well, then, as I see it, what he wants concerns either the girl, Nasha, or us three. I mean, we're the only elements that arrived in Barrier Dead at the same time he did. Mm -hmm. That's good reasoning, Reggie. Except I don't see how it could be any of us three. After all, we just happened to get on the same freight car with him and Nasha. Our meeting was as much as accident as our stopover in this place. Well, uh, then it looks like all this business has got something to do with Nash. Yeah, it looks like it. And there's another thing. That girl's completely in his power. So completely, I doubt if she has much will of her own. Well, she seems to like it. Hey, wait a minute. You don't suppose she's a filthy rich heiress or something, do you? I say. Yeah, money to burn, and he's getting her in his power so as he can get it for himself. That couldn't be it. Well, why not? Well, first place, she doesn't show much breeding or background... Besides that, she really is an acrobatic dancer. Just watch her throw herself around sometime. That shows training from childhood. And finally, she told us herself that she'd been with his magician act for two or three years. Yeah. Yeah, that don't tie up, does it? Jack, you still don't think the maestro is a great magician, do you? Well, I've changed my mind. I think he's a very great magician. Hey, you do? Now, don't get me wrong. I still think this mysticism gag's baloney. But his art of deception, his, his ability to take advantage of the average person's gullibility is tremendous. That's what I mean by great. It's quiet. So we know definitely this much. He's got a hidden plan. What he's trying to accomplish has nothing to do with Barry a dead. He has Nasher completely in his power. And finally, he's a very clever man. Well, I say, that isn't very much. And it's a beginning. And on top of all that, we suspect him of committing three murders. Hey, Jack, have you forgot something? What's that? Tonight's the night he said he is going to turn one of them wolves out yonder into a man. No, I haven't forgotten. It's early yet. Wolves haven't started to howl. Well, what are we going to do about that? You suppose there's going to be a, another killing tonight? I doubt it. The remaining residents in Barry are dead or frightened. They're staying indoors tonight with loaded guns. Any wolves or pseudo-wolves prowling around tonight are liable to get a dose of lead. Well, what about us? Are we just going to ignore the maestro's big moment? Hey, let's don't do that. If he's going to turn a wolf into a man... I'd kind of like to be in on it. Don't worry, we will. But there's something more interesting than that going on. You mean what he's doing in his room? Yeah, he's building something. Oh, is that what all that sawing and pounding's about that's been going on in here all day? Where'd he get his tools? Dry Gulch Mary let him have them. Well, you haven't any idea what it is, huh? No. I bet money he's knocking together some contraption or another for one of his tricks of magic. You mean he wants to impress us some more? I don't know. But it's all a part of the whole plan, whatever that is. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Company. Hello? Gentlemen, I have completed my task. You've done what? I have completed my task. Well, what about it? You will do me the honor of coming into my room and viewing it. Hey, he wants us to go in his room and see what he's made. Looks like it. Well, let's go. Gentlemen, I'm waiting. All right, just a minute. Uh, give me a hand with the bed, Doc. Yeah, take it away. Look. There. Uh, this way, gentlemen... If you please. You seem awfully anxious for us to be in on this deal. You talk in riddles, Mr. Baggett. I don't think so. Uh, right in this way, please. Well, uh, where's Nasha at? I have sent Nasha out into the night on a mission. That's so? Is, uh, is that what you've been working on there under that blanket? That is it. I have invited you in here for the 
unveiling. Well, pull off the blanket and let's have a look. Now, those are my intentions. You're ready? Yeah. Go on. Pull her off. Yes. Mm. Ah. There you are. <gasps> I say. What in the deuce? But I don't get it. What's it supposed to be? Uh, what does it look like? Looks like a big pine board box. But that's just what it is, Doc. A homemade coffin. A coffin? Exactly, gentlemen. A rough but sturdy gasket. Ooh, wee. Ooh. What you aim to do with that? That will hold a body for burial tomorrow. Whose body? That's a strange question, Mr. Packard. Who's dead? You mean you spent all day building a coffin for Chinese Tom? And why not? I am the cause of his being dead. You... You just out and out admit that? Certainly. I told you the wolves would come. I told you they would kill. And because you caused his death, you've gone to the trouble of making him a casket? Could I do any less? Well, if this ain't the craziest one yet. That's a very decent job, don't you think? Yeah, you're certainly all right with a hammer and saw. I think this Chinese Tom person should rest more easily. If it hadn't been for me, poor fellow would have been thrown into a hole, covered up, just as Alky Joe was. Yes, yes, he has a great deal to thank me for. Yeah, such as being dead. We must all die, some today, some tomorrow. I say, are you saying someone is going to die tonight? No, no, not tonight I have more important things to do. More important than killing folks, huh? Yes, tonight is my great experiment. Tonight I turn the big wolf into a man. That'll be good, if you do it. Oh, I'll do it. When? I have sent Nasha out to bring him here. Bring the wolf here? They should be here soon. Now, looky, Maestro, if you're kidding... When they come, the wolf will be striding beside Nasha on his two hind feet. He will have the form of a human being. Yeah, that's great talk. You still don't believe? No. You? Well, all I got to say is, whether you're telling the truth or not, you're one hombre that ought to be locked up. Ah, uh, I'm sick of your shallow mind. Wait. Hold huh? on. What's the matter? Windows open. Something outside. <laughs> it will be Nasha and the wolf. Jack! Jack, look at that. There in the moonlight. Hey, it's a man. He's carrying Nasha in his arms. Look at his face. It's covered with long hair. Stand back, please. Something's happened to Nasha. His face is covered with long hair. Coming right up to the window. Please stand back. Here, I will take the girl. Mm. Poor little Nasha. Poor child. You're standing there. Did you ever see a face like that? Eyes dead. Mouth hanging open, covered with hair. It does kind of look like a wolf, don't he? Gentlemen, Nasha is dead. Dead? Nasha's dead? Dead. Here, let me see that girl. She's dead, I see. We'll see about that. You're a medical man. I know enough. Dead. She's cold. She's like ice. Dead. No pulse. I fear our experiment tonight has been too much for Nasha. Wolf, go back to your kite. Aren't we going to Wait a minute. Him? I want to see that man. I have sent him back to the pack. Well, I'm going out that window after him. I'm not through with him yet. Jack, Jack, come back here. Stay here. Don't leave that man for a second. Stay there. Dead. Nasha. Dead. And you did it. You did it just as much as if you'd plunged a knife in her heart. Coffin. So I made the coffin for you after all. I wish Jack hadn't gone out there. A big coffin. But it will give you room to sleep more comfortably. Reggie, are we going to just stand here and let Jack go out after that thing alone? Well, I barely well don't like it. The moonlight is fraught with danger tonight. All right, fella, let's do something about it. The dog, Jack, said to stay with the maestro. Look, Reg, if we was to hog time hand and foot... That'd be just the same as stayed with. I say, of course. Don't touch me. Reggie, get a sheet off that bed. Quiet. I warn you, don't touch me. Now, looky, maestro. You can you can take a choice. Are you going to sit down in that chair and let us tie you up? Or you want I should lay you out like a carpet? You dare touch the maestro. You bet I dare. Now, which is it going to be? And talk fast. Insult on insult. Tear up that sheet, Reggie. I know. Now, I ain't fooling. You want I should box you? Oh, very well. You think you're accomplishing anything? Tie me up. Now you're talking. Sit down. Ah, the ways of fools are beyond comprehension. Give me some of them pieces. Now you tie up his feet. Christ. Now put your feet together, maestro. Yes, out there in the moonlight and 
You, you fumble with ropes. Uh, uh, there. Now put your other wrist over this here arm of the chair. And that takes care of his feet. Uh, now go over and spread that other sheet over Nash, you poor little thing. He did because of this fat creature. Uh, uh, there. Now I reckon that'll hold you. Fool. Uh, maybe. But uh, you'll still be here when we get back. All right, Doc. Yeah, let's go. And, and Maestro... Well... While we're gone, you might just as well sit there and look at Nasha under that sheet yonder and think what's about to gonna happen to you for killing her. Get out of my sight! Come on, Reg. Climb through the window. Right up. Right behind you, Biller. Now, then. Did you see which way Jack went? Yeah, down the draw. Uh, he'll give us what for if we're doing the wrong thing. Yeah. And, and he'll uh, likewise be plenty glad if he gets himself into mm. trouble. Just enough bloody light from the moon to confuse a person. Well, it's better than plain darkness. You think we ought to yell to him? Well, not unless we can't find him any other way. That horrible creature that brought Nasha's body to the window. Yeah, nightmare. Not a word, just a gaunt, hairy face with dead eyes and its mouth hanging open. Hey, hey, wait. What's the matter? Was that something moving just ahead of us? I didn't see it. During this moonlight? It does fool you, don't it? Well, come on. Well, if you think you saw something... Well, I ain't sure. No use just crouching here, right. anyway. There's one thing, Doc. Yeah? If Jack was in trouble, he'd let out a yell. Well, we might not have heard him. Well, I don't know. Sound carries belly well over the desert. Did you bring a flashlight along? Right. No use using it here, though. Well, I didn't mean that. Just have it handy is all. Mm, right. Sometimes I wish we wasn't so doggone pure. What's that? Not carrying pistols on us. Time like this, there ain't nothing that'd make me happier than having a pistol in my pocket. No, Jack's right, though. Much better off without them. Maybe. A time like Nobody this. Come here, come here. Hey, it's a girl. Come on, come on, let's get going. Somebody, somebody me. We're coming. Keep yelling. This way. This way. Joe, this belly sand. Hey, hey, I can see a light up yonder. We're coming. We're coming. This way. This way. Yeah, yeah, we can see your light. Hurry, hurry. Oh, it's happened. It's Happened. Let's see, here we are. What is this? What's the matter? Right over here. Right over here. Hey, it's jumping. Dick's daughter, Lola. Look, look here. Like, say, a man. Is he dead? I don't know. I just found him. Hey, uh, hold your flashlight still. Oh, my hands are trembling so. Here, g- give me that light. Right. There now. Doc, Doc, it's Jack. Didn't I tell you? Is he? Doc, is he? No, no, of course he ain't dead. You're sure? Well, what's the matter with you? Can't you see he's breathing? Oh, good, good. Hey, hey, look here. A cut on his head. Oh, I say, what a blow. Yeah, somebody is waiting for him here, here in the greasewood. Jumped out and whammed. Uh, but he's going to be all right. Of course he is. When did a bump on the head ever hurt Jack? But I say, let's not stand here. Let's get him back to the boarding house. Oh, but do you think he ought to be moved? Oh, yeah, that part's all right. But looky, Reggie, something's funny. What do you mean? Look at his clothes. Hacked tore off. Are you sure there's no wounds on his body? Yeah, I just look. Well, then what does it matter? I can carry him. Well, uh... But, but what did he bop him on the head for and then tear his clothes for? I don't know. All we're interested in now is getting him back to where we can give him first aid. Yeah, you better let me give you a hand. No, no, I can take him. Up, up with it. All right, there. Now let's go. Th- then if you don't need me, I... You better come along with us. Oh, but, but I've got something I must do. Well, it'll have to wait, because you're coming with us. You're making me come? If you want to put it that way. No, I won't. Oh, you won't, huh? You let go. Come on, sister, cut it out. Let go of me, dear. Why, well, you... Will... Oh, oh, ouch, you flee. Well, then, now, calm <laughs> down. Do as you're told. Twisting a girl's arm. What kind of a man are you? Well, you asked for it. Now, come along now. Go on, Reggie. Right o oh. What possible use can I be to it? Jack was slugged. You was out here when it happened. I've got some questions I want to ask you. Oh, you, you don't think I did it? I don't know. But I didn't. I... I was just out here, and I, I stumbled over his body. What was you doing out here in the first place? Looking, looking for something. That's so? Honestly. Do you very often go out looking for something in the desert at night? Oh, I was looking for my father. Jumping Dick? Yes. Well, what's he doing out here this time of night? I don't know. That's why I was so worried. That's why I was out looking for him. Yeah? So Jumping Dick's out wandering around through the desert tonight. I reckon maybe I'd like to talk to him, too. Well, you don't think my father did this? Uh, you want some help, Reg? No, I'm doing all right. But you mustn't think he did it. Father's mild, gentle. He's the biggest liar I ever run across. Who's the biggest what? liar you ever run across? Well, hey. Father. Hey, jumping dick. That burn right is jumping dick. And I just heard Texas here call me a liar. All right, Dick, come on. Join the parade. What do you mean, join the parade? You're coming up to the boarding house along with your daughter here. 
You just plain got your heart set on marrying that girl. Father, you stop that. Oh, now look, If you mention marriage once more, I'll leave Barry. You're dead and I'll never come back this time. Yeah, sure, Lloyd, sure. It's just my little joke. Come on, Reg is getting ahead of us. Come on, Dick. Uh, Don't mind if I do. Well, what's going on around here, anyway? You ain't the bird to sap Jack, are you? Sap Jack? Why, say, why would I want to do that? I like that fella. Yeah? You can let go of my wrists. I won't try to get away now that I know where Father is. Do you mind my hanging on to your hand? Yes, I do. Well, all right, then. Have it your way. Doc, come and open the door for me. Yeah, sure. Come on, you folks. Shall I take him to his room? No, I'll bring him in the maestro's room. Then we can uh, keep an eye on the maestro and fix Jack up at the same time. I know. Lead the way. Here. Come on in, everybody. Lay him on the bed, Reggie. So, you're back. Hey, hey, what you got this fat fella tied up for? Keep huh? him out of mischief. Doc, Doc Jack's coming, too. Hey, he is? What's the matter with him? Oh, it's uh, some more of your funny business, I reckon. Oh. oh. a boy, fella. Uh, take more than a slug on the head to lay you out. Oh, oh what happened? Somebody slugged you, son. Uh, get some water, Reggie. Right away. Feeling pretty lousy? <sighs> oh, what a head. <laughs> you ain't kidding there. You've got a bump as big as a goose egg. Know who done it? Uh, let me think. Yeah, oh, boy, here's the water for you. Here, take a slug of this. Uh, thanks. Where am I? Lying on the bed in the maestro's room. Oh, oh, yes. What happened? Well, you hopped out the window after the nightmare with the hair on his face. Somebody let you have it out there in the dark. Yes, now I remember. Know who done it? No. They got me from behind. I remember a movement in the bushes and then shooting stars. Yeah. Funny thing. All they did was tear about half your clothes off. Tear the... uh, Doc. Doc, the money belt. Money belt? Hey. Hey, you you mean they got that? So that's what this is all about. You mean some two-tailed sippy cats grabbed our 25,000 snacks? Shut up, you But, Jack, who knew you had the money belt? Hey, you mean you've been robbed? You keep out of this, Jumping Dick. Yeah, but all I I ask... I said it is none of your business. Now, keep your nose out of it. Mm, Sure, if that's the way you want it. That's just how I want it. What a crazy idiot I've been not to realize. Realize what, Jack? Never mind. Say, you Sam, lying on the maestro's bed? Yeah, Why? But Nasha was lying down here when I left the room. Hey, say, Nasha's buddy. But where is it? Didn't I tell you two to stay here and watch the maestro? But, Jack, he couldn't have done it. He's tied up over there in his chair. Tied up? Hand and foot. But he's the only one who could have moved her. But I tell you, he didn't. He's tied up tight as a tick. Don't worry, gentlemen. Nasha's where she belongs. Where's that? If you lift the lid of the coffin over there against the wall... Coffin? We'll just have a look and see. Hey, hey, what's going on here anyway? Yep, she's here, Jack. She's here in the coffin. Where she belongs. But look at her. She ain't wearing her black tights no more. What's that? All laid out in her prettiest dress. She, She's dead? But, but who did it? I did it, gentlemen. The heck you did. You're all tied up. The ways of the mystic are beyond mortal comprehension. Well, I will say this. She's about the prettiest corpse I ever did see. Sleep well, Nasha. Sleep well. Well, that's that. There's one thing I don't understand, Jumping Dick. There's a lot of things I don't get myself. No. I mean, there's a lot of violent deaths and quick burials going on around here without much regard for law. Uh, Law don't get out this way much. In my opinion, it should. How can it? Ain't no roads in here. No roads at all? I reckon the closest road's 40 miles over that way somewhere. That's great. Ain't no telephones, you know. Only thing we got's the railroad up yonder, half mile. And trains scoot by us like scared rabbits. I know. By the way, why was that boxcar shuttered off on the siding up there? One you fellas come in? Yes. One of the wheels froze on it. You mean they backed it onto the siding because it was out of order? Yeah. Wheel froze. But why is the siding out there? Isn't there any industry that has use for it? There used to be a mine back on the desert. It's shut down now. Though. I see. Jack, Laurie here is just telling me and Reggie something interesting. Well? Uh, go on, Laurie. Tell Jack. Well, 
It's about the money belt you lost last night. I didn't lose it. Someone slugged me and stole it. Yes, I know. But last night... Sorry. What? You be careful what you say. Oh, but Father... It ain't good going around shooting off your mouth in these parts. You're the one who's talking too much, Jumping Dick. All I'm saying is... Well, don't. Now, what were you going to say, Laura? Yes, I'd I'd like to hear it, too. Oh, you would, huh? You want to repeat it in front of the maestro? Oh, yes, I think so. Then go ahead. Well, last night, about five minutes before I stumbled over you, when you were unconscious, I saw someone sneaking along through the greasewood in the moonlight. Can you describe him? I don't think so. Well, you know everyone and bury your dead. Could it have been one of them? Well, I... I thought it was a girl. But you're the only girl in this place. Except Nasha. Nasha was dead then. Well, I say, how about our landlady, Dry Gulch Mary? No, it wasn't Mary. I'd know Mary any place, even if it was pitch black. And it wasn't. It was moonlight. You're sure it was a girl? Oh, yeah. Yes, I am. It just plain don't make sense, Jack. The only females in Bury You Dead is Dry Gulch Mary, Laurie here, and Nasha. Oh, she swears it wasn't Mary, and now she's dead. What makes you so sure it was a girl? Because she was wearing a long white gown. It flowed out behind her in the breeze. And I know she was young because she was so lithe and free. She moved almost like a dancer. Dancer? Hey, wait a minute. Now she was wearing a long white dress when we found her in the casket. But now she was dead. Or was she? Oh, look here. Hey, hey, you don't suppose we went and... Buried a girl what was still alive, do you? Oh, that's horrible. Nasha was dead. I examined her carefully. I was looking for some kind of a trick from the maestro here. Nasha is dead. I know she's dead. I took particular care to find out. But it's just like Texas here says. If it wasn't the Russian girl, the way Laurie says, then who was it? I say, I guess it would then have to be Dry Gulch Mary. Yeah, but Laurie says it weren't Mary. But it just plain have to be. But it wasn't. Can you picture dried-up Landon and George Mary floating gracefully across the desert with white robes trailing behind her? It was a manifestation. What's that? What's that you say? It was a manifestation. Hey, come again, will you, fat boy? <laughs> I turned that apparition loose upon the desert. One of the small, lovely creatures out of the mystic world beyond. Oh, go lay down, will you? Uh, just a minute now, just a minute. That's a darn good idea, if he can do it. I have done it. I mean, say, any time you're a mind to, you can reach into the empty air and pull out a pretty girl. Crudely put, but that's what it amounts to. Real live girl with flesh on her bones and hair on her head? My dear, unimaginative little man, the girls appearing in my manifestations are perfect in every way. <laughs> You don't say. And you can do all this without the help of a couple of slugs of Mountain Dew? I beg your pardon? A panther sweat, white mule, apple squeezing? <laughs> I do not follow you. <laughs> Maestro, what jumping dick means is, can you pull pretty women out of your sleeve when you're sober, or do you have to have a skin for it? I never touch intoxicating liquors. Well, call me Cecil. Say, Maestro... Now, how about you and me getting together some evening and having a party, huh? <laughs> Father. Oh, sorry, Laurie, sorry. Slip of the tongue. Forgot you was hanging around. Father, uh, you don't believe what this man is saying? No, no. Matter of fact, I don't, but I'm hoping. Oh, yeah. Well, you're hoping in vain, Dick. Now, don't go saying that. Well, you are. My soul's full of wind. A big, noisy wind, that's all. The day will come, Packard. When you will rue those words. Uh, maybe. But, Jack, we still haven't got an explanation about what Laurie's seen. If it wasn't Mary, and Nasha was dead, there are two possible explanations. Either Laura was mistaken in what she saw... You can rule that out. I was not mistaken. Or else there's another woman in Barry you dead we don't know about. Mm, living in a jackrabbit hole, I suppose. Yeah, that sounds pretty silly. Well, at least they're reasonable explanations, which are more than the maestro has to offer. I have had enough of this meaningless prattle... I wish to be left in peace. Oh, he wants to be alone. If you please. Well, go right ahead, fella. I chunder is a whole day. Will you go? Oh, I say, why? I wish to sit here besides Nasha's grave and meditate. Go right ahead. We'll go back to the boarding house. Anyone going our way? Yeah, I reckon me and Laurie will walk spell with you. All right, come on. What a strange... 
strange man. Mm, they were just leaving him here, not keeping a guard on him? No, let him alone. Jack, uh, what was the reason you made us roll that big boulder down on the top of Nash's grave? To make sure it isn't disturbed. What's that? The grave and the dry sand could be tampered with without anyone being the wiser. With that boulder on top of it, Nash will rest easier. But who would want to, to, to open a grave? I don't know. I just wanted to make sure. Well, if you ask me, that was the dead gumdest burying I ever did see. And I certainly agree to that. I don't think I'm going to stay and bury your dead much longer. Oh, Molly, don't say that. I don't belong in this place. I need to be closer to civilization. And you'd be just as happy, too, for me. Oh, no, sir, Dad Burnett. I was born a desert rat, and by crotty, I'm going to die a desert rat. But I'll leave you here. I'm going back to the cabin. You coming, Father? No. I reckon I'll walk with the boys, Pete. You won't? I should walk with you, Laurie? No, thanks. Good evening, Jim. Quaint. Bye. Yeah. You know something, Jumping Dick. What's that? You should ought to be shot, keeping a nice girl like Laurie out here in this hole. Uh, that there is what I come along to talk to you about. Yeah? You had a... Pretty good chance of sizing Laurie up by this time, huh? I reckon. Well, you made up your mind. Done what? Made up your mind. Are you going to marry the girl, or ain't you? Oh, look here. Now, looky, Dick. That ain't no way to talk about that little old girl. Ah, what you mean? Well, Laurie's too good for a pappy to be going around trying to peddle her off. Well, then how else is a man going to get shed of a daughter? Tell me that. Why are you so anxious to get rid of her? You heard it, didn't you? You heard it with your own ears. If I don't get some man to marry her and get her out of here, she's going to yank me out of here. And you don't want to go. And what's more, I ain't going. Now then, if Texas here will uh, work on her a mite... Now, looky, Dick, I'd be... Well, I'd like mighty well do you a favor. I'd like mighty well to, but... Well, I reckon you'll, you'll have to look somewhere else. Oh, I swear to goodness, I don't know what's the matter with young fellas these days. Ain't you got no blood in your veins? Why, well, say, when I was a young buck, I'd have I'd rid a mule 50 miles just to get a look at anything as pretty as Laurie. Sorry, partner. Ain't no use pressing you? Nope. That sure? Final? Reckon so. Well, I sure ain't got no heart to do what I'm a gonna have to do then. Hey, what you mean? Well, if a fella can't get rid of a pretty daughter one way, then... He has to get rid of her in another way. Oh, I say. Jumping Dick, do you mean what we think you mean? That ain't none of you fellas' business. I'll be separating from you here. Dick, you lay a hand on Laurie. Laurie's something I got to take care of. Yeah, something I got to take care of. Jack, do you think... I don't know. Sounds ridiculous. Yes, but we can't take a chance. Hadn't we ought to go warn Laura? Well, we might circle around, go over to their cabin, have a look. Yeah, let's do that. All right. Well, not too fast. You might get the idea we're following him. Of all the crazy old buzzards. Well, we'll take care of him if he tries anything funny. Now, forget him for a minute. This is the first time I've had a chance to talk to you two alone since I finished the search. Uh, for the money belt, you mean? Yes. No luck? Not a bit. Been through every cabin, shack, and lean-to in this place. Without folks knowing him? Yes. When I finished with them, I took each of the 18 residents separately, questioned them, and searched them. Hey, you searched them? I did. Well, how about Laurie and uh, Dry Gulch Mary? Well, I searched Mary... I had to take a gun away from her, but I did it. <laughs> I should like to have seen that. I didn't need to go over Laura. The kind of clothes she wears would have shown the money belt. Then we ain't any closer to finding our $25,000 of reward money than we was. No. Well, I didn't expect to. I just went over the town as a matter of course. Well, what do you mean you didn't expect to find it? Because I've known all along who has it. You do? Hey. Well, well what are we waiting for? Because I don't know where he's hidden. But who are you talking about? Well, the maestro, naturally. The maestro's got our 25 grand? Certainly. Oh, but Jack, we were in the maestro's room with him at the time you were out there being hit over the head. I know it. Well, then how... I don't the... know how. All I know is that the maestro has our money and not a little living soul in bury your dead knows anything about it. Well, I'm a son of a gun. You know that? Positively. Well, and we ain't going to do anything about it? Not just at the moment. There's no way he can get out of bury your dead with it without us knowing about it. Let him think he's pulled the wool over our eyes. Then when we're ready, we'll go for it. Well, you're doing it. But there ain't nothing that I'd like better than to sink my fist into that fat bay window clean up to my elbow. Oh, quiet. Oh, we're getting close to Dick's cabin. Keep down. Yeah. There goes Dick inside me. If we're careful, we can get right up to the window. Mm. Listen. And I gave all three of them something to think about before I left them. 
You told him that you were going to kill me? Well, not just out and out in so many words, but they sure got the idea. But now that the $25,000 has been stolen, what's the good of going on? Maybe it's stolen, and maybe it ain't. What do you mean Jack Packard spread the word around just to throw us off the trail? Yeah. So how he know we was on the trail, I can't figure out. You ain't made no breaks, have you? No. And I think you're wrong. I think the money has been stolen. Packard searched every house and bury your dead. What? He searched this cabin? Yeah. Why, blast his honor. No, never eyes. mind that. If the money is gone... Well, it's still here and bury your dead. Yes, of course. It's here because there ain't no way for it to get out. And if it's here, I can find it. Have you an idea what? You bet I got an idea. That fat man up at the boarding house. With a maestro? He's got it as sure as dogs got fleas. I wonder. You bet he's got it. But he ain't going to have it for long. No, sir. Not with jumping dick around. Jack, did you hear what I did? Come on, let's get out of here quick. I smell murder. Watching the maestro because he's the focal point for everything that's happened since we came to bury your dead. And everything that's going to happen. I say, huh? What's the matter? Look, creeping up through the greasewood over there. Where, Reggie? Creeping toward the maestro's window, just a shadow in the moonlight. Yeah. Yeah, see it, Jack? Yes. Down on all fours. You think it's an animal? No, it's a man. Quiet. I caught the glint of something in his hand. Oh, a gun, huh? I think the maestro's about to receive a visit from Jumping Dick. I say, that's Jumping Dick? That'll be my guess. Well, uh, what we're waiting for? To see what happens. But looky, Jack. If jump, Jumping Dick should up and shoot the maestro... We'll stop him before it goes that far. But if we ain't in time... That'll be the maestro's hard luck. It's good ours, too, Jack. I mean, if the maestro's got our $25,000 hidden away and he's killed, we'll never see it again. Don't forget that Jumping Dick knows that as well as we do. How you mean? Well, if Dick's after the money, he won't dare kill the maestro until he knows where it's hidden. Yeah. What's the matter with us, Reggie? He's right under the window. Man, if the maestro's nervous now... Think what he's going to be in a minute. Watch. He's going to stand up. Yeah. There he goes. Hey, did you see that? The maestro jumped a foot. Come on. Let's creep down where we can hear what they're saying. Yeah, let's do that. Take it easy. Not a sound. And as I was saying, I hope you don't mind if I just stand here in the window and point my pistol at the middle of your barrel. In heaven's name, man, put up that gun. Nope. I feel more comfortable with it in my hand. Is this a hold-up? Yeah, in a way, you might say it was. But I have nothing you could want. Oh, don't think so, huh? But I haven't. I arrived here absolutely destitute. Packard had to pay my room and board. Destitute, huh? Positively. Man, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. Ever hear uh, 25,000 good round United States dollars? $25,000. That's what I said. 25,000 of them. That's... Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, it is, kind of. You think a fellow as smart as Packard would have more sense than to carry that much spondulix around his waist, wouldn't you? Packard was carrying $25,000. Was is right. How did you know? Dry Gulch Mary listens at keyholes, and what Mary knows, the whole town of Bury Your Dead knows. So? Yeah. Now you think I have the money? I know you got it. That is an insult. Well, you having money is an insult? You are branding me a, a, a thief. Well, if you are a thief, what's the hurt of branding you of what? That's ridiculous. I never stole anything in, in my life. Oh, come on, come on. 
Is that $25,000 more important to you than your life? You... You'd kill me. Like I'd kill a fly. Wait. Wait, I've got to think. you got to think? Yes. Yes. Nasha. Nasha. Come quickly. Hey, what the tarnation's that for? Nasha. Oh, what's eating you? That Russian girl's dead and buried. Nasha, come back. Yeah, not now. Look here, you big fat tub of hog fat. If you think you can scare Jumping Dick off with a lot of truck about dead folks are coming back... She's coming. She's coming. The deuce she is. Nasha is coming. Nasha is coming back. There's no use. We can't get any closer than this. But, Jack, we can't hear nothing here. But we're close enough to see everything that goes on. Queer, huh? Maestro standing there with his eyes closed. If Dick's smart, he'll watch out. But Dick's got to drop on him. And the Maestro's cooking up something. Don't forget, he's a smart magician. I say, Dick doesn't seem to be as sure of himself. Yeah. Look at him, wiping his face with his handkerchief. You suppose he's losing his nerve? Dick doesn't. Hold it. What? Look what's coming through the moonlight. I say, hey, it's a girl in a white dress. The girl in the white dress. The girl Dick's daughter saw last night. Hey, maybe it's Laura yourself. No. no she's too small. Doesn't she remind you of someone? But she's too far away. That lithe movement, floating rhythm. That's a dancer. Jack. Not Nasha. Isn't that who she reminds you of? But that's crazy. We help bury Nasha ourselves at five o'clock this afternoon. You don't have to tell me that. And you said yourself she was dead. I know it. And I still say that looks like Nasha. And you're the fella that don't believe in ghosts. Watch it. She's coming up behind Dick at the window. Hey, hadn't we ought to warn him? Now keep still. Just watch. But if a doggone phantom was creeping up behind look, me... Look, look. She's standing right behind him, with her arm raised. Jack, did you see that? Dick went down like he'd been struck by lightning. All she done was lower her arm, and he just crumbled up. Look. Look at her go. Just a floating away in the moonlight. But Jack, shouldn't we go after her? Do you think you could catch that out there in the desert at night? Yeah. That's one thing I ain't going to do. Chase ghosts. Oh, come on. Let's go down. Yeah. Look at the maestro... Leaning out the window, looking down at Dick's body. Keep quiet until we get right up to the window. Well, Maestro. Uh, well, what's that? That was the best performance you've given us yet. Oh, you saw. You were watching. Yes. Then you witnessed the return of Nasha. Is, uh, is that what we saw? You saw the resurrection of Nasha... From the grave. You can say the doggondest things that ever come out of a man's mouth. Yeah, give me a flashlight, Doc. Let's have a look at Dick. Yeah. But where did she go? And uh, why did she run away? Run? The spirit of man has no need for legs. You still haven't said where she went. Back to the grave from when she came. Will you stop talking like that? Back to the grave. Here, Doc. Give me a hand. Is he dead? No, but he has a good-sized goose egg on his head. Goose egg? Yes, he was clubbed over the head. But, Jack, we didn't see any club in her hand. She just raised her arm and lowered it. We saw her arm because it was white. The club was probably a piece of dark wood that wouldn't show. Yes, but if she needed a club... Exactly. If she needed a club, she wasn't a phantom. You're a stiff-necked man, Packer. Maybe. But that wasn't any ghost that hit Dick over the head. It was a flesh-and-blood girl. But, Jack, there ain't no flesh-and-blood girls in Barry You're Dead, except in Laurie. And you said yourself it wasn't her... Besides, Laurie wouldn't sneak up behind her own father and bop him on the cranium. No, it wasn't Laura. Then who the heck was it? I don't know. It was the spirit of Nasha. She came back to protect me. Protect you from what? From that man who threatened me with, with a gun. Why did he threaten you? He said it was a holdup. Jumping Dick was holding you up? So he said. But uh, what did he want? I, I told him I was destitute, but he... He refused to believe me. Mm -hmm. I see. He said he would kill me as quickly as he'd kill a fly. I was in desperate circumstances, so I called on Nasha, and she came. Well, somebody sure enough came all right. Jack, I don't like what's going on. I wish we could... Is it happened? Is it Laura? Hey. Oh, somebody, somebody, please. That's Laura. Here. Here we are. Oh, wait for me, wait for me. 
Frightened? Yeah. Here, do you see us? Yes, yes. Oh, the most terrible thing I just saw, the most terrible thing. Catch her, catch her, Reggie. Uh, right. No, no, I'm all right. I'm just so frightened. Yeah. Yeah, just let her sit down. Uh, what's that on the ground? Your, uh, your father. Oh, no. Oh, he's all right. Just a bump on the head. Are you sure? Sure. Now, what's the matter? What scared you? Oh, you, you won't believe me. Tell us and see. I, I was coming up the trail from Hawk Cabin to the boarding house. I came face to face with Nasha. Hey, you saw her? Yes. yes. She was the girl in the white flowing robes. The girl I saw last night. How close were you? So close I could have reached out and touched it. You saw her face? Yes. Yes, it was Nasha. Now, will you believe me? Huh? What'd you say? It was someone in a white dress that hit your father over the head. Huh? The maestro's been trying to tell us it was Nasha. Yes, yes, I saw her. Well, what happened after you saw her? She, she just vanished off into the moonlight. I was so frightened, I thought I'd lost my sense. Joe, Jack, there, there's no answer to that. The ways of the mystic are beyond comprehension. Jack, when you reckon the next freight train will be coming through? Don't be a fool, Dad. Well, I'm a fool, because... I don't want to go mucking around the dead folks. You're a fool because you believe there are any dead folks. Well, all right, then. But go on and explain things to me. I can't. And yeah, neither can I. There are nobody else except the maestro here. Now you are talking reason. Dead people don't rise from the grave. But we've seen her and Laurie's seen her. Dead people don't rise from the grave. You can prove that, Packard? I can. And I'm going to. I would give much to be present when you do it. How and when I do, it'll be none of your affair. Come on, let's get out of here. Are we going to just leave Jump and Dick lay in there? His daughter and the maestro are with him, aren't they? As I say, a bit inhuman, what? We've got other things to do. Come on. I don't. Well, what we got to do that's all fired important? Prove the girl who struck down Dick wasn't Nash. Yeah, but how? Reggie, you know where those shovels are? Hmm? I say, uh, shovels? Yes. We're going to open Nash's grave and prove. Prove what? I don't know. What do grave robbers prove? All right. Put the shovels down. The first thing we've got to do is get that ton of stone off the top of the grave. Well, fella, don't that hunk of rock right on top of the grave just about prove Nash ain't been tampered with? Yes, quite. It hasn't been moved, Jack, so the grave hasn't been opened. And if the grave hasn't been opened, Nash is still in there. I thought you were the boys who believed we saw Nash hit jumping Dick over the head. Well, not any flesh and blood, Nash, Jack. Look, Doc, if Dick was clubbed by any Nash, it was a flesh and blood Nash. Then you think it is some other girl floating around in a white dress and not Nash at all? That's the most logical answer. Well, let's find out. Come on, get hold of this rock. But, Jack, if you think it was another girl, why are you so anxious to open Nasha's grave? Yeah, answer that, fella. I want to make sure. Well, darned if I don't think opening graves is a pretty serious business just to satisfy your curiosity. Are you fellas going to give me a hand with this rock? Mm, quiet. Well, how about it, Doc? Well, okay. But I'd sure put up a holler if anybody went to monkeying around my grave once I got myself buried. All right, all right. I'll grab hold. If we take it together, we can roll it right down off the door. All right, let's try it. Ready, Doc? I reckon. All right, then. Let's go. <laughs> Up with it. More. More. Keep her coming, Reggie. Yeah, she's moving. Look out, Jack. It's rolling your way. Let it roll. A uh, little more. Now. There. Oh. There she goes. Hold it, Reggie. That's plenty. That's quiet. Ooh, wee. Man, that's worse. I say yes. Nobody but three guys with strong backs and weak brains would have tackled it in the first place. Oh, you admit it, huh? Oh, you mean the lame brain part? Well, it ain't so lame that I'm going to move that rock back on the grave again after we get through here. We'll take care of that when we come to it. Now then, the shovels. A nice moonlight night for grave opening. Yes, we got several things to be thankful for. Such as what? Well, fairly good light. Sand will be easy to move. The coffin isn't buried very deep. Say, we've got company. The wolves are out. Yeah. Look you over yonder in that ridge. That old he wolf brindle. Well, let him watch if he wants to. No one else knows we're out here. You sure about that? I watched pretty careful. No one followed us out, and certainly no one knew we were coming. Yeah, give me one of those shovels, Reggie. Quite. I'll take the other. Oh, no, no, not at all. You could be relieved, man, Doc. I'll start here, Jack. Let's go. No, this is no job at all. I think the top of the casket's only about three feet down. Some pretty doggone shallow burying. I noticed it at the time. 
Go on, fella. Holler your head off. This here reminds me of a story my grandma on my mama's side used to tell down in Texas. About a woman that she knowed when she was a little girl. The meanest woman that ever sucked on a corncob pipe. She would snuff, too. But, man, she was the original hard-hearted Hannah. Mean. She put five husbands in their graves before she was 40. Well, anyway, according to my grandma, she upped and died when, when my grandma was still a little girl. They give her a decent burying because there wasn't nothing else to do with it. And then everybody sort of breathed a sigh of relief on account that she is safe underground. Uh, you want I should relieve you, Jack? No, no, go on with your story. Yeah, well, years went by, and my grandma growed up into a woman. Then things changed a lot. Decided to run a state highway or something right plumb through the old graveyard. Well, that being the case, naturally all the buried folk had to be moved. And one of them was this cantankerous old woman. Well, sir, you know what they found when they opened their grave? There was nothing left of her in the box but one thing. No bones, no clothes, nothing but just one thing. And you know what that was? What did I say? What? Her heart. And it had turned to stone. No. I swear to my grandma, it had pure stone. You talk about your hard-hearted woman. Hold up for a minute, Reggie. Hmm. Well, how's it coming? I'm making good progress. Well, let me take over. No, 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 not at all. I haven't even raised a sweat. Well, how about you, Jack? If you insist. Okay. <laughs> Let's go. Well, hey, you're getting right down to it. Come on, Reggie. <laughs> right on. Well, yeah, there's one thing. I'll never think of bury your dead without picturing that old wolf over on the ridge against the moon. Uh oh, bury your dead's gonna mean something a lot more important than that to me. If we don't get our 25,000 potatoes back. We don't leave this place without it, I can promise you that. Well, if you want my opinion, we should ought to be a looking for it instead of messing around Nash's grave. Who knows? Maybe we'll find the money buried here with Nasher. Hey. I say, you mean that? Why not? The money disappeared about the time Nasher died. How easy for the maestro to have planted the money belt on the girl's body, bury it with the idea of returning when the excitement had died down, and dig it up again. Well, now that gives me something to dig for. Get it going, Reggie. Right, oh. Dog gone. Why didn't you tell us that in the first place? Of course, it's only a theory. Well, that's a fairly good one, too. Hey, let's cut out the talking and just dig. Yeah, it suits me. Uh, 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 uh. Hey, say, hey, I've hit something. Yeah, yeah, so have I. Good work. Doc, climb up out of the hole, huh? I can get the rest of it better alone. Yeah. About all you got to do is just scrape what's left to sand off the top. That's yeah, quite. You know, I think I can scrape better the rest off with my hands. All right. Well, come on, Doc. Yeah. That's ah. getting it. I'm going to clean it off around the edges. We don't want sand pouring down into the coffin when we lift them. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I wish they hadn't nailed a top down. What'd you do with that hammer, Jack? Over there where my coat's lying. Okay, I'll get it. Oh, bring the flashlight, too. Yeah, all right. Yeah, that's good enough, I think, Reggie. <sighs> I say. You know, Jack, don't you feel a bit ghoulish? It isn't the pleasantest task in the world. No, I mean, a bit indecent exposing her to human eyes again. She's finished with this world, and she deserves to be left in peace. Oh, very nice. But we want our $25,000. Mm, it's quiet. Well, here you are, Jack. Okay. Hold the light while I see if I can get the claw of this hammer over the head of some of these nails. Yes, if I remember, there are only four. One in each corner. Mm -hmm. There. Well, that's one of them. Yeah, this one's easier. We get this one, I think we can just pull up the lid. Well, go ahead and get it. Well, now we are getting somewhere. Can you get your fingers under the lid now, Reggie? I think so. There, yeah, quite. I got it. Well, Nasher, sorry to have to do this, but here goes. Hold the flash, Doc. Pull up, Reggie. Right over. There. Hey. Hey, look. Well, I'll be... She's gone. She isn't here. Hey, what's going on here anyway? Here, let me have that flashlight. But I say, it's impossible, Jack. No one could possibly have got her out without moving that big rock we put on top of the grave. And no... And nobody moved the rock. We know that. And there's... Th 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 then there's only one thing that could have happened. Well, same being what? The coffin was buried without Nasha in it. That isn't true, Reggie. Just before the coffin was nailed shut and lowered into the grave, the lid was lifted and we all saw her. You darn told me, did you? But it's so absolutely impossible. It couldn't have happened. The coffin nailed shut under three feet of sand with a huge rock weighing at least a ton on top of the grave. Well, it did happen. Feller, if you want to ask me... The maestro's got some powerful magic to working on his side. The maestro's just too smart for us. And we still ain't got our 25,000 back. 
What you keep looking in that casket for with a flashlight? You don't expect to find Nasha down one of them cracks, do you? I don't know what I expect to find. But there's one thing. There is. Now we know that Nasha's still alive. And that it was she who hit Jumping Dick over the head. You think Laurie really did see Nasha face to face, see? I know it. But, Jack, you examined Nasha before she was buried. You swore up and down she was dead. I know. That's what makes me so mad. I'd let the maestro get away with that right under my nose. What you mean, fella? Look, it's a medical fact that a person can be hypnotized into a semblance of death. Suspended animation, no respiration, no pulse. To all appearance, lifeless. And I let that maestro get away with it. Well, she sure looked dead to me. Well, at least we've exposed his trick before it's too late. Exposed his trick, huh? That's what I said, exposed his trick. Well, maybe you have, but I ain't. Well, I couldn't explain how Nasha got out of that nailed-up coffin if I was to swing for it. It's another one of his tricks. I don't know how he did it, but you can bet there's an answer, and it hasn't got anything to do with mysticism. That's crying. And what do we do now? We go back and face the maestro with what we do know. Put it up to him to return our money or take the consequences. Now, you're a talking fella. And if he doesn't talk fast enough to suit Jack. us... Jack. Jack, look out there in the moonlight. It's a woman. She's coming this way. Crouch down. I say, it's Jumping Dick's daughter, Laura. Well, what the heck's she doing out here? Hold it. She's coming up to the grave. Oh! Oh, the grave. Now she's grave's been opened. So what? Oh, no! Who are you? Jack Packard. Oh, but the grave is... Don't worry. There's nothing in it. There's nothing in it? That's what I said. What are you doing out here? I, I've been looking for you. For me? Why? Something's happened at the boarding house. The maestro's disappeared. Disappeared? Well, that's ridiculous. There's no place for him to go. I don't know. I just know he's gone. The freight train stopped up at the siding about an hour ago. What's that? Did you say a freight train? Yes, I think it's picking up the boxcar. You came. Doc Reggie, did you hear that? There's a freight train up on the siding. Has it gone yet? No, but... Doc Reggie, come on. Hey, fella, what's eating you? Freight train, you fool. The maestro's disappeared. Come on. Come on, we gotta catch that freight train. Standing on the siding. I see the headlights. If we missed that freight train, we're all washed up. Well, it ain't got away from us yet. Yeah, we still got a piece to go. But, Jack, I don't understand. Why is this fleet so important? Because our $25,000 is on that freight train. Oh, I say. Hey, how'd it get on there? Well, didn't you hear Laura say the maestro disappeared? Where do you suppose he went? You mean the maestro's pulling out a bury you dead on that freight train? You bet he's pulling out. Hey, let's step on it. Who oh, the train whistle. Does that mean... Come on, come on. I can hear her. Stop talking. Maybe we can get over the tracks ahead of her. Oh, bless the bloody dog. I keep stumbling. If that fat magician gets away with our money... Save your breath. Run like you never ran before. It's going pretty fast. Can we make it? We've got to make it. Take the first empty boxcar. Hey, hey, here's one coming up. Okay, grab it. Reggie, you go first. Right on. Here I go. Get in, Jack. Get in. Hurry up, fella. Yeah. Give me a hand, Reggie. I got you. <laughs> Come on, Doc. Give me a hand. Faster, Doc. Run faster. I got him. Jack, Jack. Grab hold of his collar. He's losing his footing. Hold him. Hang on to him. There. There. All right, now pull him up. Uh, up. He could. <laughs> Yeah, there he is. Oh, I say, Doc, are you all right? Am I all right? I'm bruised and battered. The desert come up and whammed me three times before you fellas got me pulled in. You, you're lucky you didn't go under the wheels. I, I was so close once, a, a wheel throwed grease in my face. Oh, Joe, that's bad business. Well, we're here, and and, and that's all that counts. Oh. Oh, I say, we certainly pulled out a barrier dead in a hurry. So it's with... me. I just about had a stomach full of that place. Oh, say... You know something? What's uh, that? This is the same freight car we arrived in. Oh, I say, it is. Huh? Yes. Turn on your flash, Reggie. Oh, quiet. Yeah, look here. This is the same packing box the maestro used to sit on. Well, I'll be doggone. The freight train must have stopped to pick up this car. Oh, I say, that's why they were here so long. Fixing the wheel that was frozen. Probably. Save the flashlight, Reggie. We may right. need it later. Right. Jack, I, I just been thinking. What's the matter now? Well, supposing the maestro ain't on this freight train after all. He's got to be. But supposing he ain't. Then what are we going to do? If he's not on this freight, I'll eat it. Well, that ain't saying what we'll do if he ain't. Well, the only thing is to catch the next freight back to bury your dead. But I know he's on it. Well, what makes you so sure, Jack? Well, he disappeared from the boarding house. He's so fat and heavy, he can't get around in the sand. There's no place for him to go. 
Besides, what would you do if you were stuck in a place like Barry or Dead with 25 grand that didn't belong to you? You'd try to slip away the first opportunity you got. Yeah, and he thought he could get away on this freight alone while we was out there in the desert digging up Nash's coffee. Certainly. Well, it sure makes sense, all right. Uh, mind if I join the conversation? Hey, who said that? Just me. Well, who are you? What are you doing in this boxcar? Well, goodness, ain't I got as much right in here as anybody? Turn the flash on him, Reggie. Quiet. Hey, hey, what are you trying to do? Blind the fellow to take that light out of my eyes? Looks like a bindle stick. Okay, Reggie, turn off the light. I am a knight of the open road. <laughs> yeah? My name is Swenson Swenson. Well, how do you do, Swenson Swenson? I'm Jack Packard. Jack Packard, eh? Yes. These two men with me are Doc Long and Reggie York. Ain't got a can of beans on you, I don't guess. Right not. We, uh, we came away in a hurry. Yeah, I kind of noticed that. Didn't I hear you say there was a fat man on this freight with $25,000? Oh, you heard that, huh? Well, that's what it sounded like. Jack. Yeah? If we was to throw this sweet out of this boxcar, who would know the difference? My goodness, why you want to do that? Then there wouldn't be anybody on this freight that knew about that money but just us. Good gracious, but you are an impulsive feller. How about it, Jack? No, 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 wait a minute. You got me all wrong. I'm just Swenson, Swenson, knight of the open road. Yeah? Yeah, sure. Sakes alive, what would a dirty old bum like me want with $25,000? What about it, Jack? Besides, uh... What $25,000? I never heard a word about it. Goodness gracious, I'm so deaf in both ears, I couldn't hear what you said if you was to shoot a cannon off in my ear. <laughs> you made a big mistake mentioning that money, Swenson. Yeah, please, mister. I'm just a poor old sweet trying to get along. Hey, just forget I ever said anything, and I'll forget it, too. Well, I don't know. What were you doing in this particular car, anyway? Uh, just riding. Where are you from? I jumped this freight at Needles. Then how did you get in this car? Didn't I just say I come from Needles? Yes, but this car didn't come from Needles. It didn't? You know as well as I do. This car's been parked out on that siding at Barrier Dead for almost a week. Yeah, sure. I know that. Well? Well, it's like this. The car I was riding in up front, well, there's three other fellas in it, see? And what's that got to do with it? Well, they are putting on a party. They got a dozen containers of canned heat. They are drinking canned heat? Yeah, canned heat and we chase. Oh, look here. Yeah, sure, they are. Well, they was getting pretty rough and noisy, so when the freight stopped, I slipped out and climbed into this car. I see. Well, so what's the matter with that? Nothing. Just the same. I think we'd better search you. Search me? Yes. Oh, now, wait a minute. Suppose... I could be a help to you, boys. In what way? Suppose I could tell you where to find the fat man. The maestro? Is that his name? You know where he is? You bet you my life I do. Where? Is it a bet? If I tell you where to find the fat boy, do you lay off of me? And you'll forget you ever heard about that money? Oh, what do I want with money? Goodness gracious, if I had money, then I couldn't ride freight trains no more. It's a deal. Where's the maestro? Back there. Back where? In the end of the car... Him and the girl. Hey, you mean the maestro and Nasha are in this car? All you have got to do is go back and see for yourself. Well, I've all the doggone luck. Come on, let's go back. Reggie. Yes? Stay here with Swenson. Watch him. Right home. Yeah, give me the flashlight. Come on, Doc. Well, and ain't he going to be glad to see us? If that Swede's lying, I'll turn on the flash, Jack. Who is that? Nasha. Nasha, are you alive, honey? You are Doc Long? Of course I'm Doc Long. Where's the maestro? There he is, lying down. The maestro is asleep. Or pretending to be asleep. Let's see what a kick in the pants will do. Oh, 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 what, what's that? You dare kick the maestro. Here, here, what is this? Maestro, this Jack Packard kick you. Jack Packard? Yes. Shall I stick a knife in him? Jack Packard, what are you doing here? I was about to ask you the same question. I couldn't stomach bury your dead another minute. When the freight stopped, I decided to leave. Well, you were the only thing in Barry you're dead that interested us, so when you left, we came along, too. And you kicked me. That's right. Insult on insult. Shall I stick a knife into him, maestro? I will do worse than that. <laughs> Such as turning me into a wolf, I suppose. I have performed wonders, and you still do not believe. That's right. I have turned Nasha into a wolf. I've turned a wolf into a man. Nasha died and was buried, and I brought her back from the grave. Was you sure not dead, sugar? I was dead. And you do not call me sugar. There's just one thing you haven't mentioned, Maestro. What is that? The most important thing of all. You made our $25,000 disappear. You talk riddles. Oh, no, I don't. 
You made it disappear, and now you're going to perform an even greater miracle and make it return. Uh, haven't your money? I think you have. Money means nothing to me. Man who can perform marvels beyond the ken of man. You're going to return that twenty-five thousand, or you're going to be about two hundred and fifty pounds lighter when we arrive at our next stop. Threats, threats. What do they mean to me? Jack ain't kidding, Maestro. We're going to have them potatoes back if we have to take you apart limb by limb until we find them. Your game's up. Now give us that money belt. Fools! Stand up. You take your hands off to Maestro. Stand up. Take your hands off me. I I will get to my feet. And hurry up about it. I spit on you. Doc, keep your eye on Nasha. I'll take care of the Maestro. You hear that, sweetheart? Dog. Pig swipe! <laughs> Ain't you just full of words? Come on, come on, get to your feet. It, it, it is difficult. A man of my weight must move slowly. Well, keep uh, moving. Uh, I will help you, uh, Maestro. Keep away from me, Nasha. Yeah, come on uh, back over here. You do not touch me. No. I will stick a knife in you. You will, sure now? Uh, there, I am standing. Now then, I'm going to give you one more chance. Will you return that money? Money, the root of all evil. That's your answer? That is my answer. All right. Put your hands over your head. What's that? I said put your hands over your head. No, you do not, Maestro. You do not. Then why should I put my arms over my head? Don't argue. Do it. But I know on good authority that you're not armed. No, I'm not armed. But I am. Hey, Jack. I am armed with a gun and I shoot well. Well, what you know about that? Put up that gun, you fool. Don't order me around, Packard. I am master of this situation. So you want to add another murder to your list? No. No, I don't want to. But I don't mind. Hey, you admit you're a killer. Why not? You'll never live to tell it. Up next is episode 15 of Bury Your Dead, Arizona, the t radio series I Love a Mystery. Again, this is I Love a Mystery. It's actually episode 89 of I Love a Mystery, but episode 15 of Bury Your Dead, Arizona, which will start any moment now. Spank me for a baby. Gunplay. Keep those hands up. I got him up, fella. Nasha? Yes, maestro. Take that flashlight out of Jack Packard's hand. Yes. Give it here. Uh, don't move. Either of you. Nice piece of work, maestro. But what do you think it's going to get you? You do not worry. The maestro knows what he is doing. Nasha. Yes, maestro. Stand behind me with that flash. Hold it so that we're all in the light. Yes, maestro. Good. Now then, where's your partner? Reggie? Oh, he's down yonder in the doorway of the car. Doc, you fool. Uh, but, but Jack... Oh, never mind. Very well. We will go down to the doorway. Keep your hands up. March. I will follow, Maestro. We'll follow close. Keep everyone in the light. Yes, Maestro. Jack, is there anything the matter? That's a silly question, Reggie boy. What made you think that? But the mice... The maestro has a gun on you. No. York, put up your hands. I say... Put them up. What, what about it, Jack? Better do as he says. Oh. I do, but what's it all about? Jack uh, asked the maestro for our 25,000 simoleons back, and this here's his answer. I see. Hey, Reggie, where'd that fella go? Doc, what's the matter with you? Well, nothing. All I was going to say Nobody's was... Nobody's interested in what you're going to say. Just shut up. I'm very interested in what he was going to say. Is there another man in this car? Yeah, sure, there's another fella. It's me, and I wish it weren't. Who are you? Yes, Svensson, Svensson. Look at him, maestro. He is bindle stiff. What are you doing in this car? Well, you don't think I like it any better than you do, do Thank you? Thank you, Carol Taz, You're for the You're going follow. to like it a whole it. lot less before many minutes. Keep over there in the light where I'm keeping an eye on you. You sure? You never seen such an agreeable fellow like I am. Packard? Well? Go over in the doorway and stand facing out. What's that for? Going to clear this freight car. There are too many people in here. Hey, you're crazy. Go to that door, Packard. If you think I'm going to jump out of that door going at this speed... You don't have to jump. I'll help you out. With a slug of lead between the shoulder blades. Oh, look here, maestro. What's the matter with you? Well, that's a bit bloody, isn't it? Packard, do as I say. I'll give you to the count of three. And if I don't move? I'll shoot you where you stand. One... Two. Oh, Jack! Oh, Jack! I'm not shot. I'm not shot. It's the maestro. The maestro! The maestro! Oh, sir, turn off that light! Go, Nasha! Go! 
Wait a minute, wait a minute. I got the flashlight. Oh, hurry up, turn it on. Yeah, yeah, it is. Doc, Doc, fine, Nash. Reggie, help me with the maestro. Yeah, you bet. Oh, I say, look at the maestro's hand, mangled. Here, rip off his shirt. Make me some bandages. Right, oh. Yeah, but who did it? Who shot the maestro? I guess I'm the fellow. Had to shoot the gun out of his hand. Good work, Swenson. Uh, give me a piece of that cloth. Here you are. Hold that flashlight down closer. Yeah, it looks like I shot off one of his fingers. Looks like you did, all right. <laughs> oh, stop groaning, you're not dead. Jack, Jack, now she's not in this box car. What's that? No, she ain't. I, I, I look good. Hey, you mean that Russian girl jumped out? She must have. Oh, but look here. Supposing she had that $25,000 on her. Then I would say your twenty-five grand was laying back along the tracks on the body of a dead girl. Well, darn it, why don't somebody stop the train? How are you going to stop a freight train? Well, what about it, Jack? There, that'll take care of you, Maestro. Oh. At least we can get you to a hospital. But, Jack, our $25,000. I think our money's safe enough. Hey, what do you mean? Have you forgotten Nasha disappeared from this boxcar once before and came back safe? I see. Hey, that's right. Besides, we don't know that Nasha had the money. Search the Maestro. You bet we'll search you, Maestro. Here, you roll over. Man, don't he suffer good. Uh, hold that flashlight, Reggie. Right, oh. He's got so much fat on his bones. Nope. Nothing on this side. Roll him over. Oh, oh, oh I'm tired. Listen at him. Over. He goes. Anything at all? Uh, limp as a baby. Hey, Jack. There ain't nothing at all on this car. All right, let him sit up. Come on, you. Up with you. Um, will I... Will I bleed to death? Sorry to report, there isn't a chance of you bleeding to death. Who shot me? I did. You did? You're only a tramp. No, I ain't no tramp. You're not? Then what are you? Just a railroad dick. Policeman? For the railroad. What's the idea? What are you doing here? Looking for this fat man. You was? Well, what for? Murder. What nonsense is this? That's right, mister. But why is the railroad interested in the maestro for murder? We found a dead man on the railroad right of way near the California line. Did the man have a knife in his heart? You sure? How did you know? Didn't I tell you? I knew there was a dead man in this car. I touched the knife in his heart in the dark. What's that? Certainly I did. He tried to make us believe it was one of his manifestations. He let me touch it, then he shoved it out of the car. But look, fella, how come you linked the dead body up with the maestro? The body was identified... The man was last seen in the company of this fellow. Well, it kind of puts you on a spot, Maestro. I, I'm tired. I've tried and I have failed. Then you admit the murder? Yes. Why did you kill him? I wanted Packard's $25,000 for myself. How did you know I was carrying that money? You remember back in the freight yards in Los Angeles. You three were waiting for a freight to pull out hiding in a boxcar. Yes? Well, we were waiting, too. This man I killed and Nasha and I were outside your boxcar in the fog. We overheard you talking about the money. So that was it. We heard you say you were going to catch the next freight out. So we went down and got into an empty boxcar. Never hoped for you to get into the same boxcar with us. We only expected to be on the same train. Follow you to... To your next destination. And we played right into your hands by getting in the same car. When did you kill this other fellow? While we were waiting for the freight to pull out. I killed him in one box car, and then, because there was so much blood, I carried him to another car. This one we're in now. As long as you're talking, tell us a few more things. We heard a man scream before I felt the body with a knife in it. I did that. I screamed. Yeah? And how about turning Nasha into an animal? Simple magic. Nasha is completely in my power mentally. When I placed her in a trance, she will do anything I want her to do. By thought transference, I do not need to speak. Just think, and she does what I think. That's really true? Yes. With those horrible glaring eyes in the dark and the snarling. The eyes were luminous paint which I daubed on her forehead. Well, son of a gun. The snarling I did myself. Like this. <laughs> Jove, exactly the same. Yes, I did that myself. And how about all that wolf business of burying a dead? Circumstances fitted right into my plans. The wolves were killing people out there in the desert, so I I pretended that I was causing it. Are you saying you actually didn't kill Alki Joe in Chinese tongue? I did not. The wolves did that. 
I put Nasha into a trance and made her jump through that window and pretend to go out and call the wolves. Mrs. What about the wolf you turned into a man? The chappy with long hair on his face who brought the body of Nasha to the window. Uh, the people of Bury Your Dead are simple folk. I found a man among them whom I could bring under the influence of my mind. I hypnotized him, covered his face with crepe hair, and had him carry Nasha in. You certainly went to a lot of trouble on our account. Yes, I was using all the magic I knew to, to confuse you, so that when I got hold of the $25,000, you would not know where to start looking for it. You didn't fool me for a minute. I know. You're a stubborn man, Packer. Yes, but Nasha, you fooled Jack over her. Even he said Nasha was dead when the chappy with hair on his face brought her in. Yes, Nasha is so completely in my power, I can hypnotize her so that she is the same as dead. A suspended animation. No breathing, no pulse. Her body takes on a death-like white marble hue. Then we sure enough buried Nasha while she is still alive? Yes. Yes, but how did she get out of the coffin? It was still nailed shut when we dug it up. I made the coffin myself. If you had examined it carefully, you would have found hidden hinges in one end. When I sent a mental thought to Nasha, she came alive. She opened the end of the casket and dug her way through the sand to the surface. Holy jumping cow, you mean that Russian girl opened the coffin and come out alive? Yes, it has been done before. Houdini mystified the world for years with that trick. Well, what do you know? But why did you go to all that trouble? Why did you bury her? With her, I buried the $25,000. I wanted the money out of the way when you searched for it. Yes, but who hit Jack over the head out on the desert and took the money away from him? The man with the hair on his face whom I had hypnotized. Under my influence, he attacked Packard and then brought the money to me. Well, I reckon that just about explains everything. No, there's two more things. Jumping Dick and Laura, for one thing. I can explain them. That foul woman, Dry Gulch Mary, heard Doc Long mention the money you were carrying. She told Jumping Dick and he and that woman, Laura, decided to get it. You mean his daughter? She wasn't his daughter. Just an adventurer stranded out there in the desert. You know that? I do. Well, how's that for pulling the wool over my eyes? <laughs> Quiet. Well, that explains those two. Now the most important. Maestro, how did Nasha disappear from this boxcar and then return? Turn your flashlight on the door of the car. You mean you're going to bring her back now? I might as well. Game's up. All right. Go ahead. Nasha. Nasha, come back. Hey. Hey, look. Here she comes. Floating back through the door of the car. Here. What's going on? That ain't natural. Nasha, come here. Yes, maestro. Take off that money belt. Yes, maestro. There it is. There it is. Yes. Now give it to Packard. Yes, maestro. Thanks. Hey, but that still don't explain how she got in and out of the car. Nasha is an acrobatic dancer. She simply took hold of the top of the door and swung her body up onto the roof of the car. She's been up on the roof of the car? Yes. It would be impossible for anyone less lithe and supple... Even she couldn't do it, except under my hypnotic influence. Maestro, I want to hand it to you. You're a clever man. Clever enough to escape this murder charge? That I don't know. No. I don't think even the maestro is that clever. Next episode of I Love a Mystery is episode number 96 and the first episode of the series The Million Dollar Curse, which should begin momentarily. Thank you for joining us today, night, morning, wherever you are. Thank you, Carol Taz, for the follow. Come on, let's go again. I mean, game listening. Let's go, uh, video program. Get in gear here. Let's go. The mutual broadcast.
Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery, transcribed. That's all you're doing. Just asking. Yeah, that's all I'm a doing. Just asking. When you found out we couldn't get delivery on that plane for two weeks, why'd you go ahead and order it? Because we want an airplane. But there's other airplane factories. Why didn't you tell them to go jump in the lake? Because this is the kind of plane we want. Well, just the same. It looks oh, to me like... Oh, forget it, will you, Doc? We've been over this once. We've been over it a dozen times. Well, I still would like to know what we're going to do in San Diego for two whole weeks. Sit here and like it. Besides, supposing we had the plane. We haven't got any plans. What would we do with it? Well, I could think of something, I bet you. Such as what? Well, how about flying to the Hawaiian Islands? And what would we do after we got to Hawaii? Well, I, I hear they got some mighty good-looking hula girls in Hawaii. Oh, nuts. Well, okay, then. Uh, how about a non-stop flight from here to Singapore? Yeah, or Timbuktu. You don't like that either, huh? No, I don't like that either, huh? Well, we ain't been to Central America for quite a spell. Well, now, that's some better. <laughs> you you kind of like that, huh? I don't know. What will we do when we get there? Well, how do we know? There's always something interesting to do in them countries down there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. I'll say it ain't. There's a lot of hot stuff down yonder besides food. And I don't mean the weather. I wonder what Reggie'd say to Central America. Oh, what the heck? Reggie don't care. If me and you say Central America, then, then Reggie says Central America. We'll, uh, we'll have to steer clear of Guatemala. Oh, they probably forgot us by this time. Oh, don't you think they have? And there's one thing I don't want to do, spend the rest of my life in a Central American jail. Boy, boy, do they have filthy hooskows down there. Then it's uh, Central America, sure enough? Yeah, let's sleep on it. You know, it sounds good. And here we got to wait two weeks before we can get started. Now, Doc, don't start that again. Hey, where'd Reggie go anyway? <laughs> he said he's going over and sit in the lobby of one of them big hotels and look at the pretty women. Reggie said that? Well, well, I said it and he didn't deny it. Uh, not Reggie. No, I reckon he's over at the airplane plant, keeping an eye on our ship. Now, that's more like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. he was saying this morning he's going to see that every bolt and wire that went into our plane is going to be right. Well, he's the boy who can tell. I'll bet he's about as popular as a mad dog over there. <laughs> he won't let that worry. What's the idea? Who are you calling now? Same place. Hello? Uh, g give me room service. Hey, you're not going to eat again. Well, what else is there to do? But this is the fourth time. Hello? Room service? Well, looky. Send up half a dozen fried ham and egg sandwiches. Yeah, yeah, half a dozen. And a quarter milk. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, that's all. Wait a minute, you want any, Jack? No, I don't want any. Okay, that's all. And, and don't take all day. Don't you realize at 6 o'clock we'll get down to dinner as soon as Reggie gets here? Well, what the heck? Six sandwiches ain't gonna hurt anybody's appetite. Well, not yours, anyway. Hey, Jack. No? You done any thinking about Maestro or Nasha lately? No. What? Oh, I don't know. I keep feeling kind of bad. The Maestro went and got himself sent up for life. He was lucky not to get the gas chamber. Yeah, I suppose so. But I keep seeing his big, fat carcasses sitting on a stone bench in one of them little old cells. He wasn't made for that sort of thing. Pretty tough, all right. It's sure swell of you to get nice of that job. Oh, why not? She'd have starved to death without the maestro if somebody hadn't done something for her. Yeah. She sure did depend on him a lot. Dancing in a nightclub up in Hollywood isn't much of a job. Well, just the same, the crowd sure go for her. Well, it's a meal ticket anyway. She's as good as they seem to think she is. Maybe she'll get something better. That poor old maestro. I wonder if he'll try any of his magic tricks up in the big house. Well, open the door. Come on in. Hey, Ted, the door's locked. 
Oh, hey, Jack, open the door for the waiter, will you? Certainly not. They're your sandwiches. Well, of all the two-tailed sippy cans. Hey, hey, you're going to open this door, ain't you? Well, ain't you got a key? No, I ain't got no key. Okay, I'll get up. Just plain accommodating, ain't you? Well, they're not my sandwiches. Well, don't ask for one, either. <laughs> don't worry. Hey, hey, this guy's an out. I'm a-coming. Keep your britches on. Oh, thanks, pal. Well, hey, where's the sandwiches? I said, where's the sandwiches? What sandwiches? Well, ain't you the waiter? No, I ain't the waiter. Oh, you ain't, huh? That's right, buddy, I ain't the waiter. You don't say. Sure, I say. And don't neither of you boys bat an eye on account of I'm a torpedo and I'm hot. <laughs> you hear that, Jack? Yeah. I don't see no shooting pistol. What you think this bulge in the coat pocket is? A birthday present. Oh, so you're a torpedo and you got to drop on us. Well, what about it? You got cash? Well, what about it, Jack? We got any cash? Mm, a little. Yeah, we got a little cash, son. And how about shelling out? Oh, I get you now. What do you mean you get me? Well, you're one of these people who advocates the redivision of wealth. I don't get you. No, don't move your hands. I mean you want half of everything we've got. Wrong. I am? You bet. I want all of everything you got. <laughs> Just a doggone haul. All right, come on, come on. Cut the gab. I'm passing the collection plate. Shell out. Well, now, fella, when you put it like that... Hey, who's that? Probably the waiter with dark sandwiches. Waiter, huh? You let me handle this. And a first mug that speaks out of turn gets hot lead in his sandwiches. You ordered sandwiches? That's right. Bring them in and set them down. Sure. Uh, what kind of sandwiches are they? Fried ham and egg. Yeah? The egg's fried soft. How can you eat a soft egg in a sandwich? Well, what you standing there for? I usually get a tip. Oh, so you want a tip, huh? Yeah. Well, take a tip from me, buddy. Do something about that sore throat. That ain't no sore throat. It ain't? No, I had my tonsils cut out and some of my vocal cords come out with them. <laughs> Get out. Get out of here. No tip? No tip. No, I am glad I spilled them sandwiches on the floor. <laughs> spilled them on the floor, huh? Well, they don't look spilled to me. Hey, let them sandwiches alone. They're mine. Quiet, buddy. Ham and egg sandwiches are my favorite fruit. Why, blast your ornery hide. Mm, hey, that's good, too. What's that stuff in the bottle? It's a milk, and you leave it be. You drink it? Of course I drink it. Huh. I ain't had no milk since I cut my milk tooth. Almost forgot how it tastes. Jack, are we just going to sit here and let him eat my sandwiches and drink my milk? I am. Well, I ain't, Dad. Blame me. Sit down. Sit down, nothing. Sit down. Or would you rather have a hole in your middle? Doc, don't be a fool. Well, that makes me just plain mad. Ah, that's better. Hey, say, that milk ain't such bad stuff. <laughs> no wonder babies cry for it. Go swell with sandwiches. You, you, you gonna eat them all? Thanks, pal. I don't mind if I do. And say, uh, how about ringing downstairs and having them send up some chocolate cake? Well, I'll be doggone if I will. You don't like chocolate cake? No, I don't. Well, I ain't adverse to a slug of coconut cake. Uh, you like coconut cake? No. And I don't like banana cake. What? You don't like banana cake? No, I don't. Oh, that's too bad. Hey, hold it. I'm going to have me another slug of milk. Get him, Doc. You bitch. Hey, hey, hey look out. Hey, hey. Get his gun, Jack. I got it. Now then, get up on your feet. Hey, 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 hey. Cut off the rough stuff, huh? <clears throat> uh, eat my sandwiches, will you? Hey, you. You shouldn't have knocked him out, Doc. Why not? Well, now we got a body on our hands. Yeah? Well, just open the door. Before. Well, just open it. I'll show you. Uh, uh, yeah, kind of hefty at that. What do you uh, think you're going to do with him? You see that linen closet across the hall? Huh? Oh, I see. You want some help? Uh, nope, nope. Just open the closet door. Uh, there. Let him sleep off my sandwiches in there. Yeah. <sighs> I wonder what gave him the idea he could come into our room and hold us up in the first place. Oh, probably just one of them smart operators. Yeah. 
Well, by the time we get back into our room and clean up a bit, Reggie ought to be here. Yeah, come on. I'm hungry. Hey, Doc. Listen. Doggone. Will you listen to that little old she-girl cry? It's coming from the room right next to ours. You think we ought to do something? I don't know. Yeah, come on. It ain't right to let a little old she-girl cry like that. Well, I guess it won't hurt to rap on the door. Yeah. Try the knob. Hmm. Unlocked? Yeah. Uh, open it a crack. Let's see what's going on. We may get our heads knocked off for this. Hey, look. All alone, just laying here on the bed, sobbing her heart out. Yeah. Well, what do we do now? Well, I don't know. I do. Come on in. Who's there? Hello. Who are you? We're from next door. We heard you crying. Is there anything we can do? No. No. Go away. Hey, we can't leave you here crying like that. Go away if you know what's good for you. Go away. All we want to do is... If you know what's good for you, stay away from me. Why do you keep saying that? It's true. Something horrible happens to every man who knows me. Hey, what sort of something? Death. Horrible thing. I want to die. I want to die. Oh, that's silly. I'm an enemy of society. Killing the things I love. Bringing death to those who try to help me. You do all that? Yes. It's the Richard curse. I'm evil. Evil. Don't touch me. Further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love the Mystery.
Dalton Morse adventure thriller, I'm Jack Packard. This is Doc Long. I still don't know who you are or what you're doing here. Well, there are three of us. Reggie's out just at the moment. Three men looking for adventure. You mean soldiers of fortune? <laughs> well, not in the ordinary sense, but the term does help to explain us. We like excitement. When we find something that interests us, we go after it. And hearing me crying in my room interested you? Yes. Now, if we can help But you, you can't. We... Nothing will help. But to put an end to my miserable life... Hey, you stop talking like that. <laughs> you mean you came to this hotel with the intention of taking your own life? Yes. But you're young and beautiful. And evil. Hey, what kind of talk is that? There's no use talking about it. Everywhere I go, I spread death and destruction. You, uh, you haven't told us your name yet. Sonny Richards. Sonia, but... But they call me Sonny. Say, that's well. Sonny. You wipe them tears away and Sonny fits you like a paper on the wall. You don't know what you're talking about. You're beautifully dressed. That bracelet on your wrist must have cost a lot of money. Everything about you says money. You must have come from a very wealthy family. There is no family. It's just me. I see. Then you're wealthy in your own right. Money, what good is it? What good when... When... When what? When everything I touch turns to dust and ashes under my fingers. Do you mind explaining? Why should I... Tell us what's wrong and let us decide whether we can help you. It's hopeless. Well, tell us. If we think it's hopeless, we'll walk out of here and let you go ahead and do what you intended to do. You mean that? I promise. Now then, what is it? I... It... It's the Richard Kirk. What do you mean? Every other generation it falls on some member of the family. Four generations ago, it, it was my great aunt four times removed. Two generations ago, it was my grandmother. It always falls on one of the women. In this generation, it's me. Well, what, uh, what is this Richard curse? The great aunt caused the death of her husband, and then she caused the death of her four children. You mean she murdered Oh, them? no, no, no. She loved them dearly. It was accidental. She was cleaning her husband's gun. And it went off and killed him. And the children were burned to death in their home. She'd locked them in while she was away from the house because they were so little. And when she came back, the house was burned but dark. accidents. It's a curse. It's been in the family for, for generations. Well, what about your grandmother? Grandmother was kind and gentle. She wore a little knitted shawl around her shoulders, and she spent all her spare time reading her Bible. But she was cursed. When she was a little girl, the first man she loved was thrown from a horse and killed. But that wasn't her fault. Wait. The next man who loved her fell off a cliff to his death. Was she there at the time? No. Well, then, don't you see how silly... And then she married my grandfather. And after my mother and my uncle were born, he... He was drowned. And then when my uncle was 15, she shot him up in a closet to punish him. And he was suffocated. Hey. And it's always been that way. What are the women in every other generation? And now what about you? Well, I... I'm worse than any of them. Maybe. Let's hear it. First it was my mother and father. You was the cause of their death? Yes. I wanted to be a flyer. I learned to pilot a plane. And one day I got... I got them to go up with me. The plane fell? <laughs> They were both killed. No, please. Please try not to cry. Oh, it's all right. I haven't much cry left in me. Here, use my handkerchief. Thank you. You were an only child? Yes. But then about a year ago, I, I became engaged. Phil. We'd only been engaged three months when his car went over a cliff and it... Dead, huh? No. But he was so badly hurt, he'll always be a bedridden cripple. Oh, fella, that's too bad. He would have been better off if he had been killed. But it wasn't your fault. Wait! About six months ago, I began letting Roger come and see me. 
I was still in love with Phil, but I should go out a little. And one night, just as he was leaving my house, he was held up and shot. Did they catch the gunman? No. Any more? Yes. There was an old friend of my father's. He used to visit me sometimes, and about four months ago, he fell down the front steps at my house. And he was hurt so badly that he never recovered. Hey, I'm beginning to think you got something with that curse. I knew you'd believe me. I don't. But there's no other explanation. Things like that don't happen to other people. You weren't connected in any way with any of these things. They're unfortunate, but you've nothing to do with them. You've let them prey on your mind until you've become morbid. Morbid? Yes, you've developed a guilt complex. If that's all... It isn't. Yesterday it happened again. You mean somebody else died because of you? Yes. I was to have had lunch yesterday with Freddy. I'd only met him a week ago. He didn't keep the engagement, so I rang up his home. And do you know what they told me? You know what had happened? What? Suicide. He killed himself with a gun in his bathroom. Sonny, stop it. <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? <laughs> struck me. Well, get hold of yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Cry. It'll do you lots more good. I wish I were dead. I wish I were dead. Jack, this is all. Oh, go away. Go away and let me do what I've got to do. We're not going anywhere. But you promised. I said we'd go if there wasn't anything we could do. Oh, you can. I'd like to try. Oh, you fools. You fools. Get out of here. Don't you understand? It'll happen to you, too. What do you mean by that? Everybody who comes near me is cursed, and you're the same as dead being in this room with me. Now go away. Go away. I can't bear any more. If we're willing to take that risk, what's it to you? I don't want any more blood on my hands. I can't stand it. Don't you understand? I can't stand it. You can stand it for two weeks, can't you? Two, two weeks? Yes. Give us two weeks to find out what's the matter. Oh, I know what's the matter. Well, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Oh, I don't know what you mean. You say the Richard curse is on you. All right. Give us two weeks to lay that curse. Oh, you, you, you can't cure a curse. I'll bet money we can. But it's something evil in me. Something evil that will live and die with me. And I say we can kill the curse without killing you. You, you believe that? Certainly I believe it. I believe it so much I'll make you a proposition. What? You give us two weeks to lay your curse, and if we fail by then, we leave you alone to destroy yourself without lifting a finger. Oh, but your own lives are in danger. We'll take that chance. No, no, you mustn't. I'm nothing to you. Hey, wait a minute, sugar. Of course you're something to us. I am? You're darn right you are. Why, this here world needs all the pretty little old female girls it can get. I don't understand. But Doc means you're beautiful. But it's always an unforgivable crime to destroy beauty. Is that what you meant? Well, yeah, I didn't say it is pretty, but that's the idea. Put it this way. From the beginning of time, men have fought and died for beauty. It's one of the few things in the world worth fighting for. And you're a beauty. You're worth saving. We think you're worth enough to fight for you. And it's our right and you can't stop us. No one ever said anything like that to me before. Then you agree? Yes. Now, under no circumstances, no matter what happens, you won't try to kill yourself for two weeks. Yes. I promise. Good. Now get up and go in the bathroom and wash the tears off your face. Oh, I know I shouldn't hope. But I do. Go on. Make yourself more beautiful than you are. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, you asked for it, fella. What do you mean? Well, you know as well as I do, you can't cure curses. What you think you are, a witch doctor? Curse, huh? Yeah, curse. The binocular of Archimedes, nuts. Now, looky, Jack. Six people connected to Sonny had been killed. Five killed, one hurt. But hurt so bad he might as well be dead. Well, what was his name? Phil. Well, you can't tell me that all those folks just happened to die, and all within a year. That does sound fishy. There must be a reason for it. The Richard curse. Something besides the Richard curse. But there ain't no sense to that. They was all accidents. Well, anyway, ways that she couldn't have had nothing to do with. Her papa and mama in the plane crash, her lover fell in the auto crash, one guy shot by a robber, and one fell downstairs, and the last one killing himself in his own bathroom. Well, they don't seem to tie together very well, do they? Except for the curse. Now, look, Doc, I want you to stop mentioning that curse business. But, Jack... Especially in front of her. 
Never mention it. Well, what's the idea? I want her to forget it. Get it out of her mind. It's an unhealthy thought, and she can't have a healthy mind until she gets rid of it. Well, son, all I got to say... Well, visitors. Good evening, gentlemen. You were looking for something? Yes, Sonny Richard. Sonny? Just a minute, Doc. Who are you? My name is Marks, Leslie Marks. I'm Miss Richard's attorney. Attorney, huh? And the executor of the Richard's estate. I see. Now then, what right have you to question me? Who are you? What are you doing in Sonny's room? We're friends of Miss Richard's. Friends? That's what I said. Hmm. Friends. How long has this been going on? Long enough. Sonny hasn't been having many friends lately. Why not? Apparently, you haven't been her friends long enough to hear of the Richard curse. Are you one of the people who's been filling her mind with that sort of nonsense? Pretty serious nonsense. Five people killed, one injured for life. I know all about that. Doc. Yeah? Tell Sonny to come out of the bathroom. Sure, I'll get it. How long have uh, you known that Sonny was in this hotel? I found out 15 minutes ago. I've had private operatives out looking for her ever since she disappeared from home this morning. Do you know why she came here? So you do know. I suspected. That's why I was so frantic to find her. Marks. There, that's him and Jack. Well, Sonny. Hello, Leslie. I've come to take you home. All right. We're going with you, you know. What's that? Why not? I've got the household to myself. Yes, but these men, who are they? What right? We're taking the right. We're Sonny's bodyguard. Well, that's ridiculous. Sonny is your attorney. As Sonny's I... attorney, you can go take a jump at yourself. So, you won't be warned. About what? The Richard curse. Please, Leslie, please. Listen, hey, take your hand off me. If I ever hear you mention that curse again in the presence of Sonny, I'll tear you limb from limb. Now, get out. Look here. Get out. You get your things together, Sonny. We're going home with you. You shouldn't have done that. He won't take that. Shucks, honey. This is only the beginning. Only the beginning. transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking.
Oh man, I'm sorry everybody. The episode did not play the next one as it was supposed to. And I had to step away. Oh, actually it did. It played a couple of them. Sorry about that. We'll get this straightened out right now. Thank you for the contribution, Haunted Tree Beard. All right, we're doing episode 99, which is uh, the fourth episode of The Million Dollar Curse. The 99th episode of I Love a Mystery. Each episode of I Love a Mystery is serialized. Um, so let's do episode 99 right now. The Million Dollar Curse, part four of, let's see how many parts to this one. 15 parts, 15. We're up to four of 15. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love the Mystery. adventure thriller well, all I got to say sonny that was one bang up me oh right oh thank you doc and Reggie you bet you if you keep uh, putting up meals like this why you're liable to have us on your hands for a long time to come <laughs> how about that mr. Marks yes the old Negro lady out in the kitchen knows how to cook I've eaten many of her meals through the years. You have, haven't you, Leslie? Ever since I was a little girl. For almost 20 years. You were in the confidence of Sonny's father all that time, Marks? Both as his attorney and his friend. Hmm. I see. Oh, by the way, what's become of Arthur? Here I am, over here. Oh, well, why pick a dark corner? Come on over and join the conversation. What's there to talk about? Oh, come on, Arthur. Be a good sport. Oh, all right. Things like this bore the pants off me. You're an ungracious scamp, Arthur. So what? I asked Sonny to invite you especially tonight, Arthur. Why? Because I wanted to make your acquaintance. Well, I didn't want to make your acquaintance. Then why did you come? Because Phil told me to. Arthur, I don't think you're being the least bit nice. So I ain't being nice. No, you're not. What's getting the matter with you? You didn't used to be this way. Well, I am now, see? Yes, I do see. I don't think Phil, lying over there in the hospital, knows how you're changing. Stop riding me, will you? Arthur, you remember I offered you a job in my office right after your brother was hurt. What about it? The job's still open if you want it. Nothing doing. Don't you work at all? Sometimes. Doing what? Whatever's handy. I saw you the other evening with a girl. Yeah? I wonder if you realize the character, the reputation of that girl in this town. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> sure I know. Then I'm surprised you were seen on the street with her. Oh, for crying out loud, am I any better than she is? I can assure you, you won't be for long if you continue in that kind of company. Say, will you folks lay off of me? Who do you think you are, anyway? But, Arthur, we all feel responsible for you. Now that you haven't Phil to help you. I don't want any help. Just let me alone. Hey, fella, you know what you sound to me like. Yeah? You sound to me like a young punk that needs a tar whaled out of. And I suppose you're the guy that can do it, huh? That's right, son. You ain't tough. You're just a kid that's trying to put on a front. Is that so? <gasps> I say. Doc, look out. He's got a gun. Arthur, what are you doing? So I ain't tough, huh? Well, well. A real he gun toter, huh? And I just as soon drill you as look at you. <laughs> Arthur. Don't anybody move. I'm a moving, son. I'm a moving right up on top of you. Careful, Doc. Careful nothing. Why, this little pasty faced, poor flushing cat meets afraid to shoot. Look here. Can't even look me in the eye. Keep back. Keep back away from me. Looky at him. 
Him a-pointing a gun right at me and giving ground. Keep away. I warn you, keep away. Just a minute, I'm going to have him backed into a corner where he can't back up no further. Then what you think's going to happen to him? Look out, Doc. No. No. No, huh? What you mean, no? Now you know what I'm going to do? i shoot. i shoot. Well, go ahead and shoot. Oh, oh, Stand back. Keep out of the way. Oh, get away from me. Hey, pull a gun on me, no. would you? No. Oh. Uh, here's a gun. Catch it, Reggie. Got it. Now, get to your feet. Up with you. Uh, hadn't you better let him lie down? You gave him quite a jolt. What's a little joke to a tough guy? Come on, come on. What you wobbling for? Stand up. I'll get you for this. If it's the last thing I do, I'll get you for this. Okay, okay. Save the threats. Now sit down in that chair. Let that be a lesson to you. I don't know what you mean. Well, then I'll tell you. Don't you never, never pull a gun on a man unless you aim to shoot him dead. I'll remember. Well, you better, son. Because folks just don't mess around with shooting arms. Oh, Arthur, what made you do it? What made you? I don't know. He got me mad. But pulling a gun. Where'd you get that gun? I found it. Let me see it, Reggie. Mm, fine. It's an old thing. I wonder it didn't blow up in his hands. Huh. That was a very brave thing you did, Mr. Long. Walking right up to the muzzle of a gun in the hands of an angry boy. Shucks, I knowed he wouldn't shoot. You can tell by the way his eyes kept going from side to side. All he wanted to do was escape. Will everyone sit down, please? I, uh, I've got something to say. I want to get out of here. You stay right where you are till I've finished. Sonny, darling? Oh. Oh, yes? My dear, will you come here and sit by me? What's this? What do you mean? What impertinence leads you to call Sonny darling and your dear? It isn't impertinence if Sonny doesn't mind, is it? Sonny? And you don't mind, do you, sweetheart? No. No, of course not. Sonny, are you mad? But, Leslie, I'm in love. In, in love? Yes, that was one of the reasons for this party tonight, to announce our engagement. Hey, Sonny, you're going to marry this guy? Yes, I... But what about Phil? What about my brother Phil lying up there in the hospital? Sonny, you must be out of your head. Why, you haven't known this man more than 24 hours. That's not true. We've been seeing each other quietly for the past six months. But you can't do it. You can't do this to Phil. Your brother already knows, Arthur. He does? Yes. We were over at the hospital last night. What did he say? He said the Richard curse would do to me what it had done to him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it will, too. What do you have to say to that, Mars? Yes. Yes, I think Arthur's right. You're challenging death when you announce your engagement to Sonny. Oh, no, please. No, please, Arthur. We decided the Richard curse was a lot of nonsense, so don't let their talk upset you. You decided it was nonsense after all the men who have died? That's what I said. Nonsense. There's no curse. But there is something. Oh, there is something. Yes, we know that. We had a demonstration last night. What was that? Last night when I was taking Sonny over to the hospital. We were walking through the park when suddenly a bullet knocked my hat off. Someone shot at you. Are you surprised? No. No, I can't say that I am. I thought not. Uh, what happened? Well, Doc and Reggie searched the park. Tell them what you found, Reggie. A crime. We found the gun that fired the shot. Uh, where was it? We found it in the pocket of a man sitting on one of the benches in the park. You mean you caught the murderer? We don't know yet. He hasn't sobered up enough to talk sensibly. We've got him locked up in the basement downstairs until he comes to. Yes, but how do you know it's the gun? You couldn't tell the caliber by the size of the hole in your hat. That's true. But when we got the gun, the barrel was still warm. It smelled of burnt powder, and there was an empty shell in the chamber. You're going to turn this man over to the police. We'll talk to him first. He doesn't seem to me like a very good candidate. Yes, but the gun in his pocket just after it'd been fired. A man so drunk it takes him 12 to 14 hours to wake up would hardly be able to take a gun out of his pocket, let alone see where to fire it. Naturally. That's my point. It wasn't attempted murder. It was the Richard curse at work. That needs some explaining. Well, don't you see? The curse doesn't breed murder. It breeds accidental death. The drunken man accidentally fired the gun, and you were accidentally in the path of the bullet. That's how the curse always works. You don't believe that, and you're stupid to try to make me think you do. Oh, but it's happened so often before. Sonny's father and mother killed in the plane accident. Phil injured in an auto accident. The, the, the young man killed by Robert. I know all about them, and I still maintain that shot was fired with deliberate attempt to kill last night. 
May I see the man you have locked in the basement? No. You can at least be civil. No one sees or talks with him until we've had a chance at him. Sonny, surely you're not in love with this man. Oh, oh, but I am. And if you really are, then you should send him to the other end of the world. I don't know what you mean. Yes, you do. If you love him, then you can't want any harm to come to him. Oh, no, no. But you know harm will come to him if he stays close to you. Oh, oh. Marks, I think you've said enough. She knows it's true. <laughs> she knows it just as well as Arthur and I. Arthur. Where's Arthur? He slipped out of the room. Doc's trailing him. Why? Why did he go like that? Let him alone. Doc will see he gets home all right. Gets home all right? Yes. I don't understand what you mean. Why shouldn't he get home all right? Sonny, I'm afraid this gathering tonight's been loaded with more dynamite than you realize. You mean Arthur is in danger? Everyone, with the exception of yourself, is in danger. Everyone who sat down at your dinner table tonight. You... you mean me too? You mean I'm in danger? You know, that's a funny thing about you, Marx. You've probably been more closely associated with Sonny here than anyone else. Yes, that's true. Then why have you escaped the curse when so many others have been its victim? Leslie. Perhaps you're immune to cursing? Leslie, I never thought of that. Why have you escaped? I... I don't know. I've been expecting it to happen for a long time. You've been expecting to be struck down and you've continued the association. I'm a friend of the family. I'm Sonny's executor. I've got a job to do. You could have turned it over to the courts. I'm not exactly a coward. I see. But, Leslie, you mustn't. You mustn't take any more chances. That's a very strange thing for you to say, Sonny. Why? Ask me to give up a job put in my hands by your dead father when you're willing to let Jack Packard here, the man you love, stay by your side. The phone. I'll take that. Oh, Jack, I've got it, dear. Hello? Oh, Doc. What's that? I see. I see. All right. All right, we'll be ready. Okay. Jack, Jack, what is it? Arthur's just been hit by an automobile. What's that? You see? There's no end to it. There's no end to it until I'm dead. transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love the Mystery. adventure thriller I just got a report on the boy Jack well a fractured left arm and an assortment of bumps and bruises not serious Sam huh? no not a bit of it the doctor is putting the arm in a cast and nature will take care of the rest boy that's going to relieve Sonny's mind is she up in the bedroom with him? yes both Sonny and that attorney chap Marks Doc close the door will you? huh oh, oh sure bit of a conference Yes, well, we have the library to ourselves. And about time. We ain't had a minute to ourselves since we got on this business. Well, first, Doc, tell us what happened to the boy. Well, it ain't much to tell. You remember, we was all sitting in here gabbing after Arthur pulled a gun on me and I bopped him. Well, when he thought nobody was looking, he sneaked out. And you give me the nod to follow him. Yeah. Well, I did. He seemed awful skittish all the way down the street. 
Then suddenly an automobile come around the corner and threw its headlights right smack on me, and he saw me. Well, he jumped like he is shot in the pants with a box of tacks and started running across the street, and a car smacked him. Did the car stop? Yeah, a cop was standing on the corner, and he come over and said it that it wasn't the driver's fault. But, uh, well, the fellow was scared silly. He insisted on bringing Arthur back to the house. No chance of it being anything but an accident? Not a chance. Mm-hmm. What are you getting at? Well, in all these tragedies which have happened to people associated with Sonny, I'm trying to separate those which couldn't have been anything but accidents and those which might have been murder or attempted murder. Hey, you think murder's mixed up in this? I'll bet money there is. Well, what you know? Well, go on, talk some more. Well, as nearly as we can find out, the Richard curse began to work about a year ago with the death of Sonny's mother and father. Yes, but they were killed when Sonny crashed her airplane. Yes, that looks like they were killed accidentally. What you mean, looks like? Well, if someone had wanted them dead, what would be simpler than to tamper with the plane? Oh, but look here. Then that would indicate whoever did it wanted Sonny dead, too. I mean, she was flying the plane, and it's a miracle she wasn't killed, too. Well, why not? Then you think that plane crash was deliberate murder? I'm putting a question mark after that. Now, the next tragedy was Phil Terry's auto accident. Well, that looks like just plain accident to me. Yes, it does to me, too. His car might have been tampered with, and... I see how it could have been fixed to get out of control at a certain point in the road so it would go over a cliff. Mm, pretty far-fetched. Yes, so we'll have to put Phil's crash down as accident. And next comes Sonny's boyfriend, Roger. Yeah, shot to death by robbers. Right in front of his house. Mm, does that mean anything? I don't know. But we do know that it was murder, pure and simple. But in a way, it was an accident. I mean, maybe if he hadn't tried to fight him off, he wouldn't have got shot. On the other hand, why couldn't he have been deliberately murdered and then his money taken to make it look like a holdup? Yes, but who would do it? And what for? The same one who might have tampered with Sonny's plane. Motive? We don't know yet. Oh, Jack, you're beginning to make it look like there's a mighty smelly polecat hanging around in the background somewhere. Only theory, of course. Let me put murder down after the name of Roger. Well, who's next on the list? The next was the old gentleman, Franklin Skinner friend of Sonny's father who visited her from time to time. He fell down the front steps of this house and died of the injury. Accident. Or could he possibly have been pushed down those steps? I say. Well, you ask it. Can you answer it? No. No, a question mark goes down after his name. All right. Bear looking into all right. And now, Freddy, the fellow who shot himself to death in his own bathroom. Mm, suicide. I wonder. You wonder what? Well, it wouldn't be the first time that murder has been made to look like suicide. But if the police are satisfied, Jack... They don't know that they are. That's where you and Doc come in. Well, how do you mean? Tomorrow morning, Doc, I want you to go down to the police station and talk to every man on the force who had anything to do with the investigation of these cases. Right from the plane accident on down? Right straight through the whole series. Well, ain't the boys in blue going to think I'm kind of nosy? Oh, not if you work it right. I've uh, still got my credentials given us when we did that job for the insurance company. Oh, I'm an insurance investigator. Why not? Well, it suits me. You, Reggie? Yes? Go out and talk to the employees at the airport where Sonny crashed. Right on. And find out from Sonny where Phil lived before he was hurt and get all the personal information you can from people he used to know. Well, that'll take time. Okay, if you get stuck, don't waste time. And uh, go and see Franklin Skinner's family. Find out what his relationship was to the Richards family. Quite. Now, while everyone's occupied upstairs with Arthur, let's go down to the basement and see how our drugs coming along. I say, the chappy who took a shot at you in the park last night. Well, at least the man who was left holding the gun that fired the shot. Yeah, let's go. Through the back of the house is quicker. Uh, out by way of the kitchen? No, there's a door off this hall down to the basement. Oh, here, I think this is it. Oh, no, this is only closed. Oh, wait a minute. Put on the light. Huh? Well, what for? There. Have a look at that. Jack. A sawed-off shotgun. A sawed-off shotgun? Keep your voice down. Come on, close the door and get out of here. But ain't we going to have a look at it? Not now. We might get caught. I don't want anyone to know we've seen it. Doc, uh, can you lock this door? Yeah, easy. Then work on it. Make it snappy. Yeah, just a second. But a sawed-off shotgun, Jack. No one uses those bloody things but gangsters. Interesting, isn't it? What's going on in this house, do you suppose? I right, come in, Doc. It's coming. Ah. There she is. What would you want it locked up for? I don't want that gun moved until I've had a chance to examine it. I'll come down later tonight and the house is quiet. Uh-huh. Well, this next door must be the basement. Yeah, this is her. Now, wait till I turn on the light. All right, pull the door to and come on. Not so much noise, Doc. Yeah. Here, this way. Hmm. 
It's that door on the right. Mm-hmm. I left the key in the door. I get the light. Right out. Yeah. Well, this is what I call a lousy can. Oh, so you've come too, huh? Oh, uh, what did I do to get thrilled in the jug? This isn't a jail. Uh, no? No. Oh, well, what is it then? The basement of a house. Well, what's the idea? Are you sober? Yeah, uh, I guess I must be. I feel rotten. <laughs> you got our sympathy, fella. Yeah? You got a smoke? Yeah, here you are. Yeah. Got a match? Yep. Hey, you got as fine a case of the shakes as I about ever saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need a drink. Oh, that's too bad. What's your name? Fish Evans. Fish Evans, huh? How much do you remember what happened last night? Before or after? Before or after? Before I got stinko oh. or... Well, both. Where'd you take on the loan? Down at Ed's place. Saloon? Yeah, yeah. You're known down there? Sure. Everybody knows Fish Evans down at Ed's. Mm-hmm. And after you left Ed's? Well, I, I remember thinking some fresh air would do me good, so I went up to the park. What else do you remember? There was there anything else? I'm asking you. Uh, if there was, I don't remember it. How long have you been carrying a gun? What you talking about? I asked you how long you've been carrying a gun. I never had a gun in my life. That's funny. It don't make me laugh. I mean, we found a gun on you. That's a lie. No, we found it on you less than five minutes after someone took a shot at me in the park. Oh, say, I must still be drunk. And what's more, the barrel of the gun was still warm. It smelled of powder smoke, and there was an empty shell in the chamber. Oh, so that's it. What do you mean? Trying to pin a rap on me, huh? No, we're telling you the truth. Are you dicks? No. Well, then who are you? I'm the guy that was shot at. Say, uh, uh, wait a minute. Well? I'm, uh, I'm kind of beginning to remember something. Well, it's about time. Uh, seems like I was sitting on a bench in the park. Yes? Yeah. I was sitting on a bench and somebody come running up to me and stopped where I was sitting. What did he do? Hey, kind of stopped and poured me over for a minute and then he beat it off into the dark. Uh, I thought I dreamed it. Well, could he have put a gun in your pocket? Yeah, there wasn't nothing to stop him. Can you describe him? Well, uh, there was three of him. What's that? Three of them. Uh, maybe I didn't even have my eyes open. How do I know? Yeah, you're a great help. Look, here, Jack, how about him making up all this just to get himself an alibi? Well, your guess is as good as mine. But you're sure someone came up and planted the gun on you? Mister, I ain't sure of nothing except my tongue's hanging out a foot. If we turn you loose, where do you intend to go? I tell it for Ed's place. We can find you there if we want you? That's right. All right, come on. I say, Jack, you're not going to send him loose. That's right. Come on. There's an outside door to the basement. Yes, I know. Don't ever get on the liquor, boys. It'll get you. Thanks for the tip. Here we are. Hey, hey, listen. Sounds like a fire somewhere. Must be a big one. Well, here you are, Evans. You're free. How about four bits for a taxi so I can get to Ed's quick? Oh, look here. <laughs> here you are. Oh, thanks. Well, look me up sometime, huh? Yeah. You sure enough think that was smart, letting him go, Jack? I hope so. Give him a few seconds more, and then you go after him. Oh, I get it. Tail him and see what contacts he makes. That's it. If he was telling the truth, we'd soon know it. If he goes directly to Ed's place... Jack! Fella, that was gun shooting. Come on, quick! <laughs> it had to be a gun. This way. This way. There! They're on the sidewalk. Somebody's sure laying down. Right under the streetlight. There. Turn him over. Yeah. It's our man. It's Evans. Man, oh man. What could have killed him like that? I'll tell you. A sawed-off shotgun up close. Sawed-off? Hey, Jack. You don't have to tell me. There's a sawed-off shotgun in Sonny Richard's house.
The further adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Forson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love the Mystery. Episode 6 of the Million Dollar Curse and episode 101 of I Love a Mystery. Enjoy! A new Carlton Morse adventure thriller. why you might want to see me and your brother Arthur. But why Jack, Doc, and Reggie? Never mind why, Sonny. I just do. But you're not strong. Will you cut that kind of talk? I know I'm an invalid. You don't need to rub it in. I'm sorry. And and another thing, Phil, I... I don't think Arthur will be here. He'd better be here. But there's... There's something I haven't told you. I sent word for the kid to be here. Did you tell him? Oh, yes, of course, but he... Then he'll be here. You got them three fellas living at your house, I hear. You mean Jack, Doc, and Reggie? Who else? Well, yes, I told you they were staying at the house. It's kind of funny. They're moving in on you like that. Well, I'm glad you can talk about it sensibly, Phil. I'd have told you all about it the other night, only... Well, you got so angry with Jack. You're in love with him, sure enough. Yes, Phil, I am. You gonna marry him? I'm sorry, Phil. You are, huh? Yes. You don't care how you spill blood, do you? Oh, Phil, how could you? It's a fact, ain't it? You're laying this Packard Romeo wide open for the curse. You're giving him the works. Phil, that's not fair. I've got a right to be happy. Yeah. And I got a right to be walking around on two sound, healthy legs. But I'm not. I'm laying here in bed. I'm going to be laying here from now on. And all because of the Richard curse. And all I hope for your Jack Packard is that he goes out quick. Wouldn't wish what I got on nobody. Phil, Phil. Forget it. They're coming. I don't hear them. I got ears. They're coming. Come in. Go ahead. I've got a wheelchair. Wheelchair? Hello, Sonny. Oh, how are you, Phil? What's this about a wheelchair? Arthur insisted on coming over, so we put him in a wheelchair. Arthur? There we are. Didn't bump you very much. Hello, Phil. Hey, hey, punk. What's the matter with you? Nothing but a busted arm. But you shouldn't have come. The doctor said... Nuts. Now, wait a minute. What's going on here? How'd you get a broken arm? I was going to tell you, Phil. I don't want you to tell me. I want to hear the kid's story. I tried to cross the street. Car come around the corner and smacked me. Is that all? Yeah. Arthur, son, why don't you tell him everything? That is everything. No, fella, that ain't everything by a whale of a lie. Well, then suppose you spill it. Sure. Last night, Sonny here... Uh... Had that attorney feller, Marks, and Arthur to dinner with us three. After dinner, your little brother got nasty and pulled a gun on me. What's that? Sure. I had to smack him down and take it away from him. You blasted little fool. So what? What were you doing with a gun? Wheel him over here beside the bed. All right. Phil. Answer me, kid. What were you doing with a gun? I found it. <laughs> oh, Phil. What were you doing with a gun? I found it. <laughs> Oh, no, Phil. I wouldn't take that from nobody else, Phil. He ain't feeling so good, feller. I wouldn't hit him no more. You and I'll settle this between ourselves, punk. Yeah, well, well, to to go on with what I was saying, after our little fracas, Arthur here slipped out of the house and I tailed him. 
he caught sight of me down the block and uh, tried to dodge across the street. And that's when he got smacked. Why'd you follow him? Well, see, he got homesick. <laughs> Didn't do a very good job of it. If, uh, if you're through with Arthur, I'd like to ask a question. All right, Packard. You asked for us all to gather in your room here. Why? I hear a man was shot out in front of Sonny's house last night. You heard? Sure. Right across the park from the hospital. How could I help hearing? Everybody was talking about it over here. It interests you? Sure. Why? It sounds like the Richard Curse got another victim. No, no, that's not true. And being a victim of the curse myself, I got a fellow feeling for the other victims. I see. Who was he? He said his name was Fish Evans. Ever hear of him? No. He was a bum. But more important, he was found out in the park with the gun that almost shot my head off the night before last. Well, that's interesting. Yes, we thought so. He was drunk, so we held him until he sobered up, got his story, and turned him loose. He only got as far as the sidewalk when somebody got him with a sawed-off shotgun. Hold up, huh? Hold up, men. Don't use sawed-off shotguns. And uh, speaking of shotguns, less than half an hour before Evans was killed, we found a sawed-off shotgun in the hall closet over at Sonny's house. Jack, you what? That's right. And after the shooting, we went looking for the gun, and it was gone. What are you getting at? Well, Arthur here brought one gun into the house that we know of. We're wondering if maybe he didn't bring the shotgun in, too. Hey, what you trying to do, tie a murder on me? Is that what you're trying to do, Packard? Tie a murder on a kid? No, I'm just asking. Arthur. Well? Did you have that shotgun? Would you believe me if I said I didn't? You say you didn't, and that's good enough for me. You know I didn't. If you say so. I say so. Well, even if he did... He couldn't have killed that, that Evans man because he was upstairs in bed with a broken arm. But he was up there alone. The doctor had gone and you and Marks had come downstairs. Leslie Marks was there? Yes. What about his alibi? He says he was in the library. Alone? Mm-hmm. Where were you, Sonny? In the kitchen. Fixing some medicine the doctor had given me for Arthur. That Leslie Marks is too smart for his own good. We've thought about that. You're mad to think Leslie would do a thing like that? What about these three mugs, Phil? Arthur, is that nice? Yeah, what about you three? You were the last to see Evans alive. You admit you had access to a shotgun. You'll just have to take our word for it that we didn't kill Evans. How about the police? Are they willing to take your word for it? Well, they heard our story. If I was the police, I'd think this whole setup looked mighty funny. They didn't indicate they thought it was funny. They give you a clean slate? No. No, we're under suspicion like everyone else. But they haven't any evidence to give them reason to lock us up. They might get it yet. They might. If there was any to get. Please, Phil, you're looking awfully tired. You better go to sleep and let us go back across the park to my house. What's the hurry? Well, you're tired and... And Arthur shouldn't be up with that broken arm. I'm doing all right. I'm not through yet. But I say, old chap, you do look a bit ill. Keep your sympathy to yourself. Well, look here, I didn't mean... I know what you mean. Drop it. Quiet. Packard. Yeah? Sonny tells me you're announcing your engagement. That's right. You're a pretty brave man. I don't think so. I was engaged to Sonny. Look at me. I think it's pretty rotten of you to keep throwing that up in Sonny's face, no matter what condition you're Please, in. Please, Jack. And I've got just this to say before we drop the subject. In the first place, I don't believe in curses. Second, Sonny's worth any trouble she might bring along with her. All I want is Sonny. I'll take my chances on the rest. I get it. Then let's drop it. But uh, first, I, uh, I want to apologize. Hmm? What about? What I said the other night. I don't recall. I said, if the Richard Curse doesn't get you, that I would. That? Yeah, you were excited, upset. Yeah, yeah, I was upset. It was a fool thing to say. Why should I lie here worrying about how to get even with you when the curse will take care of all that? Yeah, <laughs> and it will, too. You keep out of this, punk. <laughs> just like it got you, Phil. I told you to shut up. Sure. Just as soon as that arm's well, you're coming over here and take what's coming to you for packing a gun, you understand? I'm not a kid anymore. I say you are. If I ever hear of you with a rod again, I'll call in a couple of cops and let them sweat you from now on. Now then, take him out of here. I've had all I... This is the room. Come on, boys. Hey, what is this, an invasion? What do you three policemen want? Well, take it easy, Mr. Terry. We won't be bothering you for long. This is a private room. Sure. Me and my two boys here... 
Got a job to do. What sort of a job? Orders from headquarters to pick up these three men. Oh, look here. Uh, which one of you is Jack Packard? Oh, I am. Doc Long? That's me, fella. And, uh, Reggie York. Right. They want you down at headquarters. Now, what do you suppose they want us down there for? The Fish Evans murder. That's nonsense. We've been with the police most of the day telling our story. It seems like they don't like your story down at headquarters. Well, it sure took them a long time to make up their minds. Ban them, Sweeney. We're not carrying any weapons. Don't tell us. Let us find out for ourselves. <laughs> I say, a Bobby with a sense of humor. What'd you call me? Oh, take it easy. Bobby's Johnny Bull for cop. But you're going to lock them up? None of them's healed, Sarge. Is that what you're going to do? Lock them up? Not for long, Sonny. Don't worry. That's what you think. All right. Come along with you. Oh, Jack, I don't think we got no reason to go down to no police station. We can give you a reason if you want it that way. Forget it, Doc. You mean we're just going to march along? Yes. I ain't hit a policeman, and I don't know how long. Look, you feel something hard and cold in your back? Yeah. It's a cannon, and it shoots. Well, don't jab so hard. I'm ticklish. Take him out, boys. Just a minute, Sergeant. Yes, Mr. Terry. I want to say something to Packard. Hmm? Say it. Packard, do you recall what I said about relaxing and letting the Richard curse take care of you? I do. Well, I'm beginning to relax. If you've got anything to say to me, say it. I am saying it. It'd be rather funny if the Richard curse should take you three boys to the gas chamber up in San Quentin, wouldn't it? Phil, Phil, you don't mean that. Destroying three of you at one blow... That'll be some kind of record, even for the Richard Curse. transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love the Mystery. adventure thriller. Cross the lobby with you. One bad move, you're all washed up. Taking us down to the jailhouse, huh? That's right. I don't mind saying I jolly well don't like that gun pressed against my side. You'll like it a lot less if it goes off. Oh, that's a sweet thought. Hold it. Open the door, Packard. Right. Lead the way, Sweeney. Come along, you. Down the steps with you. Now then, across the street. I don't see any police car. Cars across the park. You mean in front of Sonny's house? Yeah. We stopped there for you. Found out you'd gone over to the hospital. 
Now then, through the park. First time I've had a chance of taking an errand with an escort for a long time now. How much you get for acting as a feller's bodyguard, Sweeney? You talk too much for your own good. No. But honest, feller, do you like being a policeman? I do that. And I get a chance to pick up such as you. Oh, now, I ain't such a bad fella. You, you might even get to like me if you know me. Mm, I have my own opinion on that. Keep marching. Sure. What's the matter with your copper, Reggie? Ain't heard a word out of him. He hasn't said anything. I think he's got laryngitis. <laughs> yeah? Well, what makes you think that? Well, he's got a woolen cloth about his neck, and he smells violently of turpentine and cough medicine. Laryngitis, huh? Crying. I've been telling him he should be home in bed, but the blighter doesn't appreciate my sympathy. Ouch, I say. What's the matter? Apparently doesn't appreciate my humor either. Keeps jabbing that valley gun in my ribs. All right. This is it. You mean this car under the streetlights? That's right. Open the back door, sweetie. But this isn't a police car. You don't say. Look here, there's something phony about this. You mean these birds ain't policemen? Get into that back seat. What about it, Jack? Yes, get in. But if this is a frame up. Get in. Follow him in, sweetie. Sure. Here, you sit in the middle. I'll take the outside. Suits me. Now you, Limey. Jack, if this is. Get a... in, Reggie. Quiet. Follow him in, Burke. Well, anyway, Reggie, you and me get to ride next to each other. Mm-hmm. Is that important? Well, anyway, I like backseat riding best myself. All snug is four doggone bugs in a rug. All right, Packard, in the front seat. Suits me. Keep your other gun on him while I get under the wheel, Sweeney. He's covered right up to his eyes. I take it we're going for a nice long ride. Take it or leave it alone. You know, Jack, if these three hombres sure enough ain't cops, it looks to me like we've got a mighty interesting ride ahead of us. Looks like it, all right. Keep the gun on him, Sweeney, until I get the car underway. It's as good as done. Hey, ask him up there if he's a good driver, Jack. Well, here we go. Smooth running, bus. All right, Sweeney, I'll take care of Packard up front here. He's your boy. Whew! Your fella does smell a turpentine, don't he, Reg? Mm. He's smelling up the whole car. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, this road takes us out toward the desert. You ain't mistaken, mister. I thought so. Three bodies buried in the sand out there probably would never be discovered. Jack, don't talk like that. What's that? Well, that's something I don't ever want to be. The undiscovered car. That Texas boy's just full of bad jokes, ain't he? Uh, Doc? No, don't mind him. He's worse than a leaky faucet. Yeah. You boys look to me like part of a pretty well-organized gang. We're doing all right. You uh, wouldn't by any chance know a man by the name of Leslie Marks, would you? Oh? Leslie Marks, attorney. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard of him. I'm not surprised. Looks like a pretty smart operator. Should think he'd make a great mouthpiece for a gang. I'll tell the boss. He wouldn't be boss by any chance, would he? What do you mean? Marks. He wouldn't be the big gang boss in these parts, would he? Got a great front for it. You're nuts. Well, there's no harm in asking. Can't think of any. But what's your racket? This doesn't seem to me any sort of a town for an organized gang. You got me, buddy. You mean you don't know? I don't know nothing. I see. Of course, you're close to the Mexican border. I suppose there's money in smuggling, and then this is a seaport. Keep talking. It's only your breath you're wasting. Uh Uh-huh. How are we coming, Jack? We're getting out into the great open spaces. Are, huh? I say, how about opening some of the windows? I'm getting bloody sick of breathing turpentine, too. Leave the windows like they are. Oh, spoiling my whole ride. Reggie, I bet you if we was to touch a match to your bodyguard, he'd burn like an oil well. Or you could attach a pipeline to him and furnish Southern California with natural gas. Ouch, I say, old man, I'm getting fairly well fed up with you jabbing me with that brute of a gun. <laughs> yeah, Burke ain't a man to take a joke kindly. Mm. At least why it's not when it's on himself. Yes, I'm beginning to notice that. So we're really out in the desert now. I haven't seen a building along the highway for the past five minutes. Passing any automobiles? Not now. There's a car on our tail, though. What's that? I don't know. Been there ever since we left town. I'll take care of that. Ooh, wait. Looky at us go. <laughs> Leaving it behind like it was standing still. This car's got an engine in it, all right. I say, the other car's out of sight already. Doc. Reggie, can you hear me? Yeah, I know. Get 
ready for the worst. What'd you say? I told him to get ready for the worst. What do you mean by that? Keep on going like this and almost anything's liable to happen. Such as what? Such as this. Hey, let go of that wheel, you! Look out that, Reggie! Hey! Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Doc. Doc, you, you all right? Jack. Oh. Did you honest and truly go for to wreck this car? Yes, I yanked on the wheel. Son, you had never ought to Ooh. do that. Well, this here is the way folks get hurt. Ah, you, you see, Reggie? Huh? Ah. What do you mean? Isn't he back there with you? Feller, when this, bu- this bus done its first flip-flap, Reggie zoomed out of here like he shot from a cannon. Well, let's get out of here and find him. Ah, I reckon I'm going to need some help. What about these other guys? Well, they'll have to look out for themselves now. Car's over inside. Can't you climb out through the back door? Ah, uh, nope. Door's jammed. Uh-huh. Well, climb over in the front seat and I'll give you a hand. Okay. There. Ah. Uh, uh, oh. Ah, uh, stepped right in the middle of the driver. Uh, he didn't notice it. Yeah, sleeping like a baby. Be careful of that broken glass. Now. Up with you. Yep. Uh, uh, there we are. Ah. Uh, Hey, Jack, huh? there's a headlights of that car that was following us over yonder in the highway. Oh, never mind that. Find Reggie. Yeah, he should ought to be over this way. Hello? Is that you over there, Jack? Hey, Jack, it's Sonny. Sonny, what are you doing out here? Jack, Jack what happened? Asked you what you were doing out here. I followed you. The minute those three policemen took you boys out of Phil's room, I followed. I thought they were going to take you to the police station. Well, they weren't policemen. They, they, they weren't? Jack, what are you looking for? Reggie. Oh, is he hurt? I'll tell you better when we find him. Hey, Jack! Hey, here he is! Oh, come on. Oh, you see? You see the horrible things that are happening to you already from associating with me? That's stupid. Here, this way, Jack. How is he, Doc? Can you tell? Well, he's knocked out all right, but he lit in these here bushes. I don't think there's nothing broken. Oh, I hope not. Here, let me see. What the heck are you doing out here, Sonny? I trailed you. Who were those men if they weren't policemen? Gun-toting gangsters. How's he doing, Jack? Just stunned. He'll be around a minute. Are you sure? Certainly I'm sure. All I have to say, Sonny, is that the Richard curse is a pretty impotent curse to let us get away like this. Well, what do you mean? Well, look at the material it had to work with. Three gunmen with murder in their hearts, one of the best auto wrecks of the year. A really potent curse would have had us dead and buried by this time. Yeah, and look at us. Just one of us with a little old bump on his head. Well, you mustn't say that. You mustn't challenge fate like that. Baloney. Come on. Let's have a look at the boys in the car. All right to leave Reggie there? Yes, give him a few minutes to come around. But who are these, these gunmen? Your guess is as good as ours. Doc, I'm going to crawl back in the car and hand the bodies out to you. Okay. Good yeah. thing we didn't catch fire. I still don't understand why gunmen wanted you three. Well, won't you let us worry about that, honey? Are you inside all right, fella? Yeah. Here comes the driver. Okay. Careful with him. He's got some broken bones. Uh, got him. A meaty guy for his size. Ah. Ah. Yeah, lay there for a minute. He, he's not dead. No, ma'am. Just chewed up a little. Next. Now, let him come. Uh, which one's he? Sweeney. You got him? Yep, yep. Come on, Sweeney, old kid. The trip ended up kind of different than you expected, didn't it? Ah. Ah. That's it. Lay down there beside your pal. Can I do anything? I don't reckon. Uh, these fellas is going to need the attention of an expert. They're hurt seriously? Well, they ain't been done no good. Ready, Doc? Well, this would be old laryngitis himself. Huh? Well, I got him. Uh, uh, oh, see, you fella. Now that you're unconscious, you're exuding turpentine worse than when you was kicking. Yeah, yeah I'm glad that's over. But what do we do now? Load our cargo into your car and get him to a hospital. And that's a job of toting. I wish Reggie had come, too, so he could give us a hand. Well, hadn't we ought to hurry if there is All right. Uh, Stick up your hands, all of you. What's that? Hey, Jack, we got visitors. You heard me? Not a move out of any one of you. Guns and everything. Now, now, what do you suppose this is for? But there must be some mistake. Keep out of this, sister. What's the idea? We came out here tonight to bury you, Muggs. And burying's what you're going to get.
regular transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. The next episode will be episode 103 of I Love a Mystery. It is the eighth episode of The Million Dollar Curse. These are radio programs, so there's no video. A new Carlton Morse adventure thriller. Take them up. Would you like a chunk of lead in your middle? Oh, not me, fella. Then don't move a finger. Hoppy. That's me. I got them covered. Fan them. Sure, with pleasure. Don't waste no time. This ain't no picnic. What about the skirt? No, don't you touch me. Leave the skirt alone. It's a nice skirt. Leave the skirt alone. Well, ain't that what I'm doing? These guys ain't got no rods. I could have told you that. He, he could have told us that. <laughs> ain't he the comedian? Hey, look, he, my arms is getting tired. Tape them up. Hoppy. Shall I bump them off? No, tie them up. But what we want to tie them up for? We come out here to bump them off. We can't bump nobody off in the presence of the skirt. We could if we bumped the skirt off, too. We ain't got no orders to bump no skirt off. Yeah, but she, she's a nice skirt. Ain't you, babe? You keep your hands off me. Oh, a skirt with a temper. Uh, happy, tie them birds up. May I make a suggestion? No, you can't make no suggestion. Well, then may I ask a question? No, you can't ask no question. Well, your three pals here are liable to die on your hands if you don't get them to a doctor. You mean their height pad? Yes. That's their hard luck. Yeah, but if the height pad... That's uh... their hard luck. We got our orders to bump these three guys off and bury them. Three? That's orders. Yeah, but it's only two of them. Ah, that's right. Hey, where's the other mug? Well, I can tell you that, fella. Yes, yes, we, we can tell you where he is. He's in that wrecked car, dead. Yeah? Yes, dead. And you can blame yourselves for it. Well, ain't that too bad now? We think so. Well, don't feel too bad, mister. His troubles is all over. And you still got yours coming. Well, what are you standing there for, Hoppy? I told you to tie them up. That's right. I thought there was something you told me to do. I was trying to remember. We'll do it. Shall I tie up the skirt first? Leave the skirt alone. Oh, ain't we gonna tie up the skirt at all? No. That's too bad. I sure would like to tie up that skirt. Put your hands behind you, bud. Oh, how about it, Jack? He's got a gun on us. Well, I sure don't like it. Why, you double-jointed city cat. Put your hands behind you. Better someday I'm going to take you apart. That's better. Put your hands up, both of you. Hey, the skirt's got a gun. Sonny, you crazy little idiot, drop that gun. I won't. I can shoot as good as he can. Drop that gun, sister, or I will make a sieve out of you. I won't. I'll shoot if you do. Happy. A gun totin' skirt. Take that gun away from her. You mean I can go for her? Get that gun. With pleasure. No. No, don't come any closer. I ain't mixed with a skirt never so long. Sonny, throw the gun away. You hear? Throw it away. I'll kill him. I'll kill him. Oh, no, you won't. Oh, yeah. let go of me. Give me that rock. I won't. I won't. Yeah, you got the gun. Yeah, and I also got the skirt. 
Now, hurry up and put the ropes on these two guys so we can get going. I told you not to try to use that gun. Somebody's got to do something. Sonny, it's just like I told Arthur the other night. When you pull out a gun, you got to shoot right off. On account of folks, they just don't monkey around with shooting on you. Now put your arms back of you, and this time do it. And don't waste no more time. We got to get out of here. Doc. Yeah? I think the British are coming. Huh? Oh, oh, yeah. No fooling. No fooling. What are they talking about, Hoppy? One of them just said the British are coming. Oh, what does that mean? Search me. I got one of them tied. Well, hurry up with the other one. Yes, won't be long now. And me all tied up like a sack of potatoes. It's all right, I'm still free. But not for long. Put your hands behind you. Get him, Reggie. I've got him, Jack. Hey, Hoppy. I'll take your hoppy. Hey, look out. Had a boy, Jack. You got him first crack. Yeah. How are you coming, Reggie? Oh, it went down like a pole, Doc. Nothing to it at all. But Reggie, you were unconscious. Ooh. Oh, I say, I didn't have to stay that way, did I? Well, good work, fella. You come to, you took in the situation, and you did just what was right and proper. Right. Ooh, still a bit dizzy, though. Well, after that bump you got in the wreck, it's not surprising. Joe, I did take a flying, didn't I? What about those other chappies? Well, we've got to get them to a hospital. Only now we got five bodies instead of just three. And by the way, would somebody get these ropes off of oh, me? All right, I'll turn around. Yeah. Uh, where do you suppose those, uh, these last two guys come from anyway, Jack? Well, you heard what they said. Yeah, that they was out here to bury. There you are. Uh, yeah, thanks. Apparently, there were two more of the same gang that had been waiting out here in the desert for the others to bring us along. Right, then there was to be a firing squad, and we were to be thrown into a hole in the sand and covered up. No. Hey, honey, what you shivering about? Oh, what is it? What's going on? Well, Sonny, it looks to me as though we were beginning to get under the surface of the Richard Curse. But what's this to do with the curse? Maybe a lot. I don't understand. Well, supposing I'd been shot in the park the other night, or the three of us had disappeared, or our bodies had been found out here in the desert. What would you have thought? Oh. Oh, yes. Yes. If you hadn't known all that's happened, you'd have said the Richard Curse had caused our deaths. You'd have believed we died because we were associated with you. Yes, but this is different... Someone's deliberately trying to kill you. All the others have been accidental. Been made to look accidental, you mean? You, you mean... I mean that I think this same gang that tried to lay us away tonight are responsible for at least some of the deaths that took place before we came into the picture. But that's not a curse. Hardly. Hey, where'd Doc and Reggie go? They're taking the bodies over to my car on the highway. Oh. But, Jack, why? What do you mean, why? If a gang of men are killing people close to me... There must be some reason for it. Yes, and we're going to start looking for that reason. But the curse... There isn't any curse, and there never has been. Oh, but you're wrong. It's been in my family for generations. Who told you that? My father. You might have found something better to do. When did he tell you? Well, he didn't exactly tell me. He left it for me in a letter attached to his will. Your father's attorney, Leslie Marks, gave you that letter when the will was read? Yes, Leslie gave it to me. Was it in your father's handwriting? No, it was typewritten, but it was signed. I know my father's signature. And you didn't know anything about the curse until you read that letter? No. Do you still have the letter? Yes. Yes, I have it at home. Hmm. I'd like to have a look at it when we get back. Well, if, if you wish. Do you know the condition of your estate? But that's absurd. Leslie... It's not absurd. Nothing's absurd when people are being killed like flies around you. And I don't trust that Marks fellow any further than I could throw an elephant by the tail. But if he wanted my estate, it would be me he wanted dead, wouldn't it? Well, you're the last person in the world he'd want dead, especially if he's been looting the estate. No, I, I, I don't understand. Because if you were dead, he'd have to make an accounting to the court. And if he's been using your money, he'd go to jail for it. Oh, oh yes. But that still doesn't explain why he'd want the men close to you out of the way. No. No, I think you're all wrong about Leslie. I'm sure of it. Unless you... Look, Sonny, did your father's will say anything about all property reverting to you immediately in case you got married? No. Merely that Leslie was to be my executor until I'd reached the age of 25. Why? Why did you say that? Well, if he had to turn the estate over to you when you married, then naturally he'd do everything in his power to drive off all eligible men. But my marrying doesn't change a thing. Oh, so we can forget that. Well, this is going to take some thinking over. Well, Jack, if... If you can really prove it isn't the curse... I've already done that to my satisfaction. But proof. I want to be convinced. I've got to. Well, you better stop worrying about the curse and start worrying about something really serious. Serious? Yes, and it's my guess that it's Leslie Marks. Jack, I know you're mistaken. I know you are. Well, somebody's surrounding you with gangsters and gunmen. 
Somebody's bound and determined you're going to live alone and like it. You proved that tonight. Well, I don't understand it. Oh, but you're beginning to believe it, aren't you? Well, I, I don't know. Well, you're going to marry Phil Terry. Where's he? Cripple in the hospital. You're beginning to show an interest in Roger and in Freddie. And where are they? Buried. You and I announced our engagement. With good luck, I'm still here, but that wasn't because someone didn't try to slow me up. Yes. Yes, there's something. Well, there isn't something. It's somebody. And from now on, we don't let up until we run him down. Well, who are we going to oh. run down now? Oh, it's you, Doc. Yeah. And while you two been standing there gabbing, me and Reggie done ourselves a job. Get all the bodies loaded in the car? Yeah, no thanks to you. <laughs> Okay, let's get started back to town. I don't know where anyone's going to sit. The entire back is occupied by the unconscious. Well, that's okay. Sonny can drive. You ride in the front seat with her, Reggie. Doc and I'll hang on the running board. Hey, what's Reggie done to get a break like that? He got thrown out of the wreck on his head. And a little thing like that gets him the front seat back to town? Oh, I say, Doc, you take it. I should say not. You're riding with me, Reggie. <laughs> get in. Thank you. Right on. And that settles that. Oh, we ready to start? Yes, yeah, start the motor. Oh, here, wait a minute. Hey, what's the matter now? Uh, just a minute. I've got to get back to the wreck. So, what's that for? Darned if I know. Got some kind of a bee in his bonnet. Hmm. Think we should go, too? Well, I don't reckon. Uh, Sonny. Yes? I heard some of the things Jack said to you. You convinced now that this here little old Richard curse of yours is a lot of hogwash? Oh, I want to. Well, then just go ahead and believe it. Because it's true. Well, it's so mixed up. But I will tell you this. Yeah. There's been a knot of fear twisted up in my stomach for for almost a year now. And for the first time, it isn't there anymore. Now you're talking, fella. Oh, here he comes back. Ah, it didn't take him long. But what'd you go back for, fella? Sonny. Sonny, this may be important. What's the matter? Do you know a man named Donald Robert Lincoln? Donald Robert Lincoln? Yes, think hard. I don't have to. Of course I know. Who is he? What is he? He's one of the richest men in San Diego. Yes, but what connection has he got with you? Oh, I don't know. He was a friend of my father's in the old days. He was? How close a friend? Why, next to Leslie Marks, the closest friend he had, I think. Great. Now we're getting somewhere. But what does Donald Robert Lincoln have to do with this? That's his automobile that's wrecked over there. Hey. Oh, no, Jack. Y you mean he's head of the gang that tried to take us for a ride tonight? That's what we're going to ask him. Oh, but it couldn't. It couldn't be, Mr. Lincoln. I'll know more about that when we've had a little talk with the old boy. <laughs> transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Forson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love the Mystery. adventure thriller Bill, you should have seen that wrecked car. It's a wonder anyone came out alive. Well, that's mighty funny. I'm especially interested in how it happened that Jack, Doc, and Reggie came through that wreck with hardly a scratch and the three gunmen ended up with busted heads and broken bones. Just a lucky chance, I guess. Oh, okay, hardly that. What do you mean, York? Well, it's all very simple. You see, we were expecting the accident and we're ready for it and the other three men weren't. 
Are you kidding? No, not at all, Phil. That's the way it was. Will you tell me how you can get ready for an auto wreck? I don't mind. It's the principle, you know, of centrifugal force. I mean to say, when a speeding car spins and turns over, it's a bit like a whirling phonograph record. Anything near the outer edges flies off, but the nearer the center of the spin you are, the less violent the action. Reggie, how do you get to the center of a whirling, crashing automobile? Well, the chap in the front seat lies down on the floor and wedges himself up under the dashboard, his knees braced against the front seat. And the man in the back seat should drop to the floor and cling to the footrest. That really works? Well, you're still taking a bally lot of chances, of course, but Jack, Doc, and I have come through at least three such wrecks that way. I wish someone had told me that a year ago before I went over the cliff. Quiet. I wish they had. I've told you before not to use that tone of voice to me. I hate sympathy. I'm sorry. You haven't told me yet where Doc Long and Jack Packard are. Well, we'll have to tell you everything that's happened in the last two hours for you to understand. Never mind. You tell me that later. Where are they now? Doc is down at the police emergency hospital. Jack's gone to see Mr. Donald Robert Lincoln. Donald Robert Lincoln? Yes. You mean old money bags, Lincoln? Yes. Why? What's Packard got to do with him? Does he expect... Who's that? Shall I go to the door and see? Who is it? It's uh, Leslie Marks, Phil. Leslie? I didn't expect to find anyone else here. If uh, I'm intruding... Of course he's not intruding, is he, Phil? No, no. As long as you're here, you might as well stay. Thanks, Phil. And cut the Phil stuff, Marks. My last name's Terry. Very well, Terry. Why the sudden visit? You're surprised? Well, why shouldn't I be? First time you've been to see me since I came to this hospital. Well, Terry, as a matter of fact, I came to see you about Sonny here. Sonny? What do you mean, Leslie? Why did you come to see Phil about me? And if you must know, Sonny, I wanted to discuss your engagement to Jack Packard with Phil. Why should you do that? Yeah, why should I discuss Sonny's engagement to another man with you, Marks? I certainly don't intend to say anything in front of the present group, especially York here. Kind. Would you like me to leave? You stay right where you are, Reggie. What about it, Phil? Yeah, yeah, stick around. By the way, Marks, Reggie and Sonny were just telling me a little story when you came in. Maybe you'd like to hear it, too. Maybe I would. Go ahead. Leslie, did you know that three men in police uniforms came in here a couple of hours ago and they pretended to arrest Jack, Doc, and Reggie? Uh, what's that? Quite. For the murder of Fish Evans. Uh, no, I didn't know that. Well, then, of course, you didn't know that when those officers got the boys outside, they turned out to be three gunmen intent on taking them for a ride. Are you being serious? Bloody serious, Marks. Go ahead, tell them what happened, Reggie. They loaded us into a car and took us out on the desert. They had our final resting place all picked out for us, and just before we arrived, Jack reached over and spun the steering wheel and wrecked the car. Deliberately wrecked a speeding car? Right. Well, what happened? Well, our three captors were knocked about a bit. Jack, Doc, and I escaped with minor bruises. That's remarkable. Not at all. We knew how to protect ourselves. But if you wrecked the car, how did you get back to town so quickly? Uh, how far out were you? No, ten or fifteen miles, I should judge. Fortunately, Sonny here had the good sense to trail our car. Sonny, you did that? Yes. I see. Now, what became of the gunmen? Well, we were on the point of landing them into Sonny's car and returning to town when two more of the ballet brutes showed up. What's that? You didn't tell me that. Well, we hadn't got that part of the story yet. They threw guns on us and seemed intent on completing the execution. They were part of the same gang? Apparently. You were there at that time, Sonny? Yes. One of them was in favor of killing me, too. Killing you? Sonny, in heaven's name, child, supposing that they had killed you. Well, supposing they had. No, no, Sonny. You've got to have a guard after this. I've got all the guard I need. You haven't any guard at all. Jack, Doc, and Reggie are doing pretty well. Never mind that. What happened? The boys went to work on them. That's what happened. But they were dangerous killers. No, they weren't so dangerous when Jack and Reggie finished with them. I see. Uh, York. Yes, Mr. Mark. You men seem to know your business. If you're talking about fighting, I agree with you. Yes, but I suppose there was a certain element of luck in your favor. It takes more than luck. Just look at you. So you had five bodies to bring in instead of three. The whole back of my car was full of bodies. You should have seen the police sergeant's eyes bug out when we brought him out to the car. What do you have to say? We told him we'd picked up the five in an auto accident out on the desert. And uh, we thought he might be interested. I say, yeah. He took one look at them and we were his friends for life. What do you mean by that? Well, it seems that three of our bodies were very badly wanted for smuggling across the Mexican border. He said that? He said more than that. One of them is wanted on an old murder charge, and the other one is wanted by the federal men on a narcotic indictment. Quite a haul. 
After that, you boys should have a pretty fine standing with the police in this part of the state. Oh, you think they won't? Well, we'll know more about that when Doc gets back. He's still down there giving them our story. Uh, they let you two go. Yes, we wanted to get back up here and relieve Phil's mind. See, it all started right here in the room, and I, I knew Phil would be worried. It was thoughtful of you. You said Doc Long was at the station. Uh, where's Jack Packard? Oh, we dropped Jack off at Donald Robert Lincoln's. Donald Robert... You dropped Packard off where? That's right, at Mr. Lincoln's home. Why? Well, Jack made a very interesting discovery. I, I, I don't see any reason for keeping it to ourselves, do you, Sonny? No, he didn't say to keep it secret. Great. We discovered the car used by the gangsters and carting us out to the desert was one belonging to Mr. Lincoln. What are you saying? A bit of a blow, huh? The gangster's car belonged to Donald Robert Lincoln, and Packard's gone to beard the man in his den? Oh, Jack can take care of himself. Wasn't he a friend of your father's, Sonny? Yes. He'd better be able to take care of himself. That fellow Lincoln is no one to play around. I realize you're only the butler and you have your orders, but I'll give you one more chance. Do I get in to see Donald Robert Lincoln? No. Well, you asked for it. <laughs> I'm sorry, but there's no time to argue. And I better roll you behind the curtain so as not to upset the household. There you are. Sleep sweet. Yeah, let's see now. He said the library. This should be it. Jenkins, I said I didn't want to be disturbed. Stop it! I was fiddling with that door. If you look up from your work, you might be surprised. What's that? Yes. Who are you? What are you doing in my library? Now, don't get up. How did you get in here? Jenkins! No use calling for Jenkins. He's sound asleep on the floor behind the drapes in the hall. Is... Is this a robbery? No. Then get out. Not yet. We've got some talking to do. People don't enter my house at will. You'll be behind bars before you're 24 hours older. Maybe. Now will you let me talk for a minute? Well, say it and get out. Mr. Lincoln, you're one of the most prominent men in this section of the state. What of it? You have a good name, wife, two or three nearly grown children. What are you getting at? It'd be a pretty terrific thing to have that good name come tumbling down in ruins, wouldn't it? I'm beginning to see. You are? Blackmail. Wrong again. So you say. Lincoln, do you own a big black roadmaster car? I do. Where is it? In my garage, naturally. No, it isn't. I say it is. And I say it isn't. I was around looking in your garage before I came in to see you. Just a minute. We'll see about this. Hello, Higgins. Is the roadmaster in the garage? It's not. Well, where... All right, that's all. I was mistaken. The car's in the service garage down at the corner having new tires put on it. No, it isn't. I say it is. I'll lay you a bet of a hundred to one it's not. Say, who are you? What do you care where my car is? A hundred to one. Take it. I should be dialing the police station instead of a garage. <laughs> but I notice you're dialing the garage. Hello, service garage. This is Donald Robert Lincoln talking. You've got my roadmaster down there putting new tires on it? It's there now? You're sure about that? That's all I want to know. The car's down there just as I said it was. Now get out of here. They told you that at the garage? They did. But either they lied like thieves or else you're putting up a mighty good front. If you've got anything to say, say it and get out. Very well, I I'm will. I'm a busy man. Tonight, three gunmen took three men for a ride out on the desert. The car was completely demolished. That car was your roadmaster. Are you from police headquarters? No. Are you from the insurance company? No. Are you one of the gunmen? No, I'm one of the men who was taken on that ride. What are you doing here? Well, first I want to know why gangsters are using your car. If what you say is true, then the car must have been stolen from the service garage. But they said the car was still there. Then they must be in collusion with the gangsters. Maybe. Next, I want to know what your relationship with Sonny Richards is. Sonny Richards? Now, don't tell me you don't know her, because I know you do. You were a close friend of her father, James Richards. You... You're talking about his daughter? I am. I haven't seen the girl since her father's death. You have no interest in the financial side of her estate? I believe that is handled in its entirety by Leslie Marks, her attorney. You know Marks? Yes. What kind of a man is he? He has a reputation beyond reproach. Lincoln, there's something that stinks the high heaven in this neighborhood. 
I wonder if it isn't you. You? You? Get out of my house. Your reputation and wealth would go a long way toward covering up any dirty work you might be engaged in. Go on. Keep talking. You might very easily be... Get him, Higgins! What? Oh! transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. The next episode of I Love a Mystery, episode 105, number 11 in the 15-part uh, series called The Million Dollar Curse. Coming up next. Remember, this is radio. There is no video. This is just to sit back, listen, and enjoy while you do other things. Use the theater of the mind to picture everything. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love the Mystery. adventure thriller Open that door Who, me? Yes, you Sure Where do you suppose this goes to? Blacker than the inside of your hat Never mind Spider Yeah? Get that flashlight on him why don't we finish the job right here and get on our way? Make too much noise. Where do we get down to the basement? Yeah. So that's where we're going. Down in the basement. Looks like it. Come on, Donham stops with you. But it's dark down there, Phil. Spider's got the flash on you. What more do you want? Well, I can't see where I'm walking. For all I know, I'm stepping off in space. You heard me. Get going. Come on, Doc. Well, if you say so, Jack. Yeah. Dive down the stairs. Dive? Come on, come on, move along. We ain't got all day. Get out of the beam of that flashlight. We'll have to take a chance. Ain't we liable to bust him? We'll have to chance it. Hit that spot on him, Spider. Let's go. Spider, come on, get after Doc, Doc, you hurt? Where are you? I'm okay. Well, come on, there must be an outside basement door. Yeah, let's go. Tiptoes, keep it quiet. Hey, hey, Spider, where are you? There I am. Well, keep with me with that flashlight. As long as we can keep out of the flash, we're okay. Here, here's the door. Atta boy. Door. Locked. No key? No. Look up. Throwing that light around, crouched up. I see some junk over yonder. You think we can get behind it? Let's drive. Come on. Well, they got to be down here. There ain't no way for them to get out. I told you we should have bumped them upstairs. Did you lock the door at the top of the stairs like I told you? Yeah. Then there ain't no way they can get out. 
They gotta be hiding around here, back of some of this junk. I thought this house was empty. Sure. And hey, what's all this stuff doing down here? Well, somebody's using it for a storeroom, looks like. Let them have it the minute you spot them. Yeah, like hunting jackrabbits in a brush. Hey, hey, swing your flash over that way. Hmm. Door. Must be another room. Yeah. Furnace room, maybe. Let's have a can. Whew. Practically standing right on top of us. Yeah. Now we got a minute breather while they're in there. Can you do anything about opening that door? Well, I can try. Well, hurry up. Make it quiet. Yeah. You stay here. Wait. Huh? Too late. Here comes the flashlight. Hey, fella, what we gonna do? Just lie here under this stuff and let them dig us out? You got any suggestions? Well, I don't aim to be shot down without a fight. Hold it. Here they come. Let's jump them when they get close enough. All right. Wait until the last minute, though. Well, there's nothing to do but kick around in this junk until we find them. Yeah, wait till the boss hears about this. He ain't gonna hear unless you shoot off your mouth. Them guys are here, and we're gonna find them. Giving us a split. Jack, wh- what was that? Wh- who done that? Someone shot through that basement window. Shot at two gunmen? Looks like it. See if you can find Spider's flashlight. Yeah. Wh- wh- what do you suppose happened? Uh, gang war? Oh, never mind that. Help me find that flashlight. Yeah. <laughs> Dag nabbit. Now what's the matter? Oh, I fell over one of them gun toters. Hey, hey, here it is. Well, you got the flash? Yeah. Okay to turn it on? Well, let's chance it. Here, give it here. Yeah. There. Holy jumping toad frog. Looky at him. Hold that flesh of it. Uh-huh. Hey, fella. Those two look like they've been shot with a box of tacks. Sawed-off shotgun from a distance. Sawed-off shotgun, huh? Yes, from that distance they were sprayed with shot. Neither one of them's badly hurt. They sure are unconscious, though. They won't be for long. Get some of that rope over there and help me tie them up. You gonna take them with us? No, we can't be bothered. No. Yeah. Here's some rope. All right, go to work. Yeah. How far is Sonny's house from here, do you know? Oh, middle of the next block over. Well, yeah, I figure it. Good. <laughs> hey, coming with your man. Yeah, I got his feet tied up. Working on his hand. Step on it. Yeah. Hey, uh, what do you want to know about Sonny's house for? That's where we're going. We are? Ah. Well, there he is. All right, come on. We've wasted too much time now. Hey, uh, didn't you hear Spider say that he had locked the door at the head of the stairs? I got the key. Hurry up. Wait a minute. Come on. What are we in such a hurry about? I'll tell you later. Outside with you. Are we taking the car? Might as well. I'll drive. Get in. Go to it, fella. Turn here, Jack. I don't see Sonny's house. There she is, in the next block. Oh, yeah, okay. All right, pile up. Let's go. I got the key, fella. Where to now? Upstairs to Arthur's room. To Arthur? Well, what's the kid got to do with this? Uh, he's in bed with broken arm. Maybe he is, maybe he's not. Come on. That's his room. Yeah. Who's that? Hello, Arthur. Shut the door, Doc. Yeah. What are you fellas doing here? Well, Arthur, son, we live here. Yeah. Yes, we uh, just dropped in to see how you were feeling. So what? So we'd like to have you tell us. Yeah? Yes. Oh, what's this telephone doing in this room? Sonny brought it up for me. It just plugs into the wall. Mm Mm-hmm. Mind if I use it? There's other telephones in the house. But I want to use this one. Well, go on and use it then. Thanks. Who are you calling, Jack? Police department. What's that for? You interested, Arthur? Say, you mugs, if you think you've got anything on me... Shut up. Hello? Uh, give me Captain Norton. Yeah, Norton. If you think you've got anything on me... You said that before, son. Hold it. Captain Norton, this is Jack Packard. What's that? What do you mean, where did we vanish to? <laughs> so? 
Uh, never mind that. Listen. There's a big brownstone house at 1637 Sunshine Boulevard. Yes, 1637. Well, if you'll send an ambulance around to that address, you might find something that'll interest you very much in the basement. Yeah, in the basement. Me? Oh, I'm at Sonny Richards' house at the moment. No, not for long. I'll be going over to Phil Terry's room at the hospital in a few minutes. Okay. Get that ambulance out in a hurry. Bye. And that's that. What are you trying to do? Take me for a ride? <laughs> Scared the pants off of you, didn't we, kid? Nuts. I thought you'd be interested in that conversation, Arthur. Yeah? Yeah. Why? Because two men were shot over there with a sawed-off shotgun. Yeah? Yeah. Well, what about it? I thought maybe you could tell us uh, what about it. Are you crazy? Well, I don't think so. Well, what should I know about two mugs getting shot? I'm... I'm laying here in bed with a broken arm. Mm-hmm. Doc. Yeah? Pull the covers off him. Hey, what's the idea? Jack said to pull the covers off you, fella. You let me alone. There. Hey, Jack. He's got his clothes on. So I see. You two cheap gangsters. Now, never mind that. Why are you in bed with your clothes on? Because I feel like it. Just plain like to sleep that way, huh, fella? Got his shoes on, too, Doc? Uh, nope. No shoes. And I haven't had any on. I... I was cold, so I put on some clothes and I got back into bed. Mm-hmm. This your closet? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, here's your shoes, all right. That's what I've been telling you. Your shoes, all right, Arthur, only you haven't been telling us the truth. Oh, yes, I have. No, because the inside of the shoes are still warm from having been worn. Well... Well, what? So it was your face I saw at the basement window, that other house. Hey, Jack. It was, wasn't it, Arthur? I ain't talking. Jack, you mean it was Arthur here who sprayed them two guys with a shotgun? That's right. Arthur, you sure enough done that? I ain't talking, I said. But, fella, you may be saved our lives. Who cares about that? <laughs> well, son, I do, for one. Well, that isn't the question. What I want to know is, why did you do it? Do what? Now, look, Arthur, that's just being silly. We know you did it, so stop acting. Yeah? What do you know about those men? How did you know they were taking us there? That's funny. It sounds just as though I hear somebody talking. Well, doing what you done made things a lot easier for us, fella. Why don't you come clean, and maybe we could make it easier for you. I tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I guess there's nothing else to do. What do you mean? We thought maybe you'd like to keep this a secret. Yeah? Yes. But if you're not going to talk, we'll have to discuss it with Sonny and your brother Phil. No. No, you ain't telling nothing to Sonny and Phil. You don't want them to know? That's all I ask. Don't tell Sonny and Phil. Why not? You heard what Phil said to me. You heard him say if he ever heard of me with a gun again, he'd turn me over to the cops. But, fella, you said you didn't know nothing about it. I don't. I don't. But if you tell Phil, he'll think I did. Son, it looks to me like you're almighty afraid of your brother Phil. Yeah. Yeah. I'm his brother. I know. Further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. That was episode 105. This is episode 106 of I Love a Mystery. It is the 13th episode of The Million Dollar Curse which aired on 12-28-1949. This will be starting shortly.
Remember everyone, this is a radio show. No video. Not a movie. I love the mystery. adventure thriller Phil, I hope you don't mind us using your room for a conference hall. The pleasure's all mine, Packard. Anything to break the monotony. As long as we don't tire you. When I get tired, Sonny, you'll hear about it. That's a promise. Arthur... Yes, Phil? Where's the wheelchair? I'm through with that baby carriage stuff. Yeah? How's the arm? It's in a cast. How do I know? Well, are we all here? No. No, we're waiting for Leslie Marks. Sonny's attorney? What's he got to do with this? Well, he's in on this with the rest of us. Oh, Reggie. Yes, Jack? Open that window. We need a little air in here. Mm, Crack. Draft on you, Sonny? No, it smells good. Mmm, fog thick enough out there to spit on your bread. Hey, Long. Talking to me? That's right. What are you sitting over there by the door for? I like it over here. Yeah, I see you do. Why? Just a hunch, I reckon. Doc means he doesn't get caught in the same predicament twice. I still don't get it. The last time we were all together in this room, we had visitors. With guns. Oh, so that's it. That's it, fella. Should visitors come again... uh... We're kind of spread out and fight information. I see. You by the door, pack it here by the bed, and York over by the window. And now you know as much as we do. But that's fantastic. They wouldn't dare try the same thing again. You can't tell what a bunch of torpedoes will do. It's just like I always said. Oh, I'll get it. Oh, uh, well, come on in, fella. It's Leslie Mark. Yes. You were expecting me, I believe? Yes, come in. Have a chair. Hello, Leslie. Good evening, Sonny. How are you, Terry? Don't bother to ask. Very well. How's the arm, Arthur? It's broke. How'd you think it was? Well, all very pleasant. Arthur, that's awful. So what? Phil, you should say something to Arthur about his manners. What's the matter with him? Well, you heard how rude he was to Leslie. Oh, that. Here's that. Never mind, Sonny. But I do mind you've been a good friend to me, and I don't care what anybody says or thinks. What's that? What? Has someone been saying I haven't been a good friend to you? Oh, I I didn't mean... Sure, Marx. I say it. I see, Terry. That explains a lot of things. It does? Yes. I've noticed an antagonism in you against me, and I never understood it until now. (laughs) He never understood it till now. But if you think I've taken advantage of Sonny in some manner, then naturally I can understand your resentment. That's what I call real deduction. Phil, I'm interested... You keep out of this, Packard. Do you mind telling me why you think Marx is taking advantage of Sonny? And in what way? I said for you to keep out of this. All right, let it go. But, Phil, you're wrong. I'm not wrong. Leslie, do you know what Phil's talking about? I think so. Well, for heaven's sake, let's hear it. Phil's disliked me ever since I refused to give you extra money from the estate to maintain him here in this hospital. Oh, no, Leslie. Marx, you said the one thing that you shouldn't ever have said. Nevertheless, Terry, I believe I'm stating facts. Sonny has paid every expense you've incurred since you were injured a year ago, and I might state that there were plenty of expenses. Leslie, I forbid you to say another word. And furthermore, Terry, Sonny has been keeping this lazy, good-for-nothing brother of yours. What did you call me? Arthur, you shut up. What did you call me, Marx? I called you a lazy, good-for-nothing. Arthur! Arthur! Water glass came within an inch of my hip. I intended for it to brain you. Arthur! I'll kill that tin horn lawyer. Arthur, I'm talking to you. What do you want? Come over here to the bed. Phil! Come over here to the bed. Now then. Phil, don't hit me. Don't hit you. Why, you little baby-faced punk, I got a notion to smear your nose all over your face. You hear me? Phil, let go my collar. You're choking me. What do you mean, saying you'll kill anybody? Answer me. What do you mean by it? Phil, you're choking me. Oh, Phil, That's please. That's me, punk. You heard what he said about us. And I told you to stay out of it, didn't I? But you can't do anything. You're a cripple, Phil. <laughs> oh, Phil. 
Don't ever say that to me again. You hear? Yes, Bill. Now go and sit down. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what everybody thinks. I'm a cripple. Well, supposing I am. Oh, no, Phil. I said supposing I am. Here, Arthur, drink this. Make your throat feel better. All right. Well, isn't anybody going to answer me? Phil, we're getting entirely away from the matter we gathered here to discuss. What do I know about what you came here to discuss? You called the meeting? Yes. But I haven't had a chance to get a word in edgewise so far. Well, you've got the floor now, haven't you? All right. I suppose you all know by this time that I went out to interview Donald Robert Lincoln and got thrown into jail for my trouble. Yeah, yeah, that was great work. Uh Uh-huh. But I did accomplish one purpose. I've finally given the police a clue to this gang that's been working against us. And what is that? The service garage where Lincoln has work done in his cars is definitely connected with the mob. Hey, Jack, I thought you wasn't supposed to tell that. Well, it's not supposed to be known generally. It's all right among ourselves. The police are watching that garage? Yes, but that's a side issue. What I really wanted to tell you was a little incident that happened to Doc and me last night after we were released from jail. Or rather, I want Doc to tell it. Well, why me, Jack? Never mind. Let's go out. Okay. Well, me and Jack come out of the jail and got into Sonny's car that I had parked outside and started for home. When all of a sudden, a couple of torpedoes come up out of the back seat and poke shooting pistols in the backs of her neck. Doc! More gunmen? That's right, Sonny. You boys seem to be plenty unpopular in this town. Ain't it the truth? Well, they made me drive to a big brownstone house over on Sunshine Street, not so far from uh, from here. They, then they took us inside. It was their headquarters? No, it wasn't, fella. It was a vacant house. Anyway, from their conversation, they was all set to take us down in the basement and finish up the little jobs their playmates messed up on out on the desert. They, they, they were going to kill you? Well, that was the object of meeting. Only going down the stairs to the basement in the dark, me and Jack done a high dive and got out of the, their spotlight. You did what? They had a flash on us. We dived down the stairs. But you might have been killed. <laughs> well, shucks, a broken neck or hot lead in your gizzard, you're just as dead either way. Anyway, after that, we played hide-and-go-seek for quite a while with them, when all of a sudden, bam, and somebody let them have it with both barrels of a sawed-off shotgun. There was somebody else in the basement, too? No, no. A shot from outside through the basement window. He he killed them both? Uh Uh-uh. He he was too far off. He just sprayed them with buckshot. But it's good enough. It laid them out long enough for me and Jack to put ropes on them and call the police to come and get them. So now the police have seven members of the gang. Yeah, the five we picked up on the desert and these two mugs. That's an interesting point, don't you think so, Marks? What's that? I, I don't follow you. I mean... If the big boss isn't careful, he's going to just about find himself out of gunmen. Why do you address that to me? I just thought you might have an opinion. There seems to be an insinuation behind your remarks. You haven't an opinion? No. I have. Well, good, Terry. Let's hear it. I'd say offhand the Richard curse that's been given Sonny here so much trouble has turned into a gang fight. It does, doesn't it? In which case, the more gunmen the police round up, the less trouble Sonny's going to have with the curse. I differ with you there, Mark. Why? Because no matter how many mugs we round up, Sonny's not going to have any peace until we put our finger on the leader. Oh, yes, the leader. How do you figure that, Packin? Well, this riffraff we picked up aren't important. They're just doing what they're told. The man we want is the boss, who knows why. The man who knows why it's important that every man who comes closely associated with Sonny must be killed off. Yeah. Yeah, that's the guy we've got to get. You... You really believe that's at the bottom of all this trouble? Someone is trying to keep men away from Sonny? I know that's it. But why? That's the thing I can't understand. Why, what difference does it make to anyone who I see or know? Well, if we knew that fella, then we'd probably know who the buzzard was. Wait a minute. Well, Marks? I'm beginning to understand your insinuation a moment ago, Packard. Yes? Anyone interested enough in Sonny to want to keep men away from her would have to be someone close to her. I think so. Don't you? Yes. As her attorney and executor, I'm closer to Sonny than anyone else. Right. I'm the only man who has been close to her over the past year who hasn't been a victim of the curse. Well, let's say the victim of the gang. That's more accurate. Yes. Therefore, I'm the logical man to suspect. Now, that's what I call a beautiful analysis. However, you're wrong. Maybe. And I'll point out the flaw in your reasoning. Go ahead. What have I to lose or gain by Sonny's association with other men? That doesn't prove anything. Somebody's guilty and somebody's got a reason. You may have a secret reason just as much as anyone else. But I haven't. That's what you say. Mm, I, I say, Jack. That's right. Sir. You say it has to be someone close to Sonny. It seems logical. Hmm. Well, who is there closely associated with her? I mean, besides Marks here. Well, there's Phil Terry here. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, I'm a great candidate. I got the worst deal of anybody so far. At least the others are dead and out of their misery. Phil, dear. And don't call me dear. Don't call you dear. No. But why? Well, you're going to marry Packard, aren't you? Oh, yes. That's why. To, uh, to get back to the subject. After Phil comes Arthur here. Yeah, yeah. He'd make a great leader for a mob, wouldn't he? I'm just naming over possibilities. Little Arthur here sure has all the makings. He won't have when I get through working on him. I'm doing all right. Listen, kid, I'm going to make a man out of you if I have to kill you doing it. Yeah. Now, we're drifting again. I've got one more candidate. Well, who's that, Jack? Donald Robert Lincoln. Oh, but that's absurd, Jack. Mr. Lincoln isn't close to me. He was very close to your father. Supposing this thing reaches back... Lincoln, Lincoln, Packard, I think you've got something there. What do you mean? I just remember something about Donald Robert Lincoln. About six months before Sonny's father was killed, Lincoln and Mr. Richard had a deal. Uh, oh! Leslie! Leslie! Jack! Jack, the shot came through the window. There he goes down the fire escape. Go get him. Doc, go with Reggie. You bet here, you. Here, let me see. Leslie, Leslie. What does anybody care? Arthur, you mustn't say that. Yeah, the mugs had it coming for a long time. <laughs> transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Part 13 of The Million Dollar Curse from My Love a Mystery will be starting up shortly. Hang in there. One moment, having a wee bit of technical difficulties getting it to load. It'll be just another minute here, ladies and gentlemen. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... The City of the Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder... Come with me. But first, listen to a word from our sponsor. The City of the Dead. There are 10,000 citizens in the City of the Dead, each with a white marble slab indicating each residence. The gates of the City of the Dead have long been closed to newcomers. 
It is a city whose population has remained unchanged for the last 10 years. And the mayor of this city is Joshua Friday. Some call him caretaker of the old cemetery in the valley. But anyone who knows Joshua Friday at all calls him mayor. He is the only living person in the city of the dead. Sorry. Here we go. adventure thriller well at least there's one thing we know that Mark's feller ain't gonna die he's a long way from being dead close that door when you're ready it's quiet but now that we got the library to ourselves, let's give this business a quick going over. Well, I'd say it was about time. Yeah, I don't know which end I'm standing on half the time. Now, before we get into that, what about that torpedo? The feller it shot Mark? Yeah. Well, he got clean away in the fog. I know that. Either of you get a good look at him? In this weather? Well, feller, the fog's so thick outside. How about it... you, Reggie? Mm, no, not a bit of it. Right on top of the shooting, I looked out the window and saw the ballet blighter going down the fire escape. Now, if I'd had a gun, I could have potted him easily. Didn't see his face at all? No. Mm hmm. Well, that shooting brought to light a couple of interesting possibilities. Yeah? Yeah. Do you recall what Marx was saying just before he was shot? Yes, quite. You had just mentioned Donald Robert Lincoln as a possible leader of the mob that's doing this dirty work. Oh, yeah. And Marx, he just remembered something. Something about a deal between old Moneybags Lincoln and Sonny's papa just before he is shot. Exactly. Could it be that the gunman shot at that particular moment to prevent Marx from finishing what he was about to tell us? Hey. But if that's true then that would just about prove that Lincoln is the chap they were looking for. Yeah, gunplay to cover up something in Lincoln's past. That's one of the possibilities. Another one is the fact that Leslie Marks was only shot in the shoulder. Huh? What does that prove? Well, doesn't it seem a bit odd that Marks wasn't shot dead? Marks was sitting less than 15 feet from the window. I could have done a better job than that with a slingshot. No, fella, I don't think that proves anything. If all the bad shots in this world was laid end to end, besides that, he was standing on a fire escape and anxious to make his getaway. No, I don't think bad shooting proves a thing. Well, maybe you're right, but uh, listen to my theory anyway. Well, spill it. Well, this is built on the assumption that Leslie Marks is the mob leader. I see, and, and one of his own men shot him? Yeah. You mean they're turning on him? No, it was a plant. We've talked so much about Marks being close to Sonny and not being bothered, he had to do something about it. So what does he do? He plants one of his men on the fire escape with instructions to shoot him in our presence. Mm, Joe, what a chance he was taking. Not if he knew his gunman. Some of these torpedoes can shoot the eyes off a fly. Oh, boy, it'd sure be an alibi hard to be. Exactly. We saw him shot down, so naturally he'd be the last man in the world we'd suspect as the gang leader. So now we've got our choice between Lincoln and Marx. Yeah, and I put my money on Lincoln. You don't like my theory about Marx, huh? Well, fella, if you want the truth, I don't. Well, why not? Well, I don't know. I just don't. Sounds just a little bit like something they'd think up in the movies. Mm -hmm. You get what I mean? Yeah. Well, maybe you're right. I'd still like to know why the gunman didn't kill Marks at 15 feet, though. Mm, that's quite. Or why didn't he step into the room and finish up the job proper? None of us was armed. I mean to say, he took a ballet chance making his escape down four stories on the fire escape. Well, uh, don't get me wrong. I still think Marks is a good possibility. And now there's something else that's stuck out in our conversation over there like a sore thumb. Either of you get it? I guess I slipped up. Reggie? Yes, well, as a matter of fact, there was one thing. Yes, I thought you'd get it, because you weren't with Doc and me when we were taken to the brownstone house. Well, I still don't get what you're talking about. Well, you told the story of how the two gunmen held us up and took us down to the basement of the house. Then you said, all of a sudden, bam, somebody shot him with a sawed-off shotgun. Yeah, I remember. Well, Phil asked, was there someone else in the basement? And you said, no, the shot came from the basement window. Yeah. Well... Well, I guess I'm just plain dumb. Don't you see, Doc? The subject was dropped right there. Not a single person in the room asked who fired the shotgun. 
And all the time, that was the thing I wanted to know most. I wasn't there, so naturally, I wanted to know if you and Jack knew who fired the shots. Oh, yeah, sure. But don't you see? It was just as though everyone in the room knew who shot those two gunmen. Yeah. Well, even Sonny didn't ask. Not only Sonny, but Phil Terry and Leslie Marks. And Phil's brother, Arthur. Well, there was a good reason why Arthur wasn't curious. There was? Yes, we haven't had a chance to tell you before, Reggie, but... Arthur wasn't curious because it was Arthur who did the shooting. Oh, look here, you're sure? Oh, we practically caught him red-handed. But will you tell me why Phil and Marks and Sonny didn't ask? You, you think they knew? Well, they knew something. But looky, you trust Sonny, don't you? Well, naturally. Well, couldn't we just get a hold of Sonny and get it out of her? Well, we might try. I don't like it. You don't like what? Why should Sonny be keeping anything from us? Why should she be keeping a secret with Marks and Phil Terry? Well, of course, she has known Marks and Terry much longer than she's known us. Yeah, but we're the ones who are trying to get her out of this mess. Yeah, it does kind of make you wonder, don't it? When are we going to be able to see Marks? Well, the doctor said not before tomorrow, shock and the lock. Hey, we ain't expecting no telephone calls, are we? Hello? Yeah? No, this is Reggie York. Yes, he's here. I say, Donald, drop... Hey, Reg. Just quiet. Yeah. Yes, I'll tell him. Right up. What's the matter, Reggie? That was Donald Robert Lincoln. He wants us to come right out to his home. Well, ain't he got a nice disposition. Well, he said to hurry. It was important. First he has Jack hit over the head and thrown in a calaboose, and now he invites him out to his home. Well, come on, we're wasting time. Y- you mean we're going? Well, certainly we're going. Grab your hats. Well, shouldn't we leave a note for Sonny? Well, she's over at the hospital with Phil, isn't she? Miss Klein. Well, we needn't bother. We'll have to use her car, though. Yes, down in front. All right. Well, I'll say. Well, what do you suppose this Lincoln feller's got on his mind? It'll be interesting to see. No, I-, I still think we ought to leave word where we're going. Why? Oh, I, I smell a trap. Well, what of it? Yeah, we don't want the Marines galloping up to get us out of a hole. Mm, I don't. Well, here she is. You want me to drive, Jack? All right. No, oh, here, just a minute. What's the matter? Well, let's make sure there aren't any torpedoes planted in the back seat on this ride. Hey, they wouldn't have the gall to try the same trick twice. I guess you're right. Up in the back, Reggie. That's right. Go ahead, slide over the little dark. Yeah. We're not going to a fire now, so take it easy. <laughs> Just a backseat driver at heart. Get out! Get out of the car! Man, oh man. Oh, it blowed right up in my hands. You you all right, Doc? Uh, Anybody hurt? Don't tell me the automobile ain't dangerous. Never mind that. Where's Reggie? (coughs) I say, here I am. Are you all right? No, I think so. I got out of the car, but the explosion knocked me flat. Will you tell me what done that? Uh, certainly I'll tell you. One of our playful friends put a load of dynamite under the hood and wired it to the ignition. When you put your foot on the starter, it exploded. Well, fella, we're having more fun than anybody. You think so? I say, Jack, is this the reason Donald Robert Lincoln was so anxious for us to come and see him? Hey, you mean he's the one who had that exterminating powder put under the hood? Well, that's what we want to find out. Come on. Where are we heading for now? Across the park to the hospital. But hadn't we ought to get out to Lincoln? Well, this way's shortest. Well, I said hadn't we ought to get No. Out. Okay, fella, you're the doctor. You coming, Reggie? It's quiet. Crowd's beginning to gather back at the wreck. Yeah. If we're going to do much more of this hundred-yard dash stuff, I'm going to get me a pair of running breeches. Across the street. Okay. Now, come on to the elevator. We're going up to Phil Terry's room? No. You mean we're going to Leslie Mark's room? Yeah. Get in. Fourth floor, please. But if the doctor said Marks wasn't to be disturbed... I still say Marks was too slightly hurt for all the fuss that was made. You sure are set on making Marks the villain, fella. All right, come on. You know which room Marks was taken to? Yeah, 432. Yeah, this is it here. Well, now we're here, what? Not a word. I'm going to see how quietly I can open this door. Uh-huh. Got it? Uh-huh. I'm going to open it and crack it. Keep your ears you, The situation is more desperate than it's ever been. He's talking on the phone. Shut up. That's Listen. what I've been telling you all along. We've got to fight fire with fire. Got our backs right up against the wall, and there's only. Doc, you fool. Who is that? Uh, Who's that at the hall? I, I, I go 
couldn't help it. I'm sorry. Yeah, a lot of good that does. Who is that out in the hall? Come on. Hello, Max. How's the shoulder? Uh, what's this? What are you doing here? We just came up to see how the latest victim of the Richard Curse is doing. You were standing outside my door listening. Were we? And that's pretty dirty politics. Got a fever. There's no telling what a man might say when he's light in the head. Oh, oh, you're light in the head. A bullet in your shoulder is nothing to take lightly. I, I've caught myself talking to myself several times. You were talking to yourself, huh? What do you mean? It sounded to us as though you were talking over the telephone. That's ridiculous. I, I haven't the strength to lift a telephone receiver. You uh, know what happened to us just now? Will you go away and leave me alone? I'm in no condition to have visitors. Someone put dynamite under the hood of Sonny's car. We started to take a ride in it, and it blew up. How did you escape? Well, we saw it coming, rolled out of the car. Marks, why are you pretending to be so much worse off than you really are? I'm not pretending. Yes, you are. Well, Packard, I'm scared. Scared? So scared, I'm going to stay right here in this hospital with this superficial wound until this mob of gunmen is wiped out. Well, spank me for a baby. Yell. I've been a target for a gunman once. That's plenty. Mind if I use your phone? No, go ahead. Outside, please. Who were you uh, talking to on the phone? I wasn't. Uh-huh. Hello? Donald Robert Lincoln Residence? This is the police department. I want to talk to Mr. Lincoln at once. Thank you. Why are you calling Lincoln? I'd rather know what you were about to tell us about Lincoln when you were shot. And I've changed my mind about that. You're not going to talk? No. Oh, uh, hello, Lincoln. This is Jack Packard. That's it, the man you had slugged and thrown into jail. I just wanted to tell you that someone just blew up our car so we won't be able to keep our appointment with you. What's that? The appointment you called about ten minutes ago, and you... Oh, you didn't call. Uh Uh-huh. Can you prove that? I see. Thank you. Marks Lincoln didn't call us. He's got an ironclad alibi. What about it? Just this. If Donald Robert Lincoln isn't the man we're after, then it's got to be you. transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. This program came from New York. Episode 14 will be starting shortly. That is episode 108 of the I Love a Mystery. The One Million Dollar Curse. Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love the Mystery.
Martin Morse adventure thriller. Tell you, Captain, we've got our man. It's got to be the man. You haven't got a thing on Leslie Marks, and you know it, Packard. He's still the mastermind behind this mob. Just the same, Jack. The captain's right. We ain't got nothing on him. Well, looky, the way he acted when you accused him face to face of being the gang leader... How did he act? Well, he just plum laughed in our face. Naturally. I'm not through with him yet. I've got Reggie planted up on the fire escape outside his window. If he tries to pull anything while he's lying in bed pretending to be badly wounded, we'll trip him up. If we can only pick up the gunman that shot him, it may help. Uh, You know it won't. We've got seven of the mob down behind bars now. Have you been able to get any information out of them? No. Certainly not. They just won't talk. And I still say Leslie Marks had himself slightly wounded to turn suspicion from him. Hey, Captain, not to change the subject, but you got any line on them fellas that put that dynamite under the hood of Sonny's car? We've got a dragnet out. Man, was that an explosion. Oh, that's not essential here. They get back to Marks. Haggard, why are you so sure it's Marks? Well, he's the logical man. Why is he the logical man? You can't bring forth one single reason. There's not one way in which he benefits by keeping men away from Sonny Richards. Well, there must be a reason. That's what's driving me nuts. But why? Why is he doing it? Why doesn't he want men around Sonny? Why is he trying so hard to get rid of Doc and Reggie and me? You tell me why, and I'll personally go up and put handcuffs on him. Wait a minute. Maybe we're getting somewhere. Doc. Yeah? Go up to Phil Terry's room and ask Sonny to come down here. Yeah, okay. Oh, and Doc. Now what? If uh, Phil's brother Arthur's up there, bring him down, too. Only park him outside until we're ready for him. Why not? Now what do you think you're going to do? Look, Captain, we're going to stop looking for the man. You're going to do what? Yeah. For the moment, we're going to forget all about a mastermind. All we're going to try to find out now is why. This thing is not turning your mind, is it? No, look. All we're going to do is to try to dig out of Sonny something that might suggest a reason why someone would want to keep men away from him. Dig down into her mind. She must have the answer somewhere in her unconscious mind. She may not even know what's the answer. You see? No, I don't. Will you tell me how you're going to dig information out of a girl's mind if she doesn't even know it's there? Well, I don't know. But it's worth trying. What do you want the kid for? Arthur? Well, he knows something, and I'm going to get it out of him. Something about the case? Yes. I uh, I didn't tell you before, but little Arthur was the one who sprayed those two torpedoes with buckshot. Those two men you picked up in the basement of that brownstone house. The kid did that? Yes. He won't then... admit it, but I know he did. Well, then he saved your lives. Well, maybe. But more important, I want to know how he happened to be at the brownstone house. How he happened to have a sawed-off shotgun. And why he went to all the pains of getting out of bed with a broken arm to come to our rescue. Yeah, it looks like a good bet. Why didn't you tell me this before? Yeah, because I thought I... Uh, they're waiting in here. Uh, come on in, Sonny. What is it now? Doc wouldn't tell me anything. Shut the door, Doc. Yeah. I think you've met Captain Norton before, Sonny. Yes. Sit down here, Miss Richards. Thank you. Sonny, this is very important. I want you to think before you answer each question. Now, think. Did anyone ever say to you, you must never marry? No. You sure about that? For any reason, whatever, at any time in the past? Yes, Jack, I'm sure. Not for any reason. Well, then, did anyone ever express a dislike of seeing you in men's company? That's an awfully hard question to answer. Why? Well, well, for instance, my father used to say to me that he wished I wouldn't go out with certain boys... And then after Father died, Leslie Marks urged me not to go around with Phil. Hey, he did? Oh, but that's nothing. Even Phil has said that he wished I wouldn't be seen with certain men he didn't like. I mean, it's so hard to answer because... Well, almost every man that's close to a girl disapproves of at least one other man. But none of them disapproved of you going out with all men. Oh, no, no. It was just men they personally disliked. Uh Would you mind answering a personal question? Oh, yes, if I can. How many men have been in love with you? Oh, Captain, that's an impossible question. Well, all right, let me be more specific. Would you mind naming for us the men who have proposed marriage to you? Well, that's very personal. I said it was. Do you mind? Well, Phil, of course. Uh, we know that. And then, well, there were two boys while I was in college, Hugh Bartlett and Jimmy Pearson. They're in San Diego now? Oh, no, no. He was back going to Annapolis and... Jimmy's got some kind of a job with an oil company in the Philippines. Well, let's sum out. Go on. Oh, I hate to say this, but Judge Morton... Old Judge Morton proposed marriage to you? Now, wait a minute. Isn't he the old friend of your father's that fell down your front steps and was killed? Yes, that happened only a week or two after he asked me to marry him. But he was old enough to be your father. I know. I was a little bit ashamed of it. The old fool. Go on. The only other person was... 
Oh, please don't get the wrong impression. He was very kind and understanding. You're talking about Leslie Marks, aren't you? Yes. I think that's all, Sonny. Any more questions, Captain? No. Sonny, I think the case is all wrapped up. You're the same as freed from the Richard curse now and forever. You you know who's behind all this? Yes, and now I think we know the reason why. But who is it? Wait just a little while longer, just a few minutes. Well, may I tell this much to Phil? Sure, why not? Oh, I hope you know what you're talking about. Let her out, Doc. You, you are telling me the truth, aren't you? Positively. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. You, you want Arthur? He's outside. Shut the door for a minute. Well, there you are, Captain. There's your reason why. Leslie Marks wanted Sonny for himself. When he couldn't have her, he went a little crazy and determined to keep everyone else away from her. It's a reason, all right, but it's not good enough. Not good enough? How are you going to prove it? I don't need any more proof. Well, the courts do. You haven't got a single thread of evidence. Well, Doc, bring, bring Arthur in here. You bet you. All right, Arthur. Come on in, son, and meet the law. It's all right, Arthur. Come on in, sit down. This is Arthur, Phil Terry's brother, Captain. Yeah, I've heard about you. How are you, Arthur? I hate cops. Oh, do you indeed? Yeah. Oh, no, that's just too bad. What have we ever done to antagonize you? I just don't like you, see? Yeah, I'm beginning to. Okay, now we got that straight. What do you want? Arthur, why did you take the trouble of shooting those two thugs in the basement of the brownstone house last night? I don't know what you're talking about. You're going to tell us if it's the last thing you do, so you might as well open up and make it easy for yourself. How did you know those gunmen were going to take us there? What gunmen? Where? Where did you get that sawed-off shotgun you used? I've never even seen a sawed-off shotgun in my life. Where did you get that shotgun? I tell Where you... Where did you get that shotgun? Oh, go take a jump at yourself. You see, Arthur, we know more than you think we know. We know who the head of the mob is now. No. No, no, you don't. We not only know who he is, but why he's been carrying on this reign of terror. I don't believe it. We certainly do. All we're trying to get out of you is your part. Everything else is all tied up. Now I know you're lying. What's that? Sure, because if you knew the head of the gang, you'd you'd know where I stood. Ha! <laughs> ha! Know everything, huh? You don't know nothing. Hackett, I think you better let me take this boy down to police headquarters. You ain't got anything on me. Shooting two men with a sawed-off shotgun? Hmm? I think we got plenty on you, son. I, I didn't. That's not true. Unless you want to come clean, you're going to go with me. Yeah? Yeah. Well, I don't know nothing, see? Under those circumstances, young man, you may consider yourself... Are you expecting a call, Captain? No. Well, I'll take it. Hello? Reggie, where are you? What's that? You say... Well, stay right where you are. We're coming. Captain, that was Reggie. Leslie Marks has been shot to death in his bed. Hey, what you talking about? Murder, shot in the hallway. Come on. Hey, where did you say that girl Sonny was going? Well, uh, Sonny? Sonny? Well, she said she is going to Phil's room. What's that? Yeah, Sonny's up in Phil Terry's room. And, Phil, the best news in the world. I've just come from Jack and Captain Norton. Captain Norton? Yes, he's from the police department. He and Jack and Doc are questioning people down in the hospital waiting room. Well, so Packard's called in the police, huh? But, Phil, he's been working with the police all along. What are they doing down there? They're questioning people. They question you? Yes, and the strangest questions I ever heard. They've got Arthur down there now. Arthur? Yes, and they told me the most wonderful news. What sort of questions did they ask you, Sonny? Well, aren't you interested in the news? I asked you what sort of questions they asked you. Why, well, Mostly about my personal life. First, did anyone ever forbid me going around with men? Ask you that, huh? Yeah, and, and then they asked me for the list of all the men who'd ever proposed marriage to me. <laughs> Makes quite a list, don't it? With Jack Packard's name at the head of the list. Oh, Phil, I've got something to confess to you now. I mean, it's all right to tell it now. What's that? I'm not in love with Jack Packard. What's that? No. I'm sorry I had to hurt you by pretending that I was... But he said it was necessary to make people think we were going to marry. So you ain't in love with Packard? Huh? No. It was just a trap to draw the fire of, of whoever has been doing all these horrible things. So that was it. How come you're telling me this now? But that's it. There's no longer any need for secrecy. No? No. They know who the man is. And they're going to arrest him in just a few minutes. Who told you that? Jack, just now. He said to give them a few minutes more to clean up the details. Did he happen to mention the name of this man? No, he wouldn't tell. He said in a few minutes... You're sure he knows? Oh, yes. I think that's why he has Captain Norton with him. To make the arrest. Mm Mm-hmm. Sonny. Yes, Phil? Why shouldn't you know who this killer is? Like the rest of them? Well, well, I don't know. I think it's a dirty shame holding out on you. Oh, Phil, I don't know what you mean. It's very simple, Sonny. I think you ought to know. So I'm going to tell you. You... 
You're going to tell me. That's right. If I wasn't a bedridden cripple, I wouldn't have time to tell you because I'd be making my getaway. But what do you say? But the way things are, there's no possible chance for escape. Well, Phil, stop talking like that. Sure, I'm the guy. I'm the leader of the mob. There was a mighty good mob, too, until them three Boy Scouts busted in here. Phil, Phil, it isn't true. Sure, it's true. I've been head of the mob for three years, and after I was hurt, I kept right on being head of the mob. Why did you do this to me? What did I ever do to you that you should surround me with murder and horror? You don't know why. No. Well, then I'll tell you why. When I woke up in this hospital and saw I was never going to have you, I, I made up my mind right then that nobody else was going to have you either. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And that still goes, see? Phil. Phil, where did you get that gun? I've been saving it. I knew this had happened sometime. I've been saving it. For me? That's right. If I can't have you, no one else is going to have you either. <laughs> transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. for the last episode of The Million Dollar Curse Part 15 Episode 109 of I Love a Mystery This will begin momentarily Here it goes The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery adventure thriller. Boy, Leslie Marsh sure is dead this time. How did it happen, Rich? Well, so fast it was all over before I knew what was going on. I, I was watching outside his window on the fire escape. Marks was sitting up in bed talking on the phone. Well, suddenly the whole doorway there whipped open and a hand holding a revolver poked through and... Well, that's all there was to it. You didn't get a look at him? No, Captain. Nothing but the fist with the gun in it. Well, the hospital surrounded. No one who can't be positively identified is allowed through the police lines. Well, what's the matter, Jack? Marks kicking off seems to have knocked you all in a heap. Yeah, it has. I never thought he is such a good friend of ours. Friend nothing. I'm up a stump. All my theories have been knocked into a cocked hat. That's crying. Now we know Marks isn't the mob leader. Careful, Packet. I wouldn't touch anything until the medical examiner arrives. Yeah, wait a minute. Well, what's the matter, fella? Captain Norton, there's an envelope in Mark's pajama pocket. What's that? Might throw some light on the situation. How about getting it? Letter? Oh, uh, yes, of course. We'll have to turn the body over a little. Uh-uh, not any more than necessary. All right. Easy with him, Doc. Yep. Yeah. There. Hold it. I can reach it. Hold it. You uh, got it? Yeah, let him roll back. I see. It's a sealed envelope. Well, we'll see about this. Yeah, what about it? Well, listen to this. To whom it may concern. In case of my sudden demise, be it known that the estate of Sonny Richards is intact and in good condition, as the records in my office will testify. If I have in any way appeared violent and desperate of late, it was for no other reason than sheer nerves. 
I'm not a brave man, and for the past six months it has seemed to me I've been staring death straight in the face. I've seen those close to Sonny die right and left and always expected we might turn next. I don't know why this has happened or who was doing it. My first impulse was to turn Sonny's estate over to the court and get out, but I couldn't. I was afraid to stay on, but more afraid to admit I was a coward. Since I've been attacked once before, there is every reason to believe I'll be attacked again. Next time, probably fatally. So I write this letter. Leslie Marks. Hmm. Isn't that dolly pathetic? Oh, Jack, you sure enough had Leslie Marks all wrong. Yeah, it looks like it. I wonder if... I'll get it. Hello? It's quiet. Yes, he's right here. Uh, Captain Norton, it's one of your men. Oh, thanks. Hello? Yeah. You got him? Good. Bring him right up here. Yeah, to Mark's room. Fine. What's that? I see. Cleaned out the place, eh? That's good. Tell Mahoney to book him incommunicado. All right. Caught our gunman? I'll say they caught him. Got him trying to get through the lines and an intern's white uniform. We're trying to play it smart, huh? But that's not all. The plainclothes men raided the service garage. The garage where Donald Robert Lincoln's car was stolen from? Picked up four men wanted by the police for a long time. Hey, you police boys are doing all right. Well, that should just about round up the whole mob, Captain. You already have seven in the clink. The torpedo you picked up downstairs and the four at the garage make twelve. It's a pretty good-sized gang in itself. I'll say all except the leader. Yeah, a man we really want. Look, Captain, you don't need us for the moment. I'd like one of you to stay. Well, how about it, Reggie? Mm, I don't. All right, come on with me, Doc. Sure. Uh, uh, where are we heading for now? Down the hall to Phil Terry's room. The Sonny's act. I know. I hate to have to break the news of Mark's death to her. Yeah. She believed in him right straight through. Well, the quicker she knows about it, the quicker she'll get over it. Well, this is it. Yeah. Hey. Sonny's crying. Come on. Hey, Jack. Jack. Phil Terry's got a gun. Yeah, so I got a gun. No, you don't. Come away from that door. What's all this about? Close that door, Packin. Sure. And don't try to run for it, because if you do, I'll drill Sonny right through the heart. You'll kill Sonny? Yeah. Now close the door. Come over and line up alongside Sonny at the foot of the bed. Both of you. Yeah, sure. So you know who the leader of the mob is? Who told you that? Sonny did. Told me everything, didn't you, Sonny? I wish I were dead. I don't want to live. Well, don't worry, Sonny. I'm going to take care of that, too, oh. along with your two boyfriends here. <laughs> so Sonny told you that we knew the mob leader. Yeah, what's so funny about that? Nothing. Only it looks like you've gone off half cocked. Yeah? Yes, you see, when we told Sonny that, we thought that Leslie Marks was the man. Marks, huh? Yes, it never occurred to us that you were the man until we walked into this room just now and found you so hot and bothered. I see. So I played it dumb. Well, that's always the way it is with the smart boys. Sooner or later, they make that one big mistake. And that's the end. Okay, okay, I can take it. Curtains for me. But curtains for a lot of other smart guys, too. Oh, going to shoot us like dogs, huh, fella? Oh, that amuses you. Not very much. But looky, Phil, I can see why you might be mad at Jack and me. But what did you want to go bothering Sonny for? You ain't never had no better friend than Sonny. <laughs> Please. What do you think all the shooting's been about? How you mean? When I came to in this hospital and found I was never going to have Sonny, I promised myself nobody else was going to have her either. And that just about explains everything. Yeah. Now that I'm washed up, I'm still going to see that no one else has Sonny. Uh-huh. I get you. Tell me something, Phil. Well, did you organize your gang after you were brought to the hospital? That's a pretty dumb question. How can you organize a mob in a hospital? Then you were in the business before. That's right. But Sonny said you was a pro at the golf club. Sure. Swell blind and put me right next to the best people. One more question. The death of Sonny's parents in that plane crash was none of your doing? No, no. It was an accident, as far as I know. And your own auto wreck was an accident? That's right. But all the rest of the deaths were the work of your gunman? Correct. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess that's all. You got any more questions, Doc? Nope. Sonny? No. Well... Here we are, Phil. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as you say, here you are. All lined up in a row. I ain't shot a rod since I've been in this place. But I guess I'll do all right. Yeah, and at six feet, you should ought to be terrific. Who's that? Hello, Phil. Arthur. What are you doing here? Wasn't you expecting me? What are you doing with that rod? Well, you've got one, Phil. We're brothers. We're just alike. Didn't I tell you the next time I caught you? Sure, sure, Phil. Only this time it's different. Yeah? Yeah. I've known for a long time you was head of that mob. That was all right. I knew you were having folks pumped off. That was all right, too. But 
I kind of took a liking to Packard and Doc Long here. Yeah? Yeah, that's why I took that sawed-off shotgun down to the brownstone house and blasted two of your torpedoes. Yeah, yeah, I was afraid that's how it was. Sure. That wasn't all right. And no matter how I acted, I think Sonny's a swell girl. So what you got in mind now ain't all right either. Why, you little sawed-off meaty mouth. You ain't ever gonna slap me around or choke me again, Phil. I don't hate you, Phil. I, I wish I... I wasn't gonna do what I'm gonna do. I, I wish you was a, a swell brother a fella could be proud of. Arthur, Arthur, get away from me. Don't come to me. Now, looky, Arthur, you two fellas are... Shut up! Nice. Go on, kid, get out of here. Beat it. No! I'm warning you. Beat it. Goodbye, Phil. Oh, no, no! Oh. Get Terry's gun, Doc. I got it. Arthur, Arthur... That's all right, sir. He's gone. Jack, come over here at the bed. Phil's going fast. What's that? Yeah. Little Arthur wasn't such a bad shot himself. Here, let's see. Oh, let me alone. I'm washed up. Huh? How about Arthur? He didn't know what hit him. Oh, crazy little punk. I always told him I'd make a man out of him. Or kill him, try him. Looks like you did both, fella. He sure was plenty of man for my money a minute ago. Well, so long. Turn those propellers over again, Reggie. I do. All right, all right, hold it. Fella, this is what I call an airplane job. Boy, if it ain't. Well, that's all we can do this afternoon. What time is it? About six o'clock. Uh, let's call it a day. Come on down, Reggie. Right on. Well, here she is. Our very own airplane already for us. Why, it don't seem any time since we was a grousing around because we had to wait two weeks for the factory to get it ready. Now, yeah, these last two weeks have passed in a hurry, haven't they? Well, roll your sleeves down, Reggie. That's all for tonight. I think we'll be ready to take off by tomorrow afternoon. Don't you, Jack? Then look out, Central America. Well, we can't get out of San Diego any too fast to shoot me after what happened last night. You mean Phil and Arthur using each other for shooting targets? Mm, quiet. Forget it. We're going to have a busy time if we get away tomorrow. Reggie, you'll have to finish up the work on the plane. Mm, suits me. Doc, it's up to you to get our clearance papers for the ship and see to our passports. Yeah, I'll get them out and dust them off. Feller, I don't know when I've been so head up. Central America, doggone! It does promise a bit of adventure, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, sir, if it don't... Oh, say. Hey, that's Sonny's boy. Well, what's she doing out here at the airport? Hey, Sonny, here we are. I thought I'd catch you out here. Mm, Joe, I hope there isn't any more trouble. Hello, boys. How's the plane coming? Fine, fine. We're pulling out tomorrow. Oh, I see. Why? Is there anything the matter? Very much the matter. Yeah? Well, what? Me. Well, what do you mean, you? What do you think I mean? You're going to pull out and I'm stuck here? You think I like this place any better than you do after what's happened? Phil and Arthur and... And Leslie Marks? That's right. A bit like a morgue. Yes. Well, you three have been so swell to me. I... I know it's an imposition, but I just couldn't help asking one thing more. Well, let's have it, fella. What do you want? Well, take me where you... Oh, are. look here. Hey, uh, we're going down into the Central American jungle. I can't think of any better place to forget than you. Won't you please... I'll pay my way and I won't be any bother. I mean, just because I'm a girl won't matter. Anything goes. What I don't like, I won't see. Oh, now, I don't know about that. Uh, what do you say, Jack? Well, we could use some more money. Yeah, we are going to be kind of short of dough when we get all our equipment. Oh, look here, oh, now. Oh, please, Kevin. please. You mean you'll consider it? Why not, if Doc and Reggie agree? Well, it it ain't the way we planned it. But as you say, why not? Reggie? Oh, I say, a girl. Oh, Reggie, are, are you going to... Oh, I say you're not going to cry. I am, too. I'm so disappointed. But I haven't said you couldn't go. Uh, oh, look here. Will you stop those valley tears? Then I can go? Yes, fine. But I bloody well don't like it. Oh, Reggie, you're wonderful. <laughs> Reggie, son. Well, what? Doggone, fella. But you sure are a sucker for women.
further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. This program came from New York. And that, ladies and gentlemen, will be the end of our stream for this evening. Or maybe not. Nope, I'm sorry. We still got some more. We're going to do the Battle of the Century from I Love a Mystery. We'll do those next 10 episodes and then we'll call it an evening. Maybe. Or we might just go all morning long. We'll see. As soon as it starts. Come on, let's go, ladies and gentlemen. I think the player is starting to get a little tired here. We'll see in a few moments. Come on, let's go. This is episode 110 of I Love Mystery, the first episode of Battle of the Century. Let's wait for it to get started here. Sometimes this player is finicky. Sometimes it plays nonstop, and then after a while it stops. So I'm trying to figure out a, a better player to use, but it's going to take me a little while to, uh, to get that settled. We'll have that straighten out next weekend. In the meantime. Here we go. I love the mystery. The mutual broadcast. The battle of the century. I love the mystery. adventure thriller, The Battle of the Century. Six o'clock in the morning, on top of a haystack in somebody's pasture somewhere in Yolo County, California. It was at a quarter to midnight last night when Jack, Doc, and Reggie crawled wearily, not to say disgustedly, and at the same time gratefully, onto this haystack, burrowed in for warmth and comfort, and went to sleep. The reason they were forced to take to a haystack is typical. Doc was driving the car along the main highway through Yolo County. He suddenly decided that one of the dirt roads to the left was a shortcut. This was at nine o'clock, and Jack and Reggie were dozing in the back seat. And so they drove for two hours in the dark of the moon on dirt roads that were not meant for car travel even in broad daylight and at night would have been hazardous for Beelzebub himself. Jack woke up and cursed Doc inelegantly and Reggie hung onto the bucking machine and chuckled. And Doc plowed doggedly ahead until he finally failed to negotiate a sharp turn and ended up in the ditch with a car on its side. Half an hour later, Reggie found the haystack and now at six o'clock, dawn has broken. And Reggie moves in the hay and stretches. Mm. Awake, Reggie? Mm. Oh, I say, Jack. Mm. Quite. Mm. <clears throat> I thought I was the first to open my eyes. No, I've been lying here watching the dawn come. 
Doc? Well, he must have a clear conscience. Sleeping peacefully. The trouble with him, he hasn't any conscience at all. <laughs> Getting us into this kind of a mess. Oh, well, we weren't going any place in particular. Oh, you like sleeping in a haystack? Well, I, I can't say I've really minded. Hmm. It wasn't so bad at that, was it? Jolly comfortable, on the other hand. <laughs> All right, but don't let Doc know you like it. <laughs> Quite. He's definitely in the doghouse. Running the car into a ditch and turning it over, miles from civilization. Well, you make it sound much worse than it really is, don't you think? You think so? Quite, yeah. First place, Doc was traveling slow when we went into the ditch, and we toppled over easy. I mean to say, I don't think anything was broken. Even so, a car on its side in the ditch is pretty poor transportation. Oh, but look here, a team of horses from a nearby farm. Just a moment. Yeah. You say horses from a nearby farm? Hmm. Have you by any chance cast your eyes over the countryside since you opened them? No, not exactly. Lying here on my back, it looks to be a beautiful world. Flat on your back, all you can see is sky. Beautiful sky. Lovely morning. Uh huh. Well, sit up and take a gander at the surrounding environs and say whether it looks so lovely. I don't. I will. Oh. I say. <laughs> well, is the morning still as lovely? Oh, but look here. Miles and miles in every direction and not a valley thing in sight. Yeah. It appears we've got quite a jaunt between us and today's breakfast. Yes, I say the road. Someone's bound to come by sooner or later. That, Reggie, is optimism with very little justification. Hmm? Why so? Well, there, there's every evidence that our red-headed Texas friend not only got us lost, but ran us eight or ten miles up a private road to turn us over. I say, private road? Well, it certainly isn't a county road. Matter of fact, if you look close, there's spots that look more like a rabbit's run. But even so, eight or ten miles of private road? Mm -hmm, certainly. Out here, some of these big grain ranches spread for miles and miles without even a fence. Mm. Beautiful. What? Yeah. Roll that sleeping Texan over here closer so I can kick him. <laughs> I say he's going to suffer enough when he wakes up. He sure is, if I can contrive it. No, I mean when he's discovered there's no food in the immediate vicinity. Oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> Wake him up. <laughs> right now. Doc. I say, Doc. Wake up. Mm -hmm. Come on, Doc. Sun's up. Huh? That's what I said. <laughs> Sun's up. Well, that's his tough look. Doc! Doc! Uh, Wake up! Uh-huh. We're pretty soon. Not pretty soon! No! Okay, okay. <laughs> stop, stop shaking, man. I'm awake, ain't I? I don't know, are you? Of course I am. <laughs> <laughs> Say something, then. Uh, yeah. I'm just, I'm just, uh, <laughs> Jack, I think this is a task for Hercules. You're not violent. <laughs> I've shaken him until his teeth chatter. Yeah. Here, yeah. I'll show you how to wake him up. Mm -hmm. Get hold of his feet. <laughs> right up. I've got his arms. Now then, we'll swing him two or three times and let him go high in the air. <laughs> when he comes down, he should either be awake or have a broken neck. Well, but look at that. Aren't we liable to throw him clear off the haystack? Yeah, if we're lucky, maybe we will. Come on now. Swing him. Right up. All right. One, two, three, let him go. Hey, hey, look out. <laughs> uh, <what? laughs> Dad gum, your ornery hide. Boy, if you two ain't the top notch sippy cats, I met you. Uh, morning, Doc. Morning, my grandma. Hey, don't you know you're liable to bust a feller's neck or fling him around that way? Yes, we thought of that. You, you, you went and done it anyway? Apparently. Well, now I'm a slick tail hypnoceros. Trying to murder him meet me in my sleep. Nice, cozy couple of partners. <laughs> well, at least we accomplished our purpose. The same being? Waking you up. Well, you could have been accomplished just as easy by... Speaking nice and gentle to me. <laughs> well, Doc, now that you're awake, sit up and look around you. I ain't gonna do it. Gonna lay right here and rest. Oh, I say, listen. You're going to do nothing of the kind. Yes, I am. And, and Reggie, mm -hmm. while I'm resting, you run over to the nearest farmhouse and have them start frying ham and eggs mm -hmm. and mixing up a batch of about 20 sour milk hotcakes. Is that all? Well, it'll do all right for a starter. <clears throat> 
And, and when the eggs is turning nice and crisp around the edges, give a yell and I'll come a running. You sure you wouldn't like some orange juice and, uh, we'll say, half a cantaloupe? Yeah, it might be good at that. Uh-huh. How about a side order of crisp fried potatoes? Yeah, and, and, and maybe some hot biscuits. <laughs> Well, what you standing there chortling about, Reggie? Get it going. It's all a big, beautiful dream, Doc. Huh? What you mean? Sit up and take a look around you. Yeah? Uh, well, hey. Well, uh, well, spank me for a baby. I'd rather kick you for an idiot. You got us into this. But, but, but look, you, Jack, this is serious. Well, we're marooned. <laughs> marooned on a haystack. And not a sour milk hot cake in sight. Well, but it, it must be eight or ten miles to the nearest inhabitants. That's what we figured. But I, I can't do that, Jack. I can't go without my food like this. Well, you boys know how my stomach is. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't he suffer interestingly, Reggie? Oh, yes, there's a beautiful expression of agony in his eyes. Well, I ain't fooling, fellas. Honest, I ain't. Well, right this minute, I'm so hungry, I... Got cold chills up and down my spine. Those aren't cold chills. They're hayseed and stickers down your back. Well, there's nothing for it, Doc, but to walk to the habitat of the nearest native. Well, Reggie, did, did you say walk? Looks like it. Unless you can figure some way of making the car carry us while lying prone on its side. Yeah, yeah, that's it, the automobile. I'm afraid not, Doc. But, looky, we, we ain't seen her this morning. Maybe we, if we all get our shoulder under her... You we'll... know better than that, Doc. But I can't walk ten miles. On a full stomach, I can't walk ten miles. On an empty one, I can't even hardly get off my back. Who was the smart driver who took this shortcut? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Who was the smart driver who turned us over in a ditch? Okay, okay. Have you spilt the milk, so stop crying over it. Oh, it ain't, and I'm exactly crying, Jack. It's, I say, it's just... Jack, hmm? look yonder. What's that? Well, I'll be doggone. Or Jack. It's little old female girl coming up the road. Well, look here, where did she come from? She wasn't inside a few minutes ago. Oh, I see something else that looks fairly interesting. Why, there ain't nothing more interesting than a pretty little old she-woman. Blamed if I don't think she's come to rescue well, us. Well, now, what do you expect her to do? Pack you out of here on her back? Well, I, I wish she'd hurry up and get close enough so as I can see if she's as pretty as I hope she is. I'm still more interested in what I see further in the distance. The distance? Oh, Jack, I say, dust raising. And the way it's rising, I'd say there was a car coming this way in a hurry. Doggone, a pretty girl in a ride to town all in one break. Yes, but look here, shouldn't we get down off this haystack and flag the car? Decidedly. Yes, sir, let's make that our thought for the day. Get down and flag that automobile. Well, get up, Doc, get moving. Now, wait a minute, I, I just had a better thought. Well, hurry up, what is it? You and Reggie flag the automobile, and I'll flag the girl. Oh, <laughs> no. All right, all right. Now you've had your joke. Here, wait a minute. Huh? What's the matter? Get down, Reggie. Out of sight. I say, Jack. Keep down. Now watch. That girl's seen the dust rising back of her. But, but what I the say, heck? look at her. She's running for this haystack. Well, what you know? <laughs> you suppose she's seen me and recognizes me as her dream man? <laughs> oh, yeah. And you keep down so she doesn't see you. But I don't get it, Jack. I don't either. Apparently she's afraid of that approaching car. Or else she just doesn't want to be seen. Boy, will you look at her run. Why, my cousin Winnie May down in Texas couldn't do no better than that. I say the car's getting closer rapidly. I just caught a glint of the windshield in the sun. Poor little fella. She's still got a ways to come. She'll make it before the car gets close enough to see her. If she can keep it up. Man, I'd sure hate to have to chase that baby. Come on, sugar, keep laying them down. You'll make I it. I say, just another hundred yards. Car's still a mile and a half down the road. Yeah, but it ain't wasting no time. And that ain't no road to make time on, neither. Hey, hey, looky at her. What, Jack? That little old female girl's a hunter. Joe, look at her face. She's frightened. She'd have to be frightened to run like that. Now she's going to make it all right. Joe, there she goes out of sight. What do you suppose she'll do? Burrow into the hay and lie quiet if she's smart. Well, Jack, uh, maybe I should order to slide down off this here haystack and kind of comfort you. You stay right where you are. Yes, but look here, Jack. The car will be here in another minute. Now, if we don't get down and flag it, it'll be gone and we'll still be without transportation. Yes, son. Son, it'll flash right by. Let it flash by. Well, hey, and us have to walk ten miles to breakfast? Is your breakfast more important than this girl's safety? Uh, yeah, yeah, that is a problem. I don't see any problem. Well, I do. Which you'd rather do, sacrifice a girl's honor or my stomach? <laughs> well, there she is, going right by. Oh, mm. Apparently, they aren't going by after all. 
No, they've seen our car in the ditch. Can you see how many there are, Rodden? Three. Two men in the front seat and one in the back. Getting out to examine our automobile. Jove, look at the size of those two young chaps getting out of the front seat. <laughs> Real honest to goodness farmer boys. Reggie, how'd you like to tangle with one of them? All right. I hope I don't have to. That man in the back seat, he's much older. Yeah. He seems doggone curious about our automobile. Why shouldn't there be? Car in the ditch way out here? I say, they're looking over here. Yeah. Well, I was afraid of that. Yeah. You mean uh, they'll be coming over here? They're bound to. And if they do, they're almost sure to find the girl. Well, son, we, we can't have that. But is there anything we can do? Yeah. Let's slide down off the stack and go to meet them. And if, uh, if they're still curious about the haystack after that? We're in good health. What's to keep us from stopping them? Son, I was uh, hoping you'd say them words. Come on, Reggie. Let's go see if we can't get ourselves a little fist fighting. <laughs> Further adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Coming up next is Battle of the Century Part 2. On the epi- and it's episode number 111 of I Love a Mystery. Martin Morse adventure thriller, The Battle of the Century. Six o'clock in the morning, on top of a haystack in somebody's pasture somewhere in Yolo County, California. Last night, while Reggie and Jack slept in the rear seat of the car, Doc tried for a shortcut ran the car onto a private road some ten miles from civilization, and turned it over in a ditch. The trio, making the best of it, found a haystack and turned in for the night. Shortly after dawn, they awakened and lay discussing means of getting breakfast and help when the girl on foot approached up the road. Suddenly, she saw the dust of an automobile behind her, and in a panic, she ran to the haystack and burrowed in, unaware of the trio up above. The approaching car was on the point of speeding past when the driver saw the boy's car in the ditch and pulled up. After examining it, their attention was turned to the haystack some hundred yards distant. 
Jack, realizing if the three in the car came to the haystack, they'd find the girl, decided that he and Doc and Reggie should descend from the stack and go to meet the occupants of the car. All right, Reggie, slide off the haystack. Well, I say, right out in plain view of those three chappies over yonder? Well, why not? Huh? Right oh. Take it easy, son. That, that's 20 feet down to the ground. Well, the sides aren't too steep. I can slide all the way down. Yeah, but you're going to slide fast. Well, here goes. <laughs> Never mind that. <laughs> Never mind that. Boy, he shot down that haystack like a toboggan sled. <laughs> Doc. Huh? Those men have seen us. Get down quick. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> you came down fast, all right. Hey, that's okay. A little pile of hay to land on. <laughs> well, man could use a parachute. Look out, here comes Jerry. Yeah. Well, that was quick. Talk about shooting the shoots. Reminds me of the time me and my female cousin Winnie Mae slid off a roof on the farm. Mm -hmm. Only they, it was splinters that time. <laughs> well, uh, well, what do we do now? Well, those three men look to me slightly on the antagonistic side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just standing over yonder staring at us. Uh, do, do we go over? That's what we came down for. Come on. Yeah. Well, those, uh, those two younger chaps fit on the brawny side, one. Yeah, built like a couple of bull ripotamus. Uh, like what? Ain't you never heard of a ripotamus? <laughs> I assure you, I never have. Yeah, kind of a second cousin on his mother's side to a hypnoceros. <laughs> I see. Now, when we get over to him, Doc, don't start getting humorous. Okay. Only you know how I am when I think of something funny. Well, try not to think of anything funny. Them orders? Definite orders. That's all I want to know. Well, the nearer we approach, the more those two look alike. Probably Siamese twins no, or something. No, no, no. I say not Siamese. No? Well, they do look a little bit more like Scandinavians, don't they? <laughs> yeah. well, they're Nordic, all right. Blonde, fair, thick bull necks. Mm -hmm. Not too intelligent looking, I'd say. Yeah, finer pairs in of identical morons as I've come across yet. Old chappy looks like a... Pretty fair sort of citizen, though, huh? Well, that's enough comment. They quite definitely don't like our looks. Well, that goes double. Doc, behave yourself. Hey there, you men. Are you talking to us? Who else? How are you? Good thing you came along. Go say. Ask him if he's got a fried egg about him. Doc, I told you to cut the comedy. Okay, okay. I suppose you men know you're trespassing. Unintentionally, I assure you. So you say... Well, if you can think of any reason why we'd maroon ourselves out here in this wasteland on purpose, I'll put in with you. That haystack yonder is private property. Sleeping in it do any damage? Tain't allowed. Now, look. What would you have done if you'd run your car into a ditch at midnight? I ain't got no car. Looks to me like you have. That's the boss's car. Well, that's beside the point. Besides, what was you doing out here at midnight anyhow? We took the wrong road and got lost. And if you want to do us a favor, you can hitch a tow rope onto our car and pull us right side up and out of that ditch. This ain't much of a place for doing favors. Well, now, that's an ornery thing to say. Doc. Well, if, if you want to know what I think... Nobody I... does. So, uh, so you won't give us a hand, huh? I don't know. I ain't made up my mind yet. Well, when you do, will you let us know? I might. Might not. Well, while you're trying to decide, would... Would you mind telling me something about your bodyguard? Oh, bodyguard? Yeah, these two hunks of men. Uh, don't they never say nothing? Oh, them's Big Swede and Little Swede. <laughs> Look here. <laughs> big Swede and Little Swede, huh? Well, how do you tell which is Little Swede? Little Swede can't talk no English. Big Swede talks some English. <laughs> And that's the only way you can tell them apart. That's the only way I can tell them apart. <laughs> well, doggone. Y you say something to them, and the one what looks intelligent's big sweet. Well, I wouldn't say exactly intelligent. <laughs> yeah. Well, hello, son. Nope. That must be little sweet. <laughs> hello, big sweet. Glad to meet you. Hey, what's the matter? Nothing happened there either. All right, that's enough, Doc. <laughs> well, I I'm plumb curious. Well, save it. <laughs> If you uh, don't mind, I'd like to introduce ourselves. Go right ahead. Oh. Well, I'm I'm Jack Packard. Jack Packard, huh? Yes, do you mind? It's a good name as any, I suppose. Thanks. This is uh, Reggie York. Huh. 
Now, that's a silly name, ain't it? I say, old boy. Never mind, Reggie. And this red-headed Texan is Doc Long. He is, huh? Well, ain't she going to say glad to meet us? No. Why, you lop-eared cow. Stop it, Doc. Would you mind saying who you are? I'm Jasper. Jasper, huh? Is that all? Ain't it enough? <laughs> Why not? Well, have you made up your mind about pulling us out of the ditch? Don't push me. Oh, hey, sorry. But looky here, fella. We ain't had no breakfast yet this morning. Well, I was reading in a book where people eat too much anyway. <laughs> well, ain't you the sympathetic cuss? I don't aim to be. And another thing, uh, tell Big Sweet and Little Sweet to stop standing there glaring at it. They don't no hurt. No, except they give me the willies. Stand there like that. Like he was waiting to jump us. Yeah, they would, too. A word for me, your name's B. Mincemy. Hey, now, you ain't bragging, are you? Never mind that, Doc. Well, are we going to stand here and let him intimate that them two gorillas can... We're a lot more interested in getting our car out of the now, ditch. just a minute. Is one of your boys aiming to say he can lick one of the Swedes? No. He... I am, too. I'm a-saying me and Reggie here can wipe the ground up with them two boys of yours. Doc, I told you to... Well, we can, and I'm here to prove Joe, it. Joe, Doc, Well, I, I... now, that's mighty interesting, huh? I think the boss would like to meet you, boys. Boss? Yes, boss is what you might say uh, cracked on the subject of prize fighting. Now, see what you've got yourself in for, Doc? How you mean, prize fighting? Well, he just likes it. He likes prize fighting better than most folks like Saturday night bingo. Well, we haven't got the now, time. Now, wait a minute, Jack. Uh, let's see what he's got to say. Uh, naturally, we don't get no professional matches up this way, living out here on a... 40,000 acre ranch, we, we don't get much of anything. Oh, very interesting. Jack, will you hush up? Now, what's that got to do with us going to see your boss, Mr. Jasper? Well, on account of he likes prize fighting so much, he kind of built his own ring, if you get what I mean. Yes, I do. And I don't like well, it. Well, I do. Keep it talking, fella. Now, as I was saying, having his own ring, he's always on the lookout for fighting men. Home talent, huh? And his big Swede and little Swede, a couple of his fighters? They're his prime favorites. Well, what you know? Doc, I could break your neck with pleasure. What you talking about? Why, <laughs> well, we couldn't any more pass this up than... How about it, Reggie? We ain't scared, are we? No, of course not, but... But I... nothing. Son, you hitch your automobile onto ours and pull us out of the ditch, and, and uh, we'll go talk to your boss about uh, smacking these two Nordic babies clean back where they come from. Deal? It's nothing of the kind. Well, I say it is, and Reggie says oh. it is. That's two again. But one. Doc, I didn't say. Sure, you did, fella. You ain't never run out on a good fight, not never. But it's insane, Doc. It's one thing to fight for a purpose, but just to get into a ring for the pleasure of a wealthy farmer because he likes well, price. Make price. up your minds, Chance. I ain't got all day. I say no. I say yes. Well, what do you say, well, Reggie? Jove, no. You I... don't care one way or the other. Is that it, Reggie? Well, I. I... Oh, I say, I wouldn't mind a bit of a round with one of those chappies. It might be very interesting. On the other hand, Jack's quite oh, right. Oh, Jack. Okay, Jack, we're, we're, we're stymied. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll flip you a nickel. Heads we fight, tails we stick our tails between our legs and get for home. I uh, shouldn't even do that. Oh, come on. Where's your sporting blood? Heads we fight, tails we don't. Here she goes. Uh, now, here, let alone. Let me see that. <laughs> Head she is. Should have known better than to let a crazy idiot like you. Okay, Jasper, hook on to us and pull us out of the ditch. That's the way it's going to be, huh? That's the way it's going to be. And uh, are your two hunks of humanity going to be sorry? Now, go on. Hook your automobile on to us. Ain't going to need the car. Big sweet little sweet will lift you out of the ditch. I say you mean those two chaps. But... Sure. Now, go on, you fellas. Put that machine back on the road. Well, doggone, they're going off to do it. I say, Doc, perhaps Jack was right after all. Now, just a minute, you fellas, there's something else. I think that's plenty for now. Well, this is something else. Uh, you fellas been over in that haystack since last night? Yeah, that's right. See anything of a girl? A girl? Out in this no man's land? That's what I'm asking you. Did you see a girl? Certainly not. Was she in an automobile? No, she weren't in no automobile. Horseback, huh? No, not on horseback. Well, uh, what sort of looking gal was she? Oh, kind of yellow haired, small. Prettiest thing in all the state of California. Yeah, well, what would any female gal like that be doing traipsing around on foot way out here? She was running away from home, if it's any of your business. You don't say. 
You're home? No, I ain't married. Oh, I see. But you want to get married. No, I don't want to get married. I'll stomp the man's teeth out who says that I do. Then would you mind saying who this gal is? She's the boss's daughter, if it's any of your business. Which, of course, it ain't. That's what I was thinking. Uh, so you ain't seen her? No, I'm afraid not. But will you tell me why the daughter of a man who owns 40,000 acres of land is running away from home at 6 o'clock in the morning? Because she's 18 got just as much spirit as her old man. Is that what brought you out here looking for her? Well, maybe it is, maybe it ain't. Now, ain't that a pretty business, hunting down gals? It's a wonder you, to me you ain't got bloodhounds on her trail. You want a poke in the nose? Now, look, you're lots older than me. Well, keep your comments to yourself about that girl, and that's just what you're going to get. Well, I still think it's a mighty mangy trick, running around the country trying to catch a gal that don't want to be caught. What kind of an old buzzard is her old man anyway? Never mind that either. He's my boss. Yeah, I get it. Well, Jasper, old Joe, kid. Jack, will you look at those two men? Holy jumping cat! Lifting fish. that car back on the road as though it were a sack of flour. And them's the two guys we're supposed to fight. Oh, quite. Yes, sir. A couple of bull elephants. Well, you asked for it. I hope you're satisfied. <laughs> Adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at the same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morris, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Forson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York, with Louis Van Ruten as Jasper. Well, sir, you want to know what happened next? You want to know what happened when Reggie sinks his fist in Big Sweet's kisser? You like to know what Jack said to the girl with the yellow hair and, and what she said to him? Well, then you just listen to I Love a Mystery tomorrow night. That's right, tomorrow night, when you're going to meet Miss Jack Dempsey Ross in person. Thank you kindly. Ted Malley speaking. This is the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System. System presents I Love a Mystery. Transcribed. adventure thriller, The Battle of the Century. <laughs> Seven o'clock in the morning on a private road of a 40,000 acre ranch somewhere in Yolo County, California. Last night, Doc took a shortcut, got lost, and landed the boy's car in a ditch ten miles from anywhere. The three spent the rest of the night in the nearby haystack. At six the next morning, from the top of the haystack, they watched a girl approach down the abandoned road. Suddenly, the dust cloud of an approaching car sent her running for the haystack. Quickly, she burrowed into the hay and lay still. The car stopped when the occupants saw the boy's machine in the ditch. Jack, Doc, and Reggie slid down the haystack and went to meet them. Two of the three men were young giants, almost identical, known as Big Swede and Little Swede. 
The only way of telling them apart was that Big Swede spoke a little English. The third and older man was Jasper. Jack asked him to pull them out of the ditch. Yes, and that was when Jasper made me a counterproposal. He said he'd get us out if we'd return with him to the ranch house and fight the two Swedes. But the big boss was prize fight crazy and had a private ring. Well, I was against it, but Doc was all for it and won his point. So Jasper sent the two Swedes over, and with apparent ease, they lifted the car out of the ditch. Then Jasper asked if we'd seen a girl in the vicinity. Said she was the daughter of the ranch owner and was running away from home. Reggie, I swear to goodness. Did you see what them two sweet boys did, John? I say, and those are the two chappies we've just agreed to fight. Well, you made a bargain. Can't go back on it now. You'd hold us to it against our wishes? You sure would. You agreed to come to the ranch and put on a fight for the boss if we get your car out of the ditch. There's no backing out now. Well, who the heck said anything about backing out? I just wanted to warn you. Big and little sweet can throw that car back in the ditch as easy as they lifted her out. Now, just a minute, Jasper, whatever your name is. Well, deal's a deal, I always say. Oh, you always say that. Huh? Exactly, in so many words. Well, just get this through your head. Nobody gets very far with us using threats. A bargain's a bargain, I always say. There's quite a heap of things you always say, seems to me. And what I say is them, I mean them. That's all right. We made a bargain, we'll keep it. But don't get it into your head that you're forcing us into anything. No? No. We don't force worth a cent. Doc, you and Reggie go over and see if the car's all right. Sure. Come on, Reggie. Right on. Shouldn't be too much wrong with it. Uh, maybe we can get them Swede boys to let us feel their muscles. <laughs> sure, why do you want to do that? Well, I kind of like to find out if they got fighting muscle or just common, ordinary lifting mm-hmm, muscle. That's right. There is a bit of a difference, all right. Oh, howdy, boys. Huh. Not a spark out of either of them. Mm-hmm. Jasper said you could tell Big Swede because he could talk a little English. Uh, yeah. Uh, which one of you talks American? Oh, you won't talk, huh? Well, perhaps you tell us uh, uh, which one of you is Big Swede. Well, honest to Grandma, Reggie, I ain't never come across anything like it. Two great big hooks are standing there shoulder to shoulder giving us a dead mm, fan. Did run me all right. Now, look, you fellas, are you just playing dead, or don't you, honest to goodness, understand the United States? No use, Doc. Not a flicker from either. Reminds me of the time my cousin Winnie Mae got her jaws glued together chewing beeswax. Mm-hmm. Her papa had to knock out one of her front teeth with the butt of his six-shooter so they could feed her. <laughs> Joe, it's a bit primitive, what? Oh, Winnie Mae didn't mind. Uh-huh. She used that empty tooth to spit, though. <laughs> Blind a squirrel with tobacco juice at 20 paces. Oh, how old was Winnie Mae at the time? Well, let's see. That's the year before she eloped with Ernie Shoulder. Mm-hmm. Who must have been going on about 10, oh, I reckon? Oh, little kid. Hey, Doc, what's the matter? Won't the car start? Oh, I ain't tried it yet. I was just telling Reggie about Winnie Mae. Oh, blast Winnie Mae. Jack, you oughtn't to talk that way about my blood relations. It ain't chivalry. Doc! Okay, okay. Yeah, I reckon we ought to try out the automobile at that. You want me to get in? No, I'll do it. Yeah? Feels the same to sit in. Oh, did you think it wouldn't? Uh, hi, up front there. Hey, you two sweets, get out of the way. No telling what this thing will do when I start her up. <laughs> hey, did you hear what I said? Stand aside. Hey, Reggie, go on up there and push him two big bull elephants over to the side of the road. Right. Now then, you boys stand aside, eh? I say, I said stand aside. That's that, Reggie. Push him. Are you... Hey, Reggie, he swung on you. Swing on me, will you... Atta boy, Reggie. He's sagging. He's sagging. He's going down. Reggie, son, you knocked him out. Joe, I barely near broke my fist doing it. One sweet down and one to go. Oh, I say we can't hit this other chap. He hasn't even moved. Matter of fact, the expression on his face hasn't changed. Well, come on, fella. Put up your dukes. What's the matter with you? Ain't you going to fight for your partner? Hey, what's going on? Here, Doc, stop it. What's going on here? Hey, what's the matter with little sweet? Well, Reggie just up and knocked him out. Knocked him out? I don't believe it. Well, maybe you'd like him to knock out Big Swede, too, just to prove Stop it, Doc. What was the matter, Reggie? Oh, sorry, I lost my temper for a moment. Doc wanted to start the car, and the two were standing directly in the way. Well, we asked him to move, and then I went over and started to push them to the side of the road, and that chap, he swung on me, and I let him have it. That's a lie. You hit him with something. Mr. Jasper, did you say I lied? You hit him with something. Sure he did, with his fist. Did you say I lied? Now, see here, young fellow. Did you say no, I no, lied? No, 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 on second thought, maybe I was a mite hasty. Uh, hey. You swear you just up and knocked him out? Certainly. <laughs> well, well. <laughs> Are you sure? Uh, there was no trick about it. If you're insinuating, no, Mr. No, no, Jack... no, no, don't get me wrong. 
fact, it's the best thing that's happened. <laughs> well, uh, come on, boys. What are we waiting for? Let's get back to the home ranch. Uh, big Swede, pick up Little Swede there and toss him in the back of my car. Uh, just a minute. I don't know whether our machine will go or not. Well, hurry up and find out. If it won't go, I'll tow you in. Uh, just one thing, though, boys. Uh, can you keep this a secret? What do you mean? Uh, you mind not saying anything at the home ranch about knocking out Little Swede? Well, why should we? Sure, that's the stuff. Spoil the big fight for the boss if he knew beforehand one of his men had been knocked out by one of you. The big fight? Sure, in the ring at the ranch. Y'all promise not to say anything? All right. That's talking. Now I'll go get my car and bring it up alongside. Whoa. What's it all about, Jack? I don't know. He certainly got awful friendly after he saw what Reggie could do. Well, I say, I'm getting rather keen to see what the home ranch and the boss is like. Have you both forgotten that girl over in the haystack? Hey, that's right. Well, now, listen. I want a chance to talk to her. It's apparent that Jasper and the two Swedes were chasing her. What I want to do is get rid of them. Yeah, so as we can have a nice, cozy chat with the little lady. Not we. What you mean, not we? You and Reggie are going back to the ranch house with Jasper and the two Swedes. Hey, now, Jack. Will you listen, Doc? You haven't got much time. If you two are with him, he won't be worried about me not following him. That'll give me the chance I want. Okay, well, we'll, we'll go with him. Well, yeah, but I'm the ladies' man in this outfit. Oh, here he comes. Now, do as I say. Let me do the talking. What's the matter? Won't you start? Uh, the cell starter was stuck. I think I got it fixed now. Now, try it. Yeah, that seems to be all right. Hey, uh, how about Reggie and Doc riding back with you? Sure, sure. It's a good idea. Lots of roads. Right on. Come on, Doc. Okay. But I ain't happy about it, I can tell you. If you lose me, take the road to the right about three miles down. Take you right up to the ranch house. Thanks. I may have to take it a little easy. <laughs> See what that girl in the haystack has to say for herself. All right. Safe to come out. Hey, wherever you are, come on out. <laughs> Apparently, she doesn't believe me. <laughs> oh, no use trying to hide anymore. You're not at all well covered up. That's a very pretty silk stocking sticking out of the hay. Oh, Doc! <laughs> well, hello. You couldn't either see my leg sticking out of the hay. <laughs> I know. That was one way to find you. Well, that's cheating. You should be ashamed. Oh, I am. You know, sitting up in the hay that way, you look like my picture of Aphrodite emerging from the ocean spray. Well, a few more clothes on, I hope. Yes, but she was no better looking. See, who are you, anyhow? I'm Jack Packard. Who are you? You know who I am? No. I thought everybody in this part of the country knew me. I'm not from this part of the country. I'm Jacqueline Ross. Uh, how do you do, Jacqueline? How do you do, Mr. Packard? You know, you're a very nice young person to be running away from home and hiding in a haystack. I thought you didn't know anything about me. Well, I was on top of this haystack and saw you run over here and dive in. But how did you know I was running away from home? Because the car you were running from stopped over on the road and a man named Jasper seemed very anxious to find you. Oh, was it only Jasper? If I'd known that, I wouldn't have run. Well, there were two Scandinavian boys with him. Oh, they wouldn't have made any difference. They don't ever say anything anyhow. I see. Well, now that I've found you, what am I going to do with you? Well, I like that. Who do you think you are, anyhow? <laughs> it looks like I've suddenly become your guardian angel. Oh, no, you haven't. Oh, yes, I have. Are you being funny? No. Well, I'm not going back to my father, and that's that. Why? Because I'm going to choose the man I marry, no matter what anybody says. Good, good. That'll be our thought for the day. Marry anyone we choose in spite of anybody. You agree to that? I do. How old are you? Eighteen. Hmm. So your father wants you to marry one man and you want to marry another? Yes. Isn't there anything that would make him see it your way? Yes, but it's silly. What's silly? Well, he's crazy about prize fights. He's so crazy about prize fights. You know what he named me? His own daughter? You said your name was Jacqueline. Well, that isn't what he named me. He named me Jack Dempsey Ross. <laughs> what? Yes, he did. <laughs> Because Jack Dempsey is his favorite champion. That's just how crazy he is about prize fighting. But what's that to do with you marrying whom you want? Well, the only way I can marry Duke is if Duke can get a fighter that can whip Big Swede and Little Swede. Would you say that again? I know it sounds crazy, but that's my father. If Duke Duke's can find... the man you want to marry? Yes. If Duke can find a fighter who can whip the two Swedes, father will agree to me marrying Duke. He's got a real prize fight ring right on the ranch. Yes, Jasper told me that. But it's silly. 
There's nobody around here who would even dare get in the ring with him. They're too big and strong. Now, just a minute. Which side of the fence is Jasper on? Oh, uh, he's a love. He's done everything to help me. Well, I thought he worked for your father. He does. He's foreman of the ranch. Well, your father knew he was helping me run away. Helping you run away? I thought he was chasing you. No. I'm sure he was hoping to find me and take me on into town. Is that where you were going, into town? No. I'm supposed to meet Duke right here. Well, well, we'll sit right here and wait for Duke. I'd like to meet that young man. Hey, you mean you'll help us elope? No, I'm afraid not. Oh. So you're a traitor. Here, just a minute. So that's the kind of a man you are. Ruin a girl's whole life. But if you just listen... I don't want to listen. You just wait till Duke gets here. I hope he's got a gun. I hope he's got a great big gun. <laughs> a cannon, maybe? Well, anyway, something to shoot you with. Further transcribed adventures of Jack Duck and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at the same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Forson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York, with Louis Van Ruten as Jasper, and Mercedes McCambridge as Miss Jack Dempsey Ross. Whether you're a sporting fan or not, you'll want to hear this week's Sports for All show over most of these stations on Thursday night. For Bill Slater's guests this week are two of America's great inspirational sports names. There's prize fighter Barney Ross and ex-New York Giants football star whom Grant led Rice named for all-time All-American football honors Ken Strong. So hear them on Sports for All this Thursday night. Frank McCarthy speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery, transcribed. Martin Morse adventure thriller, The Battle of the Century. Seven o'clock in the morning, on the lee side of a big haystack in an isolated section of Jim Ross's 40,000-acre ranch somewhere in Yolo County, California. Last night, Jack, Doc, and Reggie spent the night in this same haystack when Doc got lost and ran their car into a ditch ten miles from the nearest town. This morning, from the top of the stack, they saw a girl approach on foot and then run and hide in the stack below them on the appearance of a car in the distance. The car drew up abruptly when the driver saw the three comrades' car in the ditch, and the trio slid down from the stack to ask for help. They were met by Jasper and Big and Little Swede. Yes, that's when we learned that we were on the Jim Ross Ranch, of which Jasper was foreman. That the ranch consisted of 40,000 acres, that Jim Ross was a prize fight fan, even to having his own prize ring on the ranch. 
that the two Scandinavian boys, big and little Swede, were the big boss's favorite fighters. And it would be well worth anyone's time if he could whip these two young giants. Against my judgment, Doc accepted the challenge, and Reggie sided in with him. Yeah, and was Jasper tickled. He insisted we should go back to the ranch house with him after Big and Little Swede had lifted their car back onto the road. Jack took our car and sent me and Reggie on ahead with Jasper and the Swedes. As soon as they were out of sight, I went back to the haystack and found the hiding girl. She turned out to be Jacqueline, Jack Dempsey, Ross, 20-year-old daughter of the big boss, running away from home to elope with a man she loved. A man named Duke. She said she was to meet Duke here at the haystack and asked me to help them. When I said I thought not, she flew into a rage and dissolved into tears, refusing to listen to anything I tried to say. Oh, why? Why does a girl ever trust a man? You're acting like a little fool. That's it. Call me names. Way out here with nothing for miles but this haystack. But if you'll just calm down. I am calm. All right, all right. If you're calm, then listen to me. I won't. I tell you all about me. I trust you. And then you turn on me. I haven't turned on you. You have. You have, too. Oh. Uh, you women make me sick. There, you see, you hate women. You like seeing me miserable. What you need is a good spank. Sir, don't you dare lay hands on me. I'm not going to lay hands on you, but somebody ought to. Oh, just you wait till Duke hears about this. Just you wait. Well, if Duke's a smart man, he'll never show up. Uh, what do you mean? Well, just that you've got a temper like a catamount and a disc like two cats with their tails tied together. I am not. I say you have. If your father's trying to palm you off on some man, I'd say he has an awful grudge against you. You're absolutely and completely horrid. And you couldn't tell the truth if you wanted to. Couldn't I? No, you can't. I'm young and lovely. And every young man in the country is crazy about me. They're crazy, all right. Hey, there's a car coming up the road. Oh, well, you suppose it's father? Well, suppose it's your father. Then what? But he mustn't find me. I'm eloping. I don't want anybody but Duke to find me. Well, maybe it's Duke. Mm, but supposing it isn't. Well, then you better get back under the hay until we find out. What good will that do? You'll tell on me. Will I? Well, you said you wouldn't help me. No, I won't help you run away, but neither will I give you away. You mean that? Well, look, if you don't want to be seen, you better dive back into that hay. That car's getting close. Oh, yes. Yeah. I got a nice little nest dug down here. Well, lie still. I'll finish covering it. <laughs> well? I'm sorry I was so rotten. I didn't mean to think like that. It's too late. You've already shown what kind of a girl you are. Oh, I hate you worse than any man I ever knew. Well, you better keep still. That man's getting out of his car and coming over here. Is it your father? How do I know whether it's your father? I never saw him in my life. Have you got a point? And red right here? Shut up. Oh, good morning. Is uh, this your haystack? No, it is my haystack. Hey, what are you doing here? I slipped here last night. Yeah? Yeah. My name's Jack Packard. What's your name? Does it make any difference? It might. I asked you what you were doing here. And I said I slept here last night. Well, you're not sleeping here now, are you? No. Then would you mind moving on? Well, that's not very friendly. Well, I don't feel very friendly. That's too bad. Hangover? No. I thought maybe it was, and you'd come out here to this haystack to sleep it off. Well, I didn't. Mind telling me why you did come out here? Yes. Yes, what? Yes, I mind telling you. Oh. Your name wouldn't be Duke, would it? How did you know that? And you wouldn't be looking for a girl named Jack Dempsey Ross, would you? Her name isn't Jack Dempsey, it's Jacqueline. Well, the way I heard it, her father's a nut about prize fighting and named his only child after his favorite ring champion. And his name certainly wasn't Jacqueline. Say, who are you anyway? I told you that once. Jack Packard. Well, supposing I am Duke Carter, and supposing I am here to meet Jacqueline, what of it? Going to run away with her, aren't you? Is that any of your business? Going to marry the girl? Say, look here, I now. asked you a simple question, and I repeat it. Are you going to marry her? Certainly I'm going to marry her today. Hmm. I wouldn't if I were you. What? I wouldn't even elope with her. Say, are you crazy? No. Then why shouldn't I marry her? If I can get her out from under her old man's thumb. Because she's got a horrible temper. She has not. Oh, yes, she has. She's a wild Indian, if I ever saw one. I don't care if she's a Fiji Islander. If I love her and I want to marry her, I'll do it. And it's none of your business. <laughs> you feel that way, do you? Yes, I feel that way. She, uh, she isn't very pretty. That's a lie. Her legs are too long. They are not. I don't see what you can see in her. I'll tell you what I see in her. She's the most beautiful, the most charming, the loveliest girl that was ever born. And if you say she's not, take off your coat and see what happens to you. 
Well, Duke, I guess you win. Well, certainly I... Huh? What do you mean? Come on out from under the hay, Jack Dempsey. Jacqueline! Say, you... You speaking to me? Yes. Stop calling me Jack Dempsey. But you told me yourself. I don't care what I told you. You stop calling me Jack Dempsey. And another thing. I'm listening. You're everything I ever said about you for saying all those things to Duke. <laughs> what difference did it make? They didn't even phase him. He's in love. Jacqueline, has this man been annoying you? He certainly has. All right, you. Take off your coat. What for? I'm going to give you the worst licking you ever had. Well, listen to the boy. You heard what I said. Well, it's pretty hot for a fight, even this early in the morning. Besides, I haven't had breakfast yet. I said to I take... heard what you said. I like a good fight myself at the right time and place, but this isn't it. Let's sit down and talk. Oh, come on, Duke. Let him alone. we got to get started. Sit down. Oh. Hey, you push that girl. Oh, you sit down, too. Why, why, you... That's better. Now then, listen to me. I like you, too. You... You like us? That's what I said. Well, you sure have a great way of showing it. Now then, listen to me. You two are making the mistake of your lives running away to get married like this. Well, that's our business. Well, I'm making it mine. You run away and Jack Dempsey here will be disinherited by old man Ross. I told you not to come... Isn't that the truth? Um, yes. To look at you, Duke, I'd say you weren't any too well off. Well, I've got a little ranch. Sure, but it'd be a lot better if you both stood in well with the girl's father, wouldn't it? But I told you... He wants me to marry another man. With one exception. Oh, it's crazy. Well, nevertheless, he's agreed to let you marry Jacqueline here if you can bring an amateur prize fighter into the ring who can whip Big Swede and Little Swede. Yes, but where can I find anyone like that? Well, there isn't a fighter in these parts who isn't afraid of them. You're wrong. What? I've got a partner who can knock the stuffings out of either of those Scandinavian boys. Oh, you're nuts. Don't tell me I'm nuts, son. Why not? Because I don't like it. All right. If you've got a man who can do what you say, where is he? He and my other sidekick have already gone back to the ranch house with the foreman of your father's ranch. Jasper? Yes. But if father gets hold of him first, I mean before Duke... I thought you said Jasper was on your side. He is. Well, Jasper seemed awfully pleased about something. I don't think he's going to let your father get hold of Reggie before he's had a talk with you and Duke. Reggie? That's the boy who can whale the tire out of the Swedes. How do you know he can do it? Because he already knocked out one of them this morning. Are you sure? Ask Jasper. He saw it done. Oh, Oh, Duke, do you suppose... Oh, I don't know what to say. Well, look, even if you're doubtful, it's worth taking a chance, isn't it? If by some hook or crook Reggie is defeated, you can still elope sometime in the future. Oh, I, I guess so. And this way you're gambling on staying in the old man's goodwill and still getting the girl. And what do you say, Jack? Oh, yes. Please, let's try well, it. I don't know. After all, I'm marrying you and not your father's money. Oh, don't be silly. I know that. Well, if you do... Of course I do. And after all, father is all alone in the world except for me. I mean, if I can have you both... It'll be so much better. Good. Then that's settled. Now then, let's all get to the ranch house as fast as possible. Hey, wait a minute. Old man Ross ordered me off his place and threatened to shoot me if I ever came back. He won't shoot anybody. Oh, you don't know father. Well, never mind. I'll see he doesn't shoot anybody. That is, until you've had a chance to tell him about your fighter. After oh, that... Oh, if he once knows Duke's got a fighter to put up against his men, he'll forget all about his grudge. Good. Then let's go tell him. Well, if I get shot... If you get shot, I'll personally tie up your wounds. And if you die, I'll chant hymns on your grave every night for a year. That isn't a bit funny. You think not? You can hear me chant a hymn once. Jekyll, and this fellow sounds to me like he's talking through his hat. You think he's really got a fighter? Oh, I don't know. I've never seen him. Now, look, am I going to have to hog tie you two kids to get you to the ranch house? Well... You are telling the truth. Oh, do we have to go over all that again? I suppose you know I'm trusting the honor of a good woman in your hands. <laughs> well, let's make that our beautiful thought for the day. You're trusting the honor of a good woman in my hands. If you're making light of oh, what Oh, come I... on, come on. Stop acting like the hero and the drunkard and let's get started. And just so you won't get any ideas about eloping, after all, you ride in my car, Jack Dempsey. You don't stop calling me Jack Dempsey. I know, I know, I know going to be mad at me again. Oh, why wasn't I born a man with lots of muscle? But just you wait. My father will take care of you.
The further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York, with Mercedes McCambridge as Miss Jack Dempsey Ross. Frank McCarthy speaking. You know, maybe he works at a desk next to yours or on a machine down the line. Now, he makes the same money you do, yet he can afford to send his son through college. How does he do it? Well, it's simple. You see, he played it smart. He started buying United States savings bonds through the payroll savings plan when it first started. And today, well, today he's got more than enough to see his boy through college. Now, if he can do it, so can you. Plan to put twice as much in savings bonds as you're doing now and save that money before you spend it. With the automatic purchase of savings bonds, you'll pile up savings that will buy you a home of your own or a college education for your children and old age without financial worries. Join the part payment payroll savings plan where you work, or if you're self-employed, use the bond-a-month plan where you bank. If you can't participate in a regular plan, buy an extra bond now at any bank or post office. Don't delay. Your own future, your country's future, can't wait. Buy United States Savings Bonds. This program came from New York. There are sports thrills for all on Sports for All over most of these stations tonight. Hear Bill Slater with his sport guest, fight master Bonnie Ross, and the all-time All-American football star Ken Strong on Sports for All Tonight. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System presents I Love the Mystery. adventure thriller, The Battle of the Century. Looky, Jack. Ain't I about the prettiest thing you ever did see? Purple trunks and everything. Doc, they are positively ghastly. What you mean, ghastly? They asked me what colored trunks I wanted to fight in, and I said the purple is purple they had. These is them. Yes, there's no doubt about them being purple, all right. <laughs> yeah, they kind of match my red hair, don't you think? No, I don't. Well, that's because you ain't got no sense about colors, Jack. Well, maybe you're uh, kind of colorblind or something. I wish I was every time I look at you. Well, you're simply going to overpower your cowboy opponent by sheer weight of color, Doc. I'm going to overpower him with more in color. Boy, I'm going to wipe up the floor with that curly hombre. The old fire eater himself. Yeah, huh? dang tootin'. Hey, Jack, you better hurry up and get yourself in your trunks. Fights are starting pretty soon. I'm not going to put on any trunks. Well, you ain't. I am not. I think the whole business is silly. I'm not going to make it any sillier by dolling myself up like a chorus girl. What you mean, chorus girl? These here are honest-to-goodness fighting trunks. And I'm still not going to put them on. Well, you'll have to strip down to the waist. They'll insist on that. Then I'll strip down to the waist. Well, well anyway, fella, I'll put on these regulation shoes. Well, you don't want to have your feet go slipping out from under you just when you're ready to give him the coupe de Gracie. What? <laughs> no. Coupe de Gracie. Well, sure. <laughs> fighting in the ring ain't like fighting with your feet on solid ground. Come on here. Put on these shoes. All right, Doc. All right. Well, well come on. Come on out there. What are we waiting for? Well, 
Well, Doc, I say there's still 20 minutes until we're due at the ring. What I want to know is, how did we get ourselves into this? Well, that's simple. That curly cowboy got nasty with me and I up and socked him to sleep. Now I got to give him a chance to get even. Only he ain't going to get even on account I'm going to send him bye-bye again. Well, that doesn't answer my question. Well, you ought to know how you got into this. That there Ole hombre barges around the corner of the barn and smacks into you, and then he ups and takes a swing at you. Yeah, but why did he take a swing at you? Mm-hmm. Because he has that kind of a disposition, I suppose. Well, I think you're wrong. Mm-hmm. Hey, what you talking about? I think both of these fights are frame-ups. Oh, look here, Jack. How can they be frame-ups? Well, Curly picked a fight with me, and, and Ole picked a fight with you. Well, that's just it. Two strangers pick quarrels with us out of the empty air. Why? It doesn't make sense. Well, well, all I know is when a guy swings on me, he better duck on account of I'm going to swing right back. Certainly. That's just what Jim Ross anticipated. I say, are you saying Mr. Ross deliberately set those men on you? Sure he did. It's as plain as the nose on your face. Well, what did he want to do that for? For tonight's show. I said, do you, do, you, do you think his love of prize fighting would make him go that far? I mean, to say, deliberately start a quarrel so that the men would fight it out in his own private prize ring? Yes, and I'll tell you why. Hmm? You heard him say he had 150 men working for him. That's right. And he also said that they put on two or three grudge fights in the ring every Wednesday night. Yeah, sure he did. Well, doesn't it sound a little unreasonable to you that 150 men can't work together without having two or three bitter quarrels every week? Joe, that does seem a large percentage. Unless all his men are as ornery as Ole and Curly. Well, if they are, they've been made that way by Jim Ross. What you driving at, son? I think that man spends all his spare time causing trouble among his men just for the pleasure of seeing them fight. Why, the old son of a gun. Yeah, and we've fallen very neatly into his trap. Yeah, well, son, I... I reckon ain't nothing we can do about it at this stage of the game. No, but we can see that we don't fall into the trap again. Well, I don't see how. Every time anybody takes a swat at me around this here ranch, I'm going to bop them right back. Yes, and that's another fight for the ring. Nothing of the kind. We'll insist on settling the argument right then and there. Yeah, sure. That's the way to handle it. Hey, where's Duke Carter? I ain't seen him all evening. Oh, look here. He's about somewhere with Jacqueline Ross, naturally. Yeah, I suppose so. Lucky stiff. Only good-looking girl in miles. She's got to be in love with somebody else. Mm -hmm. Well, your women always seem to be in love with someone else, Doc. Yeah, I can't figure it out. No. Me being as popular as I am with women. Just the same, Jack. That was a smart understanding you had with Mr. Ross, insisting that his daughter and Duke could see as much of each other as they liked until the fight. I didn't do it for them. I just thought it would make the old man uncomfortable. Ah, You don't like him? Oh, he's all right, I guess. Only this prize fight mania proves that he's got a cruel streak in him. And I don't like that. Yeah. I never thought about that. You know, I say, there's one thing I don't care about. Well, what's that, Ray? This business of two weeks of training. He's already talking about coming over here and watching me train. What does he expect me to do? Put on a show for him? Well, professionals always go through a lot of monkey business. The gym stuff, sparring partners, road work, stuff like yeah, that. But I say I don't need it and I won't have it. And you don't have to do it either. Look here, if if Ross expects it of me, well... Well, tell him to jump in the lake. Oh, by the way, Doc, I've got an idea. Let's see what you think of it. Well, shoot, son. How'd you like to go into the ring double tonight? Double? Yeah. We're going together. The old back-to-back stuff. Hey, I think you've got something, fella. It works in the open. I don't see why it wouldn't work in a prize ring. Oh, boy. Could we make Ole and Curly look silly? It's spectacular and probably give the crowd some excitement. But look here, do you suppose Ole and Curly would go for it? They will if Jim Ross tells them to. Then all we got to do is sell a big boss on the idea. Yeah, I can do that. He'll go for anything that's new and exciting. Say, shall I go round up Jasper and have him take care of it? Yeah, if you will, Reggie. Hey, you suppose that's our call? Well, I'll go have a look. Well, uh, tell him I'm ripping and raring to go. I say, Mr. Ross. Miss Jacqueline? Are the boys decent? Can we come in? Yes, certainly. Come right in. We thought you two would be down at the ring. No, there's lots of time for that. Hello, Mr. Packard. Well, well, what's this? Oh! Doc, what in the world are you wearing? Hello, sugar. Uh, how you like my purple trunks? <laughs> They're terrible. Uh, you must be colorblind, too. <laughs> oh, uh, howdy, Mr. Ross. Well, you boys ready for the fight? Sure we're ready. And we'll give you some fighting that is fighting. But we don't like it. You don't like it? No, we don't like and it. And I don't blame you, either. I think my father is a mean, underhanded old man. Jack Dempsey? Well, I do, and Duke agrees with me, framing Mr. Packard and Doc. The young woman, who's running this shebang? I don't care who's running it. 
You got Mr. Packard and Doc into this on purpose, and it's a mean trick. And Duke agrees with me. Will you stop bringing that young whippersnapper into the conversation? Duke is not a young whippersnapper. Well, he is a young whippersnapper. He always was a whippersnapper, and he always will be a whippersnapper. Dad, you're just saying that to infuriate And you'll keep bringing his name into the conversation to infuriate Duke me. Duke is the sweetest man in the whole world. Yes, he's probably the poorest man in the whole he's world. He's not. Well, he won't be forever. He's got ambitions. That's right. He's got ambitions to inherit my money. He has not. I say he has. I say yes. Hey, hey, hey. You two, wait a minute here. <laughs> Doggone, did you ever hear two people go on like that? Well, what's a man to do with a daughter like Jack Dempsey, I ask you. Yes, and I ask you, what can a girl do with a father like Jim Ross? <laughs> <laughs> We're not interested in your family quarrel. Why, well, you should be. <laughs> Honest to goodness, honey, do you and your papa go hammer and tongs like this all the time? No, Dad can be as sweet as pie when he wants to. Trouble is, he never wants to. Well, i tell you one thing. If my cousin Winnie May ever talked up to her papa like that, well... He'd have busted a rail fence over and flung her off a cliff long ago. You never said a true word. She's spoiled, spoiled rotten. I don't care. I don't care about anything except marrying Duke Carter. Well, you'll never marry him. I will, too. Just as soon as Reggie wipes up the ground with Big Sweet, I'm going to marry Duke at the biggest wedding this county's ever seen, and you're going to pay for it. <laughs> when Reggie wipes up the floor with the Big Sweet... Yes, and he can do it, too. I say he can't do no such thing. I say he can't. But I say he can't. Hey, hey, will you two wait a minute? Reggie can lick Big Sweet any day in the week. Jacqueline, will you shut up? Well, I don't care. You can, too. Well, I agree with you, but I've got something more important to say right now. What's more important than my Mary and Duke? Listen, Jack Dempsey. And don't call me Jack Dempsey! Well, I am calling you Jack Dempsey. If you don't keep still, I'm going to turn you over my knee and whale the living daylights out of you right here in front of your father. <laughs> That's the way to talk to a packet. That's <laughs> it. One girl against four men. Honest to goodness, honey, you, you do talk awful loud and long for such a, such a little piece of girl. Will you all shut up and listen? All right, all right. Now, look here, Ross. The fight starts in about ten minutes. That's right. All the boys are gathered down the ring, and Jasper's refereeing. Well, I don't care about that. I'm interested in what Jacqueline said about you framing us into these fights. Oh, she don't know what she's talking about. I do, too. Be still. Yes, sir. I think she does know what she's talking about. I suspected it before she gave it away. Well, what about it? Just this. We go through with the fights tonight. But don't try it again. If one of my men picks a fight, you got to fight him or show the white feather. But we don't have to fight him in the ring. And we won't fight him in the ring. No? No. We'll knock him out where he stands, and that'll be the end of it. Now then, tonight you want a really good show? What do you mean? Put Doc and me in together with Curly and Ole. Four men? Why not? Then you'll see a really good fight. You boys want to do it that way? Certainly. <laughs> then, boys, that's how it'll be. Whoopee! Jacqueline, tonight you're going to see some fighting that is fighting. Blood, guts, and feathers everywhere. <laughs> transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love the Mystery.
Dalton Morse adventure thriller, The Battle of the Century. You know something, son? The nearer it gets time to go in that ring and mop up, the better I like it. <laughs> First thing you know, you'll be enjoying yourself. Well, I think he's doing that right now. <laughs> of course I am. There's only one thing, old Jack. Us fighting double this way, it ain't so good. I thought you wanted to fight double. I asked you. Oh, yeah, I know. The, the fighting's all right. It's just that I'm going to have to divide the glory with you afterwards. <laughs> oh, no. Well, that's all right with me. You're welcome to all the glory you can get out of this. Well, that's pretty darn swell of you. Only you know I won't take more than my share. Oh, no. Well, I won't. Well, Dad, blame it, did I ever take more than my share of anything? Well, how about the girls? Oh, gals, it's different. Oh, yeah? Well, sure they are. I got first call on all the women. Oh, by the way, uh, where's that little old Jack Dempsey gal and her pappy go? Down to the ringside. Old man Ross went down to give Jasper instructions for the four-man fight. Did Ross say Jasper was refereeing? Well, what we need a referee for in a four-man fight of bare fist? Anything goes. I doubt that, Doc. They'll probably keep it a stand-up, clean-blow fight. Well, shucks, I didn't mean to get a man down and gouge him. <laughs> well, just the same with four in the ring... Jasper better keep moving or he's liable to get run down. That's yes, quiet. I'd certainly hate to referee a four-man fight in that small a space. <laughs> sure be a good chance to get the referee down and kick him around some, though, if he wasn't giving you the breaks. Oh, but look here, Doc. Remember, Jasper's on our side. He'll want to see you two chappies win. Yeah, we can't kick Jasper around tonight. Well, let's make that our thought for the day. We can't kick Jasper around tonight. <laughs> hey, uh, what's holding things up? I'm a raring and stomping to get started. Ross said they'd send word up here to the training quarters when they're ready for us. It must be about time, though, don't you think? Hmm, should be. Speaking of training quarters, these are a bit all right, what? Yeah, we should ought to have some fun here the next couple of weeks. I ain't never seen a gymnasium like this here. Punching bags, weightlifting machines, bars, trapezes. Say, did I ever tell you about the time Winnie May's mama took uh, my cousin Winnie May and me to the circus? I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, I did? I don't remember telling you. Oh, go on, Doc. What happened? Well, uh, Winnie Mae didn't ever see a circus before. She was uh, sitting there eating eating hunks of Cracker Jack when them, uh, them acrobat on brazen females in tights begun swinging out on their trapezes. Well, all of a sudden, one of them female acrobats let go way up in top of the tent and started doing flip-flaps. Flip-flops. What'd you say? Flip-flops. Well, anyway, she started doing didos, and Winnie Mae sucked in her breath and swallowed a hunk of Cracker Jack backwards. <laughs> backwards? Well, I swear to my grandma, that girl darn near choked to death right there. And then uh, some fella picked her up by her feet, and her mama whanged her on the back for maybe ten minutes before they jarred it loose. Mm, well, how, how old were you and Winnie Mae then? Oh, six or seven, I reckon. Mm -hmm. well, weren't you pretty young to remember all the details? Well, shucks, no, Reggie. I even remember reading soft as silk cake flour across the back of her underwear while this hombre was holding her up by her oh, feet. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> well, I see you. There they are. Come in. Well, if it ain't our little old gal friend. And, Duke, come on in, Duke. You boys ready? We've been ready for hours. You come to get us, Duke? Yes. No rush, though. Jasper said to bring you out in two or three minutes. Everything set for Doc and me to go into the ring together? All set. Jasper says you're crazy to want to do it. He does, huh? Why? He says Curly and Ole are old sidekicks, and they know plenty of dirty tricks. Well, he's not going to let him get away with it, is he? Well, that's just a trouble. What can he do about it? Well, he's refereeing, isn't he? Well, sure, but with four men in the ring, he's not going to be able to see everything. Well, shucks, what do we care, Jack? We can be just as dirty as they can. In other words, anything goes, huh? Well, that's what it amounts to. Does the crowd love it? The crowd's pulling for Curly and Ole, I reckon. Well, sure, that's natural. Duke and I will be sitting in your corner with Reggie. Now you're talking. With a pretty little old gal like you are pulling first, we can't lose. Isn't Doc cute, Duke? I'm crazy about him. You are, sure not. Bend over here and I'll kiss you for luck. Yeah, wait a minute. Now, don't be a darn hog, Duke. Be a good guy and turn your back. I will not. Well, don't pay any attention to Duke. He's just jealous. Mm. There. Good? Good. Lady, I feel like I've been kicked by a mule. Ooh-wee! Am I dizzy? <laughs> Jack, son, you should ought to get you some of that. It, it's potent. Nothing doing. Jacqueline's my girl, and she's not passing out any more kisses. You're right, son. If I had a girl with that much dynamite in her lips, I'd put up a fight, too. Gee! Am I really that good? I ain't kidding, sugar. Your name should be Jack Dempsey, because... You sure carry a wallop. Well, just because she did it once, don't think she's ever going to do it again. All right, son, all right. Now, don't get all head up. 
I ain't going to steal you, girl. I say, shouldn't we be getting out to the ring? Oh, sure, it's time. Come on. Okay. Well, Jack Bella, here we go, boy. <laughs> You're still dizzy from that kiss. <laughs> sure, I'm still dizzy. I'm walking around on air. Well, that's great. Well, what you mean, that's great? I want a fighter at my back tonight, not a Romeo full of love and kisses. Sonny, it's just like I'm always telling you. There ain't no time I fight better than... When some gal's honors, it's stay. All right, all right. I say, you two coming? Yeah, go ahead with Duke and the girl. I want to talk to Doc. Right ho. Now, look, Doc. Yeah? No rough stuff unless they start it first. Well, sure, but uh, that don't go if they do start something dirty. No, we'll use whatever tactics they use. We'll work back to back unless they're too cagey for us. If they won't fight that way, then we'll have to split up and go it on our own. But the minute they start pressing us, back to back again. Sure. Same old tactics as we always use. That's it. Hey... Looky yonder. The outdoor ring all lighted up. Hmm, Good-sized bunch of people, too. <laughs> it's funny how your blood starts singing at a time like this. Yeah. Oh, just one thing more now. If one of us knocks out his man first, he's to go to a neutral corner and let the other fight it out alone. Hey, they won't do that. If they get one of us, why? Well, then they'll both jump on the other, and you know it. Well, just the same we don't fight that way. Well, okay, fella. But that gives them an advantage. All right, come on. Hurry it up. They're waiting for you. All right, we're here, aren't we? Curly and Ole are already in the corners. Come on, Jasper's waving to you. All right, boys, come on. Climb into the ring. All right, Doc. Right here through the ropes. Here I come. <sighs> You next, Jack. Hey, boy, Doc. Hey, boy, Jack. Show him how to fight. Oh, you boys all ready? Let her go any time, Jasper. Well, let me warn you, I'll do the best I can, but I can't watch everything. And Curly and Ole are bound to get in some fouls. Oh, shucks, don't worry about that. We'll give them as good as they send. Well, that's fair enough. All right, then, I'm going to introduce you. Yeah, let her go. All right. Ladies and gents, tonight we caught something new in prize fighting for you. Tonight we're going to give you four men in the ring at once. Two grudges are to be settled in one fight. In this corner we have Curly Wilson and Ollie Jenkins. Listen to little old Jack. <laughs> yeah, look at old Jim Ross sitting over there on the edge of his chair. Yeah, don't go. He sure does love a prize fight, do Now, before I call the boy shot the center of the ring, I want to make one more announcement. There will be no rounds in this fight. Once the start, they keep fighting until one side is the winner. <laughs> That's it. Gather out here. Gather out. That's right. Now then, this is going to be a hard fight to referee. I want you all to keep it clean. That's all. Now go back to your corners. When the bell rings, come on, fight. You bet you. Come on, Doc. <laughs> Doggone fella. This is all right. Look out. Here comes the bell. Let me at him. Back to back, Doc. Back to back. <laughs> Give it him, Doc. Steps in. You bet. Give it him, Doc. 
Here he comes. Jake, that. He's down, Jack. He's down. Get my dude for quarter. All right, Ollie. It's just you and me now. You mean it's just you, fella? What are you waiting for? Come and get it. Here you swatch. transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morris, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Virtual Broadcasting System presents I Love the Mystery. adventure thriller, The Battle of the Century. Come on, let's go in. But Jacqueline, we can't do that. That's their bunk room. I know it. Come on. But there's men asleep in there. Of course there are. That's what I want to find out. How anybody can be asleep at 7 o'clock in the morning. Everyone isn't up raring around the country at the break of day the way you are. Well, stay out here if you want to. I'm going in. But it isn't decent. An 18-year-old girl... And besides, you're engaged to me. So what? Well, so you can't go in there. Oh, I can't, can't I? Well, listen to me, Duke Carter. My father's tried to tell me I couldn't do things all my life, and look what it's got him. Yeah. Say, maybe your old man's got a lot of sympathy coming to him after all. When I want to do something, I... Say, what did you say? I just said you can't walk into a man's bedroom. That isn't what it sounded like to me. No? No. And I'd like to know why I can't. These training quarters belong to my father, don't they? Sure, but Jacqueline, a man's bedroom is sacred. How'd you like to have some man walk into your bedroom while you're sleeping? What I don't know wouldn't hurt me. Well, that's a nice thing to say. All right, you stand here and argue while I go in alone. It's unfair, indecent, and nothing a nice girl would do. Well, you just stand there and feel bad while I'm gone. No, sir. If you go in, I'll go in. Suit yourself. If they wake up, they'll pull us out in our ears and kick us down the steps, and I won't blame them. Don't talk so loud, and they won't wake up. Oh, look. This must be Mr. Packard. Sleeping with his head under his pillow. I don't know how you can tell. But those are his clothes over the foot of the bunk. He, do all men sleep with their heads under their pillow? No. Packard must be part ostrich. <laughs> what keeps him from smothering? Maybe he is smothering for all I know. You think we should lift up the pillow and see? No. Oh, all right. I don't think I'd like to marry a man who sleeps with his head under his pillow. You don't sleep with your head under your pillow, do you? Well, certainly not. Hmm. Well, let's see what else we can find. Oh, this is Doc. Goodness, doesn't he have red hair? Mm-hmm. If he should open his eyes right now. 
Look at the expression on his face. <laughs> he looks like a satyr. Probably dreaming about women. Yeah, he's sure crazy about girls, all right. You know, he kind of appeals to me. Oh, he does. Mm-hmm. You know, it fascinates me. Well, you keep away from him. He's known women all over the world. Uh-huh. That's what I mean. When he looks at me, I can see him thinking about every woman he's ever known. You like that? Well, I don't know. But I would like to ask him how I stack up alongside all those other girls he's known. The quicker that guy gets out of here, the better I'm going to like Oh, him. look. Duke, look at his left eye. It's all black and blue. Well, what'd you expect? He had a fight last night. Oh, I didn't know he got a black eye. Well, anyhow, I'm glad he and Mr. Packard won. Oh, so am I. We've got your father worried. Uh-huh. And is he in a temper this morning? He's crazy to see what Reggie can do now. Yes. Jasper said he told him, if Jack and Doc can fight the way they did last night, and Reggie's even better, well, that Englishman may give big, sweet trouble. <laughs> I'll say he's going to give him trouble. <laughs> Let's go over and have a look at Reggie. Oh, hello, champion. Hey, don't talk to him. You might wake him up. Duke, he looks like a baby. <laughs> Pretty good-sized baby. No. Sleeping on his back with his arms up over his head. His face so relaxed and innocent. Yeah. He's not much older than we are. Twenty-three or four, I think, Doc said. Do you really think he's got a chance against Big Swede? Well, Jack and Doc think so. He sure hopes they know what they're talking about. Hey, look out. He's stirring in his sleep. <laughs> Wouldn't he be surprised to open his eyes and see us looking down at him? Come on, let's get out of here. Well, that won't last forever. Okay. I know. Let's go out and get Belshazzar to wake him up. What do you want to wake them up for? Because they've slept long enough. Besides, I want to talk to them. <laughs> go on out and I'll close the door. No. Leave the door open. What for? Never mind. Just leave the door open. Hey, Belshazzar! Yeah, Miss Jackie, I'm coming right up. Look, Jacqueline, why not let them sleep? No, they've slept long enough. Good yeah, morning, Miss Jackie. You want me, lady ma'am? Look, Belshazzar, didn't my father send you down here to cook for Mr. Packard, Mr. Long, and Dr. Igor? Yeah, he sure did, Miss Jackie. He sure done just that. Well, then why aren't you doing it? Well, yeah. but goodness, Miss Jackie, how are I going to cook for them when they're sleeping the way they are? Well, you've got a dinner gong, haven't you? Wake him up. No, oh, I swear, goodness, I done wrung that gong until my arms wore right down to a nubbin. And it didn't faze them? No, ma'am. Didn't even make them turn over. They was the sleepiest young gentleman I ever did come across. Well, try it again. Yes, ma'am. Ain't no use, though. Well, give it to him good and loud this time. I sure will, ma'am. Come and get it! What's happening inside, Duke? <laughs> Nothing. That didn't wake him up? Not a move out of any of them. Belshazzar! Yes, ma'am. You take that dinner going into that bunk room and ring it until you get some action. Huh? Right into the bunk room? Yes, walk up and down beside their beds and make it loud. Oh, yes, ma'am. And don't come out till they're awake. No, ma'am, I won't. Push the door open wider so we can watch what happens. Well, I'm not responsible for this, and I'm going to tell them. Oh! Do you have to do that? Uh, yes, sir. I sure do. Hey, hey, Reggie, I, I think we've been invaded. Yes, quite. Oh, by a big husky Negro person. Hey, hey, you. Uh, you talking to me, sir? Yeah, I'm talking to you. Well, what's your name? Belshazzar, sir. Oh, no, not Belshazzar. Yes, sir, sure is. Oh, well, yeah. what's the idea of coming in here pounding on that thing? The orders, sir. Orders? Whose orders? Well, Miss Jackie, sir, she done told me to come in here and ring this here dinner gong until you was all awake. Oh, dear. <laughs> hey, Jack, did you hear that? Hey, Jack, ain't you awake? <laughs> Certainly not. Hey, uh, hey, uh, Bell Chassis. Hey, yes, sir. Uh, go on over there by Jack's bed and do that again. Well, this gentleman? Yeah, only he ain't no gentleman. <laughs> Give it to him good. Come and go! Oh, I say, 
say, isn't that awful? <laughs> hey, uh, what, what, what happened? Well, nothing happened, boss. You, you don't suppose this gentleman's dead, do you? <laughs> no, no, he ain't dead. <laughs> well, he done got a pillow over his head. And well, just... take your pillow off and, uh, and do it again. Yes, sir. Come on, Jerry! Hey, Reggie, turn off that alarm clock. Well, well, uh, this ain't no alarm clock. Huh? Uh-huh. Oh, what, what, is, what is it, then? Well, this here, sir, is a dinner gong. What? A dinner gong. It don't even work like no alarm clock. <laughs> oh. Uh, well, no, sir, it works like this, yeah. Oh, man, hey, 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 stop that. Hey, you, you awake, sir? Say, who are you, anyway? I, I'm Belshazzar, sir. You sure you're not Beelzebub? Oh, no, sir, I'm Belshazzar. Well, what are you doing here? What do you want? I'm your cook, sir. Hey, how you want your eggs? Are sunny side up or with the eyes closed? <laughs> hey, you fellas awake? He wants to know, are we awake? <laughs> yeah. Of course we're awake. Uh, look, uh, Beelzebub. Yeah, Belshazzar, sir. No, all right, Belshazzar. You may be our cook, but you keep that infernal machine out of our bedroom after this. Do you understand? Well, that was all the size. Yeah, that little old she-daughter of old man Ross sent him in here. What? Jack Dempsey? You stop calling me Jack Dempsey! Uh, so you're at the bottom of this, huh? Yes, I am! It's silly for grown men to sleep after 7 o'clock. Hey, you mean that's all the time it is? 7 o'clock? Certainly! Now get up and take your showers and then come and have breakfast. Say, Jack, what we got ourselves into, anyway? Hey, what do you think you are out there? I'm Jacqueline Ross! My father this place. You're everything I ever said you were. I don't remember what you said. You're homely and your legs are too long and you got a bad temper. And Duke's crazy if he marries you. Why, you great big... Stand up and... And, and what? Well, Duke Carter is standing right out here beside me. And the minute you get out of that bed, I'm going to have him take you apart. Hey, Duke, are you out there? Yes, but I didn't have anything to do with this. I was against it all the time. There you are. The kind of a man I'm going to marry. You mean you stood by and let that girl do this to us? But what's the fella going to do? I told her not to, but she went right ahead and did it anyway. The fine married life you're going to have. You stop saying that. First thing he knows, he won't want to marry me. Well, I wouldn't marry you if you're the only woman in the world. Neither would I. I swear to my grandma, you're worse than Winnie May ever was. I say, Duke, are you sure you don't want me to lose my fight with Big Swede? I don't care what you guys say. I'm going to marry Jacqueline no matter what you think. Boy, now there's a man that's a real hero. I swear to my grandma, somebody ought to pin a medal on him. transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Episode 108, I'm sorry, 117 of I Love a Mystery, the series called Battle of the Century Part 11. We'll start in just a few moments. This episode goes all the way to part, what is it? Oh, part 18. And then we start broadcasting system. I love a, I love a, I love a mystery, rather, Hermit. Of Saint Felipe Alababopo. <laughs> Can't wait to try to say that one again.
Alvin Morse adventure thriller, The Battle of the Century. My father's starting any dirty work around here. I won't wait for the fight. I'll marry Duke Carter right now. You'll do nothing of the kind. I will, too. Quiet. Don't you tell me to be quiet. Quiet. Yes, sir. Your father starts any underhanded stuff, we can be just as underhanded as he can. Sure, honey. Don't you worry none. We're used to fighting city cats. I say, here they come. Boy, will you look at them. Jacqueline, do you know these men? No, where do they come from? They don't work on the ranch? No, I've never seen them in my life before. Uh-huh. And there are a couple of ringers your father's imported. Well, that shows you. That proves he's not playing fair. Well, never mind that. Let's see what they have to say. Well, come on over. What are you standing there for? Oh, so you want us to come over. That's huh? what I said, wasn't it? So we come over. What about it? What's your name? Benny. Take it or leave it. This here's mud. Mud what? Mud puddle, probably. Oh, wise guy, huh? Oh, I've been around some. Say, you two, where did you come from? Hey, mud escaped. That's great. I asked you where you came from. You don't belong on this ranch. Escaped with venom. With what? With venom. You don't know what venom is? Where's your education? <laughs> I said you didn't belong on this place. She says we don't belong on this place, Mud. And after the old man giving us 200 smackers to come all the way from Reno. Oh, so Ross brought you down from Reno. you will catch on quick, Johnny. Well, why did he bring you here? He went at Reno. He needed a couple of smart sparring partners for a fighter. So the chief of police said he'd let us two boys out of the can if we'd get out of the state. So we accepted the proposition. Hey, you fellas just get out of the calaboose? Yeah, it wasn't much of an assignment, though. We was only in for three months. I say, uh, what were you incarcerated for? Hey, what? Did you hear that? Oh, he's my ears to see me. <laughs> You'll have to talk plain, just plain United States to these mugs, Reggie. He wants to know what you was in for. For beating up five policemen. Oh, look here. You two men beat up five policemen? That's the plain truth, Percy. I say, what did you call me? The Wade was Pacey. It's fine. I just wanted to be sure. <laughs> and a kid, Reggie. Hey, Mud, you see that? He bumped me on a chin. Well, I say, hey, ain't you hurt at all? No. Then it is mighty fortunate for him I ain't, because when I am hurt, I am a dangerous brute. You're a brute, all right. Sure, did you see that, Jack? And I really hit him, too. Yes. It looked like something new in fighting men. Is Mud as good as taking it as you are? How about it, Mud? Uh, don't ask Mud to talk. It hurts him. Yeah? Well, what's the matter? His esophagus laid than I got. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mean he, he can't talk? Oh, he can whisper. I've been telling him for years, can't he, to get him sooner or later. <laughs> Boy, if this ain't a pair I've never seen in. So you've come down to be Reggie's sparring partners. Who's this here, Reggie? I am. You mean Mud or me come all the way down from Reno on a kind of that person? Now, see here, Benny. I'm getting pretty sick of your implications. You know, boys, he talks like his mouth was full of syrup. Sweet, I call it. Yes, well, you heard me, and the next time I hit you, it won't be for fun. The next time you hit me, chum, I'm going to tear a leg off you and shove it down your throat. Well, if you're going to be Reggie's sparring partner, go into the other room and get into a pair of trunks. Uh, yeah, it's a waste of time, but that's what we come for. Come on, Mud, let's go peel. Mr. Packard, are you going to put Reggie up against that man? That's the only way we'll find out what he's got. What do you care what he's got? The only man Reggie's supposed to fight is Big Sweet. What about it, Reggie? Well, I say, no, I, I'd like to guard him. I've never seen a chap who could stand up under a punch like that. Yeah, didn't he make him blink? Well, better go get into some trunks. Yes, right oh. Only take half a minute. I think you're crazy. You don't know what that man has up his sleeve. If my father sent all the way to Reno for him, he's got some good reason for it. Exactly. And I want to know what that reason is. Well, I think it's dangerous. Well, why are you so sure about that, Sugar? Because I know my father. <laughs> Honey, you sure enough ain't giving your papa much credit for fair and square shooting. Square shooting? My father? Oh, how do you suppose he got a million dollars in a 40,000-acre ranch? Not by giving his opponents the breaks. Then you really think that your father would stoop to putting Reggie out of the fight if he had any doubts at all about Big Sweet winning? I know he would. More important to father to win this fight than you realize. You mean on account he don't want you to marry Duke Carter so much? Oh, what does he care about me marrying Duke Carter? Well, he sure sounds like he cared a heap when you mentioned Duke's name. Well, he doesn't. Not really. He's against me about Duke just like he's against me in everything I want to do. Not because he cares, but because he enjoys it when we're yelling at each other. Well, will you listen at that? 
Jack, I'm beginning to get the idea that Jackie's pappy is just a plain old he sippy cat. Do you like him, huh? Of course I like him. He's the only father I got. Besides, it's nice having somebody around you can get things out of. You can get things out of your old man? Sure, I can yell louder and longer than he can. <laughs> man, oh man, what a life. You two must lead up yonder in that big house. It reminds me of the time that my cousin Winnie May... Never was... mind Winnie May just now, Doc. What you mean, never mind Winnie May? I just... Never mind Winnie May. But I don't like you saying never mind Winnie May. Winnie May is my blood cousin on my mama's side, and it ain't chivalrous for anybody to go saying never mind my blood cousin on my mama's side. Doc. Well, Dad Gummy Jack. Will you shut up? Your mouth runs like a leaky faucet when you get started. But, son, when I got something to say. You haven't. You just forgot to turn off your mouth. Well, if that ain't a pretty thing to say. We've got way off the subject. Reggie and Benny will be back here in a minute. No, I love that saying. You no, just I'm forgot to turn off your mouth. <laughs> now to get back to what we were talking about. Jacqueline, you said your marriage wasn't the important thing in this fight. Then why does your father want Big Sweet to win so badly? Because right now he's got the reputation of owning the two best amateur fighters in the country. Uh-huh. Uh, Big Sweet and Little Sweet. And if Reggie whips Big Sweet his best fighter, then everybody will laugh at him. And my father would rather sell me across the border than be laughed at. I think your old man's crazy. Well, he's certainly crazy on the subject of fighting. And I'm warning you, don't let Reggie go up against this Benny person. There's a trick oh, in it. look here now, Miss Ross. Uh, hey, Reggie, did you hear what Jackie just said? He's quiet. I, I think she's making too badly much of it. I don't see how he can hurt you much with nothing but his bare hands. I'm jolly well certain he can't. Well, what about this mud person? Oh, he ain't going to be doing nothing but standing quiet on the sideline. You don't know that. Yes, I do. On account of I'm going to be standing right alongside of him to see he don't. And I'll be standing by to jump in and stop any dirty work that might be dangerous. Hold it. Here they come. Go, go. Will you look at the build on that Benny hombre? I say, I've got it. Benny's no fighter, he's a wrestler. Yeah? That's it. A dirty wrestler. Uh -huh. So that's their game. Well, what do you mean, Jack? Catch you off guard, wrench your back, or break your arm before you realize what he's up to. Why, the double crossing Wait a minute. Old... Hold on. You all ready to go, Benny? I didn't come out here to spar with my shadow. Well, come here a minute. Say, you're always telling me to come here. How about you coming to me sometime? Never mind that. You're a wrestler, aren't you? A wrestler? Me? Yes, you. Now, ain't that a funny thing to say? Don't try to kid me. You're no more a fighter than Lady Godiva. Well, you don't see me riding no horse, do you? Are you going to stand up and fight, or are you going to use a flying tackle and try to butt him to death with your head? I'll fight my way, and he could fight his way. Yeah, that's what I thought. It's going to be rough and tumble, Reggie. You want it? I say, I haven't had a good rough and tumble about since I took on Captain Jenkins aboard the Lady Mary. Oh, golly, I wish you wouldn't. I you to Hey! You chuck me under the chin, will you? Oh, bay, out of your fight, Jack. You MC. great big lug! Yeah, uh, I ain't never seen no skate with such venom. Cute stuff. I told you to keep your hands off me! I say, old fellow, don't touch that girl again. Well, if it ain't Percy himself. <coughs> oh, yo, boy, Reg, what a sock. But I to say, it didn't phase him. Well, anyway, you made him shake his head. Look out, Reggie. Get out in the center of the ring. <laughs> I said the next time you bop me, I was going to tear off your leg. Well, come and tear it off, then. Look out, Reggie. He's going to die. Right. Oh, oh. Good work, Reggie. He missed your mile. <laughs> Let on his face in the splint. Come on. Stop squatting there, you. Get up and fight. Hey, look out. Look out. Hey, and then they're down. Get on top, Reggie. Get on top. You... Get, get your figure out of my eye. Oh, said so. Now you'll keep it out of my eye. Roll over, Reggie. Roll over. Yeah, she says to roll over. Right. Right on. Come on, boy. Come on there, son. You're doing it. You're doing it, Reggie. Get on your feet, Reggie. Get on your feet. Now get up. You bet you. And try this. He's down. He's down. He's up again. You want some more? Who can eat? He's down again. Get up on your feet. You sick? You ain't hurting me none. Oh, is that so? That's it, Reggie. Keep doing it. Here, here, here. That's enough of this. What have you say, Jack? Well, Benny, what do you think of Reggie now? Hey, hey that kid's all right. 
Too bad he ain't got no power behind his blows, though. What you mean he ain't got no power? He sure knocked you for a mess of loops. Well, me, I ain't got no use for a mug that can't beat my ears off, see? <laughs> Benny, you're sure one tough hombre. <laughs> Century. Episode 118 of I Love a Mystery. Now remember, this is a radio show, so there is no video. It's strictly for radio and theater of the mind. The further transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Any moment now, it will. S- there we go. I swear, it just wants to make me try to start Visual talking. Broadcasting system presents. I love the mystery. Now let us remember the classic line of the night so far. Yeah, well, I forgot the name. Forgot it already. Anyway, back to the show. adventure thriller, The Battle of the Century. You see? You see, my father did send Benny down here to injure Reggie. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Yeah, but he didn't have much luck. Well, if you'll try something once, you'll try it again, and maybe next time he'll succeed. Well, as soon as Reggie's had his shower and dressed, we'll go around to this scoundrelly father of yours. My father's not a scoundrel. The heck he ain't, you. He is not. He just wants to win. Well, anyone who wants to win badly enough to pull dirty work is a scoundrel for my money. He is not! All right, all right. And he's not a scoundrel. Well, he's not! Well, I said he wasn't, didn't I? Yeah, but you don't believe it. Say, what side of the fence are you on, anyway? Yeah, honey, who you rooting for? Here, we come into your camp and we're fighting your battles tooth and toenail again, your ornery pappy, and then now you go defend him. I'm me. not defending him. I'm just saying he's not a scoundrel. <laughs> well, let's make that our beautiful thought for the day. Jack Dempsey's father is not a scoundrel. <laughs> well! <laughs> well, what? Just, well! well that's intelligent. <laughs> Jack, uh, what was you saying that we was going to do as soon as Reggie comes out of the showers... Uh, when you were so rudely interrupted by Jack Dempsey here. You don't stop calling me Jack Dempsey? <laughs> What's that, honey? Well, what is you going to do if we don't stop calling you Jack Dempsey? Well, lie right down here on the floor and kick and scream. No. Well, I will. <laughs> sugar, sugar, that wouldn't be polite for a nice little old girl wearing a dress. You would say something like that. Yes, ma'am, I sure would. And you call yourself a gentleman. No, no, you're wrong there. I never did. Well. Are we back to that again? Uh, paying attention to her don't get us nowhere, Jack. Now, what was you? What was it you said you was going to do as soon as Reggie gets dressed? We're going to hunt up Jim Ross and get this thing settled once and for all. You mean about him trying to sabotage our Reggie boy? Yeah, and tell him to lay off that rough stuff or take the consequences. Now you're talking, son. Well, that's good, and I'm going along. Oh, no, you're not. I am, too. I said you're not. Hey, whose father is this, anyhow? Guess if I want to give my father a piece of my mind, I can. And who's going to stop me? <laughs> Doggone fella, it looks like she's got you there. Yeah, then I guess we just won't go after all. Oh, why? Because you'll be under our feet messing everything up. No, 
I won't. Hey. Hey, Jack. Yeah? Jack, there's somebody sneaking off the porch. I seen him bust by the window. Did you see who it was? No, no I, I didn't make it out. Well, come on. Let's have a look. Oh, look, it's my father. Why, the old son of a gun's been a spying on us. Hey, Ross. Jim Ross. You yelling at me? Yes, I'm yelling at you. Well, say, who do you think you're talking to? I'm talking to you. What are you doing sneaking around here? Well, I'll come back there and break every bone in your body if you don't change your tone of voice. Well, that's a good idea. Come on back. You bet I'll come back. No two for a penny adventure can talk to me like that. Doggone, he's coming. You think he'll try to hit you? <laughs> With that bay window out in front, he won't hit anybody. No, what do you mean by talking to me like that? I talked to you like that because you had it coming. Uh, I'll have you know yes, that... Yes, I know, I know. You're Jim Ross and you own 40,000 acres. And I don't take lip from no man. And if you're such a big man, why do you go around spying on people? Spying? Who's spying? You were. Oh, that's a lie. Don't tell me I lied. And don't tell me I've been spying. Well, you were, weren't you? Sure you were. You sick that bone-busting Benny on Reggie, and then you came down to watch him put our boy out of commission. What are you talking about? I'm talking about those two mugs, Benny and Mud. Well, what about them? Your Englishman's got to have sparring partners, ain't it? Look, Jim Ross, I'm your daughter, and I'm ashamed of you. You keep out of this, Jack. I will not keep out of this. You're scared to death that Reggie's going to whip Big Sweet. I'm nothing to the kind. You are, too. You're crazy. Big Sweet will knock that kid silly and too rough. He will not, and you know it. You're so scared you're trying every foul play you know to keep Reggie out of the ring next Friday. What do you mean talking to your father like because that? Because that's the kind of man my father is. Just a great big double-crossing two-timing scoundrel who doesn't know what it means to play fair. What did you call me? I called you a scoundrel, and Why, you are you, too. You, you, you baggage. I you, am not. You are, you, you're a... Hey, 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 cut it out, cut it out. This has gone far enough. Call me a baggage, will you? Jack Willard. Great big so-and-so. If you weren't my father, I... Hey, for crying out loud, honey, let up, will you? Oh, who does he think he is, anyhow? I'm your father by thunder. Though I don't know why. Will you two lovebirds shut up and let somebody else talk? Oh, will you? Boy, you'd sure know that them two was cut out of that same hunk of wood, wouldn't you? You think that's a decent way for a father and daughter to be acting? Screaming at each other? Well, that's the only way you can make my father understand. To yell at him. I told you to keep still. Oh, but a girl's all by herself. Quiet. She... Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Apparently, a person's got to yell at you to make you understand. Well, living around here... Keep him... still. All right. Now, don't anybody make a sound for five seconds. Yowza! <laughs> now then, I'll do the talking. The first thing I want to know, Ross, is why you sent a wrestler down to spar with Reggie if you're not up to something. Who said he was a wrestler? I say so. You know he is, even if you didn't know it before. Because you were watching in the window and saw him fight Reggie. Well, what about it? This about it. He tried every way he knew to injure Reggie. He even tried to gouge his eyes. Luckily, Reggie's just as good at rough and tumble as he is at stand up and knock down. There was all the proof that anybody needs that you paid Benny to come down here and put that boy out of commission. That's a lot of blouderdash. Well, there's no use trying to talk yourself out of it. It's the truth, and you know it. Now then, what I want to know is, now that Benny's failed, are you going to try some more underhanded tactics? I deny the whole thing. Well, that isn't answering my question. You're casting reflections on my good name, and by thunder, I have a half a notion to kick the whole caboodle of you off my place. Oh, so that's your game now. What do you mean? You're afraid to have Reggie fight Big Swede, so now you're going to chase us away so there won't be any fight. Dad, I think that's dirty rock. You keep still, young woman. I won't keep still. Jacqueline Ross, if you don't keep out of this, I'm going to have Doc gag. And, baby, I'm sure the hombre that can do it, too. Oh, all right. No. Is that your idea, Ross? Certainly not. Keep a civil tongue in your head and the fight will go on as scheduled. But how are we going to keep a civil tongue when you're going around making trouble for Oh, first? forget it. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. You see, Ross, we can't get a straight answer out of you. It's as plain as the nose on your face that you've got some more dirty work cooking. You can't talk to me like that. I'll have you know I'm a respectable member of this community. I think we can take care of that, too. Now, what do you mean by that? Jacqueline. What's the nearest town around here that has a newspaper? Knight's Landing. Knight's Landing, huh? You suppose the editor of the Knight's Landing paper would be interested in what's going on out if here? If that editor prints one word about me, I'll sue him right down into the ground. Well, I don't think that'll worry him much. 
If he's printing the truth... Truth? How's he going to know what's the truth and what's lies? We'll only tell him what we can prove. You can't prove a thing. I think so. How do you think you'd stand in the community if I were to take Jacqueline and Duke Carter into this night's landing editor and have them tell him how you're jeopardizing their future happiness on the outcome of a prize? Yes, and we will, too. If Mr. Packard wants us to. You'll do nothing of the kind. We will. Unless you give us some assurance that you'll go through with the fight without any dirty work. Get off my place. Clear out of here, all of you. All right. All right, that suits us. Doc, go hunt up Duke Carter and then start packing up our things. Get out the car. But you can't do that. We can do it. And we're going to. Now get yourself ready to go into Knight's Landing. Knight's Landing? What does she want to go to Knight's Landing for? Yeah, what do I want to go to Knight's Landing for? So you and Duke can tell your story to the editor, of course. They'll do nothing of the kind. Oh, yes, they will. And the story they tell will have the whole state of California in arms against you. The righteous indignation against you in Yolo County will be so thick you can cut it with a knife. What are you standing there for, Doc? Go find Duke. You bet you found Yeah, yeah, no, 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 wait a minute. No. Wait, nothing. You've ordered us off your ranch. I didn't do nothing of the kind. And you're not going to move one foot off this place. Well, will you make up your mind? You or... heard me. None of you step a foot off this ranch until after the fight next Friday night. Those are orders. Well, ain't he the one. First he kicks us out, and now he's just the same as makes us prisoners. You aren't about the doggondest father a girl ever had. And as for you, young woman, the minute Big Sweet has punched that English boy silly, I'm sending you to an institution for girls. I'd like to see you. You think I won't, and I know just the place, too. Under the eyes of strict, sour-faced old women all day, and locked up at night. Ah, oh, they won't keep me very long. Oh, no. No, I'll sink my teeth into the first old woman who opens her mouth to me. I'll show you. I'll break up their silly old school inside of a week. Not this school, you won't. <laughs> Besides, I'm going to marry Duke Carter. You're not going to do anything of the kind. I am, too. You're not. Oh, but, yeah, uh, hats. Here we go again. Well, don't tell <laughs> me what I'm going to do. Yes, and I'm telling you what to do. I'm your father. Worse luck. All right, all right, Ross. Are you finished? No, I'm not finished. Neither am I. Well, save it. I just want to give you one final word of warning. The next underhanded move you make, we turn loose on you with everything we've got. Doc. Yeah? Yeah. Go and see if Reggie isn't almost ready. You bet you. Have you got that straight, Ross? I'd just like to see any of you get to that editor at night's landing. It's 30 miles and no transportation. What do you mean, no transportation? Just what I said. No transportation for any of you. Hey, Jack. Yeah? Jack, something's the matter. Reggie's gone. Gone? I swear to goodness he is. Ain't hiding her hair up. <laughs> Ross, what do you know about this? <laughs> Looks like your English boys run out on you. Other transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Wow, this is the longest stream I've had going so far. This has been going for 21 hours, 59 minutes, and 16 seconds. The next episode, episode 119, which aired on 2, that's February 15th, 1950. This is episode 13, or part 13, of Battle of the Century. We'll begin momentarily hopefully
so far between this weekend and was it last Sunday? We've done 118 episodes of I Love a Mystery, Adventures by Morse, and I Love Adventure, all by Carlton E. Morse. There's 140 total episodes. Originally, this aired from 1939 all the way till 1950 and had something like over a thousand of episodes, but only 140 survived, unfortunately. The other episodes, I could just imagine what they were about. Was We've had City of the Dead. We've had The Lost Vampire. Uh, we'll be having The Hermit of San Felipe. Ada Bapo coming up soon. And then, uh, actually, that would be the last uh, series we had. Was it uh, The Man with the Third Eye? Corpses of the Living, Land of the Living Dead. All kinds of interesting ones. And now, of course, things like new, no, I'm not going to play. Come on, let's go. Or I'm just not patient enough. One moment. Try this again. There we go. Finally. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery. I Love a Mystery. adventure thriller, The Battle of the Century. Jasper, what have you got to report? Not a blame thing. I'll be hung for a horse thief if I can figure out how that English fella could so completely disappear without leaving a trace. Well, I'll tell you how he disappeared. He is kidnapped, and Dad bust Jim Ross for a yellow coyote anyhow. Yeah, but how could they get him off the ranch or hit away without somebody seeing something is beyond me, and who done it? We'll get to that in a minute. What do you got, Duke? No news. Uh, that is, except that Jacqueline's hanging on to her father's coattail every place he goes. Well, what good's that going to do? Well, she figures either he'll drop something that'll be useful to us, or he'll talk to somebody that'll give us a clue. Not a bad idea. But Jim Ross has got more sense than to say anything with her around. Yeah, unless he thinks he can put something over right under her nose without her getting wise. Well, anyway, it'll keep her busy and out of our way. Now then, Jasper, you asked who did it. I think that's obvious. Benny and Mud did it, with perhaps the help of one or two of the men here on the ranch that Ross can trust. Benny and Mud, who in thunder are they? Hey, you don't mean that those two city cats come on the ranch without you knowing about it. Sure, no one's on me. They came here to the training quarters this morning and said they'd been sent over by Ross to act as Reggie's sparring partners. Well, we should have known right then there was something wrong. We did. Benny turned out to be a wrestler. And when Reggie went up against him, he tried every trick he knew to injure him. Flying tackles, butting, gouging. Say, if I'd been around, I'd have kicked him off this ranch quicker than it take a tell us. I wish you had been around. But we felt pretty safe for the moment after Reggie succeeded in handling him so well. Reggie took everything he had and licked him, huh? Reggie couldn't knock him out, but it got to the point where Reggie was knocking him down as fast as he got to his feet. <laughs> Boy, howdy, and every one of them knockdowns was like a breath of fresh air. Yeah, Jim Ross see it? <laughs> yes, we caught him sneaking away from the gymnasium. He'd been outside watching through the window. You mean he didn't have the nerve to come in and face you guys? Apparently not. We had a row and threatened to go into Knight's Landing and expose him to the newspaper there. And that's when he issued orders that none of us was to be allowed off the place until after the fight next Friday. And he means it, too. He's let all the air out of your tires and he's got all the other cars locked up. Well, shucks, there's plenty of horses around if we want to make a break. It'd be as much as your life's worth to get one. How's that? 
Got a bunch of the toughest boys on the ranch guarding them with six shooters. Well, what you know? Gun stuff, huh? Well, we don't want to make a break. We're staying right here and fighting Jim Ross on his own grounds until Reggie's back safe. You bet you. Hey, Jack, how about us starting a war that is a war? Now, we'll discuss that later. First, I want to ask Jasper a couple of questions. Is there any place Reggie could be held prisoner on the ranch that hasn't been investigated? Well, I can't think where, except in the big ranch house. Nobody's been in there that I know of. Oh, sure they have. Jacqueline's been through that house from top to bottom. You sure she did a good job? You bet she did a good job. After she'd been through once, I sent her back and made her do it all over again. If Reggie's in that big house, they've flattened him out and shoved him under the carpet. You think Ross had him sent off the ranch? No, I don't. I don't think he'd chance it. Boy's right here on the place somewhere. Yeah, but 40,000 acres is a lot of acres when you start looking for somebody. That's true. There's gulches and ditches and underbrush, high grass. I, I don't know what all. Take us a month of Sundays to comb through. Well, if we're sure he's not any of the buildings, that's our next bet. Now then, my next question. I don't think Benny and Mud could have handled that kidnapping alone. Which of the men would Ross be most apt to trust to help him? Uh, Curly Stewart, Ollie Jenkins. Hey, you don't say. Them two hombres that me and you put to sleep the other night, Jack. Yes. Have you seen them around since Reggie disappeared? Sure, just usual. Notice them acting any different? No, can't say it did. Where do you imagine they'd be about now? Oh, down around the bunkhouse. Boys always gather down in front of the bunkhouse for horseplay and talk until time to turn in. All right, let's go down there. You know what you got in mind. I'll tell you as we go down. Well, it ain't far. All right, let's go. Hey, wait a minute. What about Jacqueline? Well, what about her? Well, she said if she got anything, she'd come here. All right, you wait. We won't be gone long. But what's the idea? What'll I tell her if she comes? Just say we've gone down to the bunkhouse to pick up Ole and Curly. Oh, you mean you're going to bring them back here? That's right. Here, now, you ain't going to get those boys to come up here without a fight. I don't think there's going to be any fight. Come along, and I'll tell you about it. Well, what the heck if there is a fight? I could do with another sock at them, too. There's not going to be any fight, I tell you. There's a group of oak trees a hundred feet or so from the bunkhouse, isn't there, Jasper? That's right on this side. Okay. When we get down there, Doc and I will wait in the shadow of them while you go on down. Yeah, and then what? Well, your job will be to hunt up Curly and Ole and tell them you want to talk to them. Bring them over under the trees. Doc and I will do the rest. Now yeah, you're talking. One sock each and they go bye-bye. Forget your fist for a minute, Doc. We want those boys in the condition to talk. Oh, I get it. Just tie them up and gag them. I wondered what you brought along that bandana for. Oh, getting in the trees now. Think you can get them over to us without stirring up the rest of the hands? Sure, I'm still former this year, Ranch. Good. Now, you boys better not come any further. All right, we'll wait here. Uh, hurry it up, though, uh, Jasper old kid. Yes. Listen to them there old Katie dits. Uh-huh. <laughs> Takes me back to the time when me and uh, Winnie May uh, used to sneak out and steal watermelons. The most fun I ever had, except the time old, uh, old Granddad Fiedelbaum caught me in the seat of the pants with a load of rock salt. The meanest man in Texas, I swear to goodness he was. Was, huh? Yes, sir. Rock salt hurts. But Winnie Mae was on the top of the fence when he let go, and, and she, she, she turned a complete flip-flap before she hit the ground. Flip-flop? Yeah. Well, well, anyway, I never run so fast in my life. I thought, sure, the seat of my britches was on fire. Hold it. I think they're coming. Hey, uh, how are we going to work here? Wait a minute. Yeah, I can see him. He's only bringing one. Yeah? Well, when they get in here, put your hand over his mouth and I'll upset him. That's the ticket. Go down on top of him and be sure to keep his mouth covered. Bet your boots. All right, now. Quiet. Now then. Got it. All right. He can't get up. Slip the gag in, Jack. Here it comes. Uh -huh. There she is. Take his belt here and tie up his hand. Come on now. Put your hands behind you. There. That's it. There. All right. Let him up, Doc. Yeah, that's one of them. Where's the other one, Jasper? Yeah, I couldn't locate Curly. None of the boys seem to know where he is. That's not so good. No, it ain't. Well, what the heck? One's almost as good as two. Uh, wh why don't we take Sweet up and work on him for a while? Might as well, I guess. Well, you go ahead. I'm going to have a look around for Curly. All right, you do that. We'll hold Sweet until you get back. All right. And careful you don't run into anybody on your way back. We'll watch out for that. I'll see you later, then. All right, sweet old kid. Step along. Keep hold of him, Doc, so he can't break away. You better not try to break away. You hear what I say, fella? Better keep to the left. There's more shadow. Yeah, over this way. <laughs> Shucks, Jack. This is easier than shooting fish. Well, I hope it'll be as easy getting information out of him. Oh, sure it will. Why, well, Sweet here will open up like the Grand Canyon when we start working on it. Won't you, Sweet? 
Uh, he shook his head, but he's just fooling. All right. <laughs> Between here and the door, it's moonlight. We'll just have to chance it. Keep on walking. Fast. Yeah, yeah. Step on it, son. There. We made it. Hey, you back already? Yes, sir. And look at the prize we got. Shut the door, Doc. Duke, help me pull down the blinds. Yeah, sure. But where's Curly? Well, he wasn't around. Jasper's still out looking for him. Maybe he's up with Jim Ross. Yeah, maybe. All right, sit down, sweet. Jack said, see it. Yeah, that's better. Shall I take off the gag, Jack? Yes. But don't yell, sweet, or you get a fist right in the teeth. Now take it off. Mm-hmm. There you are. <laughs> What's the meaning of this? Shanghaiing a fella right out of his own chicken roast. <laughs> Son, I sure do like to hear you talk. Hey, Curly, and I get turned loose, I'm going to raise more trouble with you fellas than you can take care of from now on. Well, it's fair, isn't it? You kidnap Reggie, so we kidnap you. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about very well. Now, where have you taken Reggie? I ain't took him nowhere. You fellas must be loony in the head. Now, there's no use trying to give us that stuff. We've caught Benny and Mud, and they've confessed the whole thing. They said you and Curly helped them abduct Reggie. Who? Huh? Benny and Mud. Well, for goodness sake, who's them guys? Jack, it ain't no use. Sweet ain't gonna talk until we work on him a little. What you mean, work on me? <laughs> you see, Jack, he's too innocent to know what it's all about. I'm just a good-natured Swedish boy with a, a wife and six children. Now, ain't that sweet. Duke is sweet married. Not that I ever heard of. But they're all back in the old country. Come on, come on, sweet. Shall I turn Doc loose on you? Hey, tell him to put that knife away. Hey, bleed easy. Jack, you remember the time I skinned that pirate alive down off the straight settlements? It wouldn't tell us what we wanted to know. My goodness gracious. Skinned him alive? Sure did, son. Right before his very eyes. Now then, how about it, sweet? Where's Rich? Fellers, look at me. Sweat standing out all over me. You boys is making a big mistake picking on a nice, sweet, good-natured Swedish boy like me. We're giving you one more chance, sweet. Where's Reggie? Well, I, I guess there ain't gotten to do but shut my eyes and grit my teeth. <laughs> Will you look at him, Jack? Ain't that uh, the awfulest expression you ever did? Go ahead, fellers, but remember I bleed easy. All right, Doc, that's enough. You can open your eyes now, sweet. Is it over already? We're not going to use a knife on you. You ain't? No. Thank golly, I feel better already. But, Derny, Jack, we didn't get a thing out of it. I know, but I just got a better idea. Turn him loose. Turn him loose? That's what I said. All right. But it don't make sense. There you are, sweet. Now, get to going now. Thank you, boys. It's, it's been mighty pleasant knowing you. <laughs> Doggone, sweet. You, you, you can't help laughing at it. What's your idea, Jack? Jim Ross has kidnapped Reggie, so he can't appear in the ring next Friday. So how about us kidnapping Big Sweet so he can't show up either? Say, now you've got something. Say, that's all right. Hey, Jack, how come I never thought of that? <laughs> transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
The next episode should be starting in just a moment. This is episode 14 of Battle of the Century. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery, transcribed. new Carlton Morse adventure thriller, The Battle of the Century. Nine o'clock at night in the training quarters on the Jim Ross Ranch somewhere in Yolo County. When Jack, Doc, and Reggie first came to the Jim Ross Ranch, they found that Ross liked a prize fight better than anything else in the world. He liked fighting so well, he named his only daughter, Jack Dempsey Ross, since changed to Jacqueline. He has his own training quarters on the ranch and his own prize ring, where he puts on grudge fights between his 150 workmen every Wednesday night. And he has his own favorite fighters, Big Swede and Little Swede, two mammoth Scandinavian boys. He liked fighting so well that he even offered to let his daughter marry the man she loved if Duke Carter could bring forth an amateur fighter who could defeat the Swedes. Uh-huh, but when Reggie stepped out and accepted the challenge and showed signs that he might win the fight, it suddenly became apparent that there was something Jim Ross liked even better than prize fighting, and that was victory. It is now evident that he'll do almost anything to prevent Reggie from whipping Big Swede in the ring this coming Friday night. He imported Benny, a vicious wrestler, as Reggie's sparring partner, with orders to incapacitate the young Englishman. When this failed, Reggie mysteriously vanished, quite evidently kidnapped by Jim Ross's henchman, to prevent his appearance against the Big Swede. Well, that was this morning. Now, at nine o'clock tonight, Doc, Jasper, the foreman of the ranch, and I... Are holding a council of war in the training quarters. Where you been, Jasper? We've been waiting for you. I've been hunting high and low for Curly Stewart. I can't find hide in the hero. Well, never mind Curly. Jack's got better ideas. Uh, did you get any information out of Ole? Not a word. But it was while we were holding him that I got this new idea. I wish Duke Carter would come back. Uh, where'd he go? Well, I sent him out to look for you. Oh, then he'll be along pretty soon, I reckon. Anyway, what's this bright idea you got now? Well, Jim Ross has kidnapped Reggie to keep him from appearing in the ring Friday. Yeah. How about us abducting Big Swede for the same purpose? Say, now, I think you've got something there, Packard. You bet your sweet life we got something. Of course, that don't give you back your fighting Englishman. No, it doesn't. Once we get Big Swede undercover, we'll be in a position to dicker with Ross. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. Do you think Ross will dicker? Well, you'll sure enough be in a panic... Sets a heap of store by Big Swede, and he's going to do some sweat in his boots if the boy's missing. Good. Yeah, now, now we're getting somewhere. Now, where does Big Swede keep his self knives? Down in the bunkhouse with the rest of the cow's chambermaids? Not in your life, he don't. Big Swede's much too precious to sleep in no ordinary bunkhouse. Well, where does he hang out? In one of them guest cottages the boss has got behind the big house. Yeah, he, he sleep there by himself? No, him and little Swede sleep there together. Well, now, that shouldn't be such an awful tough job. We just bop Big Swede over the head in his sleep, uh, carry his unconscious carcass out, tie him up, and lug him to where we're going to hide him, and there you are. And suppose little Swede wakes up in the process. Well, bop him on the head, too. No, it ain't going to be as easy as all that. Well, how come it ain't? Because Ross is too smart. Now, he's kidnapped Reggie. Now, you don't think he ain't anticipated us retaliating, do you? You mean he's probably got guards outside the guest cabin tonight? Tonight and every night from now until Friday, or my name ain't Jasper Fuller. Well, shucks, what's a couple of guards? We'll bop him, too. They'll be armed with orders to shoot. Well, yeah, I know, but most folks is so unhandy at pistols. Why, there ain't one man in a hundred that can really protect himself with a gun. 
We'll just up and take the shooting irons away from them, and then we'll bob them. I wouldn't advise you to be too optimistic. Well, th- th- that's what we're going to do, ain't it, Jack? So wh- why don't we get started at it? What are we sitting around here talking for? Well, that's what we're going to do, all right, but we certainly want to know what we can expect to run into and what to do under various circumstances. All gone, Jack. You're getting to be a regular old grandma. What do you mean by that? Well, feller, I can remember the times when we used to bust into trouble and figure out what to do right while we was a-doing it. Well, we can still do that when we have to. Now then, Jasper, where are we going to hide Big Sweet once we get him? You want a place close by or far away? As close by as we can get him and still safe from Jim Ross and his men. All right, how about up in the top of one of them silos? Silo? But won't that be one of the first places they look? Sure, only it's going to be easy to keep them from looking. I don't see what you're getting at. Well, look here. Them silos are clean full of silage, clean up for 50 feet in the air. The only way to get up there is a little ladder on the outside of the silo, just wide enough for one man. Now, if a feller was to stay up there with Big Sweet, he could guard the steps again all comers till kingdom come. <laughs> Doggone it. We'd be holding Big Sweet prisoner right under old man Ross's nose. You <laughs> <I> like it? <laughs> Couldn't ask for anything more. But how do we get Big Sweet up there if he's unconscious? Now, there's a block and tackle down in the machine shop that I could rig up quicker than a cat can jump sideways. That's all we need to know. If you rig up the tackle, Doc and I'll deliver Big Sweet down at the foot of the silo. Hey, wait a minute. Which silo? There's five of them. I'll make it the one in the back of the barn. Less chance anybody's seen us at work. All right. Is that everything, then? No, it ain't, but I'll take care of them things. Well, what you mean? Well, if somebody's going to be up there guarding Big Sweet, there's got to be food and water enough up there for two people for the next five days. Good head, Jasper. I forgot all about that. Yeah, and who's going to do the garden? We'll put Duke Carter up there. After all, he's got the most at stake. Yeah, if this thing don't pan out, he's going to lose that little old Jack Dempsey gal. Oh, see if you can locate Duke while you're doing your other job, uh, Jasper. I'll keep an eye open. Uh, how long you figure it'll take you to get Big Sweet down there? Five minutes. We have any luck. Ten minutes at the longest. Uh, better step on it. You betcha. There you go, and here we go. Come on, Jack. Uh, watch out for armed guards. What's he worrying about armed guards for? They're all in a day's work. Let's hike off across the field here. That'll bring us up back to the big house where the guest cabins are. Yeah. Say, talking about that little old Jacqueline baby, I wonder where she's at. Duke said she was tagging her father around, trying to get a clue as to what he did with Reggie. Yeah, you, you suppose she's still at it? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Got a little bulldog in that girl's character. <laughs> sure enough is. Ah. Nice moonlight night. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't mind having a cute little old female gal out here alongside me instead of you on a night like this. Now keep your mind on the business at hand. Ah, yes, sir. When I think of the bunch of pretty nights that I've wasted, and all the girls in the world that ain't had me to make love at. They don't know how lucky they are. Now, what you mean by that? <laughs> Winnie Mae once said to me, if and I weren't her blood cousin on my mama's side... She had to uh, hound me to death till I wedded him. Well, it takes all kinds of taste to make up the world. It sure does. Hey, wait a minute. Was that supposed to be a dirty crack? Keep your voice down now, Doc. You can see the outlines of the guest houses against the skyline. Yeah. You know, I just thought of something. Hmm? That there big Swede weighs one ounce less than a horse. It's going to be a job of toting his carcass clear down to the silo. Well, it's too late to think about that now. Lest we could catch him conscious and make him walk. No, he'd be too much to handle. If he once starts a fight, he'll make so much noise, we'll have the whole place on us. Ah, okay, fella. But I sure ain't got no stomach for a toting bull elephant. Now then, keep it quiet. We're up to the hedge. Yeah. Now we're going to get through it. It's six foot high. That's a means. There must be some way. And remember, we got to get the bull swede through there coming back. Wait a minute. What's that gleam in the moonlight? I don't see nothing. Well, I do. Come on. Good. Just what I was hoping. What you mean? Here, feel it. An iron gate. Well, doggone, son. Just as neat as you please. Can you get it open? Yeah, just latched. Careful now. Come on through. Yeah. Leave it open in case we have to get out fast. Picture of us getting out fast, carrying two tons of limp hypnoceros meat. All right, follow close. Yeah. Right there, the cottage just hanging. I don't know. We'll have to investigate. Hold her, son. <laughs> What's the matter? Look here, that shadow just alongside that window. Ain't that a man? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, darn tootin' I'm right. Must have guards at each door and window. Now then, the old teamwork. I'll slip up behind him and tell him not to move, and you step up and clip him on the chin. When do we go? Now. Wait till you hear me speak to him. Okay. Here I go. Don't make a move. <laughs> I got him, Jack. Good work. <laughs> now around the back of the house. Yeah. If there's a back door, there's bound to be a guard there. Uh-huh. Nope. No back door. Well, that's one hombre we don't have to send bye-bye. Uh, keep on going around? Yeah, there'll be a window on the other side. Take it easy around the corner. Yep. And there 
there's our customer. All right, same tactics. Here I go. Don't make a move. Hey, hey, you didn't catch him like you did the other home, Brad. I didn't have time. He went down too fast. Yeah. Yeah, I reckon it's all right. He didn't make much noise. Uh, now in front? Yeah, well, this is liable to be the hardest job, especially if the guard's up on the porch. Yeah, maybe we'll have to rush him. I hope not. If he's fast on the draw, we may be out of luck. Well, there's only one way to find out. That's to go and see. Just a few steps now, so don't make a sound. Hey, Jack, look at that. Two of them. That's bad. One of them's bound to make some noise before we can stop him. Hey, looky, they're standing there whispering with their heads together. And so what? Well, I bet you if I was to sneak up on them and ram their heads together hard enough... You think you could do it? Well, son, I'm sure try. All right, I'll be right behind you. If it doesn't work, we'll each jump a man and finish it off fast. Here goes everything. I got him. I got him, Jack. You certainly did. I hope you didn't fracture any skull. Shucks, who ever heard of fracturing a cow hand skull? So we just let him lay? Yeah, let's get into the cabin. And be quiet on the porch in case there's anyone prowling inside. Yeah. yeah the door's locked. Well, son, I'll take care of that before you can say sick. Gonna give you any trouble? Nope. When you make it open this with a hairpin. Ah, there she is. Fast work. Now, don't stumble on anything. Boy, sure is black in here. Uh, now we've done it. What's the matter, son? Well, how are we going to tell Big Sweet and Little Sweet apart? Hey. They're both here, and they look exactly alike. Yeah, only Big Sweet can talk a little United States. Well, it doesn't do us any good with them asleep. Well, then, uh, will Dad bust it? We're going to have to take them both along. You were groaning about carrying one of them between us. We can't possibly carry both of them. Hey, wait a minute, fella. I've got an idea. Well, talk fast. Yeah, I darn near stumbled over a wheelbarrow around the corner of the house. Yeah, that's right. Sure, we'll dump them both in the wheelbarrow and let Jasper tell us which is which. All right, let's go. Now, this must be the bedroom in here. <laughs> Will you listen to that? Quiet, darling. We each get beside a man and let them both have it at the same time. Okay. I'll get over here. You ready? Yeah. Now. <laughs> All right, quick. Drag them off the beds and out on the porch. Yeah. <laughs> right out on the porch? Yes. <laughs> there they are, son. Quick, get the wheelbarrow. You bet. Oh, boy. What a job. Okay, son. Then give me a hand with this one first. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> now, the other one, right on top of it. Up we go. <sighs> well, so far, it's all hunky dory. I'll take the wheelbarrow first. You keep them from sliding up. Let's go, fella. <laughs> What's so funny? I just think it. I'll bet this is the first time anybody has ever taken for a ride in a wheelbarrow. transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love the Mystery.
Baltimore's adventure thriller, The Battle of the Century. In retaliation, Doc and I kidnapped Big and Little Sweet, Ross's team of fighters, and stowed them away up on top of one of the big 50-foot silos on the place with Duke Carter to guard them. The only means of reaching the top was a small iron ladder attached to the outside of the silo, which allowed only one man to climb up at a time. Besides guarding the two Swedes, Duke's job was to prevent any of Ross's men from climbing up and releasing the two fighters. And now here I am with Doc, Jacqueline, and Jim Ross himself at the foot of the silo, while peering out 50 feet above is Duke Carter. How are you doing up there, Duke, old kid? Doing fine. And am I a long ways up in the air? Hello, Jacqueline. Hi, Duke. You really and truly got big and little sweet up there? No kidding. Tied up tighter than a sack of potatoes. Ha-ha. Hey, good morning, Mr. Ross. Don't you good morning me, you no-account chicken thief. Hey, that's no way to talk to a man who's going to marry your daughter. When you marry my daughter, there'll be two moons in the sky. Is that true, Jacqueline? Do I have to wait that long? You wait that long to marry me, Duke Carter, I'll run away with Doc Long. Now you're talking sense, baby. Hey, you keep away from that Doc Long. Well, you heard what I said. I want to get married. And I don't want to wait forever. Well, Ross, what do you think of the setup? I'll send men up that ladder and get my Swedes out of there in no time. I don't think so. Any man climbing that ladder is going to have to use his hands for hanging on. All Duke's got to do is tap him on the head. <laughs> and boy, would he come down fast. And it's a long way down. That'd be murder. Sure would. You know any of your boys that wants to be murdered this early in the morning? I think Duke Carter come down out of there fast enough he was ordered to by the sheriff. Oh, so you're going to bring the sheriff into this. And I might add that the sheriff's a very good friend of mine. Yes, but would he be such a good friend if we got out a warrant charging you with kidnapping? Try and do it. You don't think we can? I know blame well you can't. You can't prove a thing on me. How about that wire you sent to Reno asking for two tough characters? How about Benny the wrestler and Mud, his sidekick, showing up yesterday and then disappearing along with Reggie? I think we've got all the case we need. Sure, hombre. Run and get the sheriff. We really got a story to tell him. Couple of smart operators, ain't you? Now look, Ross. An hour ago, you drew a gun on us and threatened to shoot both of us. We had every legitimate right to treat you pretty tough when we took that gun away from you. But we didn't. And I can't figure out why yet. Well, I can. You behaved like gentlemen because Jim Ross is my father. Yeah, that's it. I keep forgetting a nice girl like you can have such an ornery, low-down cuss for a papa. Now then, you looky here, you long-legged excuse for a Texas steer. Hey, don't you call me no excuse for a Texas steer, you small-time four-flushing chiseler that hides behind women's skirts. What do you mean, hiding behind a women's skirt? Just what I'm a-saying. Well, if it hadn't been for your little old daughter here, we'd have mussed you up long before this. Yes, and that's the truth. You keep out of this, Jack Dempsey. Don't you tell me you keep out of this, you poor excuse for a father. Why don't you get next to yourself? Everybody in the whole country knows you'd cheat the eye teeth out of your grandmother. I've never laid a hand on you, Jack Dempsey. Yes, and you'd better not begin now. Well, by thunder, I will if you give me any more of your lips. Go ahead. Go on. Lay a hand on me. Jack and Doc are just aching for an excuse to give you the works. <laughs> What's so funny, you big lug? Give me the works, eh? Well, I don't think they will do that now or any other time. Look what's coming around the barn. What? Hey, Jack. Looky, what's it coming? Just a few of my men. Well, doggone, there's our old friends, Curly and Ole. Two, four, six, seven. You mean you got an army of seven men just to take care of Jack and Doc? And they're coming to do it right away. What's the idea of this, Ross? Well, you got two of my men prisoners up there in that silo, haven't you? Just thought I'd take me a couple of prisoners, too. Oh, so you just thought you'd take Jack and me prisoners. That's right. But you've already got Reggie. Well, that'll make me one up on you, won't it? Well, of all the mean, low-principled fathers a girl ever had. Never mind that, Jacqueline. They're getting close. We haven't got time for that. Yeah, what have we got time for, Jack? To get ready to fight. Son, them is just the words I was hoping you'd say. You mean you two are going to fight all seven of them? Why, Jacqueline, honey, I remember the time in the Philippines when me and Jack was up again 21 rips. Doc, will you shut up and get ready? But, son, I am ready. I want my back against something so one of them can't hit me over the head from behind. Well, what's the matter of this here silo? All right. <laughs> yeah, there's some Uses you, Ross? You haven't got a chance, boys. You might as well give up and come quietly. What you talking about? We ain't got a chance. Why, you're just plum, plum sending your own brace to quick and sudden day. Duke! Duke Carter, can you hear me up there? Yeah, I can hear you. What's going on down there? My father's got seven men coming to take Jack and Doc prisoners. Hey, that's dirty. I don't see how you can stand being around that old man of yours. Well, I can't much longer. Say... Ask Jack if he wants me to come down and give him a hand. Jack, do question 
I heard what Duke said. You tell him to stay up there and guard our prisoners. But if there were three of them... You tell Duke what I said and stop trying to run things. Hey, Duke! Yeah? Jack wants you to stay up there. Hold the fort. You better get ready, Jack. They are getting pretty close. All right. Listen, you Jim Ross. Have you decided to surrender? No, we haven't decided to surrender. But understand this. I've stood all I'm going to from you... And the minute we've cleaned up this mess of men you've got coming, we're going to turn you across a barrel and use a, uh, a one-by-four on you until you won't be able to sit down for a week. <laughs> Doggone fella. Let's say make that our thought for the day. Spank Jim Ross with a board until he can't sit down for a week. Hi, hold it. Sure, boss. You ready for you us? You bring the boys and get them. You bet you're my name. Come on, fellas. All right, Doc. Fight with our backs against the silo as long as we can. If they get us away from the wall, then back to back. Feller, I don't know when I've been so happy. Doggone, I hope there's at least a couple of good fighters in that mix. All right, boys, spread out. Then I say the word, pitch in and finish them off quick. Hi, Ole. Sorry, boys, but you're all washed up this time. You don't say. You better come quietly and save yourself getting hurt. Oh, feeling sorry for us already, huh? That's right. I got a mighty soft heart. Yeah, and do you still bleed easy? Sir, sure, you're going to make us come and get you, huh? That's just what we're going to do, son. And, Ole, you're just a-fixing yourself to go bye-bye again. All right, boys. You ready? All ready. All right. You're getting up. Get him, get him. Get him. What's up, Doc? Get him. Yeah, can you imagine that? <laughs> Shucks, you don't call that no blow. Hurry up, Doc. Finish him off. Hey, uh, you finish off Curly? Yes, Curly's washed up. That's all I wanted to know. Look out, Oli. <laughs> and here comes uh, one I've been waiting for. Get out, boy, Doc. Get away, Doc. He's down. He's down. Hey, Ross, do you always have your ranch messed up with unconscious hombres? This is an outrage. Outrage, nothing. This is the most wonderful thing that's ever happened on this ranch. An outrage, I tell you. You two men should be locked up. You're too dangerous to be left running around loose. <laughs> what you mean, dangerous? We're just as gentle as lamb stew. Ross, do you remember what I told you? What do you mean? I said the minute we cleaned up this mess of men, we were going to turn you over a barrel. No, no, yeah, yeah, no, no rough stuff. <laughs> he says no rough stuff. Hey, Jack, how about that barrel over yonder? That's the very one I had in mind. No, you're not being serious. You don't think so? Come along. Get, no, let, let, let loose my arm. Come along. No, no. Doc, get some boards. Hey, you really mean you're going to whale him with a board? You're going to see your father spanked until the sparks fly. No, I won't have it. It's preposterous. Here you are, Jack. Here, how are these? Well, they look pretty light. Ah, this no. here one looks like a Jim Dandy. All right, Ross, lay over this barrel. No, no, you let me alone. Get over that barrel. Get, help! Uh, 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 who gets the first wallop? You oh. wham him till you get tired, then I'll take her out. Move me! Pull up his coattail. I'll hold it. Hold everything! Here, hold still. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. Listen to him suffer. Oh, 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 Jacqueline. Jacqueline, make him stop. Father, did you call me Jacqueline? Oh, yes, yes, Jacqueline, darling. Help me, dear. Help me. Well, it's the first time in your life you ever called me Jacqueline. Oh, Jacqueline, my daughter. How sure. If I make them stop, will you never, never call me Jack Dempsey again? I, I, I promise you, I promise you. Oh, oh, save it. Save and me. will you let me marry Duke Carter? Yes, yes. Oh, oh, oh I'm being killed. I'm being killed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Father. Now, 
Oh, where's Reggie York? No, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Well, go oh. on and tell him. I'll tell him. Oh, oh he, he's tied up in, in the pump house by the reservoir. Pump house by the reservoir? Is that the truth? Yes, house? yes. All right, Doc. I, I guess that's enough. Just one more for good luck. Oh, oh, oh that did it. That did it. I'm a ruined man. <laughs> transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking. Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love the Mystery. adventure thriller, The Battle of the Century. Reggie, old son, I don't know when I've been so glad to see your homely face. I say it's jolly well mutual. You know, Jack, I think this here occasion calls for a doggone celebration. Wine, women, and song. <laughs> Look here, now, that would be a bit of a... Yes, sir, today's one of them days. Why, we had ourselves a swell fight this morning with seven medium good fighters. And I say Duke Carter says the bunkhouse looks like a full-fledged hospital. <laughs> and he ain't kidding, either. And as I was saying, we had ourselves a fight, which always makes me feel good. We turned Jim Ross across the barrel and whammed him with a board till he yelled, Uncle. And on top of that, we got old Reggie back again. Yes, sir. Wine, women, and song. Nothing less. <laughs> Nothing less, he <laughs> says. No, no, yeah, uh, uh, only thing, a wine gives me a headache big enough for hypnosis, and I can't sing worth shooting. Which leaves women. <laughs> yeah, and the only woman in miles is that little old she-daughter of Jim Ross. Well, Jacqueline's a lot of woman. <laughs> I say she's a lot of woman. Boy, there's, a, there's enough get-up and get in that gal for a dozen females. What Duke Carter wants to tie himself up to a she-whirlwind like her for... I just can't plain figure out. I say, he's in love with her. Well, he sure got to be to take what she hands out. Reggie. Wee. Oui. Reggie, you sure you feel all right after having been tied up all that time? Oh, yes, quite. Bit of a bit of a bruise on the back of my head where they slugged me before they carted me off. The two-timing yellow dogs. Why, did that Benny and Mud just slipped up behind you in the dressing room and whammed you behind the ear? What was that it? Yeah, that's about the way it happened. When I woke up, I was tied hand and foot and gagged in the pump house up by the reservoir. You sure you wouldn't like to get to bed? Oh, no, not at all. I've been sleeping all the time I was up there. Nothing else to do. Not very good training for a hombre that's got an A number one fight on his hands like you got tomorrow night. I don't think Reggie's got any fight on tomorrow. Huh? What you mean he ain't got no fight on? Or didn't Jim Ross say he'd let Jacqueline marry Duke Carter if Reggie licked Big Swede tomorrow night? No, that's what he said originally. Well, sure he did. And didn't we turn Big Swede loose out of the silo as soon as we got Reggie back? Yes, Doc, that's Well, right. then how come no fight? Both the fighters are back on the job. Well, if you'll keep still for a minute, I'll tell well, you. Well, go on and tell us then. Don't just keep saying that uh, there ain't going to be no fight. Doc, will you stop talking? I ain't a-talking. Well, you're certainly <laughs> wagging that jaw a lot about something. Well, Jack, well, well, what is the setup now? Well, all I know is that while we had Jim Ross across the barrel, Jacqueline made him agree to let her marry Duke any time she wanted to. I say, fight or no fight? That's right. Nothing was mentioned about the fight. 
Ross simply said that the girl could marry Carter. Yeah, that's right. I plumb forgot about him saying that. Oh, Joe, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, you are? That's quite. Now, I was looking forward with real pleasure to meeting Big Swede. Well, well of course, if you oh, insist... Oh, no, but look here. It takes all the meaning out of it to fight without a reason. Well, that's silly, Reggie. What's anybody want a reason for fighting oh, for? I say. Well, shucks, fighting's enough reason itself. Me, I'd just like to wham somebody just to be whamming him. Well, let's make that our beautiful thought for the day. Doc likes to wham somebody just to be whamming him. <laughs> Say, by the way, Jack, I, I haven't seen Jim Ross since you let me loose. Where is the old conjurer? Uh, well, Jim Ross is uh, indisposed. Indisposed my grandma. He's just plain sick in bed. I say, really? <laughs> he sure is. And I bet you can't guess where he's ailing. No, I, I don't think I can. He's ailing in the spot where I busted him with a board while he was laying across that there barrel. <laughs> <laughs> and all accounts of the sickbed report that he's lying on his face, suffering nobly. Oh, Joe, I would have given a lot to have seen that. <laughs> Boy, did he holler. Every time I come down with a board, you could have heard him plumb down to Turtle Creek, Texas. <laughs> oh, I say company. Yeah, it must be Jasper. Come on in. Hi, boys. Well, if it ain't our little old Jack Dempsey. Come on in, honey. Doc, won't you stop calling me Jack Dempsey? Well, sure, sugar. Anything your little heart desires. I'm true with the name Jack Dempsey forever and ever. You are sure not. Yes, I am. You heard me make my father promise never to use that name again. We heard you, but uh, how are you going to hold him to it? Well, I'll hold him to it, all right. I made a bargain with him. But, honey, you know your old man don't keep his promise worth a plug nickel. Well, he'll keep this one, all right. I promised I'd never tell anybody about you boys turning him across that barrel as long as he calls me Jackal. <laughs> He's not very proud of that barrel episode, evidently. Why, he hates it. If that got around in the community, people would never stop laughing at him. <laughs> so you don't mention the barrel and he doesn't mention Jack Dempsey? That's it. But I didn't come down here to talk about that. Well, uh, what did you come down here for, baby? To find out if Reggie's all right? Oh, quite, yes. Thank you. Never felt fitter. That's good because I want you all to come to my wedding tomorrow. What, what, uh, y your wedding? Tomorrow? Sure. You heard Father say yourselves that he gave permission for me and Duke to get married. But, but, but tomorrow, uh, ain't that kind of rushing things, little? No, it's not. I got my chance to marry Duke and by gee, I'm going to do it. Before my father feels good enough to think of new reasons why I shouldn't. <laughs> and before Duke changes his mind. Yeah, before Duke... Hey, what did you say? Oh, I, I, I said Duke's a, a great fine. You did not! I heard what you said, and you're no better than you should be. <laughs> well, let's make that our beautiful thought. No, we can't do that. We've already got one beautiful thought for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Intimating maybe that Duke doesn't want to marry me. Uh, you're, uh, you're plumb sure he does? Of course I'm sure. I don't know any man in the country who wouldn't be crazy to marry me. Well, that's right. Any man would be crazy to marry you. Jack Packard, you stop saying that. I'll be the best wife any man ever had, and you know it. <laughs> well, not for my money. And you can count me out, too, lady. Well, well what's two men's opinions? You'd marry me in a minute if I asked you, wouldn't you, Reggie? Well, well look here. I mean, say, <laughs> speak right up, Reggie. Reggie, <laughs> you don't mean you don't like me either. Oh, but I say, I, I like you immensely. But... There, what did I tell you? Yeah, but uh, he ain't said he'd marry you. Well, you would, wouldn't you? Oh, please, Job, I, I couldn't, you know. An old sick mother and all that sort of thing. <laughs> oh, poor Reggie. <laughs> You're positively precious. No, not a bit of it. No, I won't have that. No. Oh. Boy, there's a way out of a proposal I ain't never heard of. <laughs> old sick mother and all that sort of thing. <laughs> Reggie, you'd let an old sick mother interfere with your love life? Quite, yes. Bit of a sentimentalist, you know. <laughs> well, look, you've all got to come to the wedding tomorrow. Yes, but Jacqueline, you can't marry in the state of California on such short notice. You've got to wait three days after you've announced your intention to marry. Oh, that's all taken care of. Duke and I took out an intention to wed certificate two weeks ago when we were planning to elope. Oh, thought of everything, looks like. Of course we did. Oh, and it's going to be a big outdoor wedding. Out on the lawn, and everybody in the country's coming. It'll be the biggest wedding this county's ever seen. Society even, huh? You bet it'll be a society event. When Jim Ross's daughter gets married, that's news. Well, and I guess you'll have to count us out. I won't either count you out. What do you mean by saying a thing like that? I wouldn't slick down my hair and raise my little finger for the King of England. But you've got to be there. 
Jasper's going to be my best man, and I want you boys to put on tails and be ushers. Y- you want us to what? Put on tails. That's what I thought you said. Jack, you can put on a tail and wear it clean up over your shoulder if you want to. But me, I was born a human being, and I'll be darned if I don't stay one. <laughs> Not a tail, Doc. Tails. Full dress clothes. You just got to. All of you. Well, personally, I'd prefer one of Doc's tails to full dress. I won't come near the place. Oh, but that's hateful. Besides, it's time we were pulling out of this part of the country. Pulling out? What do you mean? You're not going to leave. You bet we're going to leave. You honest to goodness mean that, Jack? Yes, it's the longest we've stayed in one place in years. I'm getting fed up. Right, oh, I say, where are we going? Oh, does that matter? Look, you big lugs! You don't step a foot off this place until you see me safely married. <laughs> Listen at it. If I don't sound just like Jim Ross, I'll swallow it whole. Well, you heard me. You can't stick by a girl through a lot of trouble and then run out on her at the most important moment of her life. I said no. We're leaving, so don't try to browbeat us. Oh, you... you great big lugs. Now, you said that before. Well, I don't care. I set my heart on having you see me get married. And now look at you. Oh, looky, looky, honey. It ain't nothing to cry about. Yes, do I hate you. I hate all of you. Well, uh, of course now, Jack. Uh, we didn't know little old Jack Dempsey. I'm there. not Jack Dempsey. I'm Jacqueline Ross. Well, now, looky, honey. If you're going to yell at me, I won't finish what I was going to say. I'm sorry, but I'm so miserable. Well, like I was saying, uh, uh, we didn't know that she really wanted us this much. Uh, of course, that makes difference, uh, don't it, Jack? No. I won't put on a monkey suit for Jacqueline or anybody else. Well, of course, I ain't never seen one of them. Is as bad as all that? No, they aren't. Men look beautiful in full dress. Well, then, honey, I reckon that lets me out, too. On account of that's one thing I ain't got no hankering to be. Beautiful. Well, I'd just like to see you get off this ranch until I'm married. Hey, are you telling us we can't go? Yes, I am. When were you planning to go? First thing tomorrow morning, right after breakfast. Well, you can't. I'm giving orders to Jasper right now to put guards on your car tomorrow morning. <laughs> no. I am, too. You just watch and see if I don't. <laughs> and another thing. And another thing. Yes, and another thing. I'm sending Belshazzar down here with three of my father's suits of dress clothes. And you put him on! <laughs> Doggone. What a little old she-girl. Yeah, Mr. Jack, why, why did you tell her the time we're going to leave? Yeah, you played right into her hands. Oh, I don't think so. Well, what you mean? <laughs> because we're pulling out of this ranch at midnight. And when Jacqueline Jack Dempsey Ross wakes up in the morning... <laughs> Son, when Jacqueline wakes up in the morning, she's going to be so mad she ain't even going to enjoy her own way. <laughs> That's what they think, as you'll see in the next episode. Ooh-wee! In one more hour, we will have been streaming for 24 hours. Woo! Now, mind you, I haven't been here the whole 24 hours, but, I mean, I've been in the house where this is being broadcasted from, but I haven't been by here. The transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at man. this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Broadcast in the Hermit defense. of Saint I love the mystery. adventure thriller, The Battle of the Century.
right, Reggie. That's all I've done is packed. Well, I think that's everything, Jack. Where'd that fool Texan go? Doc? I think he's in the bedroom. What's he doing? What's in there? Well, I, you know, Doc's simply fascinated by those full-dress clothes Jack Dunn had sent down. That crazy idiot. I suppose he's got the light well, on. I'd rather imagine so, yeah. I told him to keep all the lights out, except in here where the shades are down. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love the Mystery. Broadcasting System presents I Love the Mystery. adventure thriller, The Battle of the Century. All right, Reggie. That's all I've done is packed. Well, I think that's everything, Jack. Where'd that fool Texan go? Doc? I think he's in the bedroom. What's he doing? What's in there? Well, I, you know, Doc's simply fascinated by those full-dress clothes Jack Dunn had sent down. That crazy idiot. I suppose he's got the light well, on. I'd rather imagine so, yeah. I told him to keep all the lights out, except in here where the shades are down. Does he want the whole place down on our ears? Well, you know, Doc. Besides, we've got to get a move on. Go get him, Reggie. Right, oh, I'll bring him right Hi, Reggie. Oh, look in. oh, I say, Doc. How am I doing? What's the matter, Reggie? I say, Jack, come here. Ain't I about the prettiest human critter you about ever did see? Man. Oh, no. What's going on here? You... All right, Reggie. That's all I've done is packed. Well, I think that's everything, Jack. One I'm moment. Get his crafty right now. I think he's in the bedroom. What's he doing? What's in there? Well, I, you know, Doc's simply fascinated by those full dress clothes Jack Dunn had sent down. That crazy idiot. I suppose he's got the light well, on. I'd rather imagine so, yeah. I told him to keep all the lights out, except in here where the shades are down. Does he want the whole place down on our ears? Well, you know, Doc. Besides, we've got to get a move on. Go get him, Reggie. Right, oh, I'll bring him right along. Hi, Reggie. Oh, look in. Oh, I say, Doc. How am I doing? What's the matter, Reggie? I say, Jack, come here. Ain't I about the prettiest human critter you about ever did see? Man. Oh, no. What's going on here? You... Oh. Hey, what's so funny? <laughs> this here monkey suit fits me like the skin on a heifer's plant. Yeah, you look like the first cousin to an undertaker. Hey, you crazy lunatic. What do you think you're doing? Well, what's the hurt? <laughs> I just trying it on. I ain't never been in a dress suit with all the trimmings before. You're not in one now. What do you mean I ain't? Rich, mm -hmm. would you look at that shirt? <laughs> yeah, well, this here shirt ain't all the shirt ought to be. Uh, what do you suppose is the matter with it? Well, in the first place, you've got it on backwards. I ain't no such thing. Look, here's a button. Yes, but, Doc, all old-fashioned dress shirts button in the back. This here is an old-fashioned dress shirt? Quite, and it buttons in the back. Hey, what you giving me? No, it's me? the truth, Doc. But it ain't reasonable. Whoever heard of a shirt of buttoning up the back. All right, all right. You've had your fun. Now get out of those things and hurry up about it. <laughs> oh. Jack, you, you sure we had an order to stay? Yes, I'm sure. But look, you fella, it, it, it might be kind of fun to dress all up. No. And... What you mean, no? Just no. What does it sound like? Are you going to get out of that junk? Well, I am, ain't I? Doggone it, though. Poor little old Jacqueline's going to be mighty disappointed. All right, if you want to stay, stay. But Reggie and I are getting out of here. No, no, if you fellas are going... Naturally, I'm going, too. Only it does seem a shame. Well, you go ahead and feel bad. I've got other things to think about. You, you know how that girl is. She might just sit right down and bawl if we ain't there. Yeah, pitiful. And then well, we couldn't have nothing like that happen. Will you hurry up? Well, look at me. I'm right down to my underdrawers, ain't I? Well, let's make that our beautiful thoughts for the day. Doc's right down to his underdrawers. <laughs> now I'm skinning into my pants. Boy, that sure is nice material they use in them dress breeches. Forget it. Tuck your shirt into your pants and come on. Hey, looky, Jack, are you pushing me around? Well, if we're going to get out of here, we've got to go. Such a blamed hurry. Where are we going to go when we do get out of here? I'll tell you about that when we get started. Oh, I say, Jack, you mean you've got something in mind? Certainly. Are you finally ready, Doc? Uh-huh, I reckon. 
Say, it, it wouldn't exactly be stealing if we took one of these here dress suits along with oh, us, would it? Oh, look here, Doc. You can think of more nonsense. <laughs> well, we, we might even leave a $20 bill pinned to the bed to pay for it. $20, Doc. Each of these suits cost $200 if they cost a cent. $200, Barry? Yes, quite. Well, stuff me for a hootie owl. All right. Reggie, Doc, mm. you each take one of those duffel bags. I'll bring these two suitcases. Right on. Might as well, I guess. <laughs> Kind of got so I like this place. Open the door, Reggie. Yeah. Belshazzar's going to be plumb put out at us, sneaking out this way without saying so long. Go ahead, Doc. Keep in the shadows as much as possible on the way down to the garage. Yeah. This is the way it's best, I reckon. And keep your voices down. Oh, sucks. Everybody's asleep anyhow. You don't know whether they are or not. Sure one pretty night. Yeah. Looky up there at that moon. Mm -hmm. Winnie May always said a moon like that was made for sparking. <laughs> Winnie May always was my favorite cousin. Yeah. Been a great lady if she'd ever learned to wear shoes. Oh, Doc. Yeah? Your mind's wandering. It ain't neither. Can't a hombre think about his own blood kin if he's a mind to? <laughs> it seems to me you think about Winnie May an awful lot. Of course I do. Didn't I just say she was my favorite uh, cousin? You better watch now. We're coming to the garage. Oh, all right, huh? Yeah, Keep quiet now. Hey, looky. The garage door is open. Someone must have forgot to close them last night. Well, take it easy. I don't see any guards, but that doesn't mean they're not around. Slip inside. Our car's right in the middle. Yeah. Well, here goes. I say. Bit black in here. Mm, you ain't kidding there. Hey, who turned on those lights? Uh -huh. Well, son of a gun, if it ain't little old Jacqueline or say. Look at him, Jasper. Bag and baggage. Try to run out on me, will they? Looks like you boys is caught red-handed, all right. Nevertheless, we're leaving. Oh, no, you're not. Don't tell me what we're going to do and what we're not. Jack Packard, don't you dare yell at me like that. I am yelling at you like all that. All right, then yell. Yell all you want to, but you're not leaving this ranch until you see me married. I don't care if you never get married. You do, too. I don't either. You do, you do. <laughs> hey, hey, for the love of Pete, Jack, you sound just like Jackie and her papa. <laughs> Ooh, that girl does something to me. She'd make a saint scream. Jasper, will you pull this female catamount off and let us get out of here? I'm afraid I can't do that, Patrick. Why can't you? Because if Jacqueline here wants you to stay, those are orders as far as I'm concerned. Now, don't tell me she's got you wrapped around her little finger, too. I say she's had me hogtied ever she was all legs and pigtails. Huh? Well, then I guess we'll just have to plow through you, too. <laughs> it's more than me you got to plow through. Take a look in the driver's seat of your car. Hey, who's that? I say, it's Big Swede. That's right, Big Swede. And he's got orders not to let you boys take that car out of this garage. <laughs> well, now, what you know about that? Jacqueline, you mean you've gone and sick Big Swede on us? After all we done for you... Yes, I have. I don't care what you say. Tell him to get out of that car. No, sir. He stays right where he is. Well, how's he going to fight Reggie under the wheel of a car? Yeah, and that's the object of the meeting, ain't it? No, it is not. The object is to keep you boys here. And I'd just like to see you get them out of that car. Jack, she's a honing to see us get Big Sweet out of her car. Well, that's just what she's going to see. Reggie, get in the back seat. Doc, you get in front alongside of him. You betcha. I wouldn't try that if I were you. Well, why the heck not? I'll tell you why not. Because I ordered him to tear the gear shift out by the roots if you start pushing him around. Oh, I say, pull the gear shift out by the roots. And he can do it, too. Well, what well. do you say to that, Jack? Just that we're going to keep him so busy he won't have time to think about gear shifts. Back seat, Reggie. Front seat, Doc. I'll take him from this side. Move, oh, P. Let's go. Right up. 
Yeah. That's the boy, Reggie. Ooh. He's out. You knocked him out, Reggie boy. You oh, great my. big heroes, you. Three of you picking on one man. Quiet. I won't keep quiet. Here, Doc, take this handkerchief and gag her. Come on, now. Leave me alone. I won't keep quiet. Uh, just Ooh. listen to her. Go Ooh. on, will you? Well, Jasper, we got by Big Swede. Any more objections to our leaving? Well, I reckon not. We've done the best we could to keep you. Thanks. All right, Reggie, get in and start the car. Right oh. Oh, Joe, what a mess. Front door gone, windshield gone, side windows gone. <laughs> well, goodbye, Jasper. Goodbye, boys. Glad to meet you. All right, Doc. Let Jacqueline loose and jump in. Okay. Only first, I'm going to take this gag off so I can kiss her right square on the mouth. Here we go, honey. Double crossing quitters I ever met. Now quit talking, because I'm going to kiss you. You run out on me up. <laughs> Boy, you're the kissingest girl I ever did meet. Oh, I hate you. I hate all of you. Come on, Doc. Here I come. Uh, Let her go. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, boy. Goodbye, Goodbye. 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 <laughs> Poor little old baby. She sure enough went for us, dear. <laughs> yeah, didn't she? Practically tore our car to pieces. It's going to be very uncomfortable driving without a windshield. Oh, go on. Say what you want to. There's a girl that is a gal for my money. Well, Jack, we're on our way out of the Jim Ross ranch now. What? Yeah, fella. Uh, where do we go from here? We're going to Santa Margarita in the state of San Marino. State of San Marino? Well, for goodness sake, where is Santa Margarita San Marino? East coast, just south of the equator. South of the equator? That's right. Do you remember Charles H. Fortune, the wealthy rubber tycoon we met last time we were in San Francisco? Well, I say, will we ever forget him? Well, he's fitting up a South American scientific expedition for rubber exploration in San Marino. Hmm. And he wants us to go along as guides and scouts. Oh, I say, bit of all right. But, but, but looky, Jack, there ain't no fighting in the equator jungles, is there? Oh, no? Well, what well, well, is that? I think before this expedition is over, you'll have more excitement than you know what to do with. No kidding. You bet I'm not kidding. Well, son, lead me to it. I ain't never had all the excitement I wanted. Fist fighting and gun shooting. Boy, howdy. <laughs> transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York, with Louis Van Ruten as Jasper. Frank McCarthy speaking. This program came from New York. Meet FBI man Fred Wilk, who recently won the Wanamaker Mile, and meet Ruby Goldstein, winner of Sport Magazine's award as Referee of the Year on Bill Slater's Sports for All over most of these stations tonight. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
Teresa Adabasco. I place the correct error you made in leaving us before your task was accomplished. It is my purpose to induce you to return and complete what is required of you. You can tell plainer than that. I believe I am making myself perfectly clear. You, Doc Long, and you, Jack Packard, are required to return to the place you know as the Lost Plateau. I think first you better tell us who requires this of us. That I have no power to do. Well, at least tell us what we're expected to do when we get there. In due time, that will be revealed to you. You mean it's your intention of persuading us to go back to the Lost Plateau without any good reason? Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least you might tell us how much of the long green there is in the forest. Long green? The stuff that comes out of the United States Mint. Pesos to you boys south of the border. And I was talking about money. Money is a plaything for little minds. A toy for the little less in civilization. But you don't expect us to make a trip like that for nothing, Shoy. I was told you could be mercenary. Yes. Hey, what's this? Open it. it looks like a leather sack of coins. Jack, look here. Look in this bag. Old Spanish gold pieces. Oh, so it's a precious stone. Don't be silly, Doc. This isn't old Spanish gold. This goes way back. This is Inca gold. No. Nothing. That gold was coined while yet this North America of yours was still under the waters of the great ocean. Well, this should be a museum. It's a small payment for what those in the high place require of you. Well, Jack, I reckon we can go places and do things without too many questions with this kind of payment. Now, oh, just a minute, Doc. Look, there's only one question I want an answer to. Yes, it can be answered. Last time we were up there, your higher intelligence, or whatever you call yourself, sent us over on the border of the land belonging to the eight men. And except for a piece of luck, we'd all have been destroyed. That was because on that occasion you had with you two beautiful women and a man with an evil heart. Well, what's that got to do with it? Other women are not tolerated in the high place. Other women? I'm not permitted to say more. All right, but what's this business about the man with the evil heart? The father of the girl... He was a great scientist, that is true. But also, he was full of the bitterness of death. Death is something which cannot remain in a living heart. Death is not tolerated in the high place. And what you're saying is that we came up there last time with our own companions and therefore couldn't carry out the commission which you claim the stars had in store for us. Which is true. Therefore, those whom I represent are requiring you to make another journey. And you will be our guide? No. But I will direct you in what you must do. Boy, I don't know whether I want to make another trip behind that big waterfall and up that mile and a half climb up that stairway to the sun again. No. You will be required to do neither. In fact, you would not be able to find your way to the stairway again if you tried. Well, I don't know. We got a pretty good pair of heads, I think. That does not get us into it. The way of the stairway to the sun has been closed up. There is no one on the face of the earth save the high ones themselves who could find the way. Nobody, huh? Does that mean that we're to fly directly from Caracas to the plateau? No, you will not fly to the plateau. Not you, nor any other audacious member of the outside world. But you will fly to Caracas from the city of iniquity. Huh? And you call an Hollywood the city of iniquity? I use that phrase, yes. <laughs> now you're going to get in bed with the Chamber of Commerce if you go talking like that. That is besides the point. Here are your passages on the regular airlines to Caracas. Mm. You must have a pull with the airline officials. That likewise is besides the point. When you have reached Caracas, you will be met and flown to a certain point some 200 miles up from the mouth of the Orinoco River. Uh, somebody will be watching for us, huh? That is right. At this place on the Orinoco, which is called Ciudad Bolivar, you will transfer to a motor launch, which will carry you to the mouth of the Caroni River, and up the Caroni, to a point where the river is too shallow for the launch. At this place, which has no name, you will transfer to an Indian war canoe. A what? You will transfer to an Indian war canoe, manned by six native oarsmen and commanded by a Spanish Indian. A woman's in charge of the canoe? Yes. They will conduct you to the headwaters of the Caroni. So after we leave the Orinoco River, we'll be traveling almost directly south, as I understand. That is quite right. <laughs> In other words, we're approaching the Lost Plateau from the back, on the opposite side from the stairway to the sun. That is true. What's the object of that? Yeah, and what happens after we reach it here, uh, the headwaters of the Caroni River? I will answer both questions at once. 
We're approaching the high place from the east to the south because it is in that vicinity that we will find the hermit of San Felipe Atabapo. We'll find who? The hermit of San Felipe Atabapo. I don't know what a hermit is, but what the heck is San Philip Atabapo? San Felipe Atabapo is a beautiful countryside which lies at the foot of the great plateau of the south and east. It is a rich land full of natural beauty and wildlife. You mean it isn't jungle? No. No. It is not jungle. But it is covered with great forests, with noble tablelands of fertile soil which is covered with luxuriant grass and flowers to year round. The forests are full of fruits and berries and bird life and animal life. And the plains are alive with deer and antelope and other animals native of Venezuela. Boy, it sounds like a dog's on land of milk and honey you always hear about. San Felipe Atabapo is a gracious land. No, uh, what about this hermit? What's he got to do with it? He it is who will bring you to the place of the high ones. Oh, and as we reach the headwaters of the colony, how we go about finding this hermit character? The way will be shown to you, one step at a time. Hmm. Well, let's see if I've got it now. We fly to Christ. From there, we'll be flown 200 miles up the Orinoco to a place called Suidad Bolivar. And from there, a motor launch will carry us up to the mouth of the Caroni, up that river to the shallows, and after that, we'll be transferred to a six-oar Indian war canoe in charge of a Spanish Indian woman. That'll take us to the headwaters of the Caroni and into the San Felipe Atabapo country. And into the hands of our clean hands. Then it is understood. Well, time came if you are, Doc. Sounds like money from head. All that took place more than a month ago. And now here, near the headquarters of the Caroni, a long bark war canoe manned by six bronze, heavy-shouldered natives in wearing cloths is toiling slowly up the last reaches of the river full of half-buried trees and sand pits and hidden rocks. In the middle of the craft, Jack and Doc sit on the bottom of the canoe, cross legs in the rear, and the gaunt, gaunt-faced breed woman. Episode 2 
of the Hermit of San Felipe Atabapo will begin shortly. This will be the last what this episode 125 of 140 uh, in the I Love the Mystery the series. The Hermit of San Felipe Atabapo. But first, this message. o'clock in the first warm fragrance of a new morning, somewhere to the southeast of the great lost plateau in the land of San Felipe Atabapo, Venezuela. A land in the midst of a great valley with luxuriant plains roving to the south, while to the east a vast and pleasant forest came down to meet the plains and then marched away toward the rising sun until stopped by the rugged crags of the vast mountains beyond. And here were the plains of the forest meet. Jack and Doc have come upon the hermit, a queer, bright-eyed, happy-go-lucky character, the hermit. He was small and roundish with red apple cheeks, bald with a fringe of fine white hair and blue sparkling eyes. However, he denied that he was either priest or monk and asked that he be called Jeremiah. And now, at 6 o'clock the following morning. I see you have the camp equipment packed up. We're ready to get on our way. That's right. Well, if we get a bit of breakfast down our village, we'll be throwing our paraphernalia and throwing the scotches for the journey back and things for the tall team. My father would be happy with breakfast. We'll be sitting there in your heart, just getting out of conversation and nothing else. Okay. Now, where'd you send back? Well, there's a bit of a river a hundred yards or so beyond those beach trees. I sent the boys to pitch a bucket of water. Oh, now when that big, he's a fine specimen of manhood. Yeah, that's all right. Not what you call literate, I grant you, but a fine pair of steady eyes and the kind of bite that he likes to see, none of that. Yeah, he'll take care of himself under almost any circumstances. Mm, so he will, so he will. I uh, hope you won't mind my asking something, Jeremiah. I don't know whether I will or whether I won't until you say it. My way's come an awfully long way to get to you down here. Traveled several thousand miles by plane, 300 miles from motorboat, and then spent almost three weeks coming up to Karani in an Indian war canoe. Well, hey, if there's anything you want to do to ride in an Indian canoe, it's all of God. Yes, I never ride in myself. I'd rather walk for all of us. Yes, but my point is we've finally arrived, and we've been with you since 8 o'clock last night, but we don't know anything more about why we're here or what's expected of us, and, well, and we did before we left on it. That's right. You don't, do you? <laughs> Uh, I've heard about that place. He's in California, if I remember right. You say you're the hermit of San Felipe at Apopo, but we don't even know that for sure. Oh, of course. Did you hear that? Did you ever question Jack is putting to me? He's been impatient for that jet packet. He's impatient and almost as stubborn as a certain jackass I could pick out when I was pretty mad. If he would but be reasonable now, if he would but understand that all knowledge comes to him in his sick. If he would but look and listen and ask no questions. Well, between you and me and your precious jackass there, I don't like thinking my neck into something I don't know anything about. Must I repeat that to those who seek and to those who are deserving, all things is found in you. Yes, you talk in terms of mysticism, yet you don't have the look of a mystic to me. <laughs> Jeremiah, what about this? What's that? Hallucinations. <laughs> the boy 
something you did this. Yeah, sit down, sit down. Both of you sit down where I tell you up some wild house bacon and whole things like that, see? Oh, Rosa, well, nice and I, I think what I think. Yeah, even if I don't believe it, I'll tell you the truth. Truth? What is the truth, eh? Yeah? Truth? Forget it. Truth? 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 You wouldn't be able to look upon it if you were privileged to do so. And we didn't ask for any esoteric discussion of abstractions either. Esoteric discussion of abstractions, eh? Did you hear it, sort of person? As far as I'm from the voice, I've come along and made it, eh? Esoteric discussion of abstractions, eh? I'm working with the test to go to 
you give that mule a bad reputation, Jeremiah? Yeah, no one did. Did I hear you say there was water ahead? Yes, yeah, sir, so those big fish. Oh, yeah. Hey, a uh, little boy's dream. We'll mm-hmm. stop and give all the stars as a dream. Only thinks about his food and drink. An oversized stomach walking around on four legs with an enlarged spoon full of conscience. That's all the body says. Pretty little stream of water. Oh, 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 just go up stream there about all the sources. I, I wouldn't ask a red-headed Eskimo to drink after it. <laughs> and don't make so much noise when you drink either. I'm wife off your chin. Oh, you were slumbering at that time as a man, and I've been misfortune to old. Sometimes from the look in his eye, I think he almost understands you. No, he understands all right when he wants to. Oh, boy. Hey, you should try that, Jack. Now, what is I told him? Got some kind of mineral in it. Almost like drinking sparkling water. You know, then he's got to be moving along. What do I do? Wait across? Then let's you go a bit away. Please come along, Tom Sarkis. Come along, come along. Well, if you don't hurt your mind, I'm getting his feet wet. I reckon it ain't no killer, and I don't see any other way. Mm-hmm. Hey, didn't I tell you it was cold? Now well, my feet could do with a little cooling off. I'm glad it ain't far. Lower. Yes. Just talk as you understand what I'm talking about. 
The ancient lore? Well, I don't know about the ancient lore, but you seem to have a way with animals. No, way. Would you stop that treasuring you've got no need away to go yet? Oh, but you're angry with me, Jeremiah. This is your own mess, all the stars, if you pick it at all, that will be. Do you know what I always do, Jeremiah? I never know what you will do, mate. <laughs> oh, would you allow it, I'm going to rest you the way you do. And when we get to your place, I will make you food with my own hands. Yes, you will not. Oh, but I will. For you and for you, Jack Crackers, and for you, Dr. Young. Well, I'm going to have me one way of an appetite when we get through this day's walking. I'm pretty near famished right here and now. Oh, no, you're not thinking. I will get you some. Oh, hey, that ain't necessary. Yeah. Where the heck's he off? Don't hold the fire, friend. Don't try to anticipate what that child of thinking has on the mind. Uh, tell me something, Jeremiah. I might. And then again, I might not. Well, you always seem to go into a black mood when the Uganda appears on the scene. You're pigeon and brown and scold like an old woman. And the consequences of that young woman's antics may fall upon my head if it's of any interest to you. It's a great interest to us. What are the consequences of her antics? Well, you know, and I would like to know that myself. And who is Uganda? And that she should be of such great concern to you, and apparently of no concern at all to her parents. <laughs> well, now I tell you, I... <laughs> Ah, there she comes now, racing through the woods like any other wife. Hmm? Doggone, I'd hate to have to run her down. What is she doing, Dad? Dad, what's my story? Well, I brought you. Here's our cozy home. Oh, what is it you got? Jerry, she dropped something you see. Uh, no, thanks. Oh, yes, you must. They are better than just those few. Well, we knew you were anything. Here, yes, Jeremiah. Yes, Jack. I don't know where to get them, but they take away hunger and thirst and give you a lift of vitality. Oh, there you are, Bill. Oh, no, don't stick them out. Now, well, just see the way Jeremiah is. Well, I reckon if he can do it, so can I. Yeah, not so bad after the first one. Well, I can't say I like for a steady diet. Uh, so what did you get him, uh, you got it? Oh, no. That is my secret. With the birds and with the little animals. Uganda, where's your papa and mom? Oh, no, Doc. You mustn't ask them. A must No, it is forbidden. Those who are allowed within the limits of time to look out the bottle are permitted to see what there is to see with their eyes and hear what there is to hear with their ears. If they are not to question anyone or anything with their tongue. It is one of the laws of this case. Well, couldn't I ask this one little question? It does not concern the unexplainable, you know. Did you say the unexplainable? The unexplainable law of San Felipe Atabaco. Well, I never heard of that. All I want to ask is, uh, are you going to travel all the way with me? <laughs> now we've been here, Gunda. You come up here and walk alongside of me, eh? Yes, I can answer nothing. My friend, you're my Come along, come up here and talk to sort of daughters. <laughs> you're neglecting the quitter and he's in a mean mood. All right, dear mine. But I will promise you this. Walk along. When you have passed your probation and are permitted to cross the Rainbow Bridge, then many things will be told to you. Probation? You mean we're to be tested in some way? Talk, 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 talk. Yes, you see how angry Jeremiah is. I can say no more. The rest you will have to find out for yourself. And now we go to episode 127, aired on 5-22-1952, The Hermit of San Felipe, Ataba, Atabapo, <laughs> from I Love a Mystery. We'll be starting here in just a few moments. Okay. 
KSJP 1270, which also brings you mystery and adventure every Sunday afternoon at night, invites you to enjoy tonight's chapter of I Love a Mystery, transcribed every night at 10.15 on KSJP. Adventure thriller, The Hermits of Santity Bay at a Boxful. But... Four o'clock in the warm, luxuriant forest fragrance of the afternoon, somewhere in the southeast of the Great Lost Plateau in the lands of Santity Bay at the Boxful, Venezuela. Then six o'clock this morning, Jack and Doc have been following through the great beach and ironwood forest in the wake of the black-robed, apple-cheeked little hermit Jeremiah and his ancient, bad-tempered mule, Saul of Tarsus. Jack and Doc are on their way to perform an appointed duty for the higher intelligence who seem to reside somewhere on the great plateau. That is all Jack and Doc know. Those in the high places watch something of them. They don't even know who Jeremiah is, except that he's called the Hermit of San Felipe Atabapo. And they don't know who Uganda is. She seems to be a child of 15 or 16, a free one nature full of naivete, full of wonder, full of joy and laughter. And now at four in the afternoon, the little hermit has led his party ten hours through the heart of the forest of giant hardwood trees. Oh, 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 come along with me, Mrs. Jackass. Mother of ice is what you're for, excuse for the beast of burden. I, I don't say you're here, Jackass, for your grass paper.